Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So this is another story from the Paladin DM that also goes by Lord Althory. If you like his work you should check out his subscribe star to support him directly or check out his YouTube channel linked to down below. And with that out of the way let's get into the story. Kill Team Equinox, an introduction to Alvara, M. 41. It is the 41st millennium. For more than a hundred centuries the Emperor has sat immobile on the golden throne of Earth. He is the master of mankind by the will of the gods and master of a million worlds by the might of his inexhaustible armies. He is a rotting carcass writhing invisibly with power from the dark age of technology. He is the carrion lord of the Imperium for whom a thousand souls are sacrificed every day, so that he may never truly die. Yet even in his deathless state, the Emperor continues his eternal vigilance. Mighty battle fleets cross the demon-infested miasma of the warp, the only route between distant stars. Their whale lit by the Astronomicon, the psychic manifestation of the Emperor's will. Vast armies give battle in his name on uncounted worlds. Greatest amongst his soldiers are the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines, bioengineered super warriors. Their comrades in arms are Legion, the Imperial Guard and countless planetary defense forces, the ever vigilant Inquisition and the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus to name only a few. But for all their multitudes, they are barely enough to hold off the ever-present threat from aliens, heretics, mutants, and worse. To be a man in such times is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloody regime imaginable. These are the tales of those times. Forget the power of technology and science, for so much has been forgotten, never to be relearned. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for in the grim dark future there is only war. There is no peace amongst the stars, only an eternity of carnage and slaughter, and the laughter of thrusting gods. In the Atlas Sector, within Segmentum Tempestus, yet another threat seeks to snuff out countless billions of lives. A seething swarm of vile Xenos numbering in the billions, devouring all in their path. These are the Tyranids, a species of foul aliens bound together by a powerful hive mind, driven by an insatiable hunger. The wretched aliens endlessly seek more biomas to expand their hive fleets. This particular tendril of the Great Swarm has been designated Hive Fleet Terrisk. For years now, Terrisk has devoured its way across the less important worlds of the sector while the laborious cogs of Imperial bureaucracy rally the forces necessary to put a stop to it. Now the hammer of the Imperium, the Imperial Navy, is ready to strike back, with aid from the Emperor's own sons, the Adeptus Astartes. Above the vital world of Alvara, the Imperial forces light the void with the exchange between Lance batteries and Tyranid bioweaponry. However, the planet is already in grave danger. The vile Xenos have begun their invasion of the planet, millions of spore pods falling from orbits, bringing an army of ravening horrors. Alvara cannot be allowed to fall. An ocean world originally colonized during the Dark Age of Technology, the inhabitants live in several hive cities connected by great bridges. These man-made mountains of skyscrapers and hab blocks hold hundreds of millions to even billions of imperial citizens. The technology that allowed them to be built up from the depths of the planet spanning oceans is long since forgotten. Each hive represents massive pools of manpower for the imperial guard and industrial powerhouses able to produce the lasgans uniforms, and power packs needed to equip them. Even more important are the planet's oceans, which swarm with aquatic life that can be harvested and used to feed hungry mouths across the entire sector. To protect this vital planet, relief forces are being sent down even as the void battle rages. Larger relief forces may be months of warp travel away, but swifter aid is available. To protect Hive Minos, a slightly more isolated but nonetheless important Hive, the Death Watch have deployed a kill team. The Death Watch are the militant arm of the Ordo Xenos, that branch of the God Emperor's most holy inquisition tasked with defending mankind from the accursed alien. They are some of the best and brightest members of the Adeptus Astartes, drawn from each chapter in the Imperium and forged into a precision instrument of extreme violence. 
Even now, a kill team of these elite specialists sits within a storm and gunship as it dives through the atmosphere. It breaks through the clouds, roaring down towards one of the great bridges between the hive cities. Towards the desperate last stand of a group of guardsmen as they try to hold back the innumerable aliens charging their position. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 1, Landing at Outpost Alpha. Inside the storm Fiverr five of start sat, rather cramped. The craft had been modified to double as a light transport, but it was still not quite comfortable. Still, it was better than a drop pod, and space marines do not complain. Assault Marine Constantine of the Black Templar sat nearest to the exit, shifting restlessly. The young, well, young by our start standards, warrior thumbed the activation switch of his power sword, but never switched it on. Clad all in black and silver armor, his face concealed behind his helmet, he seemed like a knight out of ancient Terran legend. Much like such knights did before battle, he was praying, eyes closed behind the visor and lips speaking silently. Unlike the foolish mortals of the past though, he prayed to a god he knew was real, for his blood flowed in his veins. Constantine offered up the coming battle to his father, the god emperor, and with it the skulls of every Xenos his sword would claim. Opposite him sat Devastator Ishvan of the Salamanders. He sat all in dark green armor, his helmet still maglocked to his belt. His back was covered with a massive Prometheum tank, ammunition for the heavy flamer sat across his lap. He was smiling, enjoying the ride as best he was able. It was a slightly unnerving sight, for Ishvan, like all salamanders, was slightly unusual looking, even by the standards of the grossly overmuscled astarts. His skin was as black as charcoal, and his grin contrasted greatly with it. His eyes were a fiery red, like burning rubies and yet they practically twinkled with life. Next to him, as far away from Constantine as possible, Andriel of the Dark Angels sat in meditation. He wore no helm, but a hooded cowl was drawn over his head, obscuring his features. He too wore green, but of a darker shade and with much more distinct markings. Furthermore, his armor and equipment were plainly more arcane. Robes and sigils and purity seals adorned it, and at his side was neither blade nor bolter, but a staff crowned with strange purple crystals. Which, Constantine would call him, for Andriel was a sicker, a mutant gifted with the power to draw upon the power of the warp. That supernatural, immaterial plane through which the Imperium traversed a void between the stars. The source of magic, and powers beyond reckoning, and with them dark things beyond a mortal's worst nightmares. Across from him and aside Constantine sat a lupin old man. He wore neither helm nor hood, but let his long, ruddy red hair and beard flow freely over his shoulders. He was old, even by the standards of the Astartes, such that his hair and beard were streaked with silver. His fangs were long, his features canine, his eyes still bright. Over his blue armor hung the pelt of a fearsome Finrisian wolf, the apex predator of his home world. At his belt hung a power axe, heavily customized with runes and totems to grant it the blessings of the friendly spirits, Froki and Loki. He was Wathin, long fang of the Vlakar Fenrika, or as the galaxy knew them, the Space Wolves. Lastly, in the cockpit, more of the Iron Hands, perhaps the most unusual of the whole strange band. He calmly operated the controls of the Stormtalon with not merely his hands, but also by directly interfacing with the machine. Heavily modified with cybernetics, Morn's mind interfaced with the craft as they descended far faster than any mortal could. From his back sprang several mechatentrites, extra mechanical limbs that managed the rest of the ship, both controls and also enacting the many rites of the machine god. Sacred urgence, smoking incense, chanting binary prayers to soothe the machine spirit. Meanwhile his steady hands guided the storm to land down at precisely the angle where speed was maximized. Without, of course, turning the inhabitants and more importantly, the ship, into flaming chunks. Sergeant Atra Germanicus of the Alvaran 23rd Infantry Regiment was the first to hear it coming. The roar of engines could be heard even over the screaming horde of monsters trying to turn her into nondescript goop. She could not look up because of said monsters currently charging her position. First in line was a wave of Hormigaunts, foot soldiers that skittered across the bridge like insects, only the size of a large man. 
They had no ranged capabilities but were lightning fast and each had two long scything claws on their front end, and a mouth filled with fangs. Behind them came other gaunts, armed with various unpleasant bio-weapons such as spike rifles, venom cannons, and all other manners of vicious nonsense that she didn't have a name for. She did have a gas mask for it though, and for that she was very grateful. Behind that was a trio of creatures that seemed more like living walls of meat and armor. Lasgans did nothing to them, and they seemed to be protecting the even larger thing behind them. Whatever that was, Aethra didn't know, and she really hoped the fire support was bringing some very big guns to deal with it. Whatever they were bringing, they weren't bringing it quickly enough. The first wave crossed into range, and the small outpost of only a few dozen guardsmen and women opened fire. Red light streaked across the divide as the Imperial Guard opened up with their lasguns. The thunder of heavy bolters followed shortly thereafter. Atre stole a quick glance backwards, the weapons team was still busy trying to right the Lascanon that had been knocked over in the last assault. Oh well, no time to help them now. Atra raised her own weapon as the first wave reached her range. Unlike the Lasguns her comrades were wielding, she was carrying a plasma weapon. Lasguns, as the name suggested, fired lasers. They were accurate over quite a long range, dealt decent damage for small arms, and had virtually no recoil. Plasma on the other hand was mid-range, far more unstable, far more violent, and far, far deadlier. It took multiple hits to bring down a Hormagaunt with last fire, but one shot from the plasma gun simply melted the creature unfortunate enough to be on the receiving end of its agile flame. She melted four monsters before the gun began to beep at her. Hitting a button near the trigger, she winced as the weapon vented scalding steam. To call plasma temperamental would be an understatement. The tyranids closed. The guard had put down dozens in their charge, but there were hundreds in this attack. Atra got off one more shot before a gaunt leapt over the sandbags she was hiding behind. She interposed the gun between herself and the monster, turning aside the claws meant for her throat. Instead, it simply ripped through her flak armor and left a long, narrow cut along her shoulder. She pushed back against the off-balance alien and fired into its shoulder. The stench of burning flesh invaded her gas mask, but she didn't have time to vomit. She turned and shot another gaunt out of the air before a third went for her side. It cut her on the thigh, and she hits the button, venting steam into its face. It let out a wordless shriek before she cut it off by disintegrating its face. She hit the ground with a deep pain in her side. A bone spike had hit her armor and bounced off, but it was still enough to crack her rib. She rolled over, trying to get to her feet when yet another tyrannid leapt at her. She dodged one stab that otherwise would have gone though her eye and blocked the other with the gun. In hindsight, she considered it very lucky the forges of Mars made their weapons so sturdy. In the moment, she grabbed her knife from her belt and drove it into a weak point in the armor, where the shoulder met the torso. Purple blood sprayed over her as she twisted the knife, forcing the alien back as she forced herself to her feet. It lunged again, as if to embrace her with its talons and she drove the knife into its eye. The alien's corpse fell on top of her. Then she wondered why she felt such a strong wind. The storm Talon had arrived. Constantine was the first out of the ship as it hovered over the bridge. Plunging down with his power sword in one hand, and his combat knife in another, he landed on top of a gaunt with a venom cannon, crushing it like the bug it was under his massive armor. For the Emperor. He bellowed his war cry, loud enough the entire battlefield could hear it. He moved like lightning back into the enemy horde, sending alien limbs and heads flying like leaves before a hurricane. Bone rifles glanced off his armor, and Hormagaunt talons scrapped against it uselessly. That is if they were lucky enough to hit it. Constantine moved far, far faster than a man of his size would appear, and his armor would apparently allow. He parried aside claws with such speed it seemed the Xenos were moving in tar. His blades cut through their armor like butter, leaving any gaunt that drew near him in several pieces he trampled over. The bone armor crunched under his boots. Atra was almost dumbstruck, but not too dumbstruck to stop firing. Constantine was moving away from the defensible position towards the titans in the third line, which was all well and good except the guard's outpost was still being overrun. Fortunately, the second son of the emperor was well suited to fixing that problem. 
Aishvan landed in Constantine's wake, heavy flamer already firing as he dropped. Like the flaming reptile his chapter was named for, he unleashed hell upon the alien horde. Tyranids would turn to ash under a roaring tide of Prometheum as he swept in a semicircle around himself. The filthy aliens were cleansed in holy fire before he finally cast the feed, and started advancing, slower due to his heavy ammunition backpack, but towards the guardsman's lines. Fear not. He declared. The Emperor protects. The others followed swiftly thereafter. Wathin was next out the door, and followed after Constantine into the horde, singing songs of battle as he went. His bolt pistol barked out several times, each followed the sound of a tyrannid head popping as the armor piercing grenades drove through the bone with contemptuous ease. Then he was in the melee. While Constantine might be compared to a swift, almost elegant blender, Wathin was simply a battering ram. Constantine cut off heads, Wathin cut gaunts in half. Long, powerful blows cleaved through the swarm, the old wolf using every ounce of his brute strength and weight to push through with raw violence. Andriel stood back from the main line, then leveled his staff at the bridge. A forest of lightning sprung up, covering half the bridge. That was not entirely metaphorical either, the lightning took the form of great trees, between which vines hung and a lion formed of psychic power prowled. With the enemy somewhat more stymied, he turned his attention to the other half of the bridge. Arrows of flame and swords forged of dark ice formed around him and hurtled into the ranks of the enemy, each one as lethal as a plasma blast. Meanwhile, Morn opened up with the Storm Raven's weapons. Twin assault cannons spent hundreds of rounds and seconds, while two more heavy bolters scattered more explosive ammo into the enemy's ranks. The weapons were far less accurate than he would have preferred, but with this many enemies it hardly mattered. He calculated that purging 16.1242% of the enemy force would provide sufficient cover for his battle brothers, and that Aishvan would provide sufficient cover for the guard. Once he had exterminated exactly that many Xenos, a process which required 146.34 seconds, he turned his guns on the tyrant guards. The huge, bulking walls of flesh were in fact, also Xenos. Remarkably dumb Xenos but equally tough. One interposed itself between the guns and the creature behind it, and simply ate fire. The full might of the Storm Raven tore into it for nearly half a minute before the monster fell. At that point, it was more whole than life form, but it did its job and bore time. Behind it, the Hive Tyrant commanding this scouting force had made the requisite calculations. Drawing upon the Hive Mind's vast library of combat experience, it recognized the thing attacking it as an Astard Stormtalon. It also learned that the Stormtalon's VTOL engine sucked in large quantities of air. The monster fired twice from the massive acid cannon that made up one of its many limbs. Morn thought the alien had missed, and then realized his mistake when he sensed the machine spirit's pain as the turbine sucked in the corrosive bioacid. Morn ordered the main engines to immediately stop, and the other engines to turn. The aircraft dropped like a stone, turning sideways to become a wall between the guard and the horde. It was not a soft landing, but the Stormtalon was not a soft ship. She was bruised, but the turbines were able to stop before they spun the bioacid around in them and utterly ruined them. Morn disconnected himself from the ship and calmly walked out the back onto the bridge, drawing his bolters as he went. These were a halfway point between the bolt pistol Wathin used and the heavy bolters on the Stormtalon. They were the standard issue for almost all the starts, a holy symbol of the Emperor's wrath. Of course, most space marines only carry one, and used it with both hands. Most space marines were mostly flesh though. Morn raised his bolters towards the line where the guard and the gaunts were locked in the mortal combat. He took a moment for his targeting computers to note trajectories and account for drop and wind, then began to open fire, at full auto. Well, not entirely full auto, he did make small gaps as he shifted from target to target. Tyranids exploded, each one receiving exactly the right amount of ordnance calculated to kill it. Atra flinched as yet another alien exploded in front of her, showering her in gore. This attack did leave his back vulnerable though. Several gaunts opened fire on him, but his armor held, just as he knew it would. 
a particularly bold few Hormigaunts cross the distance between their lines and him without being incinerated by Aishvan or Andriel. Those that made it close enough soon realized that Tetchmarine was not nearly as vulnerable as he would appear. The Macadantrites on his back sprang into action, mechanical tendrils crushing necks, delivering electric shocks, and blowtorching any who drew near. As Morn turned, one lucky Xeno leapt past his defenses and delivered its razor-sharp talons to a weak point in Morn's armor, where his pauldrons ended and his arm armor began. The Tyranid felt its claws cut through the armor and then hit something. But it was not soft, yielding flesh, but stern iron. The alien looked almost confused as it hung there, stuck to the side of the massive space marine. Atra thought it looked almost comical. Morn simply picked it up by the head with one of his macadantrites. Flesh is weak. He told it, then crushed the Xeno's head and moved on. Constantine watched the tyrant guard disintegrate under the hail of fire and knew this was his moment. As soon as the deadly barrage ceased, he activated his jump pack and flew. The space marines were called the Emperor's Angels, and now Constantine descended upon the Xenos, borne aloft by pinnons of fire. The hive tyrant stared at him, its cold black eyes watching its doom approach. The tyrant did not think it was doomed though, and drawing on the swarming minds about it, unleashed a psychic blast, not as focused as the ones Andriel unleashed, but no less powerful. The Black Templar ceased to fall, and fell backwards, rapidly, slamming into the Permacrete Bridge with a loud and painful thud. His body and mind alike burned in agony from the cyclic attack, but pain never stopped a son of dawn. As the Gaunt leapt at him, trying to overwhelm him with numbers while he was fallen, Constantine leapt up screaming in rage. Xena switch. He cursed the monster. He cut apart any who stood in his way and charged forwards dragging several hormigons that tried to leap on him with him. One fell off and he trampled over it without thought. I will have your head. He bellowed, his battle brothers wincing and lowering the volume on their vox receivers. He cut out enough room to fire his jump pack and leapt again, but this time his way was blocked by the second tyrant guard. Constantine hit the living wall like a remarkably angry bowling ball. Unfortunately, this was a rather sturdy wall. He tried to drive his knife into the monster's head, but the blade scrapped off it, leaving a long white scratch but little else. The guard swung a talon roughly the size of Constantine's head directly at said head with enough force to knock over a tank. Constantine parried with his power sword, though the effort nearly jarred it from his hand. He did notice however that the Tyranid's armor couldn't stop the powered blade. He locked his knife to his hip and took the sword in both hands, lunging to pierce the alien's heart when yet another psychic blast sent him skidding back. He stayed standing, but now had a rather nasty scorch mark on his pauldrons in addition to the one on his chest. To make matters worse, the other tyrant guard was now getting involved. The brutes were stupid, but even they knew that attacking the threat to their charge from both sides was more effective than one at a time. They are tyrannids for the emperor's sake, their whole shtick is overwhelming numbers in a way that only the orcs could rival. Constantine was brash, but not so brash to think he could take on both of these monsters and the hive tyrant at once. Instead of retreating like a sensible person, he instead radioed the squad. Where are you? I require aid to purge this abomination. Executing the backup plan C7. Morn responded calmly as he continued to quickly and efficiently exterminate any tyrannid with ranged weaponry. You appear to not have noticed that the talon was damaged as you remain in close combat with the tyrant guard. He informed his less rational brother. Next to him, Ashvan began advancing, his heavy flamer keeping back any who would attempt to close to melee with them. We do not retreat from Xenos. Constantine spat back. He knocked aside another attack from the first tyrant and countered, removing one of its arms with a mighty blow. Before he could capitalize, the other caught him with a glancing blow but it was still enough to almost knock him down. The Emperor protects. He chanted the mantra. Well he's busy. I'll cover for him. Wathin responded, almost lightheartedly, as he finally caught up with his younger brother. Sprinting forwards, he shoulder checked one of the tyrant guards. It only tipped the thing, rather than turning it to paste, but it was off balance. 
He cut one of its legs out from under it with a mighty blow, then fired the full clip of his bolt pistol into its head. The thing was too stupid to realize it was dead though, and tried to swing at him. Wathin almost casually knocked it aside and raised his axe to finish the beast when the tyrant intervened. Both Wathin and Constantine were struck by pain that nearly blinded both of them as the tyrant dropped the psychic weight of the hive mind on top of them like a thousand tiny screaming anvils. Anvil sensed the attack, and realizing the threat was one that could not be defeated with merely blasting the creature in question to pieces, contacted the guard, Aishvan, and Morn. I must drop the barrier. Charge the left. He ordered them with a telepathic command, then flung his mind to battle the tyrant. He had no hope over overpowering the creature. It wasn't just one rather powerful mind, but thousands of tiny, weaker minds. It was like trying to hold up a boulder and every pebble on a beach all at once. Instead, he went for the connection, the tether between the tyrant and his brothers. Using his superior focus, he cut it like severing a noose with a knife. The tyrant turned its attention on him and tried the same trick. Andriel threw up a defense, not a solid wall, for that would be beaten down by weight of mines, but something akin to an ancient tear and pike formation. The countless tiny minds of the tyrannids impaled themselves on it, while the tyrant prowled behind, looking for where it would try to break through. It hit his defenses like a freight train, and Andriel welcomed it. Instead, he formed a single, large spike in his backlines and reposted into the attack. The Tyranid and the Space Marine both screamed and staggered back, their focuses shattered upon each other. The Tyrant decided to answer with a physical response, namely the bioacid cannon it had used to shoot down the transport. Andriel wisely decided to get out of the way. While this exchange had been occurring, two other significant events also occurred. The first is that the forest barrier on the left ceased to exist altogether. The Tyranids had been flinging themselves into it in hopes of somehow knocking it down or draining its power, which had no effect other than killing large numbers of Tyranids. However, that did mean that once it fell, the aliens were already charging. Ishvin interposed himself between the horde and the guard post, but even a heavy flamer has its limits. Xenos was still getting through, when the guard, led by Sergeant Atra, leapt out from behind their sandbags and countercharged. Lasbolts and plasma blasts led the way, cutting down gaunts and blunting the tide. Morn did not charge the left, and instead preserved the right, something far easier considering the storm till and he had landed on the bridge largely bottleneck the enemy. Using his macadantrites to reload as he fired, he kept up a constant stream of bolt of fire. The other notable event was that a tyrant guard was prevented from crushing Constantine into a bloody pulp. The creature certainly tried, but Constantine was still able to move somewhat despite the psychic barrage. He staggered away from the brute's clumsy swipes, unable to risk getting close enough to kill it. He backed off, almost to the edge of the bridge, when a massive red blur smashed into the monster and disintegrated a hole through its body where its head used to be. The Imperial Guard's Les Cannon had finally been righted, and the weapons team had taken a shot at the biggest alien on the field. Unfortunately for them, the biggest alien was far from the most dangerous. The Hive Tyrant sensed its bodyguard's rather violent demise and reacted accordingly. It turned its attention from attempting to dissolve Andriel to succeeding at dissolving the weapons team. They were not even able to scream, as the Hive Tyrant fired both its heavy venom cannon and its acid sprayer at them practically drowning the area in bioacid. The virulent solvent even ate into the last cannon itself, and the gun exploded as its power packs were ruptured. Then the tyrant noted that its last bodyguard was dead, and also that Wathin was standing back up, and Constantine was charging. If the tyrannids engineered their commanders to feel fear, the monster probably would have retreated. Unfortunately, they do not. The tyrant lashed out at Constantine with a long tendril slowing the Templar as he was forced to parry the attack or risk being flung off the bridge. The Space Wolf was another matter. Wathin ducked the monster's tendril and swung his axe for its belly. The Tyrant was smart enough to not try to block a power axe, and instead used its last two weapons, a pair of talons similar to a Hormagaunt's but bigger, to block the wolf's arm. It was not sharp enough to cast the power armor, 
nor strong enough to crush it when it wrapped its talons around the marine's forearm, but it was strong enough that he couldn't just slip free. With Wathan immobilized, it raised its acid sprayer to melt the old wolf. Wathan turned, and with his free hand he fired the last three shots in his bolt pistol into the arm holding the acid sprayer. When that didn't stop it, he dropped the pistol, grabbed his knife, and threw it at the area the bolt rounds had softened up, severing the arm before it could fire. With that dealt with, he turned and began to punch the arms holding his, steadily breaking enough bones to pull free. The tyrant focused its long tendrils and venom cannon on Constantine, trying to keep the Templar and his deadly blade back. It ordered its forces further back to try and swarm the Astartes and preserve its life. This allowed the guard and the marines in the back line to move forwards. The tyrant hissed as it felt a sudden painful burning sensation in its chest, mostly due to the plasma currently sitting there, courtesy of Atra. It also ordered a wedge of gaunts to close in and kill her, and also turned its venom cannon on her. It still outnumbered the Imperials 10 to 1 but it had begun this engagement outnumbering them 40 to 1. It was losing. The wedge came on and Aishvan recognized it. He interposed himself between the aliens and Atra, opening fire. He fired in an upwards angle, burning away the venom of the venom cannon before it could hit either of them, but this meant a hormigons towards the back were able to close in. They completely ignored him, and while he was swift enough to catch one, the other survived. He turned. Hearing the sound of splitting flesh, expecting to find the sergeant in several pieces. Instead, he saw her turning from the slit throat of the Hormagons to plunge her knife into its eye. Aishvan smiled approvingly. Meanwhile, Andriel spotted the blue patch on the tyrant and realized they had an opportunity. Pushing himself slightly, he rallied his control and impaled the Tyranids in front of Morn. The plasma has damaged the armor. Special issue, he suggested and Morn agreed. He spent his current ammunition and this time, his Macadon trides grabbed some rather special bolt rounds. He turned, and delivered two full magazines into the section of weakened armor. These bolts were hellfire rounds, containing a special anti-biological combination of acids and incendiaries. It spread like its namesake inside the massive bioform, tearing it apart from the inside. Wathin finally managed to break free and dragged his axe across its gut, disemboweling the alien. Constantine also took his opportunity, with a beast staggered, he fired his jump pack for a third time. With a single blow, he fulfilled his promise to the alien which by splitting its head from its body. He landed on his feet, the tyrant toppling over behind him. With the death of the tyrant, a shockwave went through the aliens. The death of such a powerful mind so close to them outright killed many of the lesser creatures. Those that survived went into a killing frenzy, attacking whatever was nearest, including each other. The guard cleaned up, and in a matter of minutes, there was not a single living Xeno in sight. Cleanup complete, the space marines begin to reassemble and evaluate their status. Constantine and Wathin were sore from the Hive Tyrant psychic assault and the Black Templar in particular was bruised from his repeated falls. However, neither had sustained serious physical damage. Their armor was stronger than a tank's, practically invulnerable to the vast majority of Tyranid small arms. The guard were not so lucky. The Tyranid attack had mauled the unit, and it was a small miracle the unit had not broken and fled before the swarm. Those few who were only lightly injured or in rare cases, unharmed, quickly set to work gathering the more badly wounded into an impromptu field hospital. Ashvin approached a guardsman, and those who were not currently carrying the wounded knelt before him. Eight were approached first, speaking on behalf of the unit. My lords, you have our utmost gratitude for saving our unit. You did very well yourselves before we even arrived. You held the line in the face of the enemy and provided valuable assistance in turning back this scouting formation. Alvaro is lucky to have such stalwart men and women to defend it. The note about this being a scouting formation made Atra feel the ever so faintest bit of sickening terror, but she composed herself before she could embarrass herself in front of the Astartes. After all, the Commissar would have shot her for expressing such feelings, let alone one of the fearless space marines. My lord. You said this was a scouting force? We barely held it off and that was with your aid. 
What are we to do when the main force arrives? She asked. She might be the ranking officer here, mostly because anyone higher up was dead, but she knew better than to ask to retreat. Not be here. Morn said as he walked by the pair, examining the guard post. The post had once been a fairly solid defensible position. It was clearly meant to be a checkpoint before the invasion, with a series of barriers that could be raised or lowered to deny or admit vehicles. It was a permacrete structure with two large towers on either side of the bridge. An enclosed walkway spanned the gap between them over the bridge. He paused to check his files on the defenses, and there were supposed to be heavy weapons stationed in the towers. Strangely, no guardsmen had fought from this far superior position. Why were you not up there? He asked Atra. We were at the start. She responded. They climbed the walls and melted through the roof. They pushed us out at first when they killed our commissar, but Lieutenant Reginald led a charge back in to drive them out. The problem is that they are still full of pools of bioacid, lingering toxic fumes, and melted people. We need to clear it out before we could use it. We did evacuate the heavy weapons and cogitators though. Show me. Morn stated, and Ata led him towards a secure area towards the back. There the guard had stowed the heavy bolters when they ran out of ammunition. They had also evacuated the cogitators, computers, and all the valuable data therein. Morn knelt down besides one of these devices and placed a palm to it. A series of electrical currents flowed between him and the device, allowing the Tetchmarine to commune with the machine's spirit, the divine spark that ensured all technologies function. He quickly accessed the video logs of the checkpoint's cameras. He played the last hour by at 60 times speed, his enhanced mind able to process the information and confirm that it had all transpired as Atra had said. She had neglected to mention how she looted the plasma weapon off of the dead lieutenant's corpse, but it would have been destroyed if she hadn't, as would have the weapons and cogitators if not for her actions. He stood up and looked at her. Dirty blonde hair, pale complexion, heterochronic, blue-black, eyes, 6 foot 4 inches, approximately 190 pounds. He cross-referenced the visual data with personnel logs of known infantry units in the theater. She did not match. Her uniform had had the unit number removed and replaced with a new number, 423, which also did not match his records. Atra meanwhile shifted slightly, unsure of why the Space Marine was stating at her. After an uncomfortably long minute of silence, Morn turned his head and confirmed his theory. One of the guardsmen moving the wounded was a man. Guard units were not usually comprised of both sexes, for obvious enough reasons. That meant this was a scratch company. That explained the uniform and why Atla wasn't registering a match. Good, it could be useful. What units comprise this scratch company? He asked Atra, who started slightly as he broke the, for her anyway, uncomfortable silence. Uh, the 19th infantry and bits from the 7th mechanized sir. She responded. Do the sections from the 7th have any experience working with turbine engines? Morn asked. Yes sir, I and Private Reynold both worked with the Aeronautica during the campaign on Ivers Ive after a large portion of the Navy engineers were, ahem, blown up and or out into vacuum during void actions. Good. Come with me and show me where Reynold is. He was wounded my lord. Show me. Atra led the massive Tetchmarine towards the improvised field hospital. She pointed Reynold out. Wounded did not begin to cover what had happened to this particular soldier. His left arm resembled a candle that has been left in a microwave. He had taken a direct hit from a bioacid sprayer, which had melted his armor, skin, and bones together into an indistinguishable mass. It was bleeding badly despite the tourniquet the medics had placed around him and would become infected if not treated quickly. He was in shock, and also clearly useless. Morn drew his knife and cut off the private's arm. The razor-sharp blade and the superhuman strength of its wielder cut it free in a single clean stroke. The medic and Atla looked at the marine like he was insane as he placed a massive palm to the wound. There was a hiss and the smell of burning flesh as Morn cauterized the wound with an electric burn. He would have required amputation and fitting for cybernetics. Now you do not need to waste antibiotics. Morn informed the medic and walked back towards the Stormtlan, somewhat reluctantly followed by Atra. 
Kill Team Equinox Chapter 2, The Hive City. Ishvan walked by the wounded Azatra and Morn set to work repairing the Stormtlan, offering what words of encouragement he could. As I said to your brothers and sisters nearest the front, you have all fought very well. You stood against the enemies of man without flinching, even to the point of sacrificing your own bodies to protect the lives of your fellow Imperial citizens. I am proud to fight alongside such courageous men and women. Certainly, the Emperor smiles on your home, that it produced such stalwart defenders. He had removed his helmet, and was smiling, speaking amicably. He was trying to seem as normal, as merely human as possible to them, to put them at ease. This was not exactly easy to do, or very successful. It is hard to appear comforting when you are an 8 foot tall demigod clad in baroque power armor, with glowing red eyes and skin like charcoal. He did appear to inspire confidence in at least one guardsman. The man reached out a hand towards him, barely able to lift it. He had been on the receiving end of a Hormagon's attacks and had been pierced through with its sharp claws. The Xenos blades had run him through front to back, such that the bandages were stained crimson. A boon my lord, a boon. He wheezed, forcing air through punctured lungs. Ask? Ishvan said, dropping low so that he could hear the man more clearly. My family, my children. The man started to beg. Will they be safe? Ishvan smiled comfortingly, or at least what he thought was comfortingly, at the man. They have a father as bold and strong as you. I am certain they will be quite alright. I command you this, live, and go home to see them and hear the stories of their courage, which shall no doubt rival your own. He told him, and rose to leave as the medics came to take the man away to a medical chiller. Constantine's face was as grim as the helmet he hid it behind as he watched the bridge looking down its long permacrete stretches towards the yet unseen alien horde. He heard Ishvan approaching him. Cousin, why do you waste your words with these mortals? He asked the salamander. I hardly consider them wasted brother. Even if they were, I have centuries of time and three lungs worth of breath to spend on those mortals as you so put it. Ishvan returned. Truly? Do you think the emperor gave us those centuries to be spent on something so trivial? It is not trivial brother. Is it not? These are dead men, cousin. The Black Templar answered him. Most will fall in battle against the Xenos, and more still will succumb to their wounds afterwards. They will not go home to their families, and they may not even have families to go home to. What use are your words to them except pleasant lies? It gives them hope. Hope? The Black Templar scoffed. There is only war, there is no room for hope. Only faith and fury. What are the wars fought for then? Ishvan asked, purely as a rhetorical question. Constantine turned to him and gave him a stare that bored through his helmet into the salamander's burning eyes. For the emperor, and the chance to live and serve him tomorrow, and each day after that until we are dead, and to purge as many Xenos as we can in his name before we die. Indeed, and to protect as many of the emperor's weaker servants as we are able. Ishvan answered him returning the stare with no less intensity. The sons of Nocturne were not as harsh as the Black Templars, but that did not make them softer. The two resumed their vigil, staring down the long road towards the planetary capital. Though, neither knew if it still held. The attack had come from that direction, but the bridges were vast, and the seas between even vaster. It might yet hold. Why then had they been sent to guard such a relatively minor hive? Constantine could sense something still weighed on his battle brother, and not just the strangeness of their assignment. Even the sons of Vulcan do not grow melancholy over the deaths of guardsmen, or they would never have accomplished anything. Why your disquiet cousin? They fear us brother. Ishvan answered him. Not the alien, but our comrades in the guard. I have seen the same fear in the civilians as well. We are their defenders, scourge against the great enemies of men and yet they still look at us with dread. We are the sons of the Emperor himself, and reflections of his mighty power and wrath. I believe it was an ancient Terran philosopher who said, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We are not gods though, only men, same as they are. Same must have a different meaning on Nocturne, just look at us. We are clearly not only men, but far above mortals by the grace of the Emperor. Perhaps, but we were not always so. Have you already forgotten what it is to be a mortal? 
Constantine chuckled and thumbed the hilt of his power sword. I remember anything that matters. Aishvan smiled at the joke, or at least what he assumed was a joke. A fair point, we are warriors, not diplomats. So, grab a diplomat if you need one. Wathin said bluntly, butting into their conversation with all the subtlety of a drunk grox. Assuming of course you want to talk with people and not threaten them with imminent immolation. If it comes to that particular kind of diplomacy, I am certain you are the master. Aishvan said with a slight grin. I have heard many tales of your chapters, diplomatic expertise. Wait till you see it in person then whelp. Wathin said with a wolfish grin. The schools never quite get it right. For example, they probably never mentioned that we have a habit of having a few mortals on standby for when we need actual diplomacy. Constantine cocked his head to the side slightly, earning a small grunt of amusements from Wathin. Here's two Finrisian proverbs for you laddie. First, if your only tool is an axe, every problem had better be a neck. Secondly, you make friends with ale and foes with an axe. Both get the job done but depending on the problem you get more trouble than it was worth. The galaxy has enough enemies for us to keep busy at least for a wee bit longer. Those are not exclusively Finrisian proverbs. Morn said from inside the storm Tillon's engine as he welded the rotors back together. Similar ones exist all across the Imperium, indicating some form of common phrase that likely originated on Terra. Well I gave the Fenris version and therefore the best version. Wath encountered. Aishvan isn't wrong though. Having an emissary might come in handy. I disagree. Andriel said, not opening his eyes as he continued to hover in the air, legs crossed in meditation. We are the angels of death, we are meant to be feared. They fear you for an entirely different reason, which. Constantine growled at the sicker, who ignored him. And loath as I am to agree with you, I concur that bringing a mortal along with us would be foolish, for entirely different reason. Anyone we bring along would simply die at best and slow us down at worst. Concern noted. Atra, you are coming with us. Morn said as he continued his work. What? Said Atra and Constantine at once, one confused and slightly terrified, the other confused and mildly more enraged than usual. Both my observations of the most recent combat and analysis of her file indicates that she is the most competent mortal currently available to us. Furthermore, her recorded history with the guard would provide her with an understanding of our guard allies that we might maximize our effectiveness. Would you mind explaining what you mean by history to those of us without a cogitator bolted onto the side of their head? Wathin asked, about as politely as a space wolf can ask. Five standard years of service in two theaters, the Akan v rebellion against a renegade governor and her forces, and then the Isthmus III crusade to counter Wyag Magnots. Morn explained, causing Andriel to raise an eyebrow. You have survived five years, facing not only renegades but also the orcs and are only a sergeant, why? He asked Atra telepathically. Atra stumbled backwards, almost falling over in surprise before she realized what exactly was going on. What in the Emperor's name? What is this sorcery? Oh, you're a sicker? Apologies my lord. Not all guardsmen fight like Krieg, and many regiments have somewhat, ridiculous ways of handling officer roles. Andriel could sense the heavy weight of resentment, primarily directed at a series of men who looked mostly like they hailed from some manner of hive nobility. There was also no small amount of anger towards various commissars that seemed to come and go with surprising rapidity. He opened his eyes and looked at her. Andriel had a gift, or perhaps a curse, it was hard to be certain. He was a sicker, and as stated before that was in and of itself a gift and a curse. However, it was not just ordinary powers, if there could be considered to be such a thing as an ordinary sicker. He could see the touch of the gods, and how easy it would be for the ruinous powers to reach out and grasp at someone with their wretched corrupting tendrils. It had always been there, a flickering series of lights around a person's aura, not an indicator of taint, but rather how they might be tainted. The pulsing. Burning red of corn, the blood god hung around her, stronger than with most mortals, but she was a soldier, and a good one. It seemed no more intense than that he sensed from Aishvan, and was lesser than the boiling mist surrounding Constantine and Wathin. She also had a touch of putrid green in her aura, 
a smaller but still rather noticeable section where Nurgle, the plague god could creep in. Once again, not immune to corruption by any means, but she seemed to be one of the less corruptible mortals he'd met. She even surpassed some who prided themselves in purity, he thought as he looked at Constantine. He could barely see the black armor under the swirling mists of blood red and slanishy purple. The two weaknesses swirled around and inside one another, each one building up the other. And the Black Templar called him a witch. He shook his head and turned back to Morn. It almost comforted him to see the blue electricity of Tsneech running over him. If there was nothing there, he might have thought the Tetchmarine to be as soulless as his machines. If we must have an emissary, this one is acceptable. Morn nodded as he finished his repairs. This will suffice until we can reach the Hive's Manufactorum for proper repairs. We depart immediately, including you Atra. The flight back down the bridge was somewhat more awkward, but not noticeably more cramped than the flight down from orbit. Atra was not a small woman by any stretch of the imagination, but she was utterly dwarfed by the sheer amount of space and a starts and power armor takes up. Andriel was the smallest, and even he was 7 feet tall. Ishvan stood another 2 feet higher. Combined with the weight of their tank-like armor, Atra considered it a small miracle that a craft managed to fly at all. Still, the Stormtalon did fly, noisily, and slower than it flew in, but still swifter than the Salamander light transports racing along the bridge beneath them. Atra was sat near the cockpit and Morn and so was able to see out the viewport as they approached the Hive City. Approaching it from the air gave a new perspective to her home. The Hive sat at the end of a single massive bridge that spanned the expanses of the endless waves of Alvara. The bridge ended at a great gate, the only entrance and exit by land. The city was surrounded by high walls, atop and in which many weapon batteries were placed. They were heaviest in quantity and lowest in ordnance around the gate itself. This was the strange paradox of the Great Bridge, that it gave only a single approach by land, but also could not be battled upon lightly. The bridges that connected the ancient hives were relics, created long ago in the Dark Age of Technology, before the Imperium. Their surfaces could be patched, perhaps even large gaps were built, but if their support pillars, which reached all the way down into the abyss several kilometers underwater were damaged or collapsed, they would be utterly irreparable. The technology to construct works of this size at that depth without the need for constant, expensive, and dangerous maintenance had been lost long, long ago. Though if that technology was impressive, the hives themselves were nothing short of miraculous. As the kill team flew over, they could look down and see what appeared to be land, or at least the illusion of it generated by countless streets, highways and rail lines that ran between and connected the various hab blocks. The blocks themselves rested on what looked like ground, or at least a disc of permacrete if such a thing can be called ground. That was only a thin veneer though. Underneath that, the hive ran all the way down to the ocean's depths, a massive pillar of interconnected tubes, fisheries, hydroelectric plants, and other necessities needed to keep the main habitation units above water going. Of course, that didn't mean the underhive was uninhabited. Merely that it was supposed to be. Nothing like this could be built in the modern Imperium. It would simply be too expensive with current technology, if it were even possible. These aquatic hives made Alvara an incredibly valuable manufacturing and food producing world, and to some, even holy. Speaking of those who had a more spiritual view of the hives, the Stormtalon was currently flying towards their main cathedral in the hive. It was a massive factory cathedral stretching from the underhive all the way up to the upper spire in a single unit. In it dwelled, worked, and worshipped hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, from lobotomized semi-mechanical servitors, to the lowly laborers just slightly above them, quite literally, to the factory deacon foreman, to the adepts and magi that truly ruled this miniature factory city within the city. The great iron rose of the cathedral showed a human skull, heavily augmented, and surrounded by a halo of machinery. It was an image of the Omnisia, the god emperor, the machine god from whom all technology flowed. It marked the Manufactorum, and all those within it, as property of the machine god, stewarded by his servants, the Adeptus Mechaniucus, the tech priests of Mars. 
Morn carefully guided the storm to learn towards the factory, a series of chattering beeps flowing back and forth between him and someone or something on the other end of the Vox Haler. Atra cocked her head to the side curiously as she watched the Tetchmarine work, noting the red cog on the back of his armor, the same kind she had seen on tech priests before. It is tech cant. A more efficient binary language that cogitators use to communicate. Both I and the priest I am communicating with possess the necessary augmentations to use it. Morn explained, startling Atra. He hadn't turned his head, or shown any indication that he had noticed her at all. So, you're a tech priest and in a starts? I didn't realize you could be both. Atra asked curiously. I am a tech marine. I attend to my brother's machinery. Even bolters and power armor require repairs and maintenance, the same as your flak armor and that plasma gun you carry. Oh, I see. That's also why you've got a few extras? Atra asked. And the metal arm? Both my arms are metal. As are my legs. Morn responded calmly. And these are macadantrites. Wait, you lopped off both your arms and your legs? That seems a shade mad, even by Midozen standards. Wathin suddenly commented from the back. No. I did not intentionally remove all of my limbs. It is traditional to remove the right hand and replace it with superior steel, but no, we do not intentionally replace any limbs altogether. What kind of fights have you been getting into then? Wathin asked. Because that sounds like a tale well worth the telling. One fight. Morn corrected the old wolf. And it has been recorded well enough already. It was called the 10th Black Crusade. Those words put a chill on the air, and the already quiet, at least in terms of conversation, craft went even stiller. Atra had no idea what a 10th Black Crusade was, but if it had this effect on the Emperor's own sons, she didn't want to find out. Wait. Wouldn't that make you Andriel began to ask Morn 857 years old, yes. Assuming you count time spent in stasis, which makes up about half of that Morn answered him. There was little time for the atmosphere to recover, for they swiftly landed and disembarked. The craft was almost immediately surrounded by a small mob of red-robed cyborgs who set to work replacing the damage engine. Morn led the way as the kill team plus Atra walked off the landing platform and started into the Manufactorum. Where exactly are you going? Constantine asked Morn as they walked. The governor's palace. We should arrive there and meet with the Inquisitor as well as local command quickly. Morn responded. I concur, but how do you plan on getting there on foot? We have neither map nor a guide to this section of the city, unless the mortal happens to have been here. Constantine remarked. Atra shrugged helplessly. I might have come from this hive milord but the first time I left my hab block was when my regiment shipped off world. I haven't been here in 5 years, and even then, I don't have any clue how to get to the palace, or even really where we are right now. Morn walked up to a nearby terminal and one of his macadantrides plugged in. He went quiet for about a minute as he communed with the machine and extracted what he wanted out of it. Maps and schematics of the upper spires and especially the governor's palace were restricted behind several layers of security, but that did not matter to Morn. The security was good, these were the Mechanicus's computers after all, but not good enough to deal with a Tetch Marine. He retracted the Macadantride and started walking again. I have a map now. The Astartes and the sergeant moved fairly quickly through the Manufactorum. The halls were crowded. But the workers and adepts alike moved aside before the Emperor's angels. Many stopped and stared as long as they could get away with before the glares of the adepts got them moving again. The one exception to this was the servitors. There weren't many of the lobotomized creatures, most of them just moving heavy loads like beasts of burden, but they did not have quite the sense or the programming to avoid the astarts. The space marines simply went around them, it was hardly any trouble. Atra on the other hand gave the creatures as wide a berth as possible, actively looking anywhere but at the former humans. They quickly reached the various transports used to ferry the products of the factory to the rest of the hive and beyond. The mortal crew members and captains of the haulers turned to stare as the Astartes approached them. Atra stepped forwards. They had brought her along to speak to the other normal humans and she was not going to be found lacking. She approached the nearest captain. 
the emperor's sons require transport to the governor's palace immediately. You will provide it. She ordered him. He nodded and saluted awkwardly. Of course, you'll have it. I just don't have authorization to get anywhere near that area. You'll have it. Morn informed him as the space marine walked past him into the transport. This is not what I expected when you said you had a plan. Constantine said as the group assembled in the hauler and it lifted off. This is the fastest way to the governor's palace. Morn responded calmly. This is a cargo vessel. Cargo vessel or not, it did get them there quickly. Relatively quickly, as the hauler was painfully slow compared with the speed of even the damaged storm to learn. Still, it made it, and landed on a rather beautiful landing pad. Atra had to shield her eyes from the light, as the hauler obviously had no windows, and it was also far brighter up here than down below. She looked out onto what might as well have been another world. They had landed in what looked to be a private park of some kind. Green grass flowed out all around them. Rows of flower beds lined paths made not of permacrete but of scattered stones held together with mortar. The sky was bright, and the sun hung over it. Here they were above the clouds, and the sky was blue, not brownish grey as with below. They could actually see the clouds beneath them, a sea of golden brown and greys. Only the very tallest buildings from the lower hive could be seen, like the Manufactorum or a few anti-void gun batteries. The air was clean, and the smell of grass and flowers replaced the stench of industry and countless humans. It was also practically empty. There were several families out picnicking, or at least they were before the giant slab of scrap metal that was the whole are landed nearby, but no great crowds, no masses of people. It was quiet. It was peaceful. Up here you could hardly tell the planet was under attack by an enemy that would devour all this peaceful scenery and drag everyone enjoying it into pools of acid to be digested. Assuming they didn't simply just eat them alive during the attack. As the Astartes descended from the platform and the hoarder took off with all the grace of a drunken horsefly, Atra could hear a bike approaching. Indeed a motorbike was approaching, and sat atop it was a heavily armored officer of the law. It stopped. And the man atop it stepped off, a shock maul in one hand and a shotgun in the other. His face was hidden behind a heavy iron mask, and no flesh could be seen under layers of heavy armor and equally heavy badges, medals, symbols of rank, and of course purity seals. The officer of the Adeptus Arbides began to walk up the path ready to bring a whole new definition of the term police brutality to whoever was stupid enough to land on a noble's private park. Then he noticed just who had actually done that. The officer of the law didn't say anything. However, the fact that he dropped his weapons showed that he did indeed realize just what a titanic mistake he had almost made. He quickly picked them up, put them back in their holsters, turned around, got back on his bike, and rode away as quickly as the vehicle could take him. Atra smiled slightly. Apparently, he sent word along to everyone else as well while he ran away not quite screaming. Nobody even considered bothering the kill team as they walked the short remaining distance towards the highest point in the hive. The only road led them to a set of steps that led up a massive statue the size of a hill. The statue showed many guardsmen and women all working together to hold up a great disc, upon which was an image of the galaxy. Upon that disc, at the top of the hill and the absolute pinnacle of the world stood a grand palace of marble and gold. The governor or governess certainly had a taste for the overly grandiose. Atra noticed a small plaque as she walked up the stairs, slightly behind the Astartes. It read, Hostia this statue is dedicated so that none might forget the courage of the noble guardsman. Atra snorted as she looked at the titanic brass edifice. The amount of money this must have taken could have purchased a truly ridiculous amount of rations, power packs, warp take than decent armor. The thrones to outfit entire regiments to a degree stormtroopers might be jealous of sat there. That would have been much more appreciated than a statue they'd all be too dead or poor to see. Rural is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match. 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. 
The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out and if you decide to buy the app use promo code NICKBEDIA for 10% off and it lets them know we sent you. It's a great sponsor and a great app and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 3, The Cards in Hand. The Astartes and Atra ascended the steps towards the governor's palace, walking up the artificial hill towards the massive edifice of gold and stone resting atop it. It was actually made up of stone, real stone that was quarried from another world and shipped across the stars to build it, not permacrete. It was probably one of the few buildings actually made of stone on the whole planet. As for the gold highlighting and trimming almost every surface, well that was just standard for any important imperial building. The guards at the door were clad in the finest armor money could buy and could reasonably be expected of a guard force. The governor probably could have afforded power armor but that would be excessive. Still, it was finely decorated and could easily be considered the highest fashion on almost any world. They bowed and opened the great double doors for the kill team as they approached. Atra did her best to avoid staring at the lavish wealth on display inside. The floor was made up of a strange, shiny, brown material that was solid and smooth, but softer than stone or steel, yet harder than earth. She had never seen wood before. The walls were tastefully decorated with various paintings, both of various nobles and of many other things, great battles, fantastic landscapes, and of course more than a few of the emperor in all his glory. Andriel actually paused himself before on particular painting, just for a moment, to admire it. It showed a picture of the emperor, and a slightly shorter, but still massive man, clad in some form of primitive steel armor, with a great bow upon his back and a great sword in his hands. He was bowed on one knee, offering the sword to the master of mankind. Interesting, she has a vancock. He muttered to himself as he looked at it before turning away. A what now? Atra asked, somewhat surprised that the Astartes actually spoke. A vancock. He was a rather famous painter around M. 37. This is one of his series on the Primarchs. You can tell by the brushwork around the eyes, it's a certain technique he used to capture depth to make them and the Emperor as impressive as they really were. He explained, raising a finger to point at them. The eyes truly were quite impressive. They seemed to stare right back out of the picture at her, with a fragment of the same power and majesty the Emperor must have truly possessed. We can discuss the art later. Morn said as he walked past them. We have a governor to meet with. Atra nodded and followed. By the way, which Primarch was that? She thought, knowing that Andriel was probably listening. In response, the Dark Angel simply lowered his hood. For the first time she could see his face clearly. He was handsome, in a sort of rugged way, with a touch of the wild about him. He had long, blonde hair and piercing black eyes. He looked uncannily similar to the kneeling figure in the painting. The party continued on to another set of guards, standing before yet another set of double doors. They opened them again and the kill team entered into the most ostentatious room yet. It was clearly a throne room, built for the sole purpose of awing anyone who entered. The room was built in a slight conic shape, with the wide end at the door. The room subtly narrowed as it progressed and also elevated slightly. It made certain anyone at the wide end would be looking up at the narrow end, and the narrow end would always be looking down on any petitioner. At the very end stood a throne upon a raised dais. On that sat a shockingly beautiful woman, the kind of beauty that can only be achieved by enhancing natural beauty with very, very expensive treatments. She was clad in finery, real furs and precious gems. Somewhat unusual for a planetary governor. She appeared to be rather physically fit, almost as much as Atra herself. It was a far cry from the usual corpulent ball of lard that tended to occupy such thrones. A power sword rested at her side, and she looked at the entering Astartes expectantly. The Emperor smiled on me today. She said, though she wasn't smiling. In my planet's darkest hour, he sends his angels to aid me. I told you they'd get here in time, high fleet or no. Another woman standing nearby remarked. She was cut from a different kind of cloth, and was herself a woman of the cloth. 
Her hair still stained a pure white gave that away, as did the imperial aquila tattooed beneath her right eye. Anyone who saw her would know they looked upon a sister of battle. The Astartes helmet readouts quickly identified her as Abbas Magdalene. The Emperor had sent his angels, and also one of his inquisitors. The Astartes almost never disappoint. Abbas Magdalene. Governor Bodica. Morn said politely. Apologies for our slightly delayed arrival. The storm talon was damaged. So, I gathered when you stepped out of a bulk hauler on my nephew's lawn. The governor said with a slight smile. Nonetheless I appreciate your direct approach, and also the work you did repelling the initial probe of our defenses. We do not require thanks. Constantine said. To purge the Xenos is its own reward. Well said, son of Sigismund. Magdalene responded. I have also deployed members of one of our more inquisitive orders to analyze the remains of the Xenos. With a bit of luck and the Emperor's grace we may be able to divine some weakness to exploit. They seem rather vulnerable to a power axe through the chest and a bolt round through the head. Wathin responded, mildly sarcastically. As for poison I've heard there's a little known substance called Promethean Brother Ishvan uses. It seemed to be rather useful. The abbess pursed her lips in minor annoyance but could not risk offending the Astartes. Not for fear of them, but more because she needed them, and their blasted honor had a habit of getting in the way. I appreciate the advice Wathin, we will take it into account. Enough of this. Ishvan said, interposing himself metaphorically and physically between the space wolf and the abbess before their bickering could continue, or worse escalate. We are all servants of the Emperor here and we can have out our squabbles after we deal with the small problem of a high fleet coming for our heads. He spoke calmly, with his normal levity, but there was a hint of annoyance in his voice. Agreed. Governess, what intel do you have on the enemy force? Morn asked, forcing the conversation back on topic. We believe the fleet itself is primarily composed of large vessels of light cruiser class or larger. It is a sizable threat but should prove relatively ineffective to the ground campaign as they have not demonstrated any planetary bombardment ability aside from releasing more ground troops. Nonetheless it is still going to be quite a while before our fleet can drive off the Xenos with enough certainty to begin deploying reinforcements, particularly because of one rather notable problem. The governess explained. The original capital, Hive Tempestus, is fallen. The largest concentration of biomass and one of our best defensive positions is gone, and I have reason to believe the Xenos have already transformed it into a spawning ground. It will require substantial commitments of forces to retake it. In the meantime its central location means the Tyranids will be attacking not only this hive, but every other hive in the hemisphere. We cannot count on aid from any of them. I suspected as much, considering we were deployed here and not the capital. Morn said unsurprised. So, they possess the ability to continually reinforce here on planet. Even after the fleet is gone, the threat will remain. I shall have to account for that in my strategies. What forces do we have at our disposal? I called in whatever favors I could to bring back as many regiments as we could before the Tyranids descended on us. The governess answered. Too many were lost in the fighting for Tempestus and even more trying to stop expansion out of it. We have access to three infantry regiments and one motorized, though the motorized suffered rather heavy casualties repelling the first major assault on the bridge. Fairly few for calling back as many as you can. Constantine noted. We are a water world. Most of the regiments we produce are either marines or navy personnel. That is the navy that fights on the seas rather than in the stars. Most of our forces are busy securing the oceans, and we've been remarkably successful. High Fleet Terrisk has never faced a water world, and they haven't adapted aquatic bioforms that can take on our fleets yet. Bodica explained. Still, they aren't going to do us a whole lot of good if the Tyranids get inside the city. Wathin noted. With as few men as we have, the gate has to stand or we're in serious jeopardy of losing the city. Fortunately, I do have one more set of reinforcements who are also willing and able to attempt a landing despite the dangers of doing so while the fleets battle. Bodica said with a smile. One even you may find impressive. Legio Centurius is coming. Now that was good news. 
A Titan Legion was a force able to end almost any war. A super heavy company of god machines that were unmatched and destructive force. There was nothing more dangerous than a Titan Legion on the ground. Not since the Astartes Legions of old had been broken into chapters. A single Titan on the bridge, supported by the gate's own defenses, could block an army. Still, Legio Centurius. Morn checked his data logs and found he had no information on this. He paused for a moment as he slipped his way into the Mechanicus logs. He had left himself a backdoor and a connection when he borrowed maps of the city from them. He ran through their files until he found the information on the Legion, then frowned. Legio Centurius was young, barely five centuries old. They were newly raised, and very small. Their ranks primarily consisted of Warhound Scout Titans, their heaviest being only a Warlord. Now, a Warlord class Titan was in and of itself a supremely dangerous weapon, but there was only one of them, and a dozen Warhounds, four packs. They would still be a titanic boon, and provided an incredible advantage to the Imperials, but they would not make victory a sure thing. What truly worried him though was the age. A small but experienced legion would be one thing, but even the principi of a legion this young would still be young by titan standards. Then there were the god machines themselves to consider. A titan possessed a supremely powerful and aggressive machine spirit, and one this relatively young would still be rather hot blooded. When will the god machines arrive? Ishvan asked. The governess turned to the abbess who shook her head. My contacts in the Mechanicus are not proving particularly useful. The movement of assets as useful and powerful as a titan is kept well guarded. If I had to guess though, they'll probably try and punch a hole in the high fleet to deliver the titans as quickly as possible. That is an extremely bold maneuver. Constantine said, sounding almost impressed. I would not expect the Mechanicus to be so decisive. A god machine is no small thing to risk. Not without an even greater potential reward. Andriel commented. You have managed to rally several regiments of Imperial Guard, a Titan Legion, and the Death Watch itself to the defense of this world in this hive in particular. That is not something even a governor can do easily. That is one of the stranger ways I have been complimented but thank you. Baudica said with a glass smile. It was not a compliment. It was a laying out of evidence. All this suggests you have something here that is exceedingly valuable. I would know what that is. Andriel countered. The glass smile cracked, and the governess turned to the sororitas. She shook her head. The governess considered for a long moment, and then spoke. There is an STC in the city. It was originally in the capital, but as it fell, we evacuated it here, at the cost of practically all of the Skaterii contingent of our force. The news was enough to make even a start take pause. Morn twitched slightly. There was quite simply nothing more valuable than an STC. These ancient devices hailed from the dark age of technology and were capable of producing manufactured goods in greater quantities and qualities than anything else in the Imperium. They were so incredibly valuable that the rewards for locating one started with entire planets. Governess. Morn said after a long moment. Why were we not informed of this? His voice was calm and quiet. Andriel took two steps back from the Tetchmarine, because he could see what the others couldn't. Rage, in crimson waves, rolling off of Morn put off a psychic heat like standing too close to a salamander celebration. Andriel was rather impressed at how well Morn's face concealed how he was feeling. Atra also took several steps back. She might not have Andriel's sight, but she had developed a keen sense to danger. And there are relatively few things in the galaxy more dangerous than an angry Tetchmarine in a closed space. It was not considered crucial for you to know. The governess responded calmly. Either she was not a sicker, or she was supremely self-confident. Atra stepped back because she was aware she was weak. The governess, though still only a mortal, looked the astarts in the eyes, or at least in the visor, as he was still wearing his helmet. She didn't so much as flinch. Magdalene coughed, loudly, in a vain attempt to disrupt the tension in the air. It didn't work. These were not some quarreling spy blue bloods. Thus, she spoke directly instead. My apologies. It was not our intent to deceive you. There is an STC here, 
namely for the creation of naval destroyers, the aquatic kind, not the spacifering type. That answers my other concern. Constantine responded. I had meant to ask what you were doing to secure the oceans. They are a massive source of biomass for the high fleet to use, and a far better avenue of attack than the narrow bridges. In that we are somewhat fortunate. Our navy is superior to the Tyranid forces, for the moment at least, and they have not yet faced an aquatic world. They haven't adapted quite yet, though undoubtedly they will in time. Bodica responded. Once they do, how long will the navy be able to control the seas? Constantine asked. We are uncertain, but not for long. They will simply outnumber us, and if it comes to a battle of attrition, we will lose. So that was it then. They held the upper hand on the seas and with their immaculate defenses for the moment, but once the enemy adapted, it would only be a matter of time. The only question was if they would be able to hold out until the Imperial Navy arrived to break the blockade. Still, a Titan Legion and a squad of the Emperor's Angels was enough to turn the tide of almost any war. Their actions would have to be carefully considered, and decisively change the face of the war, but they could win it. They stayed for a while debating strategy until the sun had set and the hours dragged on. Eventually, they came to an end. Their work was only beginning, but there was a good start to it. So, they retired for the evening, though as they went, the abbess stopped them. One last thing, she asked. Aren't members of the Death Watch meant to paint the majority of their armor black? Oh, that. It got lost in the warp. Ishvan responded nonchalantly. Got lost and do you mean to say the warp somehow removed the paint from your armor? The abbess asked suspiciously. No, the planet that supplies the paint is currently in a warp storm and the munitorium has been processing the paperwork to get a new supplier to the watch fortress for the past 700 years or so. Ishvan explained. Even the mightier starts are no match for the sheer mind-numbing amounts of paperwork the drones the Munitorum are capable of putting out. Magdalene remarked sarcastically. Wathin snorted, amused by the joke. Still though, Wathin, you've been serving your vigil for some time, have you not? Ha. Huh. The old wolf barked. The paints for saying you're a dead man. I've survived this long in the service of the Owl Father, and I don't plan on dying to some damned Xenos. I'll push past this and get back to Fenris and my brothers with stories to tell that will set the Blood Claws hair buzzing. He said this with not just the ego of a brash warrior, but the confident self-assuredness of a veteran of many campaigns. And besides Lassie. He said, drawing close to the abbess, looming over her and glaring down from between bushy eyebrows and thick beard. If I die on this vigil, I die as a space wolf, a son of Ras, not a dog of the Inquisition. He snarled and turned away. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 4, Calm Before the Storm. The Astartes returned to their quarters and rested. It was less because they needed rest, and more because the mortals they were working with, particularly the governess, still required sleep. Still, even space marines are at a fundamental level human so some rest for themselves was not entirely unappreciated. Boudicca had seen to their accommodations, setting aside a suite of rooms usually reserved for passing dignitaries. A small army of tech adepts and their various personnel had also arrived to ensure their weapons and armor were maintained to the highest standard. To call such accommodations luxurious will not suffice. These rooms were equipped to a standard of class and luxury that only the upper echelons of an interplanetary empire could achieve. They were staggeringly beautiful, with walls hung with valuable art, and beds covered by the finest silks. Even the smallest and dingiest of these rooms contained more wealth and luxury than Atra had seen in her entire life. This was of course almost completely lost on the space marines. The God Emperor's greatest warriors normally lived in surprisingly spartan small cells, only somewhat larger than the ones a mid-ranking officer might receive. They held few or no possessions aside from their weapons and lived almost exclusively for combat. The soft beauty of these rooms was almost a bit uncomfortable. The exception to this was Andriel, who alone out of the kill team seemed quite comfortable. The upper spire fit the Dark Angel like an old and comfortable coat. Well, if not for one small problem. There was a saying on ancient terror, that the hands of the idol were the devil's tools. This statement, 
Born out of the Catholic faith, still bore weight even long after that church had been destroyed. For a spy noble, the greatest foe was not hunger, or criminals, or attacks from outsiders, the rare assassination attempt notwithstanding, but rather boredom. Of course, the various noble houses did compete with one another, but this was the top 0.01% of society competing for the top 0.001%. Even a house that did relatively poorly in this great game would remain unimaginably wealthy. So, the chief foe was truly boredom. Of course, there could be luxuries and entertainments, food, drugs, cinemas, games, women, or men, depending on the noble, books, etc. But when a life is stretched out into the centuries by rejuvenating treatments, these all grow a shade dull. And so new pleasures must be found, the finest and most exotic food, new drugs, radical new films, interesting games, all manner of degeneracy, and perhaps some less than sanctioned books. But for some, there was not enough. The noble who had eaten every food under the sun might stop and think, I have tasted every animal but I have not yet tasted man. This was in most cases the effect of boredom, but there were darker things in the galaxy, things that pushed men to ever greater extremes. Slanesh, the dark prince of pain and pleasure, the chaos god of excess, perfectionism, and extremes in all things. If there were to be such a thing as the devil in this age, Slanesh would perhaps fit it the best of all. Sin was her domain, and the forbidden his province. And the idle hands of the spire nobles were always fertile ground for her particular brand of crawling corruption. Andriel could see it, like a pink haze settling on the pinnacle of the city and wafting through the houses. It would only take the slightest push to make the upper spire fall into damnation. Of course, this was nothing new. It was the same on almost every world. One could almost cross-section the hives based on how they were most likely to fall. The upper spires were easy prey for Slanesh. The areas just below Fort Sneech as they constantly schemed to reach the uppermost spires. The lower hives were the domain of violence, thugs, and the general riffraff that empowered corn though the constant bloodshed of gang wars, food riots, and the like. The underhive, where all the waste and filth of the city fell down, that was Nurgle's hunting ground. Each and every hive was no more than a few short steps away from damnation, simply down to how they were organized and built and similar patterns also occurred across the rest of the Imperium. Small wonder that the Inquisition was always kept so busy. Andriel pushed the thoughts aside as he prepared to rest. Before he did though he reached into his pack and removed a small wooden box, carved with certain ornate and arcane symbols. Opening it, he withdrew a set of cards, the Emperor's Tarot. These blessed cards were useful tools for attempting to peer into the future when the proper psychic discipline was prescribed. He began to draw the cards, trying to parse out the Emperor's plan. Divination was not his area of talent though, and the future remained every bit as clouded as before. Such was to be expected though, the shadow and the warp, the dull roar of the hive mind surrounding the planet, interfered with Sika's abilities. Still, as he cast the last card, he noticed something strange. Three cards had become stuck together and cast as one. They were entangled, and when it came to the Emperor's Tarot, there was no such thing as coincidence. He examined the cards curiously. The Fool, the Prince of Swords, and the Moon were all bound together, the Fool in the center, bound to both. Andriel frowned. He had a fairly solid idea of who the Prince of Swords was, but the other two were an enigma to him. He pondered this as he packed up the rest of his tarot and lay to rest, still pondering the meaning of the tarot as he drifted off into rest. The next day, the kill team rose early and immediately set to work doing everything they could to ready the defenses of the city for the coming storm. A meeting was arranged shortly before dawn as the commanders of the PDF, guard, and the kill team met to begin discussing their strategy. Their first objective was clear, the gatehouse had to hold until the titans could arrive. If they could keep the horde outside the walls and trapped on the bridge when the titan arrived, they would have a tremendous advantage. With no cover and a narrow field of fire, any tyrannid attack would be crushed into paste under the super heavy ordinance of a god machine. As such, Constantine, Aishvan, and Atra were deployed to the gate to personally see to their defenses. However, 
Only a fool would stake everything on a single plan. And so Morn and Wathin remained behind to plan the fallback, step by bloody step, should the gates fall. They assembled in a room with a half dozen various nobles, the Inquisitor that called them, the Prioress of the local Imperial Shrine and their associated sororitas elements, the Chief Astropath of the Hive Squire, the Adept Master of the Manufactorum, and of course Governess Bodica herself. Morn was the first to speak. 4.2 billion. That is roughly how many Imperial citizens dwelled within the capital. Another 14 billion dwell in the other 6 hives on this planet. 170 million, 342,651.424243 square miles of ocean, teeming with life. This is how much Biomas the Great Devaro has access to. The other hives stand for the moment, and the seas are ours for the moment, but there is little we can do to prevent either's fall. These are in the Emperor's hands. Assuming the worst case scenario, each and every life form in these areas will be consumed broken down, and turned into yet more Xenos to hammer down our gates. Our enemy can therefore be considered to have effectively unlimited manpower and supply to throw at us. We will not defeat them. This was not a comfortable or popular truth, and so many of the nobles began to grumble slightly, though they stopped at the glares from the Inquisitor and the Prioress. Morn continued, however, aid is on its way. My battle brothers and I have arrived to coordinate your defenses and ensure the STC here remains in Imperial hands. Further aid from the Imperial Guard, Navy, and the Titan Legions are also en route. It is our objective to survive until that aid can relieve us. The Titan Legions will be the first to arrive, let us make certain that they arrive to a hive that is yet standing. For this purpose, every man, woman, and child in this city is hereby drafted into the Hive Irregulars. Those that can fight will be equipped, those who cannot fight will be sent into the Manufactorum, which must increase productivity 6.872 fold to ensure sufficient supplies are provided. There is nowhere to retreat, and the enemy will not accept surrender even if we were so weak as to offer it. There are no non-combatants, there are no civilians. There are humans and the Xenos that will devour us all unless we all stand together. There is only war. Let us begin the business of preparing for it. One of the nobles coughed. Before we do, I would see the face of the man that demands the deaths of my people. Morn stared at the man coldly, and he briefly wondered if he was going to be shot, before Morn reached up and took his helmet in both hands. There was a hiss and a sucking sound as the sealed environment within the helmet was compromised. I do not demand your people's deaths. Morn told him, as two of the nobles next to the questioner pulled back in revulsion at what lay beneath the helm. Morn's skin was pallid, his face all hard edges and strong lines. He was completely bald, and half his scalp was a nest of wires and coils slithering out from his skull and into a metal plate that covered the entire left side of his face. One of his eyes had been replaced with a cybernetic and seemed integrated into the macabre machinery that invaded his skull. His other eye was no less uncanny though, for it was a grey window into an utterly alien and machine-like soul. Their deaths will come whether I demand them or not. What I demand is that they make their deaths useful. So that's why you never take that helmet off. Wathin said, seemingly unperturbed by the cyborg sitting beside him. No. It is because the head is a rather vulnerable part of the body and not wearing a helmet into combat is a very poor decision. Morn responded, not so subtly critiquing his battle brother's own lack of headgear before a donning his helmet. Now, if there are no further unnecessary distractions, let us begin. And begin they did, the mechanical mind of Morn and the wisdom of Wathin, born from 40,000 battles, together they dominated the strategy meetings. It was clear that the Emperor's angels were not merely soldiers without peer, but their minds had been enhanced as well, to a standard that base humans simply could not compete with. Morn's plans were meticulous, considering every single passageway, every hall, every stairwell and every door and how to defend them. He carefully balanced and managed every mine, power pack, heavy bolter, and ration and how to deploy them. Wathin critiqued and refined the battle plans, Balancing his mastery of the small encounter and logistics with a knowledge of both the enemy and their own troops born out of centuries of experience. 
He understood the common soldier perhaps better than any other member of the strategic council, knowing how they would react, when they would fight, and what it would take for them to break. In between managing Morn's cold calculations with his more human touch, he reviewed the troops, squad by squad, and then individual by individual, selecting the cream of the crop and working them together into kill squads. After some argument with Morn, these squads were further specialized by their equipment, creating Elite Plasma, Flamer, Helgen, and other such squadrons to be held in reserve and deployed to deal with any special threats that Tyranids might have in store to deal with centers of resistance. The work was not swift, in fact by many it would have been considered agonizingly slow, given the lack of time, but as the strategy stretched on into the second day, then the third, and then the seventh, the other members of the council began to grow restless. The immaculate planning had begun to create a web of highly defensible positions, each with full back lines, defensive traps, and other positions able to reinforce. It was in essence a plan to maximize the effect of the fortress-like grandeur of the hive. However, even this plan could not deny a chilling reality. With every defeat, and there would be defeats, every breakthrough, every dead imperial, the front would expand, bit by bit, until it would retract again around a single strong point, namely the Manufactorum, where the STC was housed. It was a predictable plan, solid as it could be, but there was only one small problem in the plan in the nobles' perspective. Namely that the plan called for them to more or less abandon the upper spires once the enemy broke through. The fine parks, palaces, and all the wealth therein would be lost. This obviously had begun to cause some small amount of disquiet among the nobility, and on the fifth day, one voiced their disapproval. Techmarine Morn, the either particularly bold or particularly greedy noble said. I believe you may have overlooked the upper spires, or perhaps we simply have not reached there in the planning phase yet? Morn glared at the noble contemptuously. I have not overlooked them. The upper spires will be abandoned and possibly mined to be detonated after a sufficient number of Xenos can be baited into them. Are you certain that is the best course of action? The various palaces could be used as workable strong points to further bleed the Xeno, and our more elite forces, namely the upper echelons of the PDF and the Adeptus Arbites, are quite familiar with the area. Moving out of them forsakes these advantages. I have reviewed your palace's plans. Morn responded, and the noble turned rather pale. How in the world had he gotten a hold of those? And they are insufficient for that purpose. Any forces we left to guard the palaces would be cut off and destroyed before they could inflict significant damage. The rest of the upper spire is defensively worthless. Too many wide open spaces, too many structures composed of wood and other such weak materials. The upper spire is useless and will remain abandoned. Morn told the noble this in his normal monotone calm, but beneath the surface his blood was boiling. This fool, this weakling would undermine the defenses of the hive to secure his own luxury first. Utterly pathetic. Will he hold back his forces in spite of my orders? He thought loudly. Both Andriel and the chief astropath looked towards him, hearing his particularly loud thoughts. Yes. Andriel responded after a quick flick through the noble's unshielded mind. The astropath merely nodded slightly. Morn rose, drew his bolter from his hip, and fired a single shot. The noble's head exploded, showering the others nearby with gore. Inform them. He said to Andriel, but it was the astropath who answered instead. It would appear Lord Malthus was preparing to hold back the forces of his house guard in those arbites in his employ to defend his upper spire holdings. I informed Lord Morn of this, and he acted accordingly. The old blind man said, drawing stares, and in some cases glares, but nobody dared to speak. Why did you answer? Andri asked the elder sicker curiously. They know me, and while most of them are still wary, they don't fear me nearly as much as you. There's less likelihood of them reacting overly poorly. Among other things they'll still need me when all is said and done. Then again I pity any assassin they throw at you. They truly are that stupid? They got here by blood, not by talent. Now then. Morn said as he sat back down, interrupting the psychic conversation and oblivious, or simply uncaring, to the stunned and horrified silence of the rest of the nobles on the council, including the governess. Let us continue. 
Meanwhile atop the Great Gatehouse, Ishvan and Constantine oversaw the micro strategics of the defense. While Constantine deferred to his elders on the organization of the large-scale defensive strategy, he was a son of dawn, and building the fortifications was in his blood. The Imperial Fists and their successors, even the black sheep of the family, were masters of defensive works, responsible for constructing even the mighty Imperial Palace itself. Constantine was no exception. He viewed the gatehouse in an as excruciating detail as Morn saw the city. There was not a millimeter unaccounted for in his designs as he reorganized and practically rebuilt most of the gatehouse's roof and interior. However, despite the work he made in reconstructing and improving the defenses, progress proceeded at an agonizingly slow pace by his standards. The problem was the labor core. While his brothers would have seen the entire gatehouse remade in little more than a day, he was not working with his brothers. Instead, he was working with mortals, guard and PDF forces, with aid from construction servitors provided. They were weaker, they were slower, and they made more mistakes. He found himself having to directly oversee each crew and work piece by piece to ensure it lived up to his exacting standards. At first Tatra served as a go-between, but the need for that duty began to lessen. That was due to the actions of Ishvan. While Constantine found himself supervising, Ishvan personally worked alongside the mortals in constructing the fortifications. While they were initially quite wary, the friendly nature and surprising humility of the salamander soon won them over, and there was little need for Atra to act as a liaison and view to the mortal side. Still, in the two days when Ashvan was integrating himself, Constantine did grudgingly come to admit that perhaps Atra was indeed useful, at least for communicating with other mortals. As the crews began to improve and Ishvan's relationship with them also improved, Constantine found himself able to split his attention. At first the work required only three quarters of his focus, then only half, and by the end of the second day only a quarter. The young warrior became restless and began to practice various techniques with his blades as he monitored the work. The workers initially thought that this might in fact mean he wasn't watching, but he quickly disabused them of that notion. Towards the end of the second day, Ishvan approached Constantine as the later worked through a complex series of forms. Would you prefer to have a sparing partner brother? I was under the impression you favored your heavy weapons cousin. Constantine responded as he continued his workout. I do, that's why I wasn't volunteering, I had someone else in mind that might benefit from your teachings. Ishvan responded. Atra, perhaps. The Black Templar went completely still as the ridiculous suggestion completely caught him off guard. He lowered his weapons to the side and stared at the salamander. You must be joking, either that or you'll just challenge me to a duel in a most unusual manner and that does not mesh well with what I have gathered of you. Why in the world would you suggest that I try and teach that mortal how to fight? It might be good practice. Ishvan suggested, and Constantine became even more confused. Cousin. Have you been overtaken by some form of illness, or perhaps the witch is interfering in your mind? Any match between me and any mortal, let alone a mere goods woman, would see the mortal dead in an instant. That's not what I meant. Ishvan replied calmly. Isn't it true that your chapter has each brother take an initiate under their wing to teach them the ways of war? Our brothers are called initiates, the ones being trained are called neophytes, but yes, that does occur, but even then, the neophytes are still undergoing training and have begun to receive their organs. Even a truly fresh one would still most likely butcher that girl. Constantine responded. True, but the neophyte would also effectively start with roughly the same level of combat experience and training, despite their youth. If you can teach a mere mortal to fight, or at least survive, will it not be that much easier to train a neophyte when the time comes? Beyond this, you were bemoaning the worthlessness of her in combat, so this would also reduce the likelihood of her simply being killed in the first fight we engage in. Ishvan argued, and Constantine paused to consider. You are still verifiably insane for proposing this. He said after a long moment. However even Madman may still make good points. I shall take it under consideration. The next day, Constantine arrived carrying one additional weapon a chainsword he had requisitioned from the armory. He approached Atra and handed the weapon to her. 
The weight of the thing made her nearly drop it, and it took both hands for her to lift it. My lord, I appreciate the gift, but I am not certain that I would not be more of a threat to myself with this than the Tyranids. That is precisely why you were given it. Follow me. Constantine replied, leaving Atra vaguely wondering if the space marine was trying to get her killed, but she complied. Raise your blade. Constantine ordered, and the Guards woman did so. Constantine frowned as he watched her grip. This really was going to be starting from the absolute basics. The first half of that day was solely dedicated to ensuring that Atra's grip was proper. Atra had thought the Black Templar was detailed in his construction efforts, but that paled before the downright obsessive focus he had on even the most minute aspects of swordplay. He taught her only three grips, namely, how to hold the chainsword at neutral, when preparing to attack, and when defending. You will never be strong enough to simply block any attack. He told her. Therefore, you must amplify what little strength you have with peerless technique. Her arms and feet had barely moved for the first full half of the day as he worked to perfect her grip. The next two days and a half was entirely dedicated to the positioning of her arms and feet into a half dozen different basic stances. The stances and their uses were not that difficult to remember or take, but once again Constantine's insistence on perfection meant that even these basic stances took hours to even begin to reach his absolute lowest standards. Once she had found her way into the exact position he wanted, they would drill the stance over, and over, and over, and over. They did not stop for breaks, even to eat or drink, until the Guards woman nearly collapsed from exhaustion. Even then the breaks were barely enough to choke down a ration bar before the endless drills began again, and continued late into the night. At around the end of the first day of training Atra thought that Constantine seemed to be even more fanatical about swordsmanship than he was about the Emperor. By halfway through the second day, she was certain of it. By the end of the second, she disregarded these naive thoughts and was utterly convinced Constantine was not a space marine at all, but in fact some form of sword-related demon from the darkest pits of hell. By the third day, she had discarded this theory, and was now convinced that she had died, and been cast from the god emperor's light into said darkest pit in hell for some truly gross heresy that even she was unaware of, and that Constantine was the demon sent to torment her for all eternity with endless stance drills. On the fourth day though, they moved on to a new torment. Constantine began to teach her very basic static blocks to deflect a coming attack. Again, he required a level of detail and perfection utterly unlike anything that she had ever encountered even from the most ruthless of drill sergeants, and again he drilled her for another two days of endless repetition and perfection, until Atra began to have nightmares of block drills and the six hours of sleep she was allowed between practices. On the seventh day of her training, Atra pulled herself out of her cot and vaguely considered throwing herself off the gatehouse. To call her sore would be a tremendous understatement. Her whole body had at this point become little more than a constant dull roar of burning pain. She still managed to pick up the chainsword though. She hated that weapon, truly, deeply hated it. She hated Constantine, she hated Morn and Aishvan for dragging her into this hell, she hated her mother for giving birth to her and her father for impregnating her mother. She dragged herself to the work area where Constantine was already waiting. Did he ever sleep? Of course. That was a stupid question, he was a demon, of course he didn't. He probably fed off of suffering and swords. She shifted into her stance, almost mechanically. She was too tired to think about it, but he didn't correct her. She raised her monstrously heavy weapon into a block, and then something unusual happened. Constantine drew his sword. He had not done that once in the week of hellish training. Atra's breath caught in her throat. She had barely enough time to wonder if the space marine was about to test her defenses before she got her answer. The force of the yes was enough to send her sprawling across the floor, her weapon flying from her hands and falling with a crash several feet away. That was it then. All that training and effort was utterly worthless. It was like he had said, it was over in an instant. She couldn't even stop one attack. She didn't bother to get back up. Get your weapon. Constantine ordered her. My lord, this is pointless. Ata replied. She was aware that answering him in such a manner would probably get her executed, but she quite simply no longer cared. 
pointless? Constantine asked her quizzically, a tinge of wrath in his voice, but also, for the first time, empathy. I couldn't even block one blow. Atres said, too tired and sore to be afraid anymore. What are you talking about? Constantine asked her. You stopped the first blow, I knocked you down with the second, now cease this nonsense and get back up. Atla was almost as stunned by those simple words as by the blow that knocked her to the ground. She at once wanted to break down weeping in sorrow and praise the emperor all at once. He had hit her twice so quickly that she hadn't even had time to register that she'd been attacked until she was already falling. He was so utterly beyond even the concept of humanity that he was more akin to a demon or demigod of swordcraft, a pinnacle no mortal could ever hope to even draw near. Yet she had blocked one of that monster's strikes. Her mind still trying to decide whether or not to break down into tears or praise, her body decided for her. A week of brutal training and not nearly enough sleep hit her in the back of the head while her emotions were running rampant. She fell into dreamless sleep with a smile on her face. Constantine looked at her, shrugged, and walked over, picking up her form and placing her in a corner next to her weapon out of the way. You pushed her to that before you even considered actually throwing out an attack. Ishvan said from the side corridor he had been watching from. I had to see if instinct had set in. Constantine informed his cousin. She'll never be able to see or think fast enough to keep up, but if her body and subconscious have the proper form forged into them, with enough training she might be able to survive for a few seconds, maybe even 30 if the attacker wasn't particularly focused on melee like you. High praise. Well, it was a good block. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 5, A Strange Lull. The attack did not come that day. Nor did it come the next, or the next, or the next. The week of waiting turned first into two, then into three. And yet the Tyranids did not come. Constantine began to grow restless. Between sparring sessions, he would pace the wall like a caged tiger, almost eager for the Xeno to come. The brilliant lights of the void battle still filled the sky. It seemed unbelievable to him. Reports filtered in through the great Vox Spire at the center of the city. The Xeno fleet was acting unusually coy. Fighting and retreating, dancing around the system and preventing the Imperium from either relieving the planet or striking a decisive blow. The Xeno is becoming clever. I do not like it. He told Ishvan as his training sword flashed towards the giant's throat. The giant stepped back, swinging his own blade back to deflect the blow and launching a careful counter. The two were far from evenly matched, but it was not a battle Constantine could rely purely on his reflexes to win. The salamander was a giant, even by the standards of the Astartes, and his strength bordered on the supernatural. That combined with his notable reach made every blow one Constantine had to treat with respect and care. He stepped twice to the side, and deflected the blow with his knife. It could not fully stop the momentum, but instead deflected it harmlessly to his pauldrons. He stepped forwards, lunging like a fencer of ancient terror. His arm fully extended pushing every inch of his reach into the attack. The sparring blade struck the salamander's helm with a thunk. Beneath his helmet, the Black Templar grinned. The grin faded as Ishvan swung back. Too close to dodge back or away, Constantine took the one option available to him. He pushed on, continuing his lunge as the helm deflected the training blade to the side. He dropped his knife, took his sword in both hands, and hauled in a downwards chop. The metal blade screeched along the ceramite armor, as Constantine put his weight and strength into the blow. Ishvan's attack swung past his smaller opponent, only his arm connecting with Constantine's armor. His own massive reach now worked against him, as did his strength. The blow had left him only slightly off balance, 
but that slight difference, barely shifting his center of gravity a centimeter, was enough. The full weight and strength of his brother crashed down on the vulnerability, and Ishvan's posture bucked. He fell to a knee, the blade still at his throat. Constantine breathed heavily, panting from the exertion. Well, do you concur? He asked. I concur that you need a better sparing partner. The salamander said with good humor. One who can keep a conversation going while trying to deal with all your fancy footwork. And one whom I do not risk tearing a muscle any time I clash with. Constantine replied, removing his blade. The salamander stood, once more looming head and shoulders over his smaller brother. I had heard tell that your brothers forge their armor each according to his own needs. Why in the emperor's name did you feel the need to make yours as heavy as a land raider? Ishvan let out a deep and booming belly laugh. The tales of my brother's craftsmanship are somewhat exaggerated if you hear we each make our own power armor. Though the legend of the Black Templar's skill with the blade is reaffirmed in my bruises every day. Atra, sitting to the side, chose to make no comment regarding bruises, and instead nursed the constant, all-encompassing bruise that was her entire body. Well, at least she was starting to become used to the pain now. You still didn't answer my question, much as the flattery is effective in distracting me from it. Constantine pressed. Ishvan did not speak, removing his helmet and maglocking it to his hip. The frown was particularly worrying on the normally jovial starts. I do concur. The enemy grows canny, and they are a difficult enough foe to deal with when they simply throw themselves at us. I do not hear reports from the other hives. Have they also fallen? Constantine wondered. Surely we should have seen the fires. I do not know brother. Ishvan said grimly. But the battle will come, whether they come by sea in shadow or in their screaming thousands. And where also are the titans? Constantine wondered aloud. True, we alone may be enough to hold the gate, but even I am not so proud to not wish for the aid of the god machines. Likely trapped in orbit still. There they are the most vulnerable. The Xenos must understand this and strive to keep them at bay. Clever bugs. Constantine muttered, almost like a curse. Within the central spire, Morn remained almost as restless, if not more. The actions of the Tyranids did not follow what his files told of their behavior. The Tyranids were animals, and like animals they would seek food, and this being the second largest hive on the planet, it was the highest concentration of food. Why did they not come? Why did they fight so strangely? The questions continued to pile, leaving the Tetchmarine frustrated with his lack of answers. He needed a new perspective. Wathin's advice came from years of experience, but his stories were frequently a mix of exaggeration and metaphor. He would obscure the truth to make his point. It was illogical, well suited for advising flesh and emotion, but little for logic, and real solutions. He would go to the Manufactorum and seek audience with the Margos. Perhaps there he might find insight into this strange behavior. As he passed by, he heard the sound of music coming from Andriel's mediation chamber. This was abnormal. He walked to the door and pressed a button to open it. Locked. That would not remain so for long. As the door swung open, Morn kept his hands near his belters. What he found was odd. Andriel sat, cross-legged, playing a stringed instrument, somewhat similar to a harp. He opened his eyes and ceased the music as Morn entered. Cousin, he said, voice slightly baleful. Why do you disturb my meditation? It was abnormal. Why do you have an instrument? Morn asked, unconcerned by the response. As I said, I was in the process of meditating. I was specifically working to focus my mind to contact one of the other hives as you asked of me. The seeker replied, clearly irritated at the intrusion. The screaming minds of the Xeno make such concentration difficult enough without distraction. Then why do you distract yourself with noise? Morn asked, continuing to focus suspiciously. His internal computers calculated several different options for terminating the seeker if it proved necessary. The Dark Angel sighed. Of course, your librarians would have their own methods of focusing their minds. Morn, you are familiar with the process of music are you not? I am. Did you not hear the binary cants of the Manufactorum as we passed through it? He asked in reply. That was meant to be music? 
I digress. It is a careful progression of small steps, each of which is key to bringing the whole song together. Put a single note out of step or play one flat or sharp, and the entire composition can stumble. You must have it perfectly memorized, perfectly understood, knowing both each individual note and its meaning and how the whole structure falls together. This is the same manner by which a power is safely manifested. A very careful and extremely practiced series of steps that flow together to create a potent ability. The librarian explained, trying to put it in the simplest terms possible. So playing the harp is a method to focus psychic powers. Morn accepted. This is illogical. Why do you not simply practice the powers themselves? Because that requires directly touching the warp, even in passing. Andriel explained. And do not think because I wield it that I do not fear it any less than you. If anything, I fear it more, for it is my constant companion. Fear is a thing of flesh and mortals. Morn replied. We are the Astartes. We shall know no fear. Be that as it may, I am Magi. Andriel replied, with a strength and focus that gave even the soulless Tetchmarine pause. Fear is the first ward against damnation. I thought that was contempt. That is the second ward, and a universal one. All should armor themselves in contempt, but for a sicker, that alone will breed arrogance, and arrogance is the path to ruin. Morn nodded, accepting the perspective and integrating it. If this could grant him insight on this topic, perhaps another. What is the meaning behind the Tyranids' unusual behavior? Andriel started slightly at the abrupt change of subject, and paused to consider. The Xeno is known to avoid areas of high resistance until it gathers sufficient force to destroy it. He said, drawing on his own knowledge of the Great Devourer. Considering we exterminated their initial probe, the hive mind may consider this area far more dangerous than it actually is. Similarly, it fears the fleet, and knows it cannot engage it without severe risk. Therefore it circles to wait for something to tip the balance. This planet. Morn replied. Andriel nodded. The biomass of the oceans and hives could bolster the fleet enough to risk an engagement with the fleet. But the navy here is able to prevent them from fully exploiting the seas thanks to the STC. So they target our allied hives, before preparing to bring all their force down upon us. Morn concluded. But something about that conclusion still did not sit right with him. You don't think that's all it is either. Andriel said, and Morn nodded. It is not in my nature to trust my instincts, but they tell me there is something more sinister at work, though I cannot place it. Likewise. There is something strange in the skein of fate. The Emperor's tarot is muddled and double speaking. I thought it was merely the effect of the shadow and the warp, but if you sense it too. Something more is in motion. Jenna Steelers perhaps? Morn suggested. You'd have found them by now, or Wathin would have sniffed them out. I cannot say. Andrea lied. He knew what he feared, but would not dare to speak the possibility. Whatever their scheme, it must be near to complete. I shall leave you to your meditation. He said, the closest thing he would get to an apology. The Tetchmarine left, and Andriel quelled his worries, redoubling his efforts to reach the other hives. As Morn approached the Manufactorum, he heard the beautiful binary cant ringing across the hive city. To any not inducted into the secrets of the machine cult, it would certainly sound as nothing more than a buzzing whine, but to those who knew it, it was a glorious and beautiful sound. There is no truth in flesh, only betrayal. There is no strength in flesh, only weakness. There is no constancy in flesh, only decay. There is no certainty in flesh but death. Flesh is weak. Morn answered the Credo Omnigia with that of his own chapter. Weak, yes, but still numerous and swarming. Clever and cunning, enough that even the sacred might of the machine god might be strained to stand against it. Where were the god machines? As he approached, his vox buzzed with a priority alert from the wall. Morn, this is Constantine. We have conformation of bar forms approaching from the highway. A full force. How long? Morn asked. Two days at most, they move with unnatural speed. Nothing these Xenos do is natural. Morn replied, almost a grumble. His audience with the Margos would have to wait. 
Regardless of his quest to understand the Xeno, they had clearly set their plan in motion. Now all that could be done was to try and survive it. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 6, Battle Standard. Two days. At once an interminably long time to wait and not any time at all. At least depending on one's point of view. From the eyes of the Astartes, it was no time at all. The warriors of the God Emperor were each at least a century old, and they could see every detail still needing to be attended to. For the ordinary guardsman, it was a lifetime. There is only so much one can do when faced with a literal deadline, and for many, they already had done all they could. Constantine had ceased training Atra and ordered her to rest, recognizing the state the training had left her in. She complied, at first gratefully, and then with boredom and dread. She had faced only a scouting tendril of the swarm, and now the full force of the Xenos would fall upon her city. Even with the Astartes, would Alvira hold? The Emperor protected, that much was for certain, but he was a god, concerned with souls, and righteous fury, and the acts of his sons and great men. It was foolish for any to expect a god to care for the humble guardsman, even he could not watch over the countless billions who served his name. Well, perhaps their souls, but as far as Atra knew, a soul was a relatively light and manageable thing, easily detached from flesh and apparently always in constant danger, if the Ministorum was to be believed. She had never thought much on her soul, though she had certainly been at risk of its separation from her body before. There had never been this, quiet, this exacting knowledge of a battle. She went, and fought, and killed and lived. She did not know her enemy, nor had she ever been expected to. The orcs were orcs, they were Xenos and they had been purged. Mostly by the artillery. Unless you were a Catalchan, you fought orcs from as far away as possible. But the Tyranids, they were different, new, alien, even for Xenos. There had always been orcs, even the Emperor and Sanguinius had fought orcs, even before the betrayal of the Arch Traitor. Orcs were simple, understandable. These Tyranids though, alien even to the alien, more like beasts with minds. They never ran, they were devilishly clever, and they were even more numerous than the greenskins. She turned as much as her aching body would allow, thinking on the first battle, the first encounter. What could she have done differently? How could things have played out? She forced herself to consider the battle, to extract every detail of the enemy she could find. The shapes of the creatures, their weaponry and its effect. How they moved, where the LAS shot slew and where they only wounded. Then her mind went to the hive tyrant and its guards. She tried to focus on its image in her mind, and could not. It had been fast, shrouded in the power of the hive mind, and obscured by the battle. The less cannons hurt it, the plasma could eat away the armor. Morn, Morn had used some kind of new ammunition to kill it. What had it been? She considered what she knew of bolters. They fired armor penetrating mass reactive rounds, penetrating the body and then detonating inside. They were propelled initially by shot and then afterwards by rocket. The hive tyrant had, well for lack of a better term, melted. The bolter shells must have been loaded with some other kind of payload. Her first thought was plasma, but she swiftly ruled that out. Her own experience with the temperamental weaponry knew better. Could it be a chemical compound, similar to the Tyranid's own bioacid? She considered the death of her previous commander, and mentally compared it to the death of the Hive Tyrant. Yes. That was it. A powerful biological or chemical agent, eating through the creature's insides. Flammable too, based on its interaction with the lingering fires in the wound. Then again, almost anything was flammable on contact with plasma. Yes. They had torn through the formation with relative ease. But there were only five of them. They were the Emperor's Avenging Angels, but there were only five. She knew such doubts were foolishness, perhaps even heresy. She knew they stood in opposition to the evidence of her own eyes, but they were only five. So, she was left to wait, to rest her limbs, and to pray. Pray that the Emperor would protect, not merely souls, but weak flesh and stronger steel. When she was called back from her rest, she was indeed rested. She had forgotten how blissful it was to not hurt. She lifted her chain sword, initially with contempt. 
Then she laughed aloud at how much lighter it seemed compared with before. It still took her a great deal of effort to control the weapon, but she had grown substantially in the two weeks of hellish training. She caught a glimpse of herself in a reflective wall. She had never been a small or weak woman. Those did not make it into the guard, let alone survive. But her musculature had developed substantially. I still fail to see why you're considering this idea. Constantine told Wathin as the two watched the horizon for the first signs of the horde. Why would it have any benefit over doing it ourselves? You've been teaching a mortal and working with them since we've gotten here lad. Tell me what you've learned of them. The old wolf replied, watching the Black Templar cunningly. I have learned that they are remarkably weak and do not learn anything of combat besides how to hit the broadside of a battle barge from long range. Constantine grumbled. The girl is developing, and she may even have a true talent, but she tires far too easily, and her performance degrades swiftly when exhausted. Wathin chuckled. As expected. Son of Dawn, your focus is your greatest advantage, and your greatest weakness. You focus on one thing to the exclusion of all others. Is this why you still refuse my request for a match? Constantine asked. If I didn't know you better that would have been a fine joke. The old wolf said with a sigh. But yes and no. There is no benefit to a match between us, and more likely than not it would be to your detriment. Either you would, however unlikely, defeat me, and thus swell your ego further, or more likely I would send you back on your jump pack like a neophyte, and thus scar your morale. You put too much of yourself into your sword, boy. You have the potential to be an incredible duelist, but if that is all you are, you will have fulfilled only half your duty. And what would the other half of my duty be, if not to bring the Emperor's wrath unto his enemies? To bear his example onto his people. The old wolf replied. We are the Our Father's fury, his executioners, his greatest weapons. Perhaps if this were yet the great crusade and he and his sons still walked among men this would be sufficient. But those days of glory are long past, and until Russ comes again at the wolf time, we are what remains. But even Russ was not merely a master of slaughter, nor was Dawn just a duelist. Constantine considered, and nodded. You have grown wise with age, cousin. You remind me of my master's master, although he had the good sense to wear a helmet. Wathin laughed, long and heartily. This is a face shaped by the blood of Russ and the genes of the Owl Father, let all see it, so that the enemies of man may see their fury in my eyes, and that men may see a shadow of the greatest of men in my bearing. I don't recall any depictions of the God Emperor with beard or fangs. The fangs are from Fenris, and as for the beard, you've seen relatively few world's depictions of him. There's broad disagreement as to what he actually looked like. The Black Templar smiled slightly under his helmet. Wathin's joviality was more infectious than Nurgleroth, and it even affected the Dure Duelist. Then it faded, as the ever-focused mind returned to the original topic. You still haven't explained why having her alongside us in the battle is a good idea. Her purpose as a go-between is served by this point. Because the most crucial part of that service is yet to be seen. Have you seen how the men look at us, and at the pair of you as you trained her? Wathin asked. It has not been an area that afforded my attention. Constantine admitted. Well, perhaps you haven't, but I shouldn't did. Oh by the Emperor. You two striplings really do get along like beer and wine don't you? Do you have any metaphors not relating to alcohol? Yes, but they are all Finrision and that would simply irritate you further, which is not particularly productive. Bah. We are becoming distracted. What did he see that I did not bother to do more than look at? Or, though not in the usual way, mortals adapt quickly enough that that had faded by the end of the second week. Wathin replied. Or that one of them, no special powers, no bloodline of a famous regiment, no hive noble or gene or steel enhanced warrior, a mere sergeant, was sparing with one of the emperor's angels. Constantine shrugged, as if it were irrelevant. It was a good way to review the absolute basics. If it improved their morale, then so much the better. I fail to see how this is relevant to your foolhardy scheme. Simple. She trained under you, she's known, particularly so if she remains by your side. The effect upon their morale would be substantial. 
Last I checked her mutation was not that of Holy Sanguinius, blessed be his name. Constantine replied, inclining his head slightly to the jump pack on the back of his armor. I doubt she can keep up. Wathin cocked his head to the side curiously. He had known the Imperial cult had deep roots within the Black Templars, but to hear of a Primarch other than one's own referred to as Holy. In fact, did the young knight even refer to Dawn as Holy? He filed that away for later thought. I never said she was expected to keep up. By the Alfather, she's just a mortal. No, simply to stand beside when the battle begins. She likely hold fast by Aishvan and simply provide fire support. Ah, a mortal standard. That was what you meant. Constantine replied, sighing and shaking his head. For a moment there cousin, I thought you had begun to succumb to the ravages of old age. Watch it boy, or you'll get more of a scrap than you bargained for. Wathin replied, baring his long fangs at the whelp. He really is just a blood claw in black armor with the lectio thrown in as a replacement for the bletcher's glands. He thought, somewhat amused. Watch the walls, son of dawn. I'll inform your apprentice. Temporary. She's too old and not compatible to possibly to be something even vaguely resembling an apprentice. Constantine growled. Atra was utterly stunned at the command the old wolf gave her. My lord, I am honored, but, well I have been rather frequently, and painfully reminded of the disparity between a mortal and the Astartes as of late. She replied, attempting to decline the honor as politely as possible. Oh we all know. It's not because of your swordsmanship or marksmanship, that much is for certain. Wathin replied bluntly, but not unkindly. It's precisely because of that disparity. More of a moral assignment than any other tactical consideration. Ah. So I've been transferred to be a mascot. Atra replied, considering this pressure in relation to the other ones. All due respect Lord Wathin, but I don't think I'm even qualified for that. If I'm meant to be there with you to help inspire the rest, you're asking the wrong woman. I'm as scared as the rest of the men if not more so after the incident at the outpost. I, I really don't know what I'll do. I'd like to say I'll stand and fight until both my arms are gone, but I don't know that I can. I don't think I'm a coward, but I'm no heroine. I can't stand anywhere near any of you. And we shall know no fear. That nugget the Ekelshiaki loves putting out whenever they aren't calling us mutants or barbarians. Wathin replied with a sympathetic chuckle. It's nonsense, like a lot of what priests say, but a lie that keeps the men fighting is better than a truth that stops it. The space wolf laid a hand on the human's shoulder, and it covered most of her upper arm as well. We are not without fear. It would have been foolish for the Alfather to remove that from us. Fear is a fundamental instinct, part of what makes us human. It is our biological programming that tells us that a thing that threatens our survival is present. It is perhaps the rawest form of the great human ability, to survive and thrive, no matter the circumstances. So do not be ashamed that you fear, you would have to be insane to not ever feel it, especially with the great devourer at our gates. Use it. Let it sharpen all your senses, and awaken the same tenacity and drive which is within all humans, whether they are blessed with gene enhancements or not. Atra was stunned, she looked at the massive hand covering her shoulder. The raw power the Astartes possessed, barely contained within armor as resilient as a lemon rus, no pun intended. He was older than several generations in her family, and possessed training, understanding, and natural talent on a level that bordered on the arcane. He was a decorated son of the Emperor, and she was somewhere between nobody and squeak fodder. How in the world could the two of them be considered anywhere near one another? I still can't understand what you, any of you see in me. Wathin retracted his hand. The Astartes win wars. We come to end conflicts, shatter the enemy, and throw them back from whence they came. We are here and gone in a few months, a few years if it is a particularly cruel contest. Yet in every theater I have fought in, from one end of the Imperium to another, there is always the guard. You, mere mortals, hold the line, and do it for years, decades, against forces that even we do not face lightly. I have stood alongside men who fought for decades against the worst the galaxy has to throw at them. You may be mortals, 
but to consider you lesser would be the same folly as the traitors of old, and in utter denial of the reality of the modern Imperium. So, I bid you stand, daughter of Alvara. Stand for your home, and stand to show them all that the bravery of mortals has not diminished from the days of Elenia's pious. Atra's heart swelled, and she stood upright, then chuckled slightly. You know my lord, with as much as you seem to dislike the preachers, you'd make a fine one yourself with speeches like that. Bah. When you're approaching 700 years old you'll have heard enough speeches to make telling the obvious truth sound impressive as well. Though age doesn't appear to have refined Morn as much. Morn is older? By a pair of centuries no less. Must have spent some time in stasis. Either that or enough of him is steel at this point that he's ageless even by our standards. I would advise you not to bring it up. Yes sir. Is there anything else you require? A stiff flagon of mjod, but I already know your planet has nothing approaching it, so I'll manage without it. Wathin replied. The enemy will be in range in 4 hours. I expect to see you on the walls. Yes my lord. Atra replied, and saluted. The old wolf nodded, and left her. 4 hours and at least one standard issue requisition of liquid courage later, Atra readied herself for battle. New armor had been brought to her, somewhat sturdier than the usual cardboard that the rest of the men used. It wouldn't do for the battle standard to be slain by the first stray boned rifle, now would it? The armor was similar enough to her old gear to be familiar, but incorporated additional ablative plating, colored a simple black. Her sergeant stripes seemed brighter than ever. On her opposite shoulder stood a new symbol, a rising serpent, coiled about a sword. It was the Alvaran dragon, the symbol of each and every regiment her planet raised. There was no number beneath it to indicate which regiment she was from. She wondered at that, if she would go back to simply being another sergeant among many after this was all done. Of course, that assumed she survived. She checked her vox bead, straightened her helmet, strapped on her chain sword, and shouldered her plasma gun. It was time. She marched out onto the battlements. There the rest of the army was assembling. She might have recognized the regiments once, but now, with the casualties sending everyone into scratch regiments, it was all a mess of contradictory symbols. But they were here, and they would stand. Regiment hardly mattered at this point. They would all fight together, or die together. She approached the center of the gatehouse wall, where the full kill team stood, watching as the enemy came. She swallowed. She didn't belong up there, with heroes and demigods. But the emperor had need of her, to show her comrades in arms that they could stand alongside them. She closed her eyes, and offered a prayer, both to the emperor, and to Saint Elenius. For the courage to match that role, to stand like the heroine they seemed to expected her to be. Then, shaking slightly, she marched to the center, and saluted sharply before taking her place. Ishvan gave her the slightest nod of encouragement. The enemy was in range, vaster and more terrible than anything her worst nightmare could have conjured. The skies were covered in what first seemed to be clouds, until she peered closer. They were tyrannids, smaller gargoyles swarming around massive bioforms that floated along like carrier craft. Beneath them, the seas boiled. Already, the preliminary skirmishing between naval elements had begun. Monsters dwelt in the deeps, and the navy would face them. But her duty lay before her. The bridge was blotted out beneath an ocean of Xenos, both innumerable gaunts and other smaller forms, and merely countless numbers of tyrants, carnifexes, and other creatures she had no names for. Equary Atra, the enemy is in range. Her vox buzzed. Siege guns are ready to open fire. Very well. She replied, shifting into the simple, hard tones of an officer. She was here now, and so was the enemy. Fear was no longer of any use. It fell beneath a simple, cold determination. She thought she might give a speech, but it hardly mattered now. Open fire. She ordered, then unsheathed her chainsword and raised it towards the enemy. There was no need for speeches when three words would suffice. For the emperor. She roared, and the defenders of Alvara answered her, a single voice from a thousand throats. For the emperor. Their battle cry drowned out even the sound of the siege guns, and the scuttling of more than a million Xenos coming to silence them forever.
Kill Team Equinox Chapter 7, The First Wave. The guns roared, and then there was silence. The massive wall defenses reloaded, and behind them, cannons further back in the city began to sound. Across the wall the boom of fire rippled, as the other sectors fired into the seas to support the battleship and submarine fleets. A few moments later, the first shells landed. The front of the Tyranid formation vanished under fire and shrapnel, Xenos body parts flying into the air and crashing into the seas. The guns kept firing, and the Tyranids were blasted to pieces in their hundreds. The once blue seas of Alvaro began to turn red. On such a tight position, with artillery already sighted, any other foe would have been utterly destroyed and rooted from mass casualties. But these were the Tyranids, and despite the barrage, they were gaining ground, and gaining quickly. Tens of thousands would die on that bridge. It mattered not at all, for millions more were coming. They stretched into the horizon, and their air contingent blotted out the sun like a great storm cloud, advancing with terrible speed. By the god emperor. How many of them are there? Atra gasped. Even orcs were not so suicidal, or so numerous. Morn swept the horizon, his augmented eyes able to pick out precise details of the enemy formation. He paused for an instant, his already superhuman intellect combining with his cogitator implants. The enemy possessed a bioform index of 102.35924, and had access to the biomass of the capital hive and at least 400 square miles of agri-world class ocean. The capital had a population of 6,631,091,040, and the agri-ocean could be considered to be the equivalent of roughly another 1.5 billion depending on season, though exact data was unavailable due to the invasion. The total number of converted bioforms would therefore be approximately 79,436,806. Assuming an initial attack force of average hive cracking ability 7,546,182 and the standard rate of casualties 67.346% that would be an additional 2,464,130 tyranids. For a total of 81,900,937 Tyranids active on planet, at least. Of course, not all of them would be attacking here. Assuming that their success at the outpost had warranted double forces compared with the attacks in the other 5 hives, there would be roughly 27,300,312 Tyranids, with biomass split roughly evenly across land, sea, and air. Approximately 9 million are coming across that bridge. An equivalent force occupies air and sea. This is better than I expected. He replied calmly. Better? What were you expecting? Substantially more human-sized bioforms, and fewer biotitans, or terrestrial biotitans. They appear to have concentrated their super heavy elements in the air and the sea. Morn replied. Those giant flies. You'd think they'd be advancing closer to drop a payload. They are not bombardment. Those are carriers for the gargoyles. This is excellent, as is the increased deployment of linear breakers such as carnifexes. The carriers cannot advance too close to the city without risking attack by the long-range hive guns. Secondly, if the naval elements are successful, they will be able to push forwards and eliminate them. Without their support from the carriers, the enemy air force will fall as much due to attrition as to our guns. As for the enemy heavy elements, they are well suited for storming defensive positions, but are vulnerable to successful urban anti-tank tactics, and will be utterly irrelevant before the might of a titan. Then all we need to do is hold until the titans can be deployed. Atra said, realization dawning. That's what the plan is. Correct. However even without them. I estimate a 73% chance of victory, with only a 35% casualty rate. The time for talk is past. Here they come. Constantine interrupted. For the enemy had indeed come. In the time that they had been speaking, the swarm had pushed within the firing arc of the largest guns. Secondaries now rained down from the massive gatehouse, shredding the enemy as they began to swarm up the sides of the walls like arachnids. Matriculation gunners. Open fire. The Black Templar ordered an order that resounded across the walls, without the need for Vox. The gunners shook the ringing from their ears, pointed their heavy bolters down, and unleashed hell. 
They had been positioned on the outermost edge of the wall, where Constantine had created an interesting architectural addition. The wall sloped downwards into a slit, which a bolter could be fired through, aiming down the wall at a dizzying angle. It had taken a great deal of work to carefully adjust the floor to allow a gunner to fire down effectively, but the Sons of Dawn were the masters of all manners of fortification. Thus, they unleashed their shells into the swarm as they advanced. The heavy emplacements in the sides of the wall fired as well, reaping a terrible toll among the enemy. Such was the spray and slaughter that none could see through the thick smog of gun smoke, blood, and viscera. But there was no need to be concerned, for the Xenos came upon the gate in such a mass that no matter where one fired, it would find a mark. Counterfire from the aliens smashed into the positions, in such a great array that mere probability dictated that there would be casualties. Still the men of Alvara held, for this was their home, and they would sell their lives for her dearly. Yet as the inexorable weight of the swarm pushed against the wall, the defenses began to crack. Carnifexes tore through the reinforced wall guns, flying hive tyrants unleashed unspeakable weaponry and terribly psionic power. One by one, the wall guns began to fall away. But this had been known to be inevitable, planned for, and drilled for. As their defenses were overwhelmed, the gunners took up their gear and retreated deeper into the massive wall. As they fled, they detonated hidden charges, engulfing the attacking swarm in flame or casting them off the wall to fall screaming to their deaths. The Tyranids pursued them, pushing into the tight corridors between the outer and inner walls, but the guard were ready for them. The initial explosions brought the gun crew just enough time to leap over a wall, where yet further heavy weapons teams waited. Auto cannons whirred into life, filling the corridor with slug rounds and xeno corpses. They fired without ceasing, until the barrels began to glow hot. Then the third stage of the defenses activated. From above, great quantities of fast drying permacrete were released into the tunnel, and Abhumanogrin stepped forth from behind the weapons teams. Carrying great slab shields, they blocked the exit, and held out as the Tyranids threw themselves against them desperately. But the great strength of the simple Abhumans was sufficient, for the tunnels were too tight for the strongest Tyranids to push through. Thus the Xeno was denied passage, and sealed within the Great Wall. Atop that same wall, Constantine knew that the enemy was at hand. Matriculation gunners, fall back. Weapon teams, make ready. He bellowed. And the heavy bolter teams took up their equipment and fell back. Now the gatehouse of the city was a fortress in and of itself. It stood nearly 100 meters tall, with the gates being 60 meters, so that even an Imperator Titan might stride out of them. Above this gate stood the house proper, and it was 40 meters tall, and spanned 80 meters between two great towers, covering the full width of the great bridge and even more. And these towers each stretched 10 meters above the top of the walls. And the length of the wall was 30 meters. Constantine had left the first third of this bear, so as to create a killing field, and behind that was a series of cleverly constructed diagonal walls, such that any advancing foe would have no benefit from them, but the defenders would always be shielded. Now the enemy summited the wall, and was immediately consumed in a deluge of fire. Upon the wall there were many guardsmen, and from the two towers fire rained. Such was the onslaught that there was barely space for a flight to pass through without being struck by a LAS shot or bolter shell. Yet while the fire was without number, so too were the Tyranids. Many shots simply missed, and of those that hit, barely half struck anywhere that mattered. The swarm moved into the killing ground, and a wave of gaunts approached. At the same time, the gargoyles entered range, and the whole of the city was beset by them. They attacked everywhere at once, hoping to find any point of weakness they might exploit. For as they cracked the city open, their seemingly infinite numbers would surely triumph. Yet the Iron Hand did not leave such things as weak points. From the top of every roof, from every spire and every place, there erupted a great storm of flak. The city's main gun swept away entire squadrons with their overwhelming anti-starship weaponry. The maelstrom of Tyranids blotted out the sun. But the combined muzzle flashes of an entire city worth of defenses gave the daylight regardless. That day, it rained blood and gore, and the slaughter was unlike anything seen upon that world, 
and greater than it would ever see again. Upon the wall, the great darkness and slaughter sank into the hearts of the men. The endless hordes pushed through, and their ammunition began to dry. Then the Termagants summited the wall, and began to fire back, followed swiftly by six great carnifexes. Behind them buzzed hive tyrants on malefic wings. Their combined psionic might was thrown against the resolve of the guard, and they began to despair. Seeing this, the kill team knew that the time had come. Andriel threw back his hood, releasing the dampeners upon his abilities. He opened his mind, and drank in the raw emotion of the battle. He bore it within himself, and raised up his staff. Warp lightning flashed in the darkness, tearing out of nowhere to strike it. Illuminated in the Eldritch light, his golden hair flew back in the wind, like a hero of ages long past. With great effort, he pushed his unfettered psychic might against the Tyranids. He opened his mouth, and roared like a lion of ancient terror, the sound reverberating across both physical and spiritual planes. For the guard, it granted them great courage, and to the Tyranid, it rattled them, the base instincts of the lesser Xenos responding to the sound of a greater predator. Show them the light of the Emperor. Let it burn their accursed hides. HCSVNT Dracones. Ishvan roared, and strode forwards into the horde. His mighty flame roared to life, and granted light into the gatehouse. About him the flamer teams rallied, and they swept the lesser tyrannids away beneath an ocean of flame. The carnifaxes charged forwards, seeking to overwhelm the flamer teams, but already forces moved against them. On the left, Morn unleashed precise and deadly bolt of fire into their eyes, and blinded them. He then concentrated all fire on one's left leg, sundering it and causing the creature to fall under its own weight. Atra rallied a unit armed with Meltus, and they countercharged the rampaging beast, blue plasma leading the way. It tore towards them, guided by the eyes of the hive mind. Hold. Atra ordered, waiting until the monster was just near enough to be within maximum effect. Fire. She ordered, and the Meltagons opened up. The front half of the Carnifex vanished under a wave of superheated air. Its momentum, however, did not. The massive corpse threatened to crush them, until Morn intervened. Moving with almost supernatural speed, he checked the corpse, diverting it away from the guardsmen. In the center, Aishvan began to fall back. Even his masterfully crafted weapon would not be sufficient to stop the living battering rams headed for him. Fortunately, Wathin was. Charging in from an angle, the old wolf took his axe in both hands, and met the carnifex almost head on. But not quite head on. As the great beast lashed its head to gore him, the space marine altered his course slightly, and swung with all his might into the side of the monster's head. With a great wrench, he bent the carnifex's head down into the side, so that the beast's own charge carried it forwards and broke its neck. It crashed into the side of the other carnifex, slowing it slightly. Wathin made for the beast's back leg, and Aishvan covered him. The cleansing flame swept over the screening swarm and burned them to ash, but had no effect upon the ceramite armor of the space wolf. Wathin's axe bit into the carifex's leg like a great tree. If not for the flickering force field, the weapon surely would have been caught up and torn from his grasp, but instead it clove through and severed it neatly. The beast turned to rake the wolf with its tusks, but Wathin was faster, and had the momentum. He counterclothed with the axe, severing both tusks and twain and shredding the teeth of the creature's mouth. With that, he raised his axe high and delivered a devastating blow to the Xeno's forehead. It struck right between the eyes, but was not enough to reach the brain. The beast slammed him, sending him screeching back and wheezing for breath. But he drew his bolt pistol from his hip, and fired thrice into the wound he had cloven. The bolt shells pierced through, and reduced the beast's brain to paste. The last two came against where Andriel stood, and he threw his arcane might against them. Unable to strike their minds with the tyrant Sonya, he was forced to contend against their flesh instead. He formed a thin plane of telekinetic force, and thrust it under the feet of the charging Xenos. With tremendous effort, he pushed up and toppled them, though they began to rise anew. Before he could finish them, he fell to his knees as the tyrants turned their full focus upon him. The raw weight of the hive mind slammed him into the ground, so that the permacrete cracked. 
his eyes began to weep blood, and reality flickered around him as he drew on dangerous amounts of war power to resist. His staff flickered, the focusing crystal pushing itself to its limits. Somewhat ironically, the one who would prevent his death was the one who hated him most. Constantine, having evaluated the situation, had already taken to the air on his jump pack to repel the gargoyles, flew to a position above the hovering tyrants. Then he offered a prayer of hatred, deactivated his jump pack, and fell like a guillotine. With their focus on destroying the troublesome sicker, the cabal did not recognize his presence until it was too late. Constantine hurled a crack grenade at one, stunning it and setting it ablaze, then struck down the one in the center. Both hands on his blade, he put all his strength, momentum, and weight into a single blow. With a mighty strike, he clove the wings from the tyrant's back, and sent it plummeting to its death. The one he set ablaze recovered, and turned its weaponry towards him. However, the flame did more than burn the creature, it highlighted it. With a series of cracks, a half dozen Laskinans, brought up to deal with the Carnifexes, shot it out of the air. The remaining tyrant trained its weapons on Constantine. The Templar reactivated his jump pack, slowing his descent and beginning to propel him back towards the wall. For a moment though, he was almost still, an easy shot. The tyrant began to fire, when its weapon limbs broke to the side with a crack. Andriel rose, power flickering about him. With a wordless cry of hate, he unleashed his fury in a massive bolt of psychic lightning, which struck the tyrant in the side. At the same moment, Constantine soared into reach, and drove his sword to the hilt into its chest. He tore upwards, splitting the alien's skull in twain. With the death of their leader, this wave faltered for a moment, and Andriel took his chance. He struck a thousand tiny needles into the primitive, reeling minds of the attacking creatures, stunning them. Then, with a great effort, he lifted up the Carnifexes and cast them back over the wall, along with many lesser creatures. He fell to a knee, coughing up blood and an iridescent glowing substance, his veins gleaming from overuse of his powers. With effort, he drew his hood back over his head, dampening his powers once more. He weakly recited dogmas, breathing deeply until the glow faded, and the pain ceased. Don't push yourself too early. There's a lot more. Wathin advised, and the sound of scrambling proved him right. Begin the retreat while we have half a moment. We are running low on ammunition at this position. Morn ordered. And the second wave struck. Chapter 8, Cowardice and Valiance. It took no more than a minute for the Xenos to remount their assault. No longer hampered by the powerful war guns, they came swiftly over the side. The first wave had devoured the defender's ammunition, even with runners constantly moving to bring up more. The bastion towers were becoming inundated with gargoyles and other fouler creatures. This position had served its purpose well, and thousands of tyrannids now lay dead before the gate, but it was time to pull back. They had defense upon defense to fall back on, so long as they had the men to man them. It was a testament to the iron will of Morn and Constantine that the retreat remained disciplined. They did not break and run, but made a fighting withdrawal, pouring fire into the foe until their weapons ran dry. Many fell back across the walls, until they approached a narrow bridge. Others retreated into the fortress within a fortress that was the gatehouse. Morn oversaw the retreat to the bridge, sweeping the area and coming to an odd conclusion. Atra. Where are the platoon and company commanders? He asked. The sergeant ducked behind cover and vented her plasma gun. If my history with them has taught me anything, farther back than the artillery, protecting their well-appointed asses, pardon my language. Morn paused for half a moment, as sheer, mind-numbing rage briefly overcame his otherwise programmed calm. Acknowledged. You are hereby granted command over all forces in this sector until the officer corps are issued augmented spines and returned to the field. Oversee the retreat and defense of the bridge, I am broadcasting your updated rank to your fellow officers. Serve well. By your will, Lord Morn. Atra replied a savage grin taking over her face. By the Emperor, there were such things as miracles, now all she had to do was survive, both the Tyranids and the angry nobles. She rose, and drew her chains ward as the enemy closed. She focused her grip, adjusted her stance, 
and turned aside the rush. The teeth of the weapon bit into the Xeno, and dragged it deeper on, rending its way through. With a ripping swing, she cast the Hormagaunt back, and then clove another away, sending it flying off the wall in two halves. For the Emperor. Jacobs. Double time. They won't slow down. Korath. Stand and rank fire. Cover the left. We can't let the Astartes do all the work. She took to that well. Ishvan observed to Constantine as the pair held down the right. The salamander remained in good humor despite the circumstances. Talk less kill more. Constantine replied curtly, whirling through a swarm of gaunts contemptuously. You judge her better than I. He admitted. The battle came to the briefest lull as a heavy bowl to push the swarm back. Watch the depths well cousin. And may all their champions fall to your blades brother. Ishvan saluted, and the two split. Ishvan and Warthin headed into the fortress to oversee the retreat back down the wall, and to ensure the enemy could not open the great gate. Constantine fell back beneath a hail of fire, the last to retreat to the single bridge that connected the upper gatehouse towards the inner sections. Once he was clear of the last section of his defenses, he sent a signal through his vox. It appeared to be nothing more than random numbers, but it made sense to what it needed to. Namely, the charges he had built into his defenses, which erupted in a massive fireball, consuming the Xenos and denying them any cover. Would that I had more Prometheum. Alas there is never enough. He muttered. The flames and overwatch fire brought a moment of calm to evaluate their new situation. They had fallen back to yet another raised position, hardened with heavy weapons emplacements and his own architectural modifications. Two great star towers rose on either side of the bridge, pouring fire down on their former positions. If he had ammunition enough, perhaps they might have held forever. But there might be more tyranids than bowl shells. Around him, the mortals took the moments to drink from canteens and bite into nutrient bars. Atra walked the fortifications, speaking with the troops, gathering what she could. Your grip was good. You overextended on the counter slash. He informed her. Do not do the same with your men. The sudden high of recognition was replaced with a bone quaking fear. Do you not approve my lord? She asked, keeping most of it from her voice. If I did, I would take it up with Morn. You are diligent, loyal, and determined to learn and please. He replied. You are a fine guardsman. Am I fine enough for this? She asked. I do not know. I am a swordsman with no desire or talent for leadership. The Emperor made me a weapon, and so I fulfill my purpose. I do not think beyond it. Do the same. Do your duty, and think not for what comes next. Constantine bid her. The flames of his trap began to die, and the Tyranid returned. For what comes next are Xenos, and we shall not be done purging them for some time. As if to confirm his statement, the next great swarm massed and pushed through the dying embers. At the same time, gargoyles swept down out the sky in great numbers and density, such that the AA could not clear them. Constantine stepped forth under the bridge, waiting to hold the swarm. He raised his blade to a vertical position, and focused. The Auspex array in his helmet went into overdrive, and he took measured, meditative breaths. His mind focused, then expanded concentrating on taking all the data his superhuman senses could. It would have pushed any mortal man to catatonia, as the world almost seemed to slow. He understood intimately each tyrannid before him, edetic memory drawing forth the Death Watch's encyclopedic knowledge of all Xenos. He understood the Horde as the Horde understood itself. It was not many creatures, but a single abominable mind with untold limbs. To predict the movements of so many individuals would be impossible, even for an Astartes. But this was a single individual, a duel against a monster that would devour the entire galaxy with a trillion moors. But for all its Lovecraftian immensity, it was still only one mind to match against, and on this ground, Constantine was its match. He moved against the Horde, psychic lightning from Andriel and precise bolt of fire from Morn covering him, while the guards defenses formed a box of fire to hold the majority of the swarm. He closed with the coming beasts, taking in everything. Slight shifts in their position, the whisper of breath flowing into their lungs, the scent of adrenal pheromones and the quickening of the blood revealed their plans to him. 
Their possible attacks shifted, first from a hundred different patterns, to a dozen, and then their last movements collapsed the web into a certain future. And he would shatter that future. His power sword moved in sharp, exact motions, almost like a conductor's baton, albeit with more mechanical precision. He cut off a dozen lives in a moment, stopping each attack on his left side. On his right, the long knife in his offhand met the talons of the enemy, his superhuman strength breaking by weapons with mere parries. With a single slash, he tore the mana molecular edge across four throats. He moved almost gracefully, each step calculated to place him in an optimal position for his next movement. Two more steps, four dozen more claws turned away by whirling blades and power armor. He registered the roars of Morn's bolters, caught after images of the paths the shells tore in the air to clear his path. One more step, a single thrust. His blade pierced through a tyrannid and struck the one behind. The tip just piercing its skull and entering the frontal lobe of its brain. He tore it free and stepped forwards, finishing the newly lobotomized prime. His attack on the synapse creature had staggered the section of the horde, and its death broke it. The Xenos faulted for a moment, giving the marines the precious seconds they needed to eliminate this sector of the horde, before the next tendril of the swarm came against him. Six times the enemy came against the black swordsman, six times he cast down their champions, and threw their broken bodies from the bridge. Great beasts they sent against him, but the guns of the towers cast them down, and the hellfire rounds from morn broke them. Xianthropes, lesser psionic xenos, threw the wool of the hive mind against him, but his faith and contempt shielded him long enough for Andriel to destroy them. Supported by his fellow astarts, he held against the tide, though his armor endured such abuse that it was almost more silver than black. Fully half the foe were obliterated by the guard and their mighty ordnance, and of those that survived, half again penetrated the gate, seeking to throw it open wide so the full might of the swarm might enter the city. Andriel and Morn destroyed half of what remained, such that Constantine faced only an eighth of each wave. Even so, an eighth still numbered in the dozens. Those who sought to throw open the gate found themselves funneled into an even crueler series of chocker points. In the narrow corridors, the Tyranid could not bring their overwhelming advantage in numbers or their mightiest bioforms to bear. Furthermore, they no longer were guaranteed superiority over the guardsmen, as the Ogryn auxiliaries guarded the heavy weapons teams. By their terrific strength and savagery, the Tyranids were outmatched in melee for a time. Though their immeasurable numbers brought with them immeasurable pressure, steadily forcing the Imperials back. Black Xeno blood flowed freely through the halls, mixing with the far more valuable human red. Yet wherever the enemy seemed ready to break through, Wathin and Aishvan appeared. Few could withstand the flame of the Salamander, and none the fury of the son of Fenris. Together they held the defense together. In a moment of pause, Wathin took note of the blood, though he could not be certain of why. The red and black flowed together, intermingling until one could not be withdrawn from the other. It sent a chill down the old wolf's spine, though he could not understand why. He was no seer, but this was an ill omen, he was certain of it. The runes on his axe gleamed coldly in the dark corridor, though whether it was merely the effect of the force field or something deeper he had never been able to tell, and certainly had no time to figure out. At this point the battle had raged with only the briefest of pauses for two hours, and while the gate held, it was swiftly becoming one of the last areas on the outermost walls. Nearly all had fallen back to the second line of defenses, as Morn had called for, and many had even retreated to the third line. There were in total almost 40 lines, but a loss of territory was still a loss of territory. They had bled the enemy fiercely, but the horde still stretched beyond the horizon. But the gatehouse continued to hold, and the surrounding sectors had not retreated any further, even as the enemy began to pressure their flanks. This sector of the wall could not be allowed to fall until there was no other option but to retreat, and even then, the gates had to be destroyed before even that option was allowed. So, hold they did, and hold well, in spite of the heaviest onslaught. The Astart certainly deserved much of the credit for this feat, but the guard performed more admirably than they had in all the regiment's career. They fought for their home, and for once, they fought with an active commander. The officers of the Alvarin regiments were standard, 
That is to say they were hive nobles there for politics rather than competence. Naturally, they spent most of their time sitting in the rear, taking credit for victories, and executing any who did not adhere to the chain of command. It was not that the men of Alvaro were any less noble, courageous, or disciplined than any other regiment, merely that they were cursed with a patrician's command structure. But the elevation of one of the remarkably capable sergeants remedied this otherwise fatal flaw. An outside commander might have earned the troops grudging gratitude simply for being there, but one of their own? That person could be trusted. And Aitra did all she could to earn that trust. She moved like a dynamo, rushing here and there across the walls to ensure the ammo kept flowing, and the men kept firing. All the while, she continued to pour fire down upon the enemy whenever she was able to stand still. Yet in spite of all of their efforts, the tyrannid could not be denied forever. The fatal blow came from the skies, when a cloud of gargalies descended upon one of the defense towers. A hive tire and led the assault, blasting a hole in the side of the tower with a bioacid cannon. As it fell upon the defenders, it unleashed a horrific psionic scream, which broke the men and sent them running. The gargalies swarmed into the tower, beginning to overwhelm any brave enough to remain. Morn watched this development bitterly. He prepared to send the order to destroy the gates and pull back, when he looked towards heaven. The skies were ablaze as the Imperial Navy forced its way towards the planet, closer than they had ever been. The battle was clearly fierce, the Navy taking a fight on the Tyranid's own terms. But they would only do that if. Morn quickly checked the patterns of the clouds, and saw that they were beginning to be parted. They pulled away, as a particularly bright star grew brighter. Beneath his helmet, Morn grinned. The god machines were coming. If the gate could hold, they could win this war yet. He turned from his reverie and redoubled his fire. Without the support of the left tower, the Xenos came upon the bridge in greater numbers. He stepped forwards, Macadentrides whirling as he came to Constantine's aid. Atra. The tower must be retaken. Victory is coming, but the gate must hold. He ordered her. Do whatever it takes. Aitra prepared to reply in the affirmative, but froze. She knew what was in that tower. It would rebred ruin among her men, and the Astartes would not be there to support. Even without the cyclic attack, dread gripped her heart. Her mouth went dry, her vision swam. He was ordering her to lead her comrades to their deaths. Aitra, do you hear me? The tower must be taken. The gate must hold. Victory is coming. He ordered again. She tried to force herself to respond, to move. Time was growing shorter. She could hear the enemy coming down through the tower. It would be upon them all soon. They were all going to die. Fear is a fundamental instinct, part of what makes us human. It is our biological programming that tells us that a thing that threatens our survival is present. It is perhaps the rawest form of the great human ability, to survive and thrive, no matter the circumstances. So do not be ashamed that you fear, you would have to be insane to not ever feel it, especially with the great devourer at our gates. Use it. Let it sharpen all your senses, and awaken the same tenacity and drive which is within all humans, whether they are blessed with gene enhancements or not. Wathin's words reminded her, the wisdom of the old wolf breaking through the terror. The fear melted, and something colder took its place. Her face and heart hardened adrenaline and ice roaring through her bloodstream. It shall be done my lord. She answered, and she gathered her men. Her own squad, three units of veterans, two units of flamers. Two rocket launcher teams and a melter squad. They assembled and prepared to breach the fallen tower. As they did so, the door flew open, and half a squad ran screaming out. Atra hardened her heart, and did her duty. Stepping forwards, she slammed her chainsword into the first deserter's face and revved the engine. His head was sucked onto the blade and utterly destroyed. The rest of the fleeing men stopped. If that tower falls, we all die. Now do your duty. Atra snarled, doing her best impression of a commissar. It worked, and the men halted, more afraid of her than the Xenos. Behind them the gargoyles began to emerge from the tower. Atra ordered her flamer squads forwards and they suppressed the entrance. Fix bayonets. Atra ordered, and the men did so. 
Once they were done, she lowered her chain sword, and the flames ceased. For the emperor. She roared, and they charged, shotguns roaring. The sudden ferocity of the assault caught the tyrannids by surprise, and they cast them back from the lowest level. Atra led the way, blasting the head from one, and cutting down another with a slash of her blade. Around her, the veterans tore into the enemy, giving space for the special weapons teams. The flamers lit the dim rooms with burning corpses, and the whoop of Meltagons eliminated the tightest pockets. They maintained their momentum, forcing their way up the stairs. Men fell to the claws and bile of the gargoyles, but they pushed on. Reinforcements poured in from both sides, and the tower was filled with slaughter. But the ferocity of the veterans and the prospect of victory was enough, as they cut their way to the fourth floor. Through the tight corridors they relentlessly advanced, sweeping aside the foe with discipline and wrath. On Atra's flank, a unit rounded a corner, ready to let fly with their shot guns. Instead, they exploded, their skulls and spines torn from their bodies by an invisible force. Then it came around the corner. The Hive Tyrant, a massive, heavily armored creature that filled the whole corridor, and had to stoop to avoid dragging its head through the ceiling. Swifter than any creature of that size should be, it impaled two more members of the squad on a bone sword, then swept it aside to bisect two more. Atra's mind went white, then red. Fall back. Don't let it get close. She ordered the remainder of her men, pulling back and opening fire with her plasma gun. It struck the monster as it charged, letting forth another psychic howl. The retreat nearly turned into a rout, the stairs becoming cluttered. The behemoth leveled its acid cannon, and Atra realized its ploy. Get down, she ordered, tackling one of her men down the stairs. A blast of bioacid melted several guardsmen, and splashed onto her arm. She rolled away, tearing off that section of carapace armor before the acid could eat through into her. The tyrant came down the stairs, ripping into the men with blade and psychic blast. The veterans held, firing shotguns into the beast and trying to pierce its hide. Black blood flowed from dozens of wounds, but none enough to even slow the monster down. It tore through them as easily as Constantine did Gaunts, casting their scattered bodies about like toys. Atra screamed in defiance, beyond the point of fear or conscious thought. She flicked the plasma gun to high-powered mode, and fired. The massive blast of blue-hot plasma finally staggered the monster, melting one of its wings to the wall. It tore free, gathering its focus and advancing on the lone sergeant. She braced for death, charging another shot, when the whoop of the Meltagon squad saved her. The tyrant reeled forwards, then whirled. A blast of rage and pain struck the team, boiling their flesh off of their bones and reducing them to a soupy mess. Atra fired, but the sight made her wretch, and the shot went wide. She vomited onto the floor, thinking that this was a particularly humiliating position to die in before an explosion rocked her world. When she came to her senses, she saw a very large hole in the wall where the tyrant used to be. A rocket team had fired, and their blast had detonated the charge packs on the melter squad's corpses, taking most of the tyrant and a sizable chunk of the wall with it. Atra got up with some assistance and oversaw cleanup of the tyrannids, not her vomit. As new men manned the guns, she had a moment, and the reality of what had just happened struck her. The memory of the melter team's deaths burned into her mind, and she was grateful there was nothing of their corpses remaining. Her limbs shook slightly. Now she understood why she feared and despised the witch. She opened her vox to inform Morn of their success, when a great sound shook the tower. A brilliant light filled the outside, and then the whole planet seemed to shake. She hailed Morn. Lord Morn, do you copy? What manner of new devilry is this? Not devilry, salvation. Morn reported. Titan Nimrod has come. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, 
The succubus that has poisoned the towns well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Chapter 9. A Titanic Climax. Constantine had fought alongside the god machines of the Mechanicum before, within the crusade to retake the lost forge world of Ozma, but he had never seen one land. What came first was a noise, and not merely a noise, but an all-consuming, all-encompassing noise. It drowned out the sound of battle with a low rumble, which built and built. Then there was the light. The coming of Titan's massive carrier craft disrupted the weather, and blew all the clouds to the horizon. The gargoyles and all others that dwelt in the air were blown away by the winds. And the land had ascended, gleaming white hot from the re-entry, like a crashing star or burning mountain. When it landed, all the earth shook, and even the Tyranids and Astartes were staggered. The sheer enormity of what had just ascended boggled the mind, and stunned even the alien. And then, silence. The battle held almost awkwardly. The Tyranids in this sector at least slunk back a few steps, cautious of this new entry. Constantine watched them, but did not overpursue. In sectors far enough from the drop point, the attack resumed swiftly, but around it, every eye, alien or human, was focused on the lander. What had fallen from the sky was nothing short of a building, and a very large building at that. It had landed upon the main causeway before the gate, and filled it utterly. Its descent had torn off sections of nearby buildings, and crushed them beneath its bulk. It resembled a mighty, albeit slightly boxy, cathedral, all solid pillars and integrated supports, so that it might resist the great stresses. It stood just over 30 meters tall, and was very long, far longer, one would think, than for a titan. The Tyranids began to regather themselves, to launch another, concentrated assault when another great sound gave them pause. The mighty doors of the Skyborn Cathedral began to open, and war horns sounded, such that all the city was filled with their clarion call. At this, the whole city gave out a mighty cry. The guardsmen punched their fists and rifles into the air if they were able, offering prayers of thanksgiving. The bells of the Manufactorum tolled joyously, and all the Mechanicus raised up a beautiful and happy binary chant. Even the kill team could not hide their satisfaction at this sight. Constantine gave a great shout, proclaiming the glory of the Emperor. Morn lowed his head in awe. Andriel felt the miasma of despair lift from the city, as a cloud passes away before the wind. Within the gatehouse, Ashvan took pause, not recognizing the sound at first, but Wathin simply grinned. Now things get entertaining. He said with a laugh. With earth shaking thuds, the titan strode forth. 23 meters tall the god machine stood, covered in the indigo and red of its legion markings. Upon both arms bristled incredible weaponry, the rival of starships. Upon its back were mounted two more bastions of apocalyptic firepower. Morn watched it move with something like religious awe. It was a bellicose Mars Beta type Reaver battle titan, among the mightiest of the Omnigia's weaponry. On its right arm was mounted a plasma destructor, and at its left was a mighty gatling blaster, which began to whirring at life. Fall back. Get clear. Morn ordered, and the men retreated. The Tyranids pursued, but not swiftly enough. A wave of heat, light, fire, and sound swept over the gatehouse battlements. So many shells, and of such size, that where one ended and another began could not be determined. In but an instant, it was scoured of all life. Atra poked her head out from behind cover, and beheld a riven and smoking wasteland, layers of plating peeled back like the wrapping on a nutrient bar. Feth me with a spanner. She cursed under her breath. She had heard stories of the god machine's power, but witnessing it herself was something else entirely. The titan spoke, its voice booming out across the city. Open. The gate. About its feet. An army emerged from the lander. Dozens of tanks, scores of skitterii, and many other Mechanicus vehicles that she did not recognize, loping, crawling, and otherwise advancing forth. At the gate controls, the mortals hesitated for a moment, until Wathin laid a hand on their shoulders. Both of them at once. With one hand. Lads, when a titan tells you to do something, you do it. He's about to win this war. 
The great gates began to swing open, and the Tyranids surged forwards, pushed even tighter together in their rush. The Princeps had clearly expected this, as he leveled the Plasma Destructor. A blinding light erupted from it, obliterating everything. Thousands of Xenos, wiped out in an instant. The weapon swung upwards, and carved a canyon of ruined flesh and scorched permacrete across the bridge. As the doors opened fully, all the Titan's guns unleashed into the tightly packed Tyranids, as it marched inexorably forwards. About its feet, its auxiliaries unleashed their own weaponry, exterminating anything so fortunate as to survive the god machine's gaze. Cast them down. For the Emperor. Constantine roared to the guard, and charged. For the first time, the men of Alvara took the offensive to clear the remaining Xenos from the walls. Any attempts by the Xenos to summit the walls were rendered nearly impossible by the firepower of the victorious Titan, cutting the endless Xenos reinforcements to a minimum. The guard, possessed by an almost divine fervor, fired until their lasguns grew hot in their hands. Atra took what remained of her command squad, and they charged across the bridge to support Constantine. Flamer, Melter, Boot and Bayonet cast down the Xenos. In the center, Constantine clove a bloody path through the Tyranid, Atra following behind. Her chainsword roared, and she laid waste to the foe, firing her plasma whenever she could not reach an enemy within a few steps. Morn continued to deliver precise fire support from the wall, joining his voice to the binary praises of the Mechanicum. Soon, a gout of flame and the bark of a bolt pistol heralded the return of Aishvan and Warthin, at the head of a massive Ogryn charge. Constantine's focus slipped momentarily at the sight of the wretched Abhumans, but his hate for the alien was stronger. He resisted the urge to vomit, as together, the Astartes, Guard, and Ogrins cast the Tyranids down from the walls and reclaimed the upper gatehouse. The Titan continued forth his inexorable march, plasma and massive shells annihilating the enemy in their tens of thousands. Lord Morn, if I may ask, what are our odds now? Atro asked with a grin, the Dirtech Marine smiled under his helmet. I would say that they are very good. He replied. Oddly imprecise, truly you are in a good humor. Ishvan commented. And why not? This is a great victory. Oh by the spirits he said it. Wathin cursed. Boy, have you never learned to not ever say that? It tempts the fates and the fates are cruel mistresses. Cousin Wathin. I have a great deal of respect for you as a warrior, but your superstitions are unbecoming. Constantine replied. Mark my words. This isn't over. I've a grim feeling for all of this. Wathin replied, scanning the area. Look, the Xenos are acting too clever by half. They're retreating. Indeed, as they looked down from the great gate, they saw something as strange as a waterfall flowing upwards. The great tyrannid swarm occupying the bridge was falling back, pulling away from the gate and the great death that marched through it. Any normal army would have rooted by now, and been caught against itself, but the swarm rolled back as one. It was an eerily smooth and controlled movement, setting all of them at edge. They're up to something, Wathin said with a growl, watching the seas and skies, which still boiled with Xenos. Shadows passed in the Red Seas, too deep for even the enhanced eyes of the Astarte to make out. The Titan continued to march forwards, pursuing the enemy relentlessly. The ancient and bellicose machine spirit combined with the youthful aggression of its princeps, sounding its horn for yet more death. It passed beyond the gates, and Wathin's eyes narrowed. Look. They're in the deeps, it's a trap. Morn immediately activated his Vox, but realized to his horror he could not reach the Titan. It had only a few minutes ago entered the field, and been too preoccupied to establish a link with him directly. He hailed Central Command, ordering them to patch him through to the Titan. Too little, too late. The trap was already sprung. The shadows of the seas darkened and hardened, until they erupted in a spray of foam. Atra looked down and turned pale, backing away from the edge of the wall and falling on the battle-scarred ground. Emperor preserve us. She whispered, for from the sea had come the largest tyrannid she had ever seen, larger than any that could have filled her nightmares. Her heart pounded, her blood roared, the biological mechanisms of her body malfunctioning in response to something it was never meant to see or comprehend. 
They were like great crabs, covered in spines and chitin, standing upon four armored legs. They were easily 10 meters tall, and just as wide. They must have weighed several thousand tons, yet they moved swifter than tanks. Ishvan seized her in one hand, and the Astarte sprinted for cover. 4. Morn cursed. Rust and rot. 4. One had emerged before the titan and rushed at it head on. From a thousand paws it unleashed an ocean of bioacid and a forest of tree-sized spines, but the attack fizzled harmlessly against the void shields. The god machine sounded its challenge, and supercharged its plasma destructor. At this range, it was impossible to miss, and the blast tore the bio titan in half. It bought time for its comrades though, for even the mightiest tyrannid is but an expendable tool to the hive mind. The second rushed the titan from the side, firing wildly. Its ammunition was no more effective than the first, until it rushed within the shield. The shield was far from the last defense of the god machine though, and its side became engulfed with sparks as the armor deflected the worst of the damage. It swung its gatling cannon to engage, but the tyrannid leapt atop it, rending with its claws. The massive scything talons and rending claws carved gashes into the armor, but this was not the true threat. Instead, the sheer weight and momentum of the massive beast caused the titan to stagger, backing towards the edge of the bridge. The third high elephant raced over the top of the gatehouse, summiting it with horrific speed. The Astartes ran, fleeing deeper into the fortress. Ishvan covered Atra with his body, and smothered her mouth and nose with a hand. The lack of breath compounded the sergeant's terror, and she kicked and flailed fruitlessly against the armored warrior. As the shadow of the beast passed over, it unleashed a chemical attack. Toxic vapors and infectious spores inundated the fortress, melting and poisoning anything they touched. As they melted through discarded power packs, they ignited the gases, and a fireball swept over the battlements. The fire calcified the spores, and they shot forth like shrapnel, piercing into anything and everything. Ishvan staggered from the blast. His armor preserved him from the worst of the spores, but such were their number that many found their way through. He bled for only an instant, blood practically freezing as soon as it began to bleed. Even so, he dropped Atra, and his vision began to swim. The toxic spines would have brought instant death to any mortal, and while Ishvan was far hardier, the sheer amount of them began to battle against his enhanced physiology. Morn saw this, and raced to his battle brother's side. He tore the gauntlet from his right hand, exposing the mechanical limb beneath. With a whir, a panel opened up, exposing an uncomfortably large syringe. He tore Ishvan's helm from his head, and stabbed the needle into his throat. The larger starts his breathing began to grow stronger, his vision cleared. The powerful antivenom provided all his system needed to quickly and completely expel the poisons, followed by the spines, from his body. Was that Constantine began to ask, but Wathin cut him off. Deal with it later. We have titans to deal with. Morn, Ishvan, Atra. He began, then paused. He knelt by the nearly catatonic goods woman, and clapped his hands in front of her face. The sudden sound caused her to blink and gasp for breath. Go to the controls. Shut the gate. Make ready for another attack. Prepare to destroy it after you shut it. Andriel, coordinate our forces. Break minds if you need to. Get all our heavier support up the main causeway and have it engage from maximum range. Constantine, with me. He ordered, then started running. Constantine followed him and the other Astartes made for the control room. Atra staggered to her feet, shook her head, and followed after them. Duty came first. Then the mental breakdown, and a whole lot of Amzek. As the wolf and the Templar raced back to the battlements, the third high elephant executed its attack. Scurrying under the arch of the gate to avoid the titan's weapons, it launched itself at the reeling god machine. The impact sent it back further, nearly toppling it into the sea. However, the machine would not fall so easily, and it swung its gatling cannon free. It shredded the second high elephant, and turned its plasma to obliterate the third. Then the fourth titan emerged from the seas, and it was unlike the others. It seemed cephalic, like a Fenrisian kraken with many armored tentacles. It wrapped its tentacles about the titan's arm and throat, 
and braced itself against the bridge. With tremendous effort, it hauled the off-balance god machine down. The plasma destructor fired wildly, melting one of the defense towers to slag. The third high elephant leapt clear with a scree of triumph, as god machine and kraken vanished beneath the waves in a titanic splash. After allowing itself the merest instance of triumph, the bio titan set to work annihilating the imperial spearhead. It rent, tore, burned, and poisoned with animalistic glee, trampling and overturning tanks, sweeping away skitteriae formations with waves of pyro acid, and melting circuitry, steel, and flesh all together into an unrecognizable morass. With the spearhead effectively broken, the titan rushed for the gate. Behind it, the tyrannid swarm had turned, and now moved with the same eerie smoothness and speed back to the open city. The high elephant threw all its fury against the gates, for if they were to be sundered, the city would surely fall. What then? I fail to see how the two of us are going to kill a titan. Constantine admitted. I am fully confident in my bloody walk, but I do not have a big enough sword for this, and I do not think your axe will quite do the job either. That is because you lack both imagination, and a melter bomb. The elder Astartes replied. With that, he took a few steps back, ran towards the edge of the battlements, and leapt. Constantine paused, blinked, and blinked again. He is insane. The Black Templar concluded, and leapt after the Mad Wolf. The two Astartes plummeted towards the Titan, and landed on its back with a crash of splintering chitin and exploding flesh. Their armor and incredible anatomy protected them from any real damage, but the fall was certainly not comfortable. They struggled to keep their footing as the titan moved, but they managed. About them, things like boils began to burst, revealing yet more tyrannids. So, it has an immune system. Something to add to the files when we return. Wathin noted as he drew his weapons. To the head. With that, he opened fire and began to charge down the monster's back. Constantine followed, twin blades dancing and keeping the immune system off of them. They fought like madmen as the boils burst, and the back of the titan became covered in toxic fumes. Constantine's helmet preserved him, but Wathin was still not wearing his. This is why we wear them. The Templar complained vocally as he cut a pair of bioforms in half. The old wolf held his breath, and did not reply. Blasting and hacking his way forwards, he came to the base of the monster's skull. Taking his axe in both hands, he cut a great gash, exposing the spine. However, this wound to such a vulnerable area alerted the creature to his presence. It bucked and thrashed, trying to throw the astarts off. It succeeded, hurling Constantine from its back. The Templar fired his jump pack, soaring back, only to nearly be thrown again. Wathin on the other hand, was thrown into the air. Twisting, he bit his axe into one of the spines atop its crown, and swung himself back. He landed, feet first, inside one of the monster's many eyes, plunging him up to his waist. Undeterred, he drew his bolt pistol and emptied the clip, obliterating the eye and giving him some space. Bracing himself inside the eye, he hacked away at the back of the socket, until he exposed the optic nerve. Returning his axe to his belt, he took the ropey nerve in both hands and hauled, tearing it out by the root. The titan screamed, shaking its head violently. Wathin could feel himself being shaken out, so he took the melter bomb, armed it, and threw it down the passage the optic nerve once occupied. An instant later, he was flung violently from the eye. Lad, I would appreciate some assistance. He calmly voxed Constantine as he tumbled through the air. Constantine leapt from the monster's back, just as the bomb detonated. An explosion tore through the creature's brain, killing it instantly. As the fiend collapsed, Constain pushed his jump pack to the limit, catching the falling wolf and trying to pull free from the dive. However, he had asked too much of the machine, and it overheated, screamed, and exploded. The two astarts fell in a parabolic arc towards a building. Wathin attempted to curse but had little time before they smashed through the wall and two floors before rolling to a stop. They lay there, flat on their backs, for a long moment. Then they remained for another long moment, processing what madness had just occurred. We are still alive. Constantine noted. Yes. 
I suppose it would hurt less if we were not. Wathin replied. Then our duty has not ended. The Templar replied, and struggled to his feet. Wathin attempted to rise, somewhat slowly, and the younger offered him a hand up. I really am getting old. Wathin grumbled, cracking his neck and popping his left arm back into its socket. A few minutes later, they located the stairs and door, and walked out onto the street. Looking up, they saw the great gate close with a mighty boom. Morn, what's our status? Wathin asked. Too good. The Tetchmarine grumbled. The enemy is pulling back, and Titan Agamemnon is intact, and mostly operational, although retrieving it from the sea may prove somewhat troublesome. I'm not going to jinx it again, but we both know that this was far too easy. Agreed. This was their initial probe. They will return, or attempt some other scheme. Let us hope that that scheme involves fewer titans. I do not care to try that again. Rural is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out and if you decide to buy the app use promo code NICKBEDIA for 10% off and it lets them know we sent you. It's a great sponsor and a great app and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Chapter 10, Sheep and Lions. Upon their glorious return to the rest of the kill team, Constantine and Wathin were immediately moved to a Medici. The Emperor gave you brains. Morn grumbled at them. So in the Omnigia's name, use them. Throwing yourselves off of a fortification onto a bio-titan is a monumentally foolish decision in so many different ways that I'd expect it from a hive noble with too many stories in his head, not Death Watch. Elsewhere, Andriel sneezed. Well, it worked, and we aren't dead. Woth encountered. So we aren't morons, we are innovative, brave, or some other nonsense propaganda word like that. What is the status of the other titan? Constantine asked. Still operational, just at the bottom of the ocean. Retrieval will not be swift. On the upside, all of their weapon systems are still fully operational, so they will no doubt provide support for the submarine effort. Mon reported, quoting a report verbatim. This was still far too easy. They threw three bio-titans at us, along with over a million less Izinos. Constantine grumbled. While also attacking every other hive on the planet. It's possible that the Xeno simply overextended, trusting in its numbers alone. The three of them were now sat inside the Great Manufactorum, or at least Constantine and Wathin were sitting. Their legs were suspended in large slings, their armor removed so that Morn could examine their injuries. It was not pretty. Their feet and lower legs were more bruised than anything else, and covered in clots from a dozen compound fractures. The damage would have been enough to cripple a mortal and require their legs to be replaced, not that Morn hadn't considered that an option. Fortunately, these were a start, and their power armor had held their legs in one piece, allowing Morn to reset the bones. From there, a cocktail of painkillers, steroids, and other more obscure drugs in the Astarte's own physiology would have the pair walking within a day, assuming the pair held still. Though they might actually have a day to recover. After the fall of the Bio-Titans, the Great Devourer had fallen back, and had not yet returned. Among the Guard, it was cause for celebration, among the Death Watch, cause for greater concern. The Tyran had never retreated. They regrouped, they tried again. They would return, and in greater numbers. Morn and Wathin had discussed it, and concluded the Xeno would now refocus its efforts on the other hives, to claim their biomas and restore its strength before making another attempt. Word trickled in from the Void War. The move to deploy the Titans had been a risky one, and costly for both sides. They had forced an engagement from the Hive Fleet, and brought it to battle. However, in order to secure a swift and by all accounts certainly perilous entry, 
Many ships had been sacrificed. Their blood had been avenged threefold upon the Xeno, but that was still a losing trade. A prolonged engagement under such circumstances would have resulted in a Pyrrhic victory at best, with relief forces so depleted in strength that retaking the lost capital would be impossible. The navy had pulled back, and engaged the high fleet at long range with lance weaponry, but the fleet escaped to the other side of the planet, vanishing among its rings. A high fleet, once dark, was nearly impossible to detect. Even when fully active, they propelled themselves slowly, with none of the vox chatter, internal energy, heat, and other such necessities that could be used to track any other form of ship. However, the biological ships of the high fleets had an even more insidious tactic. By entering into a sort of pseudo hibernation, they could reduce their energy consumption and heat output even further, making them virtually undetectable by traditional means. Combined with their effect upon the warp, tracking down a hidden high fleet was a monumental effort in spite of their massive numbers. Needless to say, the navy was frustrated. What was supposed to be a certain blow to break the fleet upon Alvara before it could threaten the rest of the sector was turning into a drawn out game of cat and mouse. Meanwhile, the forces already on the planet grew, and pressured the Imperials ever further. The Tyranids knew that if it came down to a war of attrition, they would always win. All they had to do to secure victory was keep the pressure on, and keep the Imperium on the defensive. This left Morn equally frustrated as he departed the Medici facility. If they had the Titan and associated forces, perhaps a counter thrust may have been possible. But the Titan was, for the moment, out of the picture, and its accompanying forces had been obliterated by the surprise arrival of the Bio Titans. His fists clenched until they creaked from his anger, anger towards himself for not predicting this outcome, and anger at the Princeps for acting so recklessly with the counter attack. He composed himself, and began to intake the data from the various reports. Casualty lists, ammunition expended, fortifications in need of repairs. It filtered through and he began to send out orders, directing labor, lasgans, power packs, and shells as best he was able. It was a meditative process, cold and data driven. Even so he felt the animal anger, the wrath blood of Ferris coursing through his veins. He would stand. He would defend, he would do what was required of him. But it burned him to remain still while the enemy remained on the back foot. Now was the time to strike, but he was unable. His frustrations grew as his thoughts turned towards them, and he forced himself to regain his composure again. His irritation had affected the machine spirit of his mechatentrites, and they had begun to squirm and hiss. He took a deep breath, and put aside the reports for a moment. He walked along the edge of the great factory cathedral, and took a seat upon an iron pew. It creaked slightly beneath his weight. There for a moment, he paused and joined his voice to the Beneric choir, offering praise and prayer to the machine god, the emperor, his father. Father. Grant me focus, and let cold logic overcome my wrath. Oh how I yearn to bring destruction upon your enemies, upon the Xenos who defile your world. Yet do not let it blind me, for to go by fury alone is a path to defeat, if not damnation. Enlighten me, omnisiac, to the secrets of the mechanical mind. Cleanse me from the temptations and passions of flesh, and elevate me to the purity of logic. O oh machine god, liberate my mind from this rotting cage of biomatter and animal instinct, and let your cold dispassion reign. Then he took the sacred oils and performed the rite to atone before the machine spirits which upheld his form, and returned to his duty with renewed calm. Meanwhile, Atra had left the battlefield, and the threats to her life had by no means diminished. Word had spread quickly of her actions, and of the temporary command Morn had bestowed upon her. But with Morn occupied with other matters, the question of where that command ended, or if it had ended, remained open. Not to say that the sergeant meant to keep her command. Quite frankly, she would have preferred to keep her head down, but irritated nobles will not be so easily dissuaded. So as she labored alongside the other members of her regiment to rebuild and repair the damage caused by the first attack, trouble found her. It came in the form of her erstwhile commander, along with two members of his personal squad. Sergeant Atra, step forth. He ordered. The goods women sighed 
put down the bag of permacrete mix and stepped forwards, saluting sharply. Yes sir. She responded. I am placing you under arrest on two counts of cowardice, one count of impersonation of a commissar, and one count of improper dress. The lieutenant informed her and nodded towards his men, who began to approach. Improper dress? Atra asked, flabbergasted. She had expected trouble from her brief command, but this was a shade ridiculous. Inwardly, she seethed. They were under attack by the Tyranids and had barely fended off their initial thrust, and here this fool was arresting her over improper dress. Yes, you received a temporary field promotion to captain, however you neglected to don the proper uniform, and therefore are subject to severe offense. Furthermore, you summarily executed a retreating guardsman, which is not within your authority, and thus committed a capital crime. As for cowardice, there are indeed reports of you fleeing from the vile Xenos, which resulted in the death of Special Weapons Squad 142. A. The lieutenant explained coldly. Consider yourself lucky we are bothering with the court-martial. Unlike you we still have some respect for military tradition and proper procedure. If you were judging yourself, I have no doubt you would have been simply executed. His words were clipped, professional, and impartial, but his sneer was anything but. Atra still had her lasgun near to hand. Her eyes flicked briefly towards it. This fool, this utter baboon. She wasn't certain what a baboon was, but some expressions stand the test of time, even if their meaning does not. This sniveling blue blood had stood back away from the lines. So far that she had had to step up and do his job, and he had the gall to call her a coward. Had he even seen a hive tyrant? Don't. A voice filled her mind. Don't. Then space parted behind the officer, and Andriel stepped through. The man turned, alongside the command squad, who leveled their helgens at the approaching figure, then very quickly set them aside. The dark angel approached, drawing very, very near to the officer so that the differences between the two were painfully, horrifyingly obvious. Good day Lieutenant Devoir. May I inquire as to what exactly you are doing? Devoir soiled himself, and Atra smirked. The blue bloods could do whatever they damned well pleased, but an angel cares nothing for the amount of thrones in a man's bank, or how long his bloodline ran. I, I, uh, he stammered. No matter. I will find out. Andriel said quietly, and his staff gleamed slightly. Ah. He said, as he casually plucked the information from the officer's mind, as easily as a fish from a stall. I see. I will attend to this myself. As it was my battle brother who granted her the promotion, and ordered that she stand beside us at equerry. He informed the cowering noble. Hey, her, my lord, my sincere apologies, but there is so much to be done. I thought I would attend to it, so as to not waste your precious time. Devwa stammered. Indeed, there is a great deal to be done. So much paperwork, so much that even during a battle one must remain back to attend to it. Andriel replied diplomatically. So did go and attend to it. It would be a shame if you were not able to claim glory for yourself and your house, because such duties were not attended to in time. Devwa recognized an out when he saw it, and fled. Andriel watched him go, shaking his head. So much for the sword nobles. He muttered. Emperor forbid any of them have a clue what it truly means to serve. Thank you for the assistance my lord. Atra told him, bowing low. I will not permit my battle brothers to have their honor tarnished, even if merely by the association with you. The dark angel replied. You will die, that much is certain. It is a shame, because you are a fine soldier, but you are mortal, and we are not. I will ensure that when you die, die with honor, so my brothers are not disgraced. Then he departed, leaving the Guards woman shaken. She returned to her work for the next few hours, but it was mindless, and there was little talk. Few could speak, as all labored, but even in the brief breaks to swig from a canteen, they avoided her. She was a dead woman walking one way or another. Why bother speaking with her? It was almost a relief when her vox bead buzzed. Captain Atra, gather your squad. The enemy has revealed their hand. More nord at her. Meet with us at Spire R 51 floor 24.
The targets are Jenna Steelers. Chapter 11. Changing of the Guard. The reports of Jenna Steelers in the Underhive did not come as a surprise to anyone who had ever faced the Tyranids before. In fact, the reason they knew of them was because Morn had made preparations for this exact eventuality. In consultation with Wathin, he had placed Ganger Militia, Arbites, and even a few battle servitor forces in the Underhive to act as a screen and early warning system. The information he was receiving now indicated that there was a substantial force down there, gathering itself together to strike when it received the signal. A decisive blow at this stage might be able to shatter their fledging resistance, but they possessed certain advantages. Firstly, they were in the underhive, which was trouble enough. The dumping ground of a hive city, running full of toxic disposals, mutants, heretics, and all manner of threats was not an area easily penetrated. The environments down there were so deadly they were occasionally used to gather recruits for space marine chapters, most particularly the Imperial Fists and their successors. Constantine would be of no help in that particular matter though. Even if he had come from a hive world, it would have been long enough ago that his memories of the underhives would have mostly faded. Even if they had remained, each hive was slightly different but those slight differences could mean the difference between victory and catastrophe. Nonetheless, Morn began to assemble all data available on the movements of the Xenos hybrids and their location. Yet as he began to do so, a concerning pattern began to reveal itself. He cross-referenced this pattern with the overwhelming amount of data gathered in the battle, and nodded grimly. He then assembled the rest of the kill team and began to present his findings. 1132.34 hours. As Trapath Laura Argentals disappears. He began, then pointed to her last noted location on a map of the city. 1137.02. Battle Sicker C3 822 also vanishes. His corpse was found decapitated several levels down. He pointed to a nearby location. 1202.57. Battle Sika C3-839 vanishes, another decapitation. 1217.39, Astropath Clara Martel disappears. I suspect if we find her corpse, it will also be missing its head. Furthermore, at points here, 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 and here, sergeants assuming impromptu command went mere. I hypothesize these disappearances are the work of a lictor. Wathin sucked in air through his long teeth. Aye, you're probably right about that. Blackmane and bloodied hunter. He cursed, a fitting epithet considering his foe. That's going to be a problem. I note that it has not targeted any of the higher command staff. Constantine remarked wryly. Their uselessness is so apparent even the Xenos can perceive it. You might want to watch yourself Andriel. it seems to like hunting witches. Ah. I see. Get one of your countless apothecaries here then, you may have found a new neophyte to train. Andriel replied with a faint grin, which grew only somewhat wider when he saw the Templar's face darken. You are correct. It is targeting sickers with unusual frequency, and not engaging with command elements as is the usual pattern for this bioform. I wonder what it is up to. Firstly, the new neophyte is that Guard's woman of his. Wathin commented. To which Constantine groaned and put his head in his hand. By the Emperor, you do all recall that bringing the mortal along was Morn's idea, correct? We have a duty to do, let us attend to it without unnecessary humor. Bah, laugh while you can lad, for tomorrow we may all be dead. Wathin said with proverbial intent, but a real edge underneath it. The old wolf was fond of joking, but there was a serious side to this jest. Wathin. If I recall correctly you and Constantine managed to kill a bio-titan, which is why you are still here. Ishvan mentioned. They were, of course, still in the infirmary as the titan slayers recovered from their adventure. If nothing else, I am confident you will devise some equally cunning and equally insane plan to deal with this lictor. Wathin grinned as wolfishly as one would expect him to, but it quickly faded. Neither of you two young bloods have faced a lictor before, have you? It is a Xeno, we are Death Watch. And we have the blessing of the Emperor. We will kill it. Constantine asserted confidently. 
I'm surprised to see you optimistic about anything brother, but I concur. This is what we were chosen for. I shouldn't have said in agreement. I would advise you both to review your training on this particular form of Xenos, and check your excitement. Overconfidence is a slow and insidious color. Morn reminded them coldly. Regardless, we will not be able to engage it until Constantine and Wathin have both recovered, so not for, there was a slight pause as he ran calculations. Another 6 hours, 32 minutes, and 18 seconds. Do not attempt to engage it yourself, it will kill you. Constantine's eyes narrowed, but he nodded. Watch yourself then and real. As said, it hunts sickers. His voice was cold, but not contemptuous. He had accepted the threat, and while he detested the witch, to fall to a single Xeno would not be a worthy death even for a cursed warrior. Andriel nodded. As we will not be engaging it directly for some time, I will move to the astropathic choir. I may be able to conceal their powers and keep the enemy from engaging them for a time. That leaves only the small, original problem of the Jenna Steelers festering in the Underhive. Ishvan noted. We shall have to call on the mortal defenders again. Morn nodded. I concur. If not for the presence of the Lictor, I would have waited for these two to recover and then we would have led them directly, but as it stands we are most needed to eliminate this threat. Therefore, I shall have to accelerate my schedule. Ishvan, you have faced the enemy in similar conditions, fighting within the gate, and your chapter has a greater understanding of mortals and urban combat than mine. I would benefit from your assistance in directing our strategy. Gladly brother. Ishvan replied. And I will gladly assist the new mortal command staff also. Morn nodded, pleased that the salamander understood his intentions. Within a few hours, he gathered together the full command staff in a great conference room. He had not informed them of the purpose of the meeting, but they came nonetheless. His heightened senses could smell the sweat of their fare. He was no space wolf, but they were obviously frightened. So he began to speak. You are failures. You have failed the Emperor, you have failed the Imperium, and you have failed your city. He judged them coldly. You are primarily cowards, having attained your rank by familiar connections and politics. You are weak, unwilling to face the enemy when it is at your very gates. You are fools, thinking that you can save your own lives even while endangering the city. Do you think that you will negotiate with the Xenos? These are not T.A.U. who will bring you into their fold because of your thrones. Not that you would have survived the wrath the Emperor would bring down on you for such a betrayal. You risk one of the most important worlds in the sector, and worse still an STC fragment and an entire Titan Legion which has been deployed to save your ungrateful bodies. You are weak. A weakness in this city that will poison it and see it destroyed. Such weakness shall not be permitted. With that pronouncement of judgment, Morn raised his bolt as swifter than a mortal I could follow, and executed a preset firing protocol. In less than 5 seconds, all but 6 of the mortals were dead, the patter of exploded skulls still faintly pattering to the ground. The 6 survivors stood in shocked silence for a moment, before one drew a LAS pistol from his hip and placed it to the side of his temple. Morn's bolt roared once more, and the pistol flew from his hand in several pieces. The bolt shell impacted the wall behind the officer and exploded, showering him in dust and leaving a ringing in his ears. As for the rest of you, you possess potential. However your records indicate that you are as of yet unworthy of your current positions. Nonetheless you have demonstrated courage and loyalty in the face of danger and also possess the training in the theories of warfare needed to complement the direct experience of your new superiors. You will each serve as an adjutant, and have been selected to survive and fulfill this duty because you will serve loyally and with all courage. And, he added, noting the corpses of the former officer corps. You are very keenly aware of the consequences of treachery and failure. You will find your new assignments at the door. Dismissed. The shell-shocked officers nodded slowly, and then equally slowly turned and walked to the door. Within the hour, Atra received new word. A pale, nervous man in an officer's coat approached her carefully. A bandage was wrapped about his head, fresh with blood. Captain Atra, I am here to inform you that you have been permanently promoted, as the prior captain and the colonel have been dismissed from duty. At this, 
there was a great cheer from among the common soldiery, for the high officers were much detested for their cowardice and cruelty. Atra did not cheer, for while she was every bit as happy that the old officers were gone, that did not mean she wanted their job. Her previous command, while successful in its mission, had suffered heavy casualties. She likewise had training neither in the convoluted politics of the guard officers, nor experience in commanding large formations for more than a brief time. She consoled herself with the fact that while the times had called for her of all people to be elevated, she was at least not a colonel. Understood. Who is my new superior officer? It appears Lord Morn has not appointed any as of yet, and will be maintaining that duty himself. The man admitted. Ah, apologies. I am Cap, er, uh, that is, Lieutenant Matthias. I have been assigned to act as your adjutant and tactical advisor to help you acclimate your new command. Matthias, you commanded the second. Atra noted in surprise, before watching the man's face flinch and checking herself. He had been demoted. Well, at least he was alive. I've heard quite a good deal about you. I'm glad to have you on staff. Follow me, we should discuss a few things. Atra quickly led him away, attempting to look like an officer, or at the very least like she wasn't panicking. Once they were alone, she turned, and sighed heavily. Look, I am sorry you were assigned to me as you are going to unfortunately be the one handling a lot of the work, as I have no idea what the feth I am doing. The Astarte seem to like me and far as I can tell that's the only reason I'm still alive and have this now. I'm not an officer, I haven't been to the Scholastica, I don't know the politics or protocol or grand strategy I just lead my squad and try to keep people from dying unnecessarily. I'm fine on the battlefield but for the Emperor's sake please do not put me in front of a stratagem table, because I would like to avoid being shot by my own side for incompetence. They know. That's why they sent me I suppose. I'm something of the opposite, I'm quite well versed in the theoretical but rubbish on the field. Matthias admitted. He spoke with a posh upper spire accent that was at once charming and infuriating. Look, I just watched Morn execute the entire bloody command staff for cowardice and the only reason I didn't get shot was because I was at the front lines during the attack, mostly just trying to not get eaten. I don't know what I'm doing once the fight starts, and you don't know what you're doing off the field. Let's work together and maybe, just maybe we can do our duty and only get shot at by one side. He what? Atra said, jaw dropping. Wait, it's Morn, of course he did. Blood of Sanguinius, or Ferris Manus as the case may be. Matthias nodded. He had good reason mind you. The old staff were completely naff at everything except giving themselves medals. Though I wonder what his process was for picking new staff, well besides you. Atra just sighed and put her head in her hands. I honestly can't tell if they're trying to get me killed or not. First the moral assignment at the front lines and now they're promoting me right after they killed the dastard who held the position before. Though as for the rest he's probably read through the files on every soldier in the regiment and picked out the ones he's liked. Oh, the news gets better, or worse. Guess what our first orders are? He asked her. Clearing the bloody Jenna Steelers out of the underhive. Oh by the Emperor why? Atra growled. Bah, well best we get to work figuring how we're going to do this. Get me whatever maps we have on our assigned area and see if you can find me any gang of leaders and an arbides who knows the area. She said, cracking her neck. You have a plan already? Matthias asked, mildly impressed. No, but if you want to make a plan, you get all the information you can, and all the experts you can first, or else you may as well not. She growled. Matthias smiled. She might not think she was suited for command but she had a certain talent for it, and the humility that the other officers had lacked. She had an odd kind of potential, so he saluted sharply. Yes ma'am. He reported sharply, turned to go, and paused. Ah, you'll be needing this. He said, turning and presenting a small golden aquila. Afraid times belay the usual pomp and ceremony. Atra took it, and considered it for a long moment. An officer's aquila. It was heavier than its size would indicate, and vaguely warm to the touch. Then again it was made of gold, 
though she swore she could feel some arcane technology buzzing within. You'll need it, it saved my life more than once during the last attack. Atra looked at him curiously, but attached it to her breast regardless. Perhaps there was something strange in the little golden bird, or perhaps it was as Aishvan was fond of saying. The Emperor protects. Let's get into the story. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 12 Treachery and Contempt Atra, Matthias, and a number of the new captains were soon assembled inside one of the command bunkers a few rings back from the walls. It was still largely intact, although the manticore battery on its top was currently undergoing repairs. It had suffered a direct hit during the first attack, which had melted through one of the main support joints and caused it to collapse. As they entered, Atra shivered as she watched the servitors hauling in materials, and the inhuman tech priests performing the rituals of repair and reconstruction. Inside, she recognized several former sergeants she had fought alongside, now elevated to higher rank just as she was. The few former officers remaining were there as well, and she noted each in turn. She had never had the good fortune of serving directly under them, but heard from reputation that each one was competent, brave, and loyal. There were six captains here, each with an adjutant. Each one seemed uncomfortable in their new uniform, with faintly humming Aquila. It was somewhat reassuring to know that she wasn't alone and dreading her new command. To her surprise, it was not Morn standing ready to direct their efforts, but rather Aishvan. The salamander quickly explained that his battle brother was currently in conference with the forces of the Manufactorum and naval elements, working to increase security and recover the sunken titan. Atra was amazed to hear that the god machine was still functional, and apparently continuing the fight alongside the submarine elements. Then again, considering the arcane and incredible technologies used in its creation, should she have been? Aishvan began to explain the situation. As you know, we recently repelled the first probing attack from the Xenos. Thanks to the intervention of the Titan and your own remarkable courage and stoicism, we accomplished a decisive defense. However, it has become clear that the initial attack was in fact a distraction. During the battle, a number of Xenos known as Genostilos infiltrated the Underhive. To make matters worse, during the battle the equivalent of a brigade also defected. We believe them to have been infested, a sort of Xenos human hybrid who have now shown their true colors. Atra sucked in a breath. The Xenos were capable of something like that? She had read the infantryman's uplifting guide, and it had described certain types of Xenos capable of controlling humans. The Enslavers, a race of heretical Xenos which used unstable seekers as gateways from their worlds to the Imperium came to mind. But a union of alien and human flesh, particularly something as alien as the Tyranid? It caused her blood to boil and her stomach to churn in disgust. Aishvan continued. The enemy forces are primarily comprised of these traitorous guardsmen and similar hybrids, their armaments will be slightly below your own as they will be relying on stolen equipment. We have confirmed that they do not have any tank support, and a large number of the cultists will be using primitive or improvised weapons such as stubbers. However, they will be linked by the hive mind, and thus have an advantage in command and control. However, he warned. They do possess a number of highly dangerous bioforms. Firstly, the infiltration consisted primarily of pure strain genostealers. While they are relatively few in number, they are intelligent, adept at stealth, and extremely dangerous in close combat. They are most likely led by broodlords, particularly large and dangerous bioforms that also possess psionic abilities. The enemy general is most likely a genostealer patriarch. A particularly dangerous psionic bioform. Atra nodded. So despite their Xenos blood, they would be like fighting most rebels, under-equipped but numerous. Unlike most rebels though, they would be highly coordinated. She began to run over potential threats. Mines and traps would be a certainty, as would ambushes. The broodlords would be the most significant threat. A single hive tyrant had managed to butcher several of her veteran squads and had been destroyed more due to luck than anything else. These creatures wouldn't necessarily be as powerful, but their ability to evade detection meant they wouldn't be able to engage it until it was practically on top of them. Aishvan then gave each of them their assignments. As Atra suspected, he proposed a methodical approach. 
Each captain would take command of a spur tip which would push into the underhive along one of the six main spires. Each brigade would have additional support from arbites and gangs to help navigate the area. The brigades would largely be expected to clear traitor guardsmen resistance themselves, but would receive some heavy support elements from the Mechanicus. Atra grinned at the mention of heavy support. The manufacturers of Alvaro were primarily dedicated to creating seafaring vessels for the Imperium, particularly the Paracles, for which they possessed something called an STC. However, they did manufacture a few land-based vehicles. Most notably, the wider machine cult had Grand Alvaro dispensation to create a specific, ancient tank uniquely suited to conflicts on the massive bridges and inside the Great Hives, the defender pattern of the Malkada heavy tank. Even a single Malkada would prove an incredible boom in this mission, and the defender pattern, while originally developed for use against the orcs, would be perfect for engaging the tyrannid hordes in these tighter quarters. As the meeting drew to a close, Aetra nodded to Matthias, and the two retreated to plan with their Arbides and Ganger attachments. Aishvan prepared to return to some other duty, but paused when he spotted a pair of Gangers conversing. One of them had a tattoo on his arm, which was nothing special, if not for what it was. It was a grey shark, with tail curved so it nearly reached the head and formed a circle. Aishvan approached the gangers curiously. You, what is that on your arm? He asked the man, pointing to the tattoo. Oh. The man said with surprise, having either not noticed the space marine, an impressive feat or actively resisted noticing him in hopes he wasn't coming over to him. Uh, that gov? It's a keratin. Cause I'm with the keratins. There's a gang around there. We got dragged up by the bobbies over yonder and they told us we'd be crumped if we weren't there to guide the guard down to smash up the bugger gits. Ashvan blinked, and was grateful he had his helmet. Keratin? Do you mean a car keratin? He asked, wondering now both on the origin of the symbol and the addition of orc slang to the ganger's vocabulary. Uh, no governor I don't think so. What would a Karkaroden even be? He asked, looking towards his friend for support. The other ganger shrugged. I dunno, sounds like a proper hard and great big Karadon to me, like a space marine Karadon. Emperor, that'd be something to see. Actual Karadons, uh, they're a great big fish bugger, bout as wide as a jit and twice as long, mouth full of teeth that is governor. The ganger explained somewhat nervously. They're a right proper batch of scrappers, hate to be on the bad side of a car keratin. Indeed you would. I try to avoid it myself. Aishvan responded, then walked away with a smile. As he did so, he vox Constantine. Brother, was this planet attacked by orcs during its history perchance? The Templar was silent for a moment, then responded. Yes roughly two millennia ago. They laid siege to the major hives before the wog was defeated by the efforts of the Karkarad Nastra? Aishvan ventured a guess. Constantine was silent for a long moment longer. Yes. How did you know that? I'll tell you later. Aishvan replied, and ended the connection. It took another few hours for the forces to be properly assembled, scouting parties to be sent out, and divisions reorganized into their new formations. It was a frenzied few hours, as Atra and Matthias set to work planning, and then Matthias set to work politicking to acquire the additional war gear they would need. Once that was accomplished, their brigade and attached support elements moved into the depths. Atra's forces were not insubstantial. Leading the way were 60 guardsmen, divided into 6 squads, each one led by a newly promoted sergeant. Each one was also accompanied by either an Arbites or gang member which served as guide, and a servitor equipped to disarm mines or other traps. They advanced slowly and cautiously, maintaining constant radio contact. In the second wave marched various reactive elements, ready to deploy as needed. There were two squads of Ogrims and one of the larger Bulgrins, as well as two squads of veterans equipped with shotguns and flamers. Aetra and her command squad, including Matthias, marched here as well. It had taken quite a bit of effort from the former captain, but each member of the command squad was now equipped with a plasma gun. Aitra had learned her lesson from the battle in the tower. 
Metalus might be supremely effective at killing things, but with their relatively short range they would be too slow to reach the enemy, and if they failed to kill it the squad was almost certainly lost. In this position, they would quickly respond with devastating firepower towards any larger bioform that showed itself. Finally, bringing up the rear came the heavy support. Trundling along, at times struggling to fit through the tight corridors of the underhive, a veritable rolling fortress, bristling with firepower. No less than seven heavy bolters protruded from its sponsoons, and a mighty devastator cannon swept from side to side on its turret. Towering over even the Ogrins, and covered in more heavy armor than even a lemon rus, it was the Malkada Defender, a venerable and devastating heavy tank. While not so heavily armed as a banner blade, or as well armored as a land raider, it was perfect for this situation. About it came the red-robbed cybernetic defenders of the Manifactorum, the Skittery, and with them an Angisir to maintain the machine. Atra had also ordered a heavy weapons squad armed with Laskinans to move alongside the tank in the event they required anti-tank firepower. They proceeded into the underhive slowly, almost agonizingly so. Outside they could hear the dull sloshing of the tides against the great pillars of the hive, dark waters where even now submarines and a titan wage war against the aquatic Xenos. The air was thick with the stench of a hive city's waste, even through her gas mask Atra could smell it. The stink was occasionally punctuated by the smell of mildew, as the marching troops splashed through the damp tunnels. Strange things skittered and lurched, mutants, insects, and unwholesome things. Each one was responded to with a volley of lasgan fire, each area carefully checked for traps. Yet despite this, it was quiet. The underhive was a festering jungle, full of rejected life, but now it was silent. New predators had entered the jungle, fearsome enough that all the madness cast off by society could not crush them. So they hid, and they waited for the two sets of intruders to clash and destroy one another. Fortunately, they were only headed into the shallows of the underhive, just a few hundred meters below the waves where the Jenna Steelers had entered the city. Here in these shallows there was toxic sludge and leaks and mutants and gangers and all manner of other uncomfortable things, but at least it wasn't the depths. Not even the gangers and arbites went that far down, down past where the sigils of the Imperium still held some fundamental sway, save for isolated chapels preserved by ghosts. Down where the truly mad and horrific things were born, lived, and died kilometers beneath the waves in the great spire pillars. Nobody knew what lay at the basest portion of the hive, at the sea floor, and perhaps beneath. Legend said the hive tunneled beneath the sea floor, dredging up magma from the planetary core to power arcane machinery which upheld the hives. Rumors spoke of men of clockwork and brass, of technology forgotten, and symbols that predated even the Imperium. But many say many foolish things, and such heretical whispers were dealt with swiftly. Still, nobody went down that deep, not even the Xenos were that mad. Still, the rumors and tales of nameless things, things forgotten, and things erased still permeated upwards. Ghost stories were bad enough, ghost stories when they actually were fighting monsters that lived in the dark were unacceptable. Atra monitored the communications of her men carefully, keeping an ear and rebuking senseless chatter sharply. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 12.5, Treachery and Contempt Part 2. After a few hours of careful exploration, during which they disarmed no fewer than 28 booby traps, mines, and other obstacles without any major casualties, they entered a large waste processing area. Here things opened, as pipes ran across a broad steel floor and among a web of such in the ceiling. Towards the back of the room stairs led upwards to some sort of expansive control center, set like a bunker onto a plateau of permacrete and iron railings. Across the floor, servitor and servo skull parts lay scattered, blood and oil staining the already dirty surface. Towards the back of the room the scouts could see sandbags and other defensive emplacements, but they appeared to be unmanned. This reeks of a trap. Aethra growled, looking around. I agree. Matthias agreed. Though the question is what to do about it. We've yet to encounter the enemy, and if we cause them to attack when they expect us to be surprised, we may be able to take advantage of their overconfidence. Agreed, though we don't know how many forces are concentrated here. 
Get on the Vox Hailer and see if we can establish contact with the other formations. Atra ordered. Matthias complied, and they soon established contact. Formations Beta and Gamma had engaged the enemy, but encountered only minor resistance, and were quickly rolling through. Formation Delta was out of contact, and Formation Epsilon reported that they were currently engaging notable Xenos and traitor forces, but were having some success, before the transmission failed. Atra frowned, cursed at the Vox Haler, kicked it, and sighed. The Tetch Priest examined it and reported, aside from a minor dent, it was perfectly functional. Atra swore that it was glaring at her, but its eyes were mechanical, and she had a hard time reading them. Right. This is almost certainly some kind of ambush, but we might be able to turn the scales on them. Listen up. She then quickly explained her plan to the staff. If we trigger it, then this will give us a better chance, if it's not a trap, we can link up and press on. She looked up at the ganger and the tech priest. Can you make this work? The ganger, a heavily scarred giant who looked like he was half ogrin, cracked his neck. Gov, these places are a balmy mess and we're likely to be running into the buggers. Even with the support you're after it's a mess, could be a bit slow. The tech priest pondered for a time, then nodded. It can be accomplished if there is a point to establish point of contact. It replied. Right. What do you mean by a point to establish point? Atra asked. Beacon. Signal. Flare. Pharos. Sign. Has to be non-visual. Would something broadcasting vox work? Yes. The tech priest replied. Atra nodded and pulled her spare vox bead from her front pocket. She had been given a more advanced one following her promotion, but kept the old one. The tech priest took it and quickly examined and tweaked it, before handing it back. Activate. We'll produce point. We'll burn out battery and need replacing. Atra nodded. Understood, I'll get it fixed up after we're done here. Then she rose. Alright. You have your orders. God Emperor willing I'm just being paranoid, but if not, then let's kill some bloody Xenos. The plan set into motion. Two squads moved forwards cautiously up the center of the large room, while two more moved along the flanks close behind them. The remaining two squads moved up further behind them, keeping hidden but ready to rush forwards. Alongside them the Ogrins waited, grinning stupidly. They were going to get to squish more bugs. Atra waited besides them with her command squad. They were planning to ambush an ambush. It wouldn't do for the scheme to be ruined by the stupid abhumans. Matthias waited not far from her, with the special weapons teams around him. He checked the lenses on his LAS pistols, and double checked the power packs and his spares. He nodded to his captain, who returned it with a slight incline of her head. Her eyes were fixed on the men and on the elevated platform. Her stomach churned, her body felt cold and hot all at once, and she tasted bile in the back of her throat. Yet in spite of this her mind was calm and cold. Adrenaline roared through her veins. Her hand itched, grasping faintly for the handle of her chain's ward or plasma gun. Her breaths were slow and steady. As the first two squads drew near, the expected occurred. Once they were within range, traitors dressed in guardsmen uniforms burst from the command center and began to lay down fire on the advancing squads. The moment the enemy showed themselves, Matthias activated his vox bead and sent a one word warning, confirm. The infantry received and fell back smoothly, just as they had planned. By the time the enemy was firing, they were already in cover behind the pipes and valves. They began to return fire in good order as the enemy presented themselves, downing several overeager traitors. Four traitor squads had revealed themselves to the two scouts, forcing the loyalists to hunker down. Two pairs of the hybrids rushed to waiting heavy bolters, and the sergeants ordered their squads further back as the mass reactive shells began to punch through cover and into flesh. But even as the center began to execute an orderly retreat, the flanks pressed in while their comrades distracted the enemy. On the left flank, they moved over easier terrain and so managed to close the distance quickly. The sergeant gave the order, and each man seized a fragmentation grenade from his belt. As one, they pulled the pins and hurled the grenades up onto the enemy. The hybrid scattered, as a wave of explosions tore their defensive position apart, shredding through the Xeno scum. 
The squad on the left rushed to cover as the enemy rallied and began suppressing their position. Their revelation set the enemy to watch their other flank as well, and the heavy bolt roared to life. Fortunately for that squad, the terrain which slowed them also provided cover thick enough to resist the mass reactive shells. Then the smoke turned, and Atra's hand dropped. The Ogrims let out a shout of glee and charged forwards, slab shields raised and mauls ready. The command squad moved not far behind. Across from them, Matthias ordered the special weapons teams on forwards even faster. Their timing was perhaps even a moment soon, a hasty decision based on snap reactions. They rushed forwards into position somewhat heedlessly of cover, focused entirely on speed. It was still too late, and they were still too slow. From the smoke burst humanoid horrors, the pure strain. Here the Xeno stood in all its revolting glory, leaping and bounding with terrific speed. They were disgusting creatures, vaguely humanoid with oversized wrinkly heads and mouths full of sharpened teeth and purple tongues. Their bodies were covered in leathered, wrinkly hides and chitinous plating. They moved on four limbs, human-like hands at the end of the forelimb, clawed feet at the rear. From where their shoulders met their back rose two crooked insectoid limbs, each tipped with a set of three razor-sharp claws. Atra knew that they were deadly in melee, and that they were swift, but having never faced them, was utterly unprepared for just how swift. They moved unnaturally swiftly, leaping across the gap and crossing over the obstacles in seconds. The guardsmen attempted to retreat, but caught off guard by their speed and sudden appearance, they were slow moving. One fell behind as two pounced on him. He vanished under a storm of fang and rending, flesh and armor shredded like paper. The Jenna Steelers caught four more, ripping them off their feet. There were brief, piercing screams as they were dragged back into the oncoming horde, and then silence as they were torn to pieces. The fifth one to fall grabbed the other grenade and pulled the pin, and the explosion halted the Xenos for a moment, allowing the rest of the squad to escape. Go. 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 Atra shouted. The two reserve squads raced up ahead of the Ogrins and opened fire. Red LAS blasts crossed the distance in an instant, forcing the Jenna Steelers to dodge behind cover, allowing the mangled squad to pull back. The Ogrins started to charge, but Atra ordered a halt. You lot. Left. She ordered, pointing to the left. To the left, there were of course, more Jenna Steelers. They had raced in to flank the retreating squad, but now pushed on to counter the counter assault. Their sheer numbers would be enough to overwhelm even the mighty Ogrins, but fortunately for the Abhumans, Matthias was about to reduce that advantage. All ranks. Up and fire. He roared as the flamer teams raced into range. Raising his pistols, he opened fire, blasting two perfect holes through two Jenna Steeler faces. The battle cries of the Xenos were drowned out by the whoosh of Promethelium, as the flamer teams unleashed their fury. Even the agile Xenos could not escape the flame, and their limited armor and weak frames were perfect targets for a Promethean baptism. They pivoted in their charge smoothly towards the flamers, charging without any concern for their own safety. The Ogrims charged, too stupid to fear the flame, not that they needed to. Their heavy armor, sheer bulk and resilient slab shields would render the flamers virtually useless against them. They crashed into the splintering Jenna Steeler swarm and utterly shattered it, crushing the frail Xenos with swings of their mighty mauls. But as they moved to finish the creatures, they staggered, looking about in a daze. Then a shadow moved from the periphery and was among them. In a blow two heads went flying from their necks, dazed and confused expressions still on their faces. The bone head, an Ogren sergeant, had enough presence of mind to raise his shield, and it spared him a moment more. The thing struck his mighty slab shield, digging into the permacrete and sticking. The creature paused for a moment, and Atra took it in. It was a massive creature, even taller than the Ogrins, even taller than Aishman, yet with a slight frame. It was built like the Jenna Steelers, but instead of having human-like hands, it had two mantis-like blades at the end of its second set of appendages. It was covered in heavier bony armor, but moved even more swiftly. Clearly this was this brood's lord. Atra grit her teeth and raised her weapon command, take aim. She ordered. In the moment it took the command squad to raise their weapons and charge them, the bonehead died. 
the Broadlord jerked its embedded arm to the side, pulling the shield away from the adult Abhuman's body. The scything talon struck, severing both of the Ogryn's arms, and then the other claw swept across and cut the unfortunate's bony head from his bulky body. However, the time it took it to slaughter the Ogryn squad cost the monster its own existence. Fire. Atra roared. The command squad's plasma gun screamed, blue fire crossing the gap between the monster and themselves in an instant. Even at this virtually point-blank range, the creature moved with almost supernatural speed. It evaded Atro's own blast, but the second struck it in the leg. The bone armor was vaporized, and the creature began to fall. The remaining blast struck it across its midsection, and it exploded in a flash of blood and plasma. The remaining nine ogrins staggered back to their feet. Go around, smash the bugs. Atra ordered them, waving them around. Third squad pull back and move up the center. Fifth, cover them. Command and fourth on me. Second, left back and grenade off their cover. Matthias, forwards to support the Ogrins. With that, Atra started venting her plasma as she moved forwards to flank the Jenna Steelers. Matthias chuckled. Yep. She's perfect for commanding the big guys. Then he ordered his men forwards and led the way, less pistols blasting. The overextended Xenos attempted to pull back, as Matthias led the flame squads and the Ogrins towards their position. Second squad unleashed fury into them from the flank, and Atra charged in from the side. The surviving heavy bolter turned its blast towards her. The first shot went through a pipe and deflected to the side, the second whipped past her head, and the third seemed ready to strike home when it deflected against a crackling energy shield. Plasma. LAS, and Flamer Blast alike utterly destroyed the overextended formation. A single smoldering Xeno raced into range, Talons lunging for the command squad. Atra slipped her plasma gun to her side and her chains ward roared. The Xeno stepped back from her initial strike, countering with its claws. Atra shifted her foot and grip, bringing her blade into a relentlessly practiced defense. With a snap, the Jenna Steeler's claws went flying mangled stumps remaining, before Atra cut down, severing the Xeno's head from its body in a bloody spray. You're slow. She commented, before ducking behind cover. The enemy's counterthrust shattered, Atra ordered the Ogrins forwards. First and second squad moved up behind them, using the bulky Abhumans as cover. Fourth and the remains of third held back with the Flamer squads, ready for another counterattack. All the while 5th and 6th squad hammered suppressing fire onto the Xenos. As the Abhumans began to climb the stairs, Atra grinned. Victory was so very near. And then doom fell upon the brigade. A wave of sickness, dread and despair that radiated out from the control center. Atra leaned on the pipe she was taking cover behind, breathing heavily. Another member of command squad collapsed, retching. Then the discomfort grew worse. A screaming gnashing, the chanting roaring of a thousand minds falling upon their own. Discomfort turned to pain, pain turned to agony, and it struck the whole brigade as one. The Ogrin stopped, then turned. They raised their mauls, and brought them down on their own allies. They moved clumsily, jerkily, like puppets on strings, but against the crippled squads it was enough. The Jenna Steelers began to fire casually taking their time to line up kill shots on the helpless guardsmen. Atra struggled to raise herself up, and looked into a face of death, looming above the Ogrins. At the peak of the stairs was a gargantuan Jenna Stealer, larger even than the Bloodlord. It walked about on four limbs, while its upper two directed its minions. It was covered in thick black plating, and seemed to shimmer as she looked upon it. The more she looked at it, the greater the pain felt. A thousand screaming gnashing minds, bound together in an avatar of psionic power, scraping against her mind. She tried to move her limbs, but they would not respond. The Ogrins drew nearer, having finished massacring the squads nearest to them. So this was the Patriarch. Atra cursed it in her mind. She could still think, still feel, but her mind seemed trapped inside her own body. This level of psychic might was unlike anything she had even considered. The power of the hive tyrant had been direct and brutal, tearing her men apart. This was worse, an insidious evil that plumbed the cracks of her mind and held her helpless before the swarm. 
She fell to her knees, limbs shaking. Her gums bled. Her eyes felt like they were going to explode. The ogrins were getting closer. Atra pitied them. Poor creatures. Not even fully human. Now puppets for the vile Zeno. For a moment a treacherous thought crossed her mind. Give up. Give in. Perhaps you will live. Even if you do not, then the pain will end. No mind to understand she was about to die. No more screaming agony. Not even the pain of a maul crushing her skull. No. Almost as soon as soon as the idea crossed her, her mind it was rejected. Violently. That was treachery. Heresy. A fire lit in her soul. And her fists clenched. She raised up her head. Then staggered. Almost drunkenly to her feet. She would die. Yes. But all men died. She brought to mind Constantine, standing alone upon the bridge against the swarm, Wathin, leaping from the gate to destroy a titan, Ishvan, fighting in the dark alongside fellow guardsmen, even risking his life to protect her, Morn, standing implacable among the storm, Andriel, whose powers exposed him to suffering like this each day. She was no Astartes. She was merely mortal, but they had chosen her considered her worthy to stand alongside them even if only for a time. She rose, facing the patriarch. Its powers were too great to allow her to raise her weapon, but she had one last card to play. Its power seemed to focus on her, as she reached into her pocket for the vox bead. It hammered down on her, trying to force her to her knees, but she would not die kneeling. The agony intensified, but she bore it with bitter contempt. Her face twisted into a sneer, as she drew out the vox bead and activated it. Her mind burned, the screaming golden heart, and she armored herself in all her duty, in all her hatred, in all her contempt. She took a step forwards. This thing, this worm, this subhuman animal dared to come to her planet, to her city, to corrupt her men, to kill her soldiers, to elicit such heretical thoughts from her mind? Her fury and contempt burned golden and consumed her so utterly that she could no longer feel the pain of the psychic attack. She met the patriarch's gaze, human purple eyes burning into alien ones. For the emperor. She screamed, with such vitriol that her throat bled. She raised up the vox bead, and cast it forwards. The bead landed with a faint, anticlimactic clack at the patriarch's feet. The Xeno looked down to evaluate the threat and looked up at Atra. Through its cyclic attack, she could sense confusion. Then an explosion rocked the room, as the wall to the left of the command center vanished in the brilliant flare of a melted charge. The patriarch turned to face this new threat, when a second, deeper boom sounded through the room, followed by the roar of a rocket. Instants later, a demolisher cannon round punched through the smoke, and the side of the command room, into the patriarch's chest. The monster went flying off to the side, before the round burst, scattering it into a thousand pieces. Roaring out of the smoke, the Malkada defender came. Atra had ordered it to outflank the enemy. Using the modified Vox Bead as its signal, they struck the enemy with their mightiest blow when it was least expected. Roaring into the stunned cultists, the heavy bolters mounted all across its chassis opened fire in all directions. The hybrids died like flies. With this overwhelming threat in their heart and the death of their god, the cult broke and fled. With the spell broken, Atra screamed to pursue them, chasing after them with chainsword raised and bloody murder in her eyes. It took the combined efforts of the command squad and Matthias to hold the blood-mad captain back and sit her down. By the god emperor. Atra you're bleeding out of your ears stop and get some medical attention before you run off and get eaten. Matthias begged her as he held her chainsword arm back and desperately evaded the roaring blade. A few moments later the divine, through from what god is somewhat questionable, rage subsided and Atra sat down groggily. She was in fact bleeding quite badly from her ears, eyes, nose, and mouth, and her whole body ached. Her eyes in particular ached, and she was having trouble seeing. Intense pressure from the Xenos witchcraft results in damage to capillaries throughout the body particularly the head. Commonly accepted side effect of resisting psychic powers. Metal eyes the Tetch priest explained. Particularly prevalent in blood vessels around eyes. Vision likely hampered by 17%. Replacements or visual aids will be required. It explained, injecting her with an anesthetic. 
Thanks cog boy. Guess I'll put my new officer's pay towards glasses. Atra grumbled. Also, where's the actual medic? I'm not a tank. Company medic was eaten by Jenna Steelers. You are not a tank. You are a biological machine. Also, I am a woman. Metal Eyes explained. Wait, what? Atra asked as she looked up. She examined the tech priest more closely. I couldn't tell. Also I didn't think you lot really were men or women. Just, you know, metal. The flesh is weak, but we are men and women. Metal Eyes explained. She pulled back her hood, revealing brown hair mixed in with wires, and the tanned skin of an alvaran. The flesh is weak, but humanity is not. Anything without humanity is an abomination. Ha. Huh. Atra grunted, still woozy from her headache, and also now the painkillers. Ah, shit. I never got your name. To be honest I, well I didn't think you had one. I am Mara Cognus. The tech priest explained, then offered her hand to shake. Atra shook it. The hand was cold, but not inhuman. Sorry about that, it was, I suppose quite rude. To be honest you lot scare the shit out of me most days, not sure why we're talking. You are exhausted, have suffered a head injury, and are on painkillers. Mara replied. Your adrenaline response is also entirely spent for the moment. You are physically incapable of being afraid. Query, why do you normally produce a fear response? Not sure. You just don't seem human, and you're also always with those servitors. Atra shivered. I know those were people once, the thought of something like that. Same fear that let me fight the attack I think. You fear servitude perpetuous. This is good. It is meant to be this way, and only a deficient would not. Myra agreed. The fear is necessary, as is their function. Both are required to maintain the machine of the Imperium. Yeah, I get that, don't like it all the same. I am not fond of waste disposal systems. They remain necessary. These ones will require extensive repairs considering the damage inflicted by driving a heavy tank through them. Hep, fair enough. I am pleased to see you appear to remain sane. Your actions had produced doubt as to that fact. Uh, crazy like a fox? What is a fox? I have no idea, but apparently they're very clever but also crazy. I must find a fox and evaluate it. Good luck with that. First, let's get these bugs off our planet. Agreed. First you must sleep though. Mara replied, and then injected her with something else. Atra regained consciousness looking at the ceiling. Her headache had diminished to a dull roar, and she had full function again. She was thinking clearly, and her first thought was it's a damn good thing I'm a captain now or I'd be shot for sleeping on the job. The benefits of command, and having subordinates who also know how to do the job. Matthias remarked. Oh, you're still alive, thank the emperor. Atra said as she sat up from the bedroll and looked around. They were in the control center of the room the battle had taken place in. You're a good shot with those pistols by the way. Lots of dueling practice, and I'm not crazy enough to try to resolve my honor with a chain sword. Matthias explained. Don't knock it until you've spent a week practicing how to hold it properly. Bloody space marines, they're insane. They're as good as the story say, but they are completely insane. Matthias chuckled. I was considering writing a report for you but I'll give you the short version. We're winning, handily. Cut off the head and the body will wither is as true for the Tyanids as it is for Orcs. It's less the body withering and more the body fighting itself to the death trying to be the new head with green skins. Atra noted, then cracked her neck. Glad to hear it. Make sure they know who gets the credit. Roger that. I've been trying to hail Lord Morn, but I can't get through. He explained. We're fairly far down, that's to be expected. How long was I out? About 4 hours. Metal eyes. Uh, Mara said you'd need fluids and nutrient paste when you woke up, even though you probably won't be hungry for the next couple of days. Couple of days? What did she hit me with? Something they use on skittery I suppose. Puts them under so you can repair them. How the hell did we owe right Jenna Steelers? Right. Let's move back up a few floors and try it there. I'll eat on the way. 
she grumbled, reaching into her pack and retrieving a few tubes of nutrient paste and her canteen. She drank both on her way back up the hive. Supposedly officers ate better. Maybe it was more nutritious paste, but it was the same flavorless goo as ever. As she washed it down, she pondered whether the better eating was in fact just higher quality alcohol to wash the goo down with. As they traversed back further up the spire, accompanied by Matthias's squad and command, the Vox Haler crackled into life. Repeat, Victor is attempting to terminate the astropathic choir, unable to contain. Request immediate support. Morn's voice crackled through. Atra quietly felt her bowels sink into her feet, but she did her duty. Roger that Lord Morn, my brigade is on its way. Atra replied. Command, with me, Matthias, vox the others and get them to cover our clean up, then get the rest of the brigade up to support. Matthias stared. The entire brigade? Even the tank? Yes the entire brigade. The Astartes are calling for backup. If I had a titan I'd bring that too. Atra growled, then turned and raced with command towards the nearest lift towards the upper spire. She voxed back as she ran. Mara, can you potentially get a salamander towards our entry point? I need to get to the astropathic choir immediately. You what? Mara asked in genuine confusion. Atra explained the situation and the tech priest replied. I do not have the authority to requisition a vehicle, but I will inform Imagos that Tech Priest Morn is in jeopardy. You'll need to come up a few levels. No. The Defender's Voxcaster has not been kicked, and is functioning better. Mara explained, then cut the connection. Bloody cog boy, cog girl. Atra grumbled as she continued running up the spire. A few minutes later, Mara hailed her. I cannot provide a salamander, but the Margos has negotiated for a Valkyrie to meet you. Roger that, I owe you one Mara. We do our duty, but if we are counting, you owe me four. One for this, one for repairing you, two for tolerating your rudeness and potential insanity. Atra was very quiet for a moment, before Mara replied. That was a joke. Atra breathed a sigh of relief. Mara, when the bugs are gone. We're gonna have to take a moment to discuss the finer points of humor. I look forward to it Captain Atra. Also, there is a lift shaft 20 meters to your south. Enjoy your flight. Atra quickly took the lift upwards, raced another 2 miles up the spire, and came, breathing heavily, to the exit point. Outside, a Valkyrie waited for them, and they quickly piled in. As they flew, one of Atra's squad made a comment. Plasma. Volk transport, chatting with tech priests and crazy plans to kill things we never thought existed. Captain for less than a day and you're turning us into Tempestus. You don't want to be Tempestus Sam, Atra grumbled. They have to deal with this kind of bullshit all the time. Rural is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races. 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out and if you decide to buy the app use promo code NICKBEDIA for 10% off and it lets them know we sent you. It's a great sponsor and a great app and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 13, Preparations for the Hunt. As Atra underwent her preparations and trial beneath the city, the Astartes prepared to hunt their own quarry. As their superhuman physiology restored their injuries, Wathin and Constantine sat and plotted. Or at least Wathin was plotting. Constantine rather fumed, largely in the silent, brooding way which is the manner of the Sons of Dawn. Wathin took note of this and raised the point. You're bored out of your mind aren't you laddie? I am not bored, merely unused to stagnancy. Constantine grumbled. Even when we wait for the enemy to come, or on the ships to reach the enemy, there is preparation, meditation, training, the construction of defenses. This, 
Immobility is unsettling. You bored. Wathin summarized. And perhaps a bit over eager for battle. One can never be too eager to smite the enemies of the Emperor. One can if it breeds discontentment with peace, or costs you. Blood is the Emperor's currency, it must be spent well. Indeed, but I think you are overly cautious in this regard. We slew a bio titan, what is a single crawling xeno after that? We killed the titan because it didn't consider us. Things like that are made to kill cities and other titans. It doesn't give anything smaller than a tank notice, because nothing smaller than that is even a minor threat to it in most circumstances. In the Xeno's defense, I doubt even an actual titan would have expected that particular maneuver. True, as the old sagas say again and again, cunning is a greater weapon than strength, and unpredictability is better than bowl shells. You are a veritable fountain of proverbs old one. Comes packaged with the gray hair and longer fangs. Wathin grinned, displaying said elongated canines. But to return to the topic, we defeated the titan because the titan was not meant to kill us, and did not consider us. Elictor, he frowned. That is an entirely different kind of creature, more equivalent to you and I. It is a hunter unlike any other in the galaxy, and it is built to kill us. If we are over eager or arrogant, it will. Constantine heard the words of the elder marine and saw they were tinged with bitter experience. Taking this under consideration, he nodded. Very well, I retract my accusation of overcautiousness. I have seen you are utterly fearless, to the point of insanity, and if you consider the Xeno such a threat, I will heed you. Insanity is relative. Wathin said with a shrug. Crazy like a wolf so the saying goes. I thought it was like a fox. What in the Owl Father's name is a fox? A form of ancient Terran canid, they were transported in early colony ships and spread throughout the galaxy, same as the other forms of canid. They were known as symbols of trickery on my world and many others I have fought upon. HM, interesting. Tell me of your world. I know that the Black Templars are drawn from many, and each one seems somewhat different. It is of little note. Constantine said with a shrug. It is a primitive one, brought within the Emperor's light shortly after I was born. It is ruled by warrior nobles, who gather forth and train skilled warriors for their youth to defend the people, for they were frequently raided by a vile Xeno species. The inhabitants called them the Drachii, the Dark Fairies, but I believe they were actually that corrupted subspecies of Elder. Curious. It actually sounds as though you may have something in common with Andriel. How so? Constantine bristled. Your world sounds quite similar to how the tales say Caliban was. But as it was destroyed in the Great Heresy, I believe the Lion's sons draw from similar worlds now. He does not act like it. Constantine noted. Nor does he move like one trained from birth. He is a start, a warrior of course, but not of the same caliber and origin. Well he is a sicker. Wathin said with a shrug. Perhaps. But there is something unusual in that one's origins besides his witchcraft. Bah, he's a lion's son, they all have secrets, but it's no secret that they have their secrets, which makes me think the tales they don't tell aren't half as interesting as they'd like to believe. Why bother with all the blatant skullduggery then? It does not befit a starts. Mystery is a powerful force, if it is known that an enemy has many secrets and knows many things, you will endeavor to uncover them. But if the blatantly hidden secrets are what you are focused on, you will not know what tales you hear are truth and which are deception, and the true secrets will remain hidden as you uncover paltry things. In this they maintain the advantage of deception and surprise. On which all warfare is based. Yes, such a thing does make sense. They are almost like the raven guard in that regard, but rather than denying sight they deny knowledge. Cunning. Constantine nodded with newfound respect. Albeit somewhat convoluted. The Emperor has many tools. Sometimes he needs an axe, sometimes a hammer, sometimes a blade. Wathin said with a shrug. Each legion is a weapon in the Alfather's arsenal, so that no enemy will be beyond his ken, and nothing shall escape his wrath. Not forever. Constantine growled. Wathin raised an eyebrow, but sensed a sore spot on the young warrior's honor. He did not pry, but rather diverted. Tell me, 
How did your chapter come to honor you by offering your vigil upon the Death Watch? Wathin asked. HM. In truth I am not sure. I am by no means the most skill slayer of the Xenos within the Eternal Crusade. I am inexperienced, having not even raised a single neophyte, and I approach only the first century of my service. I possess talent with the bleed, this much is true, but my battles against the Xenos have not seen any great victory. Perhaps a certain talent or record against the Elder? Wathin suggested. As befits your origin. I have participated in campaigns against the Elder, both the Corrupted and the Merely Xenos, but I saw no particular success there. The nearest thing to that would be engaging one of their raid leaders, but he escaped me, and in truth I was outmatched by his skill. How did you know? You fight like you've fought them a great deal, and studied them in particular. You're sort of like an Alfenwenra, a berserker, but a different sort of trance. Sword trance, yes. It's somewhat rare and takes practice to activate, but it's nothing unusual, I simply learned it from my master, who learned it from his. Interesting. Perhaps when this is done, we shall hunt Elder together, I think I should like to see such a thing. Perhaps, if the Emperor wills it. Meanwhile, Ashvin concluded his meeting with Aethra and her group, then returned to one of his own projects. Heading back to near the Manufactorum, he entered a large room, formerly for storage, but recently reposed into an examination room. He was quite fortunate that Constantine had killed one of the tyrants so cleanly, the corpse was still mostly intact and waited now on the table. Its head was off to the side, while the main body slumped over the table. He decided to begin the dissection with the head, and he removed his gauntlets, replacing them with gloves to allow for finer movement. He then reached for a saw, and began to disassemble the Xenos. It was rougher work than he preferred, but necessary to understand the enemy on a more fundamental level. As he began to disassemble the brain, he happened upon something that gave him pause. He set his tools to the side and voxed Andriel. Brother Andriel, I think I may have discovered something interesting about the Tyranid physiology. Of course, I'll bring it up. He then removed his gloves, redonned his gauntlets, and carefully picked up the head. Andriel did a double take when he saw Aishvan approaching. He might have expected Wathin to arrive carrying the severed head of a hive tyrant, or possibly Constantine, but not the salamander. He was even more confused when he saw that the head was partially dissected, and approached the Devastator Marine with some concern. I did not take you for a xenobiologist. The librarian admitted, surprised at the grizzly trophy. I thought your chapter prided itself on crafting, not such endeavors. We construct many fine weapons and armors, this much is true, and metal is our specialty, but there are many weapons not made from iron. You and I for example are weapons forged from humanity and ancient sciences. Similarly, many of the Xenos are as much weapons themselves as wielders of weapons, and the Tyranid is a fine example of such. So you are seeking to understand the enemy's weapon by taking it apart. It makes sense, though it is still unexpected. Andriel conceded. I told you I had discovered something about their physiology, how do you think I did it? Just taking a bite? Aishvan joked. A fair point cousin, though if you were a flesh tearer perhaps. Perhaps, but in this case it was examination, not ingestion. I was examining its brain when I discovered something that looked rather familiar. He pointed to a set of lobes in the brain, which Andriel examined. The dark angel's eyebrows rose, and he looked back to his staff. Indeed. It has a psychic amplifier grown in. Andriel shook his head. The staff is only a focus. It actually constrains my abilities, forcing them into a pattern I desire. To wield the power of the warp is not really a question of power, there is enough there to drown a star, but rather one of control. Though the Tyranid Seeker does not draw its power directly from the warp like you do, it instead draws it from the hive mind. Though even this would naturally require focus, and also, there's this. He explained, pulling back a section of the skull to reveal a thin grey layer of almost fabric-like growth. Andriel suspected immediately, and reached out his senses towards it. The reaction, like a thick fog, confirmed his suspicions. It's a dampener, the same as my hood. Not altogether surprising considering its composition. 
Aishvan raised a finger to ask, then stopped. I don't want to know, and you wouldn't tell me even if I did, correct? Exceedingly so. Ah, as I suspected, well that confirms a hypothesis, and grants me a greater degree of concern over our quarry. What do you mean? It is a lictor specialized for hunting sickers, and the hive mind is capable of growing psychically dampening material on the interior of a hive tire and skull. A lictor operates as an ambush predator, would it not also contain an adaptation to conceal itself from its prey? Andriel scowled. Yes, that makes altogether too much sense. Unfortunately, I've never fought anything with skin that dampens psychic powers, so I have no idea just how effective such an adaptation would be. Well, it does offer one advantage. Aishvan replied cheerily. The stuff is highly flammable. Andriel chuckled. And I am once again reassured that I am speaking to a salamander. Though with your interest in such things, I am somewhat surprised that you are not an apothecary. Aishvan smiled broadly. You honor me brother, but I am far too young to be given such a responsibility. Perhaps I shall be granted it if I perform my vigil well, but I cannot say. Perhaps? The Dark Angel replied. Though you seem far more suited to this work than I. I am, in truth, not entirely certain why I was seconded. My service is not that much longer than yours. Aishvan shrugged. The hood makes you look older I suppose, and as for the method of choosing, I am uncertain. I volunteered, so that I might gain a greater understanding of our enemies and my battle brothers alike. Andriel smiled at the salamander's optimism. Well then brother, let us hope you do not find understanding of what it is to be killed by that enemy, it would be a great loss to the galaxy. The kill team Ray assembled an hour later, briefing a surf sadid Wathin and Constantine in Ray donning their armor. The only one not physically present was Andriel, who remained guarding the astropaths, and instead projected an image of himself into the room. Aishvan briefed the rest of the team on his findings and hypothesis about the Lictor's potential psychic resilience, to which Wathin let out a low whistle. Cunning, and nasty business besides. I knew they adapted but an adaptation on this scale, for this purpose? It reeks of intelligent design, not merely a helpful response to stimuli. Morn nodded. The intelligence of the hive mind is poorly understood. It is not impossible that it has the capacity to specifically craft a variant on the bioform to suit a specific purpose. A variant specifically designed to prey upon sickers is not an impossibility if they had previously encountered blanks or similar entities. I wasn't aware that the Xenos had souls to be soulless. Constantine admitted. You confuse the religious implication with the practical application. Andriel explained. A soul is very much a physical thing, simply existing within the immaterium. Everything that thinks has one, even if its thoughts are very basic. With the exceptions of blanks. Morn concurred. A null lictor. It is an interesting hypothesis. Andriel shook his head. It's not a null, the resistance is part of its makeup. A psychic hood effectively. He gestured to his own hood. This doesn't make me a null, it simply makes me more difficult to detect and resistance to warp energies. It wouldn't be completely immune, just difficult to pierce. We'll have to conduct a more extensive examination of the corpse. I'm curious to see if my hypothesis holds true. Aishvin explained. Though considering its threat level, I doubt there will be much of it remaining to examine. We can store the corpse and examine it in greater detail back on the Watch Fortress. Morn advised. If you hold true and it is a new variant bioform, it will need a new designation. A hooded lictor. Aishvan suggested. Simple, gets the point across. We'll have to see if it has an actual hood or that may raise a few questions. Constantine noted as he donned his helmet. I recommend warp smoke lictor. We can name it after we kill it. Morn stated practically. The Xenos resistance to psychic screen combined with the presence of the shadow in the warp denies us the arcane means of tracking, and so logic must suffice. He raised up a new map, showing the pattern of disappearances. It is working its way up the main spires, evading patrols and cameras, however, I have found a way to track its progress. A number of low-level sickers yet to be sanctified have been released under commissarial supervision to act as markers. 
when they go dark, it means that the lictor has moved by. Ashvan's expression was unreadable, watching the lights on the map closely. It occurs to me, if they are targeting sickers, would they not also potentially engage the containment cells? He asked, referring to the dungeons in which unsanctioned sickers were held until the black ships could arrive. Due to the effect of the shadow and the warp, the majority of said cells were purged. Those that remained were both the weakest and the most stable. All others either went mad or were given the Emperor's mercy before their powers could overwhelm them. Morn explained coldly. The ones currently deployed are all that remain. A pity. Ishvan noted. Still, their willingness to serve in such a condition does mark the remainder well. Even witches may serve the Emperor. They are tainted, but in duty there is penance. Constantine replied dogmatically. By the Emperor, that was almost tolerant of your brother. Andriel noted wryly. Cousin. I have had to adapt to my situation. You are still an abomination, but you are a start, and a member of my kill team. It is inevitable that your corrosive presence would force me to compromise, albeit temporarily. Andriel smirked under his hood, but Morn interrupted. You can continue your inane bickering in the transport back to the Watch Fortress. Look now, Sector 129, the light is gone out, we have our target. Aye. That we do. Or specs to maximum lads, we're on the hunt. Wathin growled, crinkling his sensitive nose. By this point the Astartes had become accustomed enough to the hive that they were able to move between the hab blocks and transport lanes with the ease of those who had lived there for a lifetime. In fact, considering the somewhat limited movements of many hive inhabitants, they probably knew the city better. Navigating through the tunnels at high speed, they moved towards the next likely target of the Lictor. As they traveled, they were briefly halted by a line of crackling light. The line expanded and Andriel stepped through the gate of infinity, cracking his next as he did so, and falling in with the rest of the team. Ishvan raised an eyebrow under his helmet. Teleporting onto a moving target, impressive. You all shine brighter than anything else in this city, bar the astropaths. Andriel replied. Wathin's axe in particular. Ishvan looked towards the space wolf curiously, who grinned and chuckled. Always bring a bit of home with you. He replied enigmatically. Particularly when your home's as potent a world as Fenris. Andriel looked at the space wolf quizzically. Your chapter doesn't call it sickers sickers does it? The rune priests aren't sickers in the usual sense. Their power comes from Fenris, not the warp. Even in the halo stars? Always bring a piece from home, and the runes always work, far as I can gather. I'm not a priest. Wathin replied with a shrug. They quickly approached the location of the next sicker, but found they had arrived too late. Wathin growled even as the supposedly secured room opened. The reek of blood was clear. The kill team entered quickly, looking about. It was an empty, formerly white room, with two chairs and nothing else. Formerly white, as it was now spattered with blood. The decapitated corpse of the sicker lay on the floor, though the head was nowhere to be found as usual. Nearby, the tattered remnants of a corpse lay scattered. Only the color of the shredded coat and still mostly intact fancy hat explained it was the remains of a commissar. Her severed arm, still holding their signature bolt pistol, lay against the opposite wall. She had fought back, but only one round had been fired. Ishvan knelt by the body and moved its remaining arm over her chest. As he began to close her eyes respectfully, he noted something. There were a series of holes bored into the commissar's skull. Instantly, the hypno training activated, and Ishvan found himself standing in a flashback. He sat in a stone chair, almost resembling a throne in the watch fortress. Images flashed before him on a screen, fast enough that even his conscious mind could not process them, but his unconscious could. The Lictor possessed many adaptations to make it a superb infiltrator. Its carapace was chameleonic and it was armed with dangerous flesh hooks to drag prey into reach of its mighty rending claws. However, its most terrifying adaptation was the feeder maw, a series of bone-tipped tentacles which bored into the skull and consumed the brain. From this, the lictor would gain all the knowledge the victim possessed. The commissar had known the plan, or at least part of it. Now the lictor did too. 
Aishvan shot up and shouted a warning. It knows. Instantly the kill team went on full alert, but it was barely swift enough. Andriel's defense is activated at the speed of thought, a psychic barrier deflecting a bone hook which struck from apparently nowhere. The Lictor recovered swiftly, launching a second hook at Morn before the Tetchmarine sensors could even recognize it was there. The hook bit into the elbow joint of his armor and into the metal arm before. There was a ripping sound as the Xeno hurled the Tetchmarine across the room like a toy. Morn hit the opposite wall hard, cracking the permacrete and throwing up a cloud of dust. His left arm sparked uselessly, the fingers twitching. Constantine's battle focus activated, adrenaline surging through his brain and slowing the world. His mind went into overdrive as two parallel futures arched in front of him. He couldn't see the Lictor in the present clearly, a blur of chameleonic light moving at speeds even the space marine couldn't hope to match. He could see where it would be though. It had engaged its flesh hooks, now it would use its speed to seek its target in melee. In one future, it rushed upon the wounded Morn and severed his head. In the other, the biological programming led it to attack Andriel. The world moved in slow motion. He saw the energy of the warp flickering indigo around Andriel, the light of Prometheum emerging from the barrel of Aishvan Slamer, heard the hammer of Wathin's bolt pistol striking the bolt round. But even in this state, the Lictor moved, now visible, but moving at what would seem to be a casual walk. He had known the creature was large, but he had not expected just how large. This monster was nearly twice his height and moved as swiftly as Drakhari Witch. He could not intercept both futures. So he changed the rules. He hurled his knife towards the future that attacked Morn, and stepped in front of Andriel, power sword moving to parry where the attack would be. The knife struck the wall and embedded into it, and power sword met monstrous claw in a storm of sparks and searing flesh. No flesh, no matter how resilient or how well gene crafted could withstand the energetic edge of a power weapon. The Lictor screamed, pulling away as its lethal arm fell to the ground. Ishvan fired his flamer hastily, still on one knee and rising as he did so. The Prometheum flame washed over Constantine and Andriel. The mighty power armor of the Astartes bore the blinding flame without even scorch mark, and flickering energy fields warded Andriel's exposed head. But even this nearly instantaneous reaction was not enough. The Lictor, already backpedaling away from Constantine, pivoted with remarkable agility, sidestepping the flamer's blast. Wathin, acting more on instinct than anything else, fired his bolt pistol several times in a second, each shot aiming for an area where the Lictor might evade. Only one was successful, striking the beast in the shoulder and wounding it as it evaded the flame. Reacting swiftly, the monster lashed out with its flesh hooks, tearing the bolt pistol from Wathin's hand. Changing tact, it rushed Morn as the Tetchmarine rose to his feet. It closed swifter than a warning could reach, the speed and mass of its passing blowing away the dust. Morn fired from the hip, two shots smashing into the Xeno's midsection and throwing off its attack. He ducked to the side, the Bioforge blade slashing off a section of his helmet but only grazing the skin beneath. At the same moment, the hellfire rounds exploded, blasting chunks out of the Xenos and melting through its body like their namesake. Recognizing its situation, the Lictor proved itself to be among the most intelligent of all Tyranid lifeforms by attempting to retreat. It moved down the hallway, blurring out of sight to strike again. But Andriel would not allow it. Reaching out with his mind, he felt his power push against the Lictor, like pushing through a thick curtain. As suspected, it was resistant to direct psychic attacks. Instead, he formed his power into a blade, and sheared off a section of the ceiling to crush the impudent bug. Again the Lictor's inhuman reflexes preserved it, stopping and pulling back from the falling slab. Andriel cared not, pulling the slab back to strike the Xeno in the chest, pushing it back towards the kill team and pinning its legs under the heavy permacrete. It struggled to break free, immobilized only for a moment. Ishvan took that moment, stepping forwards and filling the corridor with fire. The Lictor staggered out, having torn off one of its own legs in its desperation to live. The fire had struck it in the face, blinding the creature. The heat had scorched the chameleonic carapace as well, blackening it and revealing the full horror of the beast for the first time. It moved sluggishly, 
but only for a moment, before Wafin and Constantine hit it at once. The mighty axe split the beast in half, while the swift blade severed the monstrous head. The creature hit the ground with a crash, instantly slain. The whole encounter had transpired over the course of roughly 20 seconds, but even so the Astarts took a moment to catch their breaths. The adrenaline rush faded, and they took another 8 seconds to compose themselves and evaluate the situation before they spoke again. Well done predicting its movements. Wathin told Constantine. That trick with the knife was nicely done. You did well yourself. I only saw two places for it to go, but you saw what, for? And where it was if it decided to stand still, they do that occasionally. Wathin said with a grin. You'll learn to predict more as you get older. Morn turned to Ishvan gratefully, reloading his bolter as his macadam tribes repaired his damaged arm. It seems that compassion occasionally has its benefits beyond morale. Compassion, and several days of hypno training every Xena the Imperium has ever faced into your head. Ishvan said with a smile under his helmet. Yes but that is not exclusive to you on this team. Constantine turned from the Lictor towards Andriel, and the two nodded at one another. Well fought which. You also Templar. Ishvan began to examine the corpse, using his knife to saw through the carapace and examine the body. Aha. I knew it. He said, pulling free a layer of grey material. It is a new bar form. Morn flexed each of his fingers individually, made a fist, and nodded. We shall have to write a report upon our return. Then a report appeared in his information feed. Another light had gone dark, then another report, something large, fast, and difficult to see was moving very rapidly up the spire. He froze, dedicating all his energies into calculating an explanation. The hive mind had placed a high priority on this mission, dedicating substantial forces in order first to infiltrate the Lictor and then distract from its presence with the Jenna Steelers. It was a new bioform, specifically created for this purpose. If it was such a high priority to destroy the Sickers that all these resources were committed to it, would it not also make sense to ensure there was a contingency? And furthermore, to coordinate in the manner only a hive mind could to conceal the existence of that contingency. And now, having obtained knowledge of the plan and the death of its partner, the other would proceed with all speed towards the highest concentration of Sickers in the hive before it was destroyed. There were two. Morn warned and began to sprint. The kill team took an instant to process this, then turned and ran to follow him. Andriel paused, gathering his powers to open a gate and teleport to the destination directly, but Constantine raised his blade to stop him. Can you bring us all? He asked. No. Andriel admitted. Then you run. We cannot face this enemy alone. Andriel nodded, and redoubled his pace. Space marines at a full sprint are a sight to behold, practically flying from stride to stride in a surprisingly graceful motion. All those who saw them quickly threw themselves out of the way unless they be trampled. As they ran, Morn began to hail their forces. The Lictor has breached containment and is attempting to assassinate the astropathic choir, unable to contain. Repeat, Lictor is attempting to terminate the astropathic choir, unable to contain. Request immediate support. A few moments later, Atra hailed him in turn. Roger that Lord Morn, my brigade is on its way. And so they raced onwards, pushing themselves to the limits of their superhuman physiques in a desperate move to stop the hive mind's plot. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 15, Sacrifices. The Kill Team raced up the spire, chasing the Lictor through the winding streets and through the endless stairs and lift platforms. They were approximately halfway down, 
about 2 kilometers below the heavily defended and warded building that served as the hive's astropathic choir, and 5 kilometers from the pinnacle of this particular spire. If they could move directly, they would reach it in roughly 3 minutes moving at their top speed. However, the lifts, stairs, and curves greatly extended the Astartes pathway and delayed their progress. The Licta by contrast would suffer no such delays. Despite its absurd bulk, it was able to move through areas smaller than its frame would suggest, and could just as easily scale the side of the spire as going through it. As Morn was processing this, he recognized the solution. Up the side. He ordered, charging for a wall and opening fire on it. The rounds bitten and blasted the permacrete apart, and then the charging marine smashed through it and the steel plates on the exterior. Morn moved out past the boundary of the spire into the open air. Five kilometers below the black asphalt of the city's artificial floor stared back up at him. He began to fall, but turned as he did, undeterred by the dizzying height. His boots met the steel exterior of the spire, and stuck with a clunk. He took several steps backwards to reduce his momentum, then began to sprint up the side of the building, racing up it like a lizard. The rest of the kill team swiftly followed in their own way. Constantine was the swiftest, firing his jump pack to reorient himself and land above the hole the Tetchmarine had punched. Shortly after Andriel stepped out into the air and levitated himself, turning on nothing to stick to the wall. Wathin simply bit his axe onto the side of the hole and used it to swing himself around, laughing uproariously as he did so. Ishvan was the slowest, pausing briefly to secure his flamer, then gingerly locking his boots to the base of the hole and coming around in the most controlled manner, as his greater bulk required. And so they made their path straight, even if not entirely direct. Moving upwards while gravity pulled them back would have been agonizingly slow for any mortal, but the Astaire's superior sense of balance allowed them to accomplish the feat at impossible speed. Even so, their great bulk forced them to move cautiously, advancing at only two-thirds of their maximum stride, which nonetheless remained twice as swift as a human running on flat ground. Occasionally the metal armor they relied upon for traction was damaged or moved aside for an unarmored section, in which case they were obliged to leap across it like a vertical ravine. If they did not possess the peculiar focus which once again sets the Astartes apart from mortals, they would have perhaps marveled at their fantastic situation. An outside observer would have perceived them as Goliath silhouettes, framed against the setting sun. The smoke and pollution of the great hive turned the fading sunlight blood red, and it seemed an ascent like that of Orpheus and Dante, rising from purgatorial torment to a gilded heaven. Indeed, the upper parts of the spires, where the smoke was faint enough for light to be golden, were gilded. They shone brightly in the fading sun, so much so that when the lictor passed onto that new section of the spire, they spied it for a brief moment. Its carapace flickered in the light, shifting from the black and grey to the luxurious gold of the upper spire. Constantine hurled curses and oaths at it, mourn bowl shells. The lictor was still far ahead of them, well out of the conventional range of a bolter. But Morn was not a conventional marine. His inbuilt cogitator, working in concert with his superhuman mind, calculated the distance and arc needed to strike the foe. He fired an arc, a full burst, and only after this recognized the error. He had adjusted to moving on the vertical plane like a horizontal one, and in his haste attempted to arc his shots as if gravity were beneath his feet. However, he instead missed, and the bolt shells fell uselessly past him. On their way down, one of them had the ill fortune to strike a bust of an imperial saint. It passed through the head and exploded within, raining marble down on the streets below. The Lictor had a head start on the space marines, and furthermore its companion had demonstrated that the bioform was swifter than them. They would not be as far behind it as they might have been, thanks to their innovative approach, but it was still ahead. Even if Constantine had fired his jump pack at full burst, he would not be able to close the gap in time. The effect was clear, it would reach the choir first. Both Morn and Andriel contacted the choir and its defenders, and told them to prepare for the worst. There were relatively few lone creatures in the galaxy that would pose a serious threat to the astropaths. While blind, their psychic powers were potent enough to cross between sectors, granting them better perception than most with their sight. Their powers were specialized for communication, 
but they were still powerful telepaths and able to wield the warp for offensive purposes. While individually weak, the full choir could rival or even surpass Andriel's psychic might. However, the inability to detect the lictor in the psychic field would make them truly blind to its presence. Furthermore, while telepathic attack was capable of laying low even the most physically mighty adversary, it was worse than useless against the Tyranid. That screaming mass of countless primitive minds would drown out any telepathic attack, potentially even infesting the connection and driving the connected individual to utter insanity. Thus the astropaths were helpless before the lictor. They could all run the numbers, they would arrive approximately one minute behind the lictor at their current speed. It would still be too late. Then a shadow passed over the Astartes, and they turned to see a Valkyrie passing by them. Atra looked out the side to see the Space Marines sprinting up the side of the building, catching a flicker of moment quite a ways out ahead of them, nearly level with the landing pad. There's our target. She shouted over the sound of the Valkyrie's engines. The Marines? One of her squad asked in confusion. No grox for brains, that thing, above them. She shouted pointing harder. Despite pointing hard and not actually making anything more visible, unless you are a sicker, which Atra was not, the guardsman did see it. What the hell is that? I can barely see it. Our target. Doesn't matter what it is the marines want it dead and need us to help make it that way. Atra replied coldly. Are you crazy? We can't even see it, how are we going to kill that? We're not. We just need to slow it down enough for the marines to catch up so they can kill it. Now stop bitching and check your charge. The pilot of the Valkyrie, sensors not showing any threat, began to put down. She knew speed of was of the essence, but had yet to spy the lictor. Fortunately for her, the Xeno had other concerns. As the thrusters began to fire for landing, the lictor reached the landing pad and began to move towards the large spherical building in which the astropaths were housed. 60. The guardsmen set to defend the astropaths were as prepared as they could be. They had two heavy bolter emplacements armed and ready, and were already on edge. However, distracted by the landing Valkyrie and the sound of space marines running up the side of a hive spire, they did not see it coming. The first they knew of it was when a pair of flesh hooks dug into the sergeant and one of the gunners, then hurled them off the side of the spire. They fired wildly into the air unable to strike the creature with enough precision to damage it. Four were cloven in half by the massive arms, and a fifth went down as the lictor's jaw distended and a swarm of bone-tipped tendrils punched through his head. The survivors broke and fled, some hurling themselves from the spire. 50. Atra and her command squad leapt from the Valkyrie. Estimating the lictor's position by the storm of blood and viscera, she raised her plasma gun. Open fire. She ordered and a storm of plasma struck everything in the general vicinity. The Xeno was already on the move, evading most of the lethal blue fire. Only a glancing blow caught it, setting one of its back legs ablaze. It let out an alien scream as it rushed for the door. The squad moved up, shifting their sights towards the burning limb. The lictor carved the door out of the wall with its curved blade arms, then seized it with its flesh hooks and flung it with incredible strength back towards the squad. They dove for cover, but one was too slow. The door struck him in the chest and he went down. Atra ordered the medic to stabilize him, and the remaining three guard raced for the door. 40. As he raced up the side of the spire, Andriel felt a spike of pain slam through his senses. He staggered, nearly falling. Ishvan reached out a hand, stabilizing the librarian as he shook his head. It took him a precious instant to recover and recognize the source of the pain. Death scream. It's inside. 35. Atra and her squad raced into the astropathic building. They immediately felt an odd sense of peace. Such areas were built to isolate the psychic noise and ensure the calm of its inhabitants. Its walls were built and warded to keep away the background noise of a hive, and so it was oddly still. The interior of the building was pitch black as lights were unnecessary for a choir of the blind. It was perhaps the most peaceful place that any of them had ever been in. The fact that it was that in spite of the decapitated corpse on the floor and the screams of panicking astropaths was a testament both to its effectiveness and the sheer chaos of a guardsman's existence. The squad activated their lights almost instantly, 
casting beams into the darkness. They swept in all directions for the lictor, eyes straining to see it. Then Atra spotted another source of light, a series of blue plasma embers. Turning, she fired, and her men followed suit. As the flash of plasma illuminated the darkness, they saw that it was just the leg, severed from the body and left as bait. As soon as she recognized this, Atra opened her mouth to shout a warning. Instead she screamed, as something bit into her shoulder and arm. She went flying into the darkness, smashing into the wall hard enough that her helmet cracked apart. Lightning covered her arm, then all was darkness and nausea. 15. Atra vaguely saw, through a blurry vision, the lights of her squad's plasma guns fall to the floor. Why had they dropped them? They needed to fight the Xeno, and those were valuable. Did they have any idea how much trouble oh, where was hers? There it was, why was it floating? And so large? Why did her arm hurt so much, but at the same time why couldn't she feel her fingers on that hand? Andriel forced his thoughts into a wall, a barrier of energy forming around him. The astropaths were being slaughtered, their death cries slamming against him like the waves of a great ocean. He was falling behind. Go. It is among them. He shouted to his battle brothers, moving forwards as the backlash of so many dead threatened to throw him from the spire. Zero. The space marines came up over the spire, and moved at last at their full speed. Their passage was like thunder, and like a righteous wind. The medic heard them go, but by the time she looked to see they were already gone. Andriel staggered up a moment later, then charged bravely after them. The marines moved into the building, already sweeping, each brother covering the other's line of sight. Constantine spied movement, and fired his jets sweeping forwards hastily to strike the enemy. As he moved through the air, he saw that they were not the lictor, but three astropaths, their limbs severed, but still alive. Then the lictor moved, slicing the heads from the three in a single motion. Outside, the combined backlash blew Andriel off his feet like an electric shock. Constantine raised his blade to defend, and met the Xeno in a flash of sparks. Constantine went flying, his power sword falling from his grasp and striking the floor. Its field sparked uselessly, blade bent from the fall. As Constantine crashed into the opposite wall, Wathen moved forwards, firing at the area around the down Templar. His axe was ready, but the Lictor did not move to finish the fallen marine, merely using him as yet another distraction. Instead, it moved from the flank. Ishvin and Morn saw it, turning to fire. But the flesh hooks were faster. The roar of the flamer was cut to a whimper as the fuel line was severed. Another hook bit into Ishvan's side and hauled him forwards. The lictor launched itself over the salamander, using him as a platform to leap yet further and strike Morn. The Tetchmarine fired, but not swiftly enough. The Xeno bore him to the ground under its bulk. Behind it, the force of its leap sent Ishvan tumbling forwards. Detaching his now useless weapon from his armor, he rolled to his feet, but too slowly. One of Morn's bolters went skittering across the floor, while the other fired uselessly. The Xeno had one arm pinned, but Morn had managed to slip the other one free. The Lictor's head dipped forwards towards Morn's, but the iron arm interposed itself, holding the monster back. Its jaw distended once again, and the Ripper Maw dove down. The tendrils scraped and screamed against the ceramite of Morn's helmet, but one found a weak point. It punched through the reinforced glass of his left eye hole, and down into the cybernetic eye beneath. Sensor screamed in Morn's head, and the hydraulics of his arm creaked. The deadly tendril was extended to its maximum, but was held mere centimeters away from the marine's brain. The arm began to scream, even steel yielding before the weight and purpose of the deadly Xeno. But then something distracted the monster, just for a moment. Its weight increased slightly, and it shifted back as something leapt upon its back. Its head turned slightly, allowing Morn to see what had caused the disturbance. Atra, one arm torn to shreds, helmet gone, and hair matted with blood, hung on with her legs to the lictor. Her plasma gun was jammed into a gap in its armor, and her eyes blazed even brighter. The plasma charge built with a hiss, then a scream then a wail. Morn shut his one remaining eye, then a blue sun filled the astropathic chamber. Atra's body went flying to the side, 
as the lictor reared back, screaming in pain. Half of its body was virtually gone, and what remained was wreathed in agile fire. As it fell, Aishvan fell upon it with his bare hands. Undeterred by any flame, the salamander seized the Xeno by the midsection and hauled it back, uttering a bellow of such fury that even Wathin paused for an instant. The Xeno writhed under the devastator's grip, but his strength was unmatched, with the crack, he broke the creature, and in a moment of indiscriminate violence, he tore it in half, and crushed its skull under his boot. Andriel arrived just as this occurred, and swept the area grimly. Still smoking faintly from the backlash, he looked about for survivors. Seeing none, he helped Mon to his feet. The Tetchmarine brushed past his concerns and moved with speed. Constantine turned to Ishvan, in awe of the salamander's raw strength. Cousin, remind me to never make you angry. He acknowledged. Ishvan did not respond, but followed Morn. The Tetchmarine had moved with all speed to Atra's side, and there was a hiss as his fire contingency is activated, dousing the flames that racked the Guard's woman's body. Atra's body was ruined. Her entire right arm was gone, and the left was mangled beyond repair. Her hair had all burned off, and the entire right side of her body was blackened. The flesh on the right side of her face had been burned off to the bone in places, and her eye was gone. Her torso was similarly damaged, parts of it simply gone, disintegrated along with her arm in the blast. Still though, she dragged in shallow, ragged breaths, her body so badly damaged it was incapable of going into shock. She was not bleeding, every wound cauterized to charcoal. It was only a matter of time before her body simply gave up though, unable to sustain such injuries. Her remaining eye flickered about in pain and terror. She knew she was dying, but still fought for life valiantly. Her remaining fingers twitched, her legs spasmed slightly. Her eye met Morn's, and she opened her mouth, trying to speak, but her throat was too badly burned. Ishvan laid a hand on Morn's shoulder gently, as the Tetchmarine examined the Guard's woman. Wordlessly, the salamander's hand drifted towards the bolt pistol on his hip. No. Morn said, and a mounted device on his arm whirred, and a syringe pierced her neck. Atra spasmed, her breaths becoming more rapid, her heart continuing to beat in spite of the tremendous injuries. Morn, that will only prolong her suffering. Her body cannot survive this. Ishvan said warningly, his grip becoming tighter, that same dangerous anger still smoldering, and threatening to wake to life. The Tetchmarine whirled on him, and met him with an iron stare, baleful and unyielding. Ishvan met that gaze, the lone iron eye, and the twisted wreck of scrap that was once an eye. He saw how very nearly Morn's long service had come to an end, and for an instant, he felt something he had not truly felt since he had become a full battle brother. Fear. Ishvan took a step back, uncertain now of how to handle the situation. Morn gently lifted up the fallen goods woman, practically cradling her. Indeed. Flesh is weak, even that of the few worthy servants of the Omnigia. So Iron must preserve it, for it cannot go to waste. Well go- Morn left the area swiftly, commandeering the Valkyrie and flying ahead with the mauled Guards woman. The weight of the Astartes was such that only one could go, and so Morn went, his one-eyed glare daring any to challenge him. As the Valkyrie departed, the Astartes began to find their way back down. They moved back down, pondering what the Xenos meant to accomplish. Well Andriel, you're the expert in sorcery, what are they up to? Constantine asked at length. Aside from breaking my sword. He grumbled. I have absolutely no idea. The goals of the Xenos are as obscure to me as they are to you. Andriel admitted, head still aching from the backlash. It's possible that this was some form of elaborate trap meant to remove us from the field, but it would have made more sense for the lictors to engage us during the middle of an assault if that were the case. You have any idea either Wathin? Ishvan asked. Nay, though they're most certainly engaged in some trickery or another. I can't say what it is though, just a certainty in my bones. The old wolf grumbled. I've fought the Tyranid on a dozen dozen worlds, and they've never behaved like this. Assassinating leaders? Absolutely, it's usually a prelude. But they never cared much about Sickers, the shadow in the warp covers that area. So why does this fleet engage in such an abnormal manner? 
Constantine grumbled. It begins with a simple enough attack, spore bombardment, eliminating the capital, and spreading outwards. Perhaps it recognizes that direct assault is futile, but if so, why so few forces committed to subterfuge, why develop a creature simply to attack sickers when they are no threat to it? I don't know. The Xeno has always been hard to read, and now more so than ever. We also have received no contact from the fleet or from the other hives. Combine this with these recent attacks and it seems clear to me that they mean to isolate us, but for what purpose I can't say. Regardless, something is coming, something big. They threw titans at us, what oh. Andriel said. Targeting sickers, isolating the hive, ensuring there is no support from orbit. You don't suppose. A Norn queen. There's one on the planet. Constantine finished, in a mix of awe and excitement. The most important creature in the hive fleet. If it was indeed here, and they could kill it, then it would shatter the fleet. It is certainly a possibility. Wathin considered. Though to see one deployed is rare in the extreme, there are only two circumstances which come to mind, both from the early stages of the Tyrannic Wars. The Xeno have not dared to deploy their leaders since. Constantine fell silent. I am eager to face the foe, but if such power as has not been unleashed since then will fall upon us, even I would advise caution. We nearly lost one of our number and may yet lose the best of the Alverans to a mere lictor. What comes next, we must be prepared for. Ishvan said, his fists clenched. Indeed. I'm going to need to get a new sword. Constantine remarked, examining his bent and dented blade. The power field was no longer functional, sparking uselessly, and it was bent badly enough that it could not be sheathed. I can take care of that. Ishvan suggested, brightening slightly, reaching out and taking the weapon. He moved forwards with greater purpose, longer legs beginning to carry him in front of the rest of the team. Does this hive have access to the necessary components? Constantine asked, having not exactly given the salamander his sword, and mildly alarmed at no longer having it. It should, there are sororitas here, and the guard use them as well. Those are for different models. I'll improvise. Ishvan called back, then vanished around a corner. Constantine, in a less than dignified manner, hurried to catch up, but the salamander had made like a purple orc and disappeared. How? 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 The Templar turned towards the remaining two marines in confusion. Is he also a sicker? He demanded to know. Andriel blew air out his nose in amusement. Absolutely not. You have more psychic potential than he does. He's in a hurry to do something to distract himself. Constantine cocked his head to the side. Distract himself? The salamanders care a great deal for mortals. I suspect he's concerned for Atra. Andriel explained. Really I thought you'd be acting the same way with how much time you spend trying to teach her. Constantine crossed his arms. Oh ye of little faith. Either she lives, and Morn shall reforge her into a new weapon for the Emperor, or she dies, and is born to the God Emperor's side, a martyr's death is the best one can hope for. HM. Was all Andriel responded to that with. Well, the best a mortal can hope for. It will be a shame to lose the propaganda, she was good for morale. Now if you will excuse me brother, I must go and meditate. He replied, and moved away. He's in an ill temper. Constantine noted towards Wathin. I imagine the shadows giving him a headache. Rune Priest mentioned it to me once. The space wolf said with a shrug. The pair continued onwards, taking a moment to process. We should go and re-review the defenses, since Morn is occupied. Constantine said after a long moment of awkward silence. I'll handle it lad. The old wolf said, laying a hand on the Templar's shoulder. Go and pray. You can fool the sicker but not me. I am quite fine. Thank you Wathin. Guardsmen die, such is their duty. Constantine said, shrugging the older marine off and moving forwards. You've never seen a brother die in front of you yet have you? Wathin said, and Constantine turned. Seen it happen when a blood claw looses packmates, damn fools. Cuts the aura of invincibility down doesn't it? Constantine clenched his fist. Be silent. 
He said, voice angry. You nearly lost a brother, and a friend besides. Because we aren't invincible, and we can die. I am not weak. I do not fear. Constantine growled. Then you're an idiot. Wathin replied. And have been lucky enough to feel invincible for some time because you're talented for your age, presumably around equally talented brothers. Constantine whirled at this slight to his honor, fist lashing out at Wathin's face. The old wolf caught his arm and stepped in, slamming his palm forwards into the Templar's breastplate. Off balance, Constantine fell back, flat on his back. That wouldn't have worked if you were focused. Wathin noted. The Templar got back up, still furious, but seeing clearly through the anger. He did not move. You aren't invincible, you can die, and you will die if you go to battle without your own head in order. So go, pray, meditate, train, drink, and get yourself in order before the next fight. Wathin said, ordering him not from rank, but from the authority which all old and wise men hold over young and foolhardy ones. Constantine did not respond, but turned away. You and I shall have a matter of honor to settle upon the watch fortress, cousin. Then we will settle it there, but have your head in order or I'll put you back on your ass in the training cages. Wathin replied, and the two parted ways. As the old wolf walked back towards the central spire and his next duty, he smiled slightly. Yes, he had stung the pup's honor, but he had needed it. What was the high marshal thinking? Sending that one, barely more than a scout, to the death watch. Perhaps the Templars wanted to be rid of him. He was unusually tolerant and cool-headed for the heirs of Sigismund. Then he chuckled. Unusually tolerant, but even more arrogant than usual. It had been quite a long while since he had faced an honor duel from anyone besides a son of the lion. Most young claws weren't quite stupid enough to challenge him, and he wasn't fool enough to draw challenge from the old guard. Oh well. Constantine was finally going to get that match between them after all. Despite his fury, Constantine found his steps guided, as they ever were, by faith. Until he came before the great cathedral of Saint Augustine of the Silent. The Silent Saint was not as well known as some, but Constantine knew of her. A mute saint, she had appeared on the world of a person M35. In her youth she forsook civilization and lived among the wilds protected by the emperor, until a demonic invasion had fallen upon the world. With nary a word, she banished the forces of chaos, rallying an army of the humble about her, and defeating a mighty prince of chaos in utter silence, empowered by the emperor with martial skill beyond her primitive origins. He removed his helmet in respect, and anointed himself with the sacred water as he entered. The cathedral was nearly full this evening, as the faithful gathered to pray and seek peace. As he walked through the cathedral, they parted before him, some reaching out fingers in silent or to catch the hem of his robe or graze his power armor. He did not begrudge them. The masses required faith, symbols of hope to remind them always of the emperor's light. He was such a symbol, or at least was meant to be. He approached the altar and bowed his head. Upon the floor were graven sacred words, passages from the Lictitio Divinitus, the divine word of the emperor. The author of the sacred text was somewhat debated, the true author, or authors, as many posited lost to history, though it had undoubtedly been divinely inspired. Privately, Constantine held that it had been composed by Rogel Dawn during his vigil upon Holy Terror. Sigismund, the first Templar, had been among the first to recognize the divinity of the God Emperor, surely Dawn must have as well. Furthermore, from where else could such beautiful and persuasive prose arise as was found in the Lictitio, if not from a Primarch? He took comfort in the divine words, reaffirming his faith by the impenetrable arguments therein. Each word was like the breath of paradise, even for one so accustomed to higher senses and experiences, they were a sort of holy bliss. He meditated upon them, and found peace. Indeed, he had been struck by momentary doubt. But the moment of weakness was overcome by the all-consuming will and power of the God Emperor. Indeed, he was a son of the Emperor, and he would usher in a penance tenfold for the moment of sin, paid in Zeno's blood. Yet as Constantine was elevated to divine peace, Atra had succumbed to hell. She saw, but did not understand, her mind feverish and tormented. 
the stimulant which preserved her life was meant for a start, not mortals. Its effect upon her brain was to stimulate it beyond reason, and fevers racked her body. This left her mind hyperactive but unfocused, experiencing far heightened emotions. If she was capable of being sick, she would have vomited until her stomach tore, but she could not move, could not think, and could not die. She had enough presence of mind to recognize a shift from outside to inside, moved swiftly. Her world had transcended pain at the moment of sacrifice, and she could no longer feel anything, perceptions overloaded and shattered. She wondered briefly why her nose seemed so large, or why one of her eyes could not open. She passed again into a smaller room, and a thunderous voice filled the air, though she could not tell what it said. Was that the voice of the Emperor? The roar faded, and red and silver blurs moved around and above her. For a moment she focused on a pair of metal eyes, struggling to remember and place the exact memory. The emotion related was fear, then calm, and she could not entirely understand why. She felt something prick her neck, then a pressure there. The burning began to fade slightly, but not the confusion. She could feel again, cold, the cold of metal on her back, cool air on open skin. Where had her armor gone? She was going to need that. Bugger that. Where were her clothes? She was an officer now, it wouldn't do for the officer to go about in the nude. Her head shifted slightly in protest, and she felt cold tubes by her ear. She tried to rise, but found she could not. She tried to lift her arm, but it wouldn't respond. She looked towards it, and saw the seal of the cog on the back of a red blur. McNanicus. No this didn't make sense she wasn't near any Mechanicus she was moving to support the Astartes, she didn't have time for the Mechanicus. There was a Xeno, the Astropaths were in danger. Memories of pain struck her, blinding blue light and sudden darkness. She couldn't see what was to the other side of her, but something moved. With great effort, she turned her head, and the leering cybernetic face of a servitor stared back at her. She began to panic. Breathing heavily, limbs jerking, why wouldn't her arms respond? She struggled to raise it, and it would not respond. She rasped for air, unable to breathe. She tried to scream but her throat only hurt as she bucked on the table. Strong, cold hands restrained her, and a metal limb pushed a mask over her face. She kicked and struggled, not understanding, mind white with terror. She couldn't breathe, she couldn't breathe. Her eye fixed on a series of mechanical components, limbs, claws, a metal eye. No. She was loyal. She was loyal. She was loyal. She bolted up in bed, screaming and covered in a cold sweat. Strong arms pushed her back down and she struggled. Atra. Atra be calm, it is me. You are going to be alright. A voice insisted. She focused on the face. It was dark. Too dark with glowing red eyes, but kindly and full of concern. Ish? She asked, in her haste forgetting her manners. Ah, that is, Lord Ishvan? Yes. It's me. Ish replied. You were very badly injured, but it seems you will live. He said happily. Although, you may have to take some time to grow accustomed to the changes. Changes? Atra asked, and then she noticed. Her right arm was gone and in its place shone a steel limb, ending in a five talon claw. She turned it, and the talon moved like her arm. She clenched it, and released. There was a sense of feeling, but with the ever slightest of delays, and muffled, like touching something through a glove. The metal also encompassed much of her body, strands of iron weaving across and under her skin. Most of her left arm had been reconstructed with similar cybernetics. She lifted her left arm, the arm that was still at least somewhat human, to her face. Two of the fingers were gone, replaced with artificial ones. She touched her face. The left side was still warm, but the left was cold steel. Her hair was gone as well, but it seemed most of her scalp was intact. She lay back in a state of shock, then noted her clothing and armor was still gone. Hurriedly she pulled up the blanket she had thrown off on awakening to cover herself. Uh, where are my pants? She asked at length. It was easier to focus on that problem than on the small problem of most of the right side of her body being gone. They are by the side of your bed. Are you able to stand? Ishvan asked. 
I, I'm not sure. Did they replace my legs too? Only a section of your upper thigh and femur. It should be mostly the same. There are enhancements throughout to integrate your body with your replacements, but the core is still biological. Atra sighed in relief. At least she was still mostly human. She slowly swung her feet over the edge of the bed. Just as Aishvan had warned her, her legs were run through with the same telltale signs of cybernetic meddling. She rose gingerly, but found her balance seemed to be mostly intact. There was a definite weight on her right side now, but not so much it threw her balance off severely. This, she looked down at herself and stared. I, I lost half my body. This shouldn't feel this natural. She said in astonishment. You'd have to ask Morn for the details. I simply made a few tweaks to your arm. Aishvan said with a shrug. It should hopefully serve you well. I suppose I will. She said, examining herself. It didn't seem like her body. Her body didn't have wires running through it, or metal tubes under her skin. How long was I down for? Two days. Fortunately the Tyranids haven't made any further moves. Some sort of cloud rolled in during the night we faced the Lictor, but nothing's come of it, and it seems natural. Storms roll in all the time here. This one's quiet, I can't hear it. Then she paused. Aishvan, do you hear singing? It was faint, strange, and yet beautiful, like the song sung on the day of the Emperor's ascension or Sanguinola, but different. It seemed artificial, and yet perfectly understandable, almost familiar. The marine paused, and then shook his head. No, there's a good deal of noise from the manufactorum, but if there's singing I can't hear it over that. It could be the binary cant. That noise? No I don't think so. Gives me a headache. I am no expert on cybernetics. Wait here, I will go and inform Morn that you have awoken. Aishvan said, and left. Atra stood alone in the room, looking at her reflection in the smooth surface of the wall. Her face was gone, a metal mask covering half of it. A red eye stared back at her, cold and soulless. Her artificial fist clenched, and she punched the reflection, denting the steel and leaving an impact. She breathed heavily, tears falling from her one remaining eye, breaths ragged, then she composed herself, and dressed in the provided robes. She lived, and only in death did duty end. Morn rose from his meditative work as his senses registered the arrival of Aishvan. He was still in the process of attempting to repair the storm till and gunship they had arrived in. The work to restore the bellicose machine spirit and undo the damage wrought by the Xeno was slow, particularly given the lack of proper components. This forge, while not lacking in zeal or competence, did not possess the requisite resources or expertise to maintain such a craft. She is awake then. He said, turning to meet the salamander. Yes, she's awake, and the repairs to her lungs were fully successful. Aishvan replied with a slight joke. Morn looked at him in confusion. Why did you evaluate her lungs? You are not an apothecary or a tech priest. Aishvan sighed. It's a joke, brother. She woke up screaming like the night haunter was after her, may his bones freeze. If a child cries when it is born that means it is healthy. Morn nodded in acknowledgement. I have not been present for any childbirths, excepting my own. I was not aware of such things. Why are you aware of this? The salamanders do not set ourselves apart from our people. Aishvan replied. Many of my brothers spend the brief days of respite among the very villages we once dwelt in as mortals. But you are set apart. Why do you bother with such things? Morn asked. Why do the Mechanicus sing, after your own manner, or you care for our good goods woman? Aishvan replied. To remind yourselves that you are still human, even if reforged for a new purpose. Morn nodded. A logic built on somewhat shaky axioms, but nonetheless arriving at a correct conclusion. Flesh is weak, but iron alone is abomination. He said, and made a warding sign against the abominable intelligence. The two men began to walk. Speaking as they did so. Apart from her lung function and the expected panic on awakening, how is she? Morn asked. You know if I didn't know you better I'd almost think you made a joke. Aishvan noted. She seems to be doing as well as can be expected. 
she was able to stand and dress herself, and appeared to be fully lucid. However, she may be experiencing some manner of auditory hallucinations. She claimed to be able to hear music. Morn stopped and blinked, his new eye blinking slightly slower than the other one. That is unusual. She shouldn't be able to understand that. Wait, it's not something you've done? No it absolutely is, but not something I've done intentionally, which makes it unusual. You're telling me you accidentally gave her even more modifications? No, but it is likely a side effect, albeit an unintentional one. It is possible that the machine spirit of her bionics has done it. They actually do beneficial things. Occasionally. But she is not an acolyte of the Omnisia, it shouldn't even be active, let enough aware and active enough to be doing that. Well you are, and you handled the actual installation. HM. Morn said, and continued on with somewhat more purposeful stride. How are the repairs to Constantine's blade coming? Having to improvise. It's likely to be less powerful than it was before given the components, though I may have a way to compensate for that, which I'm certain he'll enjoy. What do you have in mind? Morn asked. Brother, I am a son of Vulcan, what do you expect? Ishvan asked, almost insulted. Morn smiled under his helmet. Go and finish it, I'm certain he shall approve. I will attend to this matter. Ishvan nodded and left to return to his work. Morn approached the room where Aitra was waiting, and checked his sensors. There were few tech priests in the area. He quickly checked the internal cameras and audio and began to feed them a stream of secondary data before entering the room. It was time to test if he had made the error he feared he did. Aitra stood to attention and saluted, her new arm making a clink as it struck the metal of her skull. Activating a modification in his throat, he spoke his words translating from his mind to a stream of binary. At ease captain. It is good that you are moving about so quickly. Atra went to ease, or at least to at ease as she could me. I'm surprised to be moving about at all my lord. I wish to express my gratitude towards you for saving my life. She said. There was that slight, reluctant pause. She was indeed grateful, but the change was sudden, uncomfortable. Something she could not quite fully thank him for doing to her. Morn did not begrudge her it. She was a guardsman, not a servant of the machine god. She was a mere mortal, overused to mortal flesh and sinew. The Echol Shiaki had taught that the flesh was holy, humanity found in the flesh. This was folly, but he had taken much of it from her, even if it was to save her life. He was also somewhat distracted, and concerned that she had understood the binary clearly. In fact, she likely did not even understand that he had used it. This could prove a problem. She was not of the Omnisia, she should not know this. It would have to be dealt with sooner rather than later. It would appear you received more than was expected. You can hear the Beneric cant and understand it. He explained. This should not be so. I am uncertain what has caused it, but you will not speak of this to anyone until I can determine what code has transmitted it and remove it. He said firmly. If she was discovered, the consequences would be severe for them both. I see. Understood my lord. Aitra replied. Pardon my asking, but what exactly did you do to me? She asked, raising her talon. Besides the obvious. You may not want me to answer that. Morn warned. An unfortunate consequence of your state was that you were unable to be totally sedated for much of the process. Local anesthetics were used along with a drug which prevented the formation of memories, but you were conscious for much of the process. Detailed discussion may trigger partially formed memories. Aitra shivered, stomach twisting at the half-remembered nightmares that had plagued her sleep. Though they hadn't been nightmares, and she hadn't been asleep, but she steeled herself. If she did not understand her body or her new limitations, she would die again. She met the space marine's gaze with her own, which was somewhat easier now, had she gotten taller? It's my body, I need to know what it can do. Morn nodded. The damage to you was extensive, and the modifications necessarily needed to be equally so. On the most obvious level, your arm, half your torso, one of your lungs, your eye, most of your face, and a section of your brain were entirely unsalvageable or were completely destroyed, as such they have been replaced. However, 
such extensive modifications also place additional strain on the rest of your anatomy. It was necessary to remove your spine as the plasma explosion had weakened it. You are now 3 inches taller as a result. Modifications were also made to your ribs. Of them, all on the explosion side of the body have been replaced, along with half to act as anchors on the other side. Your sternum has also been replaced, and many of your other major bones have been supplemented to reduce the effect of deep plasma burn. Morn continued. Atra sat back down, a half-remembered vision flashing through her mind. She remembered the part about the spine, flashes of numbness and agony traveling up her body. It was like a progression of electric shocks to each part of her body, nerves fluctuating between uselessness and sharp bursts of pain which lingered. She felt vaguely nauseous, but controlled herself. Your lung was replaced, as was your liver and stomach. Your primary heart had received only moderate damage and so was able to be repaired. Morn continued. Um, Morn, I only had one heart, you didn't stick another one in me did you? Atra asked. No. It is a pattern of habit. A starts have two. Morn explained without missing a beat, then continued. Your appendix was also removed. It was not damaged, it was simply useless and a source of potential future trouble. Unfortunately, cybernetic replacements for reproductive organs cannot be manufactured, so you are now sterile. He informed her as coldly and calmly as if he had told her she had gotten her hair cut. Your pancreas also received minor repairs. Nearly everything. Atra heard the point about children vaguely, but it was simply one more layer of loss on top of countless more. It seemed there was no segment of her still meaningfully and totally human. She felt shell-shocked, like a bomb had gone off next to her. What about these? She asked, holding up her and gesturing towards the wires. The proximity of the blast to you caused notable damage throughout all the major muscle tissues of your body. Even areas not directly damaged by the blast suffered severe burns and scarring throughout their structures. They would have healed improperly, resulting in severe pain and loss of function leading to paralysis. As such, the damaged tissues were removed and replaced. They have not totally replaced your existing muscular structure, but are integrated within it. This required the implementation of a general enhancement and supplemental system to your own circulatory system to properly deliver resources to your body and ensure that what remains will fully heal. Morn concluded. Down to every muscle then. A total integration of steel and flesh. Atra sat for a moment in sheer awe and no small amount of horror at what had been done to her. Something like this was beyond any real story she had heard of. Yes prosthetics were nothing new, many in the regiment had them. Feth, even some of the most famed heroes of the Imperium, Yerik, Strachan and the like were as much machine as man. Were all prosthetics so advanced, they couldn't be. What Morn was describing was nothing short of completely rebuilding her entire body. Why? She asked at length. Why expend so many resources, so much effort and talent on one good woman? I know for a fact that all of these are worth more than my life. Blood of my fathers, I've had it hammered into my head that my plasma gun was more important than my life to the Imperium so why the sudden change? I'm one woman among trillions, why this? You are one in perhaps a trillion, or more likely one in 100 billion. Morn replied. There are very few mortals who can boast that they have directly saved the life of an astart. Fewer still who can say they did so in the manner you did. You risked and gave your life without hesitation, and to full effect. Such individuals are rare, and sorely needed in this age. They cannot be allowed to go to waste. Atra lifted her head. You know, you may be the one person in the galaxy who's completely absent of any bullshit. And even knowing that I have a hard time believing you. I'm a nobody, a statistic. Five months in the guard will make that clear. Five years makes you really believe it. You were. But you are not so any longer. Whether you intended to become so or not, you are the hero of Alvara now. Your life is no longer so cheap that it is easily expended. You are of course still may be, if the reward is high enough or your sacrifice becomes necessary once more, but there is no soul in all the dominion of the Emperor, from the lowest serf to even the Astartes and the Custodes this is not true of. And. He concluded. You saved my life, 
and potentially the life of my battle brothers. I had the power to save yours. I could not allow that debt to remain unpaid. It is a stain on my honor that I required it of you, I would not compound that stain by allowing you to trade your life for mine. Such is not your duty. Right. So what all can I do now? Atra asked, gesturing towards the dent in the wall. I think I already figured out I'm quite a bit stronger. Correct, and this will improve as your natural tissues recover. You will likely achieve a 125% increase in overall strength, compounded by the fact your natural limiters should now no longer activate, as they are no longer required. In addition, the cogitation matrix replacing the damaged portions of your skull is based on my own design and programming. You should experience a drastic increase in your reaction times, memory, and special reasoning. Furthermore, you are, as is to be expected, more resilient to damage. Atra let out a low whistle, and brightened notably at the fact she was still capable of doing that. It sounds almost like you tried to turn me into something like you. I did take inspiration from the Emperor's work. As stats have survived and fully recovered from similar damage. It was only logical to mimic some elements of our own biology when attempting to allow you to do the same. Ah. He raised a hand and issued an order. You are explicitly forbidden from sparing with Constantine for at least three weeks, if not more if my examination of you at that time demands it. Atra raised her one remaining eyebrow. Does this also include a link that lets you read my mind? She asked. No, though in hindsight that would have been very useful. I was actually predicting Constantine's behavior. Morn admitted. However, you are capable of engaging in combat, which will be necessary. In the meantime, you will come and assist me with repairing our storm Talon. We will require it for our next mission. He said, then turned to depart. Our next mission? Atra asked, following the marine. Correct. The Xeno is engaged in some manner of subterfuge. It is time that we engage them on our own terms. We will conduct an investigation into Alvara Primus. There were two kinds of rain on Alvara. In some places it was the same as it was throughout all of the Imperium, where acrid pollutants from the hives mixed with the water in the air, and it sent down an acrid bombardment. It was a foul time to be out. A stinking rain that made the skin itch, though not strong enough to hamper sturdy steel unless it collected. But in other places, far out on the bridges, or on the open seas between the hives, it was an older rain. Ancient legend said that Holy Terror once was very much like Alvara, a world covered in bountiful oceans. Some trickery had led to the end of that, and the great seas were gone, covered over in miles of permacrete and gold. Perhaps in the youthful days of humanity, when we were yet naive and innocent, it rained softly. You would find that kind of rain out on the open and free seas, or on the great bridges. The Imperium had not killed Alvara yet, her oceans preserved her. Their bounty was key to feeding the hives that poisoned her rains, and other worlds nearby. They could not dredge up her bounties from the great depths, nor could their cities sprawl out all across her. The ancient hives were all the places the Imperium could stand upon this world. And the Imperium had not built them. Such was the case for many hives throughout the Imperium. Ancient structures of the Dark Age of Technology, captured and built upon by the growing reach of the God Emperor. These hives were such a sort, rooted in the mantle of the world, complex and crafted to an extent humanity could no longer replicate. The humans of old had built complex systems into them limiting their effect upon the planet. This too was a testament to that strange time. It must have been a gentler one, to expend resources on such a system. A gentler hive, from a gentler world, like a dream that fades on waking. The rain that fell on the hive was gentler than most in the hives, blown in from the south and west, covering the whole horizon. The green-blue sky, marred by haze, vanished under a gently rolling torrent. The grey-black clouds poured down on the city a silver-grey rain, washing away the blood and smog for a brief moment. It caught on buildings and ran down into pools, dragging the soot and dirt with it. A drop struck the spire clear, and hit the bottom black as tar. They left strange trails of muck, hissing from the heat of the city. The hissing rain left its detritus behind and rose in a silver-pure mist that blanketed the mid-levels of the city. 
It was out into this mist and the somewhat clear rain that Morn and Atra silently went. They moved with solemnity towards the storm clan, accompanied by several tech adepts. They labored in silence over the bellicose machine, steadily dismantling the damaged rotors and bearing each piece back to the forges. There were no spare parts for such a rare and valuable machine, so each one would be remade. The mantras of reforging and rebirth rang through the hottest sections of the forge. Around them sacred oils were gathered, and strong incense burned. It was filled with a fiery character to please and rouse the warlike machine spirit. As they labored, Atra heard their words, but did not listen. She was no tech priest, and had no right to hear their sacred incantations. They did ring familiar to her, the scents and songs alike. She recognized the purpose of several oils, though she had never seen them before. She pondered this strange familiarity for a moment as she walked back outside. She looked out briefly past the storm till and into the swirling silver mists. In spite of all her situation, they filled her with some joy. These were among her first memories. The small hab block she had lived in was lucky enough to have a small window. She remembered sitting, looking out at the mists and daydreaming when she was meant to be reviewing her scholar work. She liked to pretend she could see her father in the mists, bravely fighting against the Xeno and the heretic, as had his before him and so it had been for generations. She wondered what he would think of her now. He was with the Emperor, as was the fate of all guardsmen. Not merely him, but all that long line of hero ancestors. She never met him, any of them. She never set foot on Holy Cardia, whose blood ran in all Alvaran veins. She never even been in the same segmentum. What would they think of her now, those legendary cousins? She started when a figure emerged from the mists, and she realized her steps had faltered. She began to redouble them, then halted and came to attention. It was Constantine. She saluted smartly, flinching slightly as her metal arm made a click where it struck the augments on her eye. The Templar stopped, and the two stood there in the rain a moment. It bounced off his armor, shrouding him in a silver halo. She stood there as well. Did he even recognize her? Bald, misshapen and with as much metal as flesh. Constantine raised his fist and clasped it to chest, returning her salute. Atra. He said, and released the salute. She did as well. He began to move forwards, and touched for where the tip of his sword should be, then paused as he recalled its absence. Heal quickly. I look forwards to training with you again. And that was all. The sun of dawn passed her by, and she went back to work and wondering. Constantine entered the Manufactorum with a small smile under his helmet. He had sensed the time had come to leave his prayers and knew now it was no mere intuition. The Emperor knew his own, and preserved the worthy, even if in the guise of the Machine God. He quickly sought out Aishvan. It was time to get his sword back. He found the salamander towards the back of one of the larger forging chambers. Aishvan had claimed some space for himself, and nearby lay an anvil, hammer, and blacksmith's tools. He had removed his armor to better work, and now stood clad in only the under tunic. Constantine's fingers twitched slightly at the sight of him. The salamander's gene seed was tainted by their home world, mutating all who received it. Beneath the armor, Aishvan's body was unnaturally dark, black as coal, and his eyes glowed crimson as he labored. It was a paradox in Constantine's mind. Mutation was a sign of spiritual corruption, a malformed soul reflected in the body. But the salamanders were unquestionably loyal, among the most loyal of all the emperor's servants. None expressed the love the emperor had for the common people of the Imperium more so than they. Yet they were accursed, mutant. Constantine himself could think of no faults in his battle bro. Cousin. Save perhaps for insufficient hatred, but then again, he'd seen his rage against the lictor. The salamanders were masters of flame, perhaps they simply controlled and did not lose their fury as readily as the Templars. Cousin. Constantine said, letting his presence be known. Ah, your timing is providential brother, I have almost finished the repairs and modifications. Aishvan said with his usual pleasant mood. Modifications? Constantine asked. What modifications? What have you done to my sword? He did not feel fear, but there was a certain level of apprehension at the idea of his blade being altered. 
Even a slight change in the balance would potentially throw him off. You recall how they do not produce the requisite power cells? Well they did not produce the correct kind of energy ring either. I have been forced to work in a slightly different direction, but I believe it should be to your liking. Ishvan replied. Hold a moment longer, the etching is cooling now. Constantine waited, as Ishvan made the last few touches, then rose and turned. What he had done to the blade made Constantine stare. It had already been a finely made weapon, but only that. Where once there was only a plain, if effective sword, there was now a magnificent work. The crossgood had been reworked into an imperial aquila, the central activation switch now the symbol of the templars on one side, and that of the death watch on the other. The blade itself seemed made from dragon scale, woven through with burning threads, and blew along the edge. Along the blade were etched words in high gothic in the Promethean script. Add Vigilia to Vigilance. This and Atra's arm. You have been a remarkably busy blacksmith, Constantine remarked. Those fibers, they are energy coils. The god emperor made sleep somewhat more optional for us. What would I be if I did not take advantage of that? As for the coils, see for yourself. Ishvan replied, and handed the blade to his friend. Constantine felt its weight, still balanced, though slightly heavier to accommodate for the new features. It would take practice to use perfectly again, but it was not intrusive. He thumbed the activation key, then pressed it. He watched as the coils between the scales ignited, and with a hum, and a whoosh, the blade came to life. The coiling power fields lapped over one another, and coated the blade in golden flame, blew hot around the edge where the power field stood strongest. This is truly incredible cousin. Your chapter's reputation is entirely deserved. On the count of craftsmanship or pyromania? Ishvan asked. Both. Ishvan chuckled, and smiled knowingly. Fire cleanses, as the Ekelshiaki is so fond of saying. It is hope to humanity, and a terror to its enemies. Though I'm afraid it's more of a compensation in this case than an upgrade. Ah. Constantine said, deactivating the sword and sheathing it. As I once heard a rogue trader say, what's the catch? The power field around the edge is not nearly as powerful. It will not part armor as easily as it did before. It's the unfortunate consequence of the weaker cells and ring. Constantine explained. However, with the fire weave, whatever it does part shall be all the worse off for it. I'd not fancy taking a blow from this myself. Constantine muttered in acknowledgement. Even his own superhuman physiology would have difficulty withstanding a blow from such a devastating weapon. Swift as a sword, but devastating as an axe. It would mangle on a molecular level, superheat blood to the point of instantaneous evaporation, causing miniature explosions all throughout the body, and trigger heat shock through the entire body, flash frying anything not immediately destroyed. This weave, it's the same type used by the Sororitas? Constantine nodded. Godwin D's Excelsis, commonly used in the Blessed Blades, and my own chapter's more complex items. It seemed fitting given your own fervor. You honor me more than you know. Constantine said. He looked at the weapon with some degree of awe. It brought to mind images of the god emperor's own flaming blade, and while only the palest imitation of that divine artifact, it provided him great comfort. You are my battle brother. How could I do anything less than my very best work? Ishvan replied. Xenobiology, blacksmithing, what next? Do you speak elder? Constantine asked curiously. No, but oh I can talk proper like if oh I needs to. Ishvan replied, in guttural orkish. I have no idea what that means. Constantine admitted. But I've fought enough greenskins to recognize their tongue. It seems your skill with the flamer is the least of your talents. The salamander shrugged. The flamer is a deceptively simple weapon to master. I have slightly more spare time to develop my other skills than you do. Constantine prepared to answer, when their ears picked up a loud whirr, and then an explosion. That was the landing pad our ship was on. Operative word being was. Ishvan looked to his armor. I'll be a moment. Go. Constantine nodded, and ran upwards towards the landing pad. As he moved, the sounds of further explosions rocked the manufactorum. Morn, what in the god emperor's name is going on up there? 
He voxed ahead. I am uncertain. Morn admitted. But it seems quite clear that the Manufactorum is under attack. Cousin I am not deaf I can tell that. Who? Cannot confirm at this time. Lads, I recognize the sound, and you're not going to like it. Wathin cut in. The shells landing are Earthshaker, that's Basilisk fire. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. A few minutes before the shells began to fall, Matthias was standing outside the lift which would take him up to the Manufactorum. He stared at it, somewhat pale, as if it were the inside of a heavy flamer rather than a lift. It had been days since his captain had gone to the aid of the Astartes, and he had heard nothing. There had been no report on her. The rest of the command squad, the entire astropathic choir, and every member of the guard assigned to protect them were listed as dead. But the captain on the other hand wasn't even listed Mia. If the reports were to be believed, then she was alive and well. Which led to the question of where in the god emperor's name she was after a battle that catastrophic. Matthias had considered that there were three likely options. The first was that she was dead, and the Astartes were concealing that fact to preserve morale. This seemed the most likely to him, but considering how his last encounter with the space marines had ended, he wasn't about to ask them. The second was that she had been injured, and so he had checked with any and all medical staff. The medic with the squad had reported she had seen the captain, badly injured taken in a Valkyrie towards the Manufactorum. He had only recently discovered this kernel of information, after two days of digging. It was still more likely that she was dead, but it at least laid to rest the third possibility, one that was all but impossible, but still had haunted him, that for whatever reason, she had turned from the Emperor's light, and simply been erased, forgotten from history. He considered this possibility slightly less likely than Morn showing up for tea and biscuits, but it still nagged at him. He recalled an old parable blessed is the mind too small for doubt. Sometimes he wondered if the Ogrins, abhuman as they were, were actually among the most blessed of all the god emperor's servants because of that. Still, the trail led here, to the Manufactorum. So he summoned his courage, and entered the lift shaft. As he rose, he felt his headache beginning to grow worse from the binary wine. He had slept little, Busy managing the regiment back into something resembling a proper structure after morns, not decimation. Decimation would have been a mercy, obliteration, of the prior command structure. In between focusing on that he had attempted to track down his supposed superior officer. If she was to be the new colonel, as Matthias suspected she would be, given the Astartes favor of her, she would need to know every detail. And, much as he layered it in practical, logical arguments to sway the Mechanicus as best as he was able, he simply was concerned for her. He emerged from the lift shaft about midway up the Manufactorum, and quickly attempted to find his bearings. The interior of the factory temple was as alien to him as the seafloor, and he did not belong here any more than he did there. He moved with faint purpose, acting as if he knew where he was going, and that it was also very important that he got there. He engaged a practiced nobleman stride which was about as useful on the servitors as any other sort of social interaction, then abandoned it, for just getting around them. As he maneuvered away from the ghoulish servants, he glanced back and shivered. Nobody liked servitors, except the Mechanicus, and he wasn't entirely certain about that. He looked forwards and stopped, backpedaling away swiftly. The green armor and black hood and cape of Andriel swept by him. His breath caught in his throat, heart skipping a beat. It then plummeted to the core of the planet when the Dark Angel turned and looked at him balefully. He took another two steps away from the librarian, then remembered himself and saluted. Atra is above, yes she is alive, no she is not well, her plasma gun overloaded and she's been rebuilt primarily out of cybernetics, 
Yes somewhat like that Catherton but no she's still wearing her shirt. Andriel told him curtly. No, you may not see her but yes I will inform her of your concerns and of her duties. And no I cannot confirm or deny whether she will be the new colonel. Matthias paused, stunned speechless. And because I am a sicker, therefore I can read your mind more quickly than you can speak, and thus do not need to spend as much time dealing with you, as I cannot be bothered to waste time making you mortals feel comfortable around that which you rightly fare. Now go away. You have no responsibilities here that vastly more experienced and qualified servants of the Emperor are not already attending to. Andriel concluded, and turned away. Matthias stood flabbergasted, attempting to process what had just happened. Andriel hadn't shot him, that was a good thing. Atra was alive, that was a good thing. Andriel could read his every thought before he even had them. That was, well Andriel was on his side, and also he knew he was loyal. So it wasn't a bad thing, but that didn't make having it done any less uncomfortable. His headache was growing substantially worse, and there was an uncomfortable buzzing in his brain. He started back to the lift. He'd gotten the answers he wanted, though he hadn't seen a trap personally. It occurred to him that Andriel could be lying to him. The Dark Angels were infamous for their secrets, but even if he was, it wouldn't matter. He'd been ordered to leave, and so he was going to leave. His headache began to pound, and he staggered, falling to his side and holding onto the wall. The buzzing in his head became more intense, an all-consuming ringing which drowned out all other noise. It pulsed, beating like a heart. He felt nauseous, and then felt his limbs go limp, losing all feeling to them. What was this? It reminded him almost of the Jenna Steeler's cyclic attack. Was Andriel doing this? The all-consuming buzzing, chittering. Screaming roaring drowned his ears, and he felt nothing. He tasted nothing for the first time in his life. He could now describe what his mouth had tasted like. His sense of smell on the other hand intensified. He drew in breaths, of some sweet and astounding scent, like, well he had no words for it, every breath filled his mind with euphoria even as his brain was filled with a tornado of shattered glass and chain swords. He nearly slipped away into the strange convocation of sensation but some part of him registered that his eyes were still working. In fact it felt like he saw more, or saw differently. He registered the servitors no longer with fear, but with animal analysis. Prey, weak, more food, less food. Threat. The last descriptor came as his eyes fell on Andriel. The Dark Angel had fallen to a knee, staff raised high. Arcane energies swirled around him, and the tech adepts backed away, chittering in their strange cant. They staggered and stumbled, as if they were drunk, or something beneath had shaken them. Strange, he didn't recall looking towards Andriel, and why was he getting closer? Feeling returned in one of his fingers, the familiar grip of his hotshot pistol. A flood of memories struck him, throwing him off his feet and into the swirling mists of Alveria. He remembered the day he received them. He was 12 standard years of age, time enough for him to have a weapon of his own. How massive the pair of pistols had seemed at the time, their warm fur wooded grip, the brilliant and bright focusing lens. He remembered the careful maintenance each evening, against water and weir, to honor the weapons he used. Death he had dealt. Orc boys, near enough to his men to charge, cut down, concentrated beam punching through primitive helm and through the brain, renegades from a planet's PDF, unorganized, scattering under the guns. In the cold decks of battleships on sea and star, in the titan deadly fighting the Alvarin specialized in. The librarian, Andriel, fighting off the cyclic attack himself, on his knees, with only a hood, not a helmet. Wait, no stop. He saw his arm raise, the pistol leveled at Andriel's exposed head. Stop. Stop me. I'm not in control. Help. He screamed, but his mouth did not open. It hung, drooling, and he began to pull the trigger. The LAS bolt went wide, as ceiling and floor spun and began indistinct from one another. He hit the ground, hand already on the other pistol. His body fired it towards the center of the rising mass that was Andriel, but it stuck harmlessly on a psychic barrier. The librarian jerked his staff to the side, and the other pistol went flying out of hand. He then pulled it back. And he rushed forwards no, 
Matthias was flung though the air towards him. He froze in front of the space marine's enraged face, and Andriel placed a hand on his forehead. Lightning tore through Matthias's body, and he began to scream. The space marine forced their eyes to meet, and Matthias fell. His soul seemed to tumble from its disconnected frame, through iron walls and stone corridors, out into the void. But the void did not freeze him, and it was not dark. For an eternal instant he burned, in lights too countless and alien to describe. Then he fell towards a golden beam, like the sun, like forces so potent that they were only found in nature. But not a nature, a godlike soul, piercing the immaterium like a spine-mounted lance cannon. He fell into that golden infinity, and felt his whole being come apart. He did not burn, what was felt was so utterly beyond burning that it lacked words. He fell to the ground, his mouth full of blood. He'd bitten the tip of his tongue off. His eyes were bleeding as well, and, well, he hoped that was blood leaking out of his ears and not his brain. He spat out the tip of his tongue and spat blood hurriedly so as to not choke. The bleeding stopped, or rather was stopped, as he felt the rest of feeling return. He could hear again, feel again, smell something other than that awful intoxication again. There were roaring booms, and the floor beneath him shook. An artillery bombardment, the Tyranids don't have artillery. He slurred. He shouldn't be speaking that clearly, he'd, ah it was back. No, but they don't have LAS pistols either, and yet one just shot one of me, using you. Andriel explained. It appears the attack was widely directed. Attack? Matthias asked, still confused. I, oh, by the god emperor I tried to shoot you, twice. And then ah, what, what was, was that the astronomican? I've heard navigators describe it like that. Did you just throw me, or, my mind, or my soul or whatever into the astronomican? Of course not. There would be nothing left if I had, and if I were that powerful they would have sent just me to deal with the invasion. Andriel replied. I simply purified your mind. Which is why you are saying literally everything you think. I have removed all internal restraints as well as a side effect of the purification. Well I have no idea what any of that meant but I'm scared shitless of you already and confused and generally entirely out of sorts and really don't want to be here. God Emperor's balls I need a drink and a lie down but nope, getting bombarded, and oh God Emperor I can't stop talking please someone shut me up before the Astarte shoot me oh and then he shut up. You have been shut up. Andriel replied. You should return to normal, eventually. I don't know how long it takes mortals. And I wouldn't shoot you, I would simply sever every blood vessel in your head and disassemble your blood brain barrier. Saves ammunition. Matthias stared at the dark angel. Had he just made a joke? I found it funny. Andriel remarked. Go find your guns. You'll need them. Another blast sounded through the factorum. I can't do purification at Basilisk range, and it takes a bit of time. The first that Morn and Atra knew of the attack was when a missile struck the storm Talon as they were approaching it. The explosion blew both back, Atra hopping slightly to stay on her feet. Then another hit, and another and another, and the pair retreated swiftly inside the manufactorum as shrapnel flew. Atra registered one large piece flying towards her eye, when the refractor field deflected it away, and she ducked behind cover. Morn slammed his fist into the door controls, slamming the great shutters closed before the bombardment could spread. Outside, they could hear the groan of straining metal, and the crash as the landing pad fell off the side of the building. The building began to shake, as more explosions resounded off all around her. What in the drowned hells was that? Atra shouted. When the feth did the nids get manticore missiles? I don't know. You purged the Jenna Steelers, and that could have only come from one of the defenses I mounted. Morn growled. Whoever is responsible, he paused, shaking in fury, before he calmed himself and spoke calmly, deliberately, and in the most terrifying tone Atra had ever heard. They blew up my ship. They are dead. It was then that they received Wathin's message. Acknowledged, I guessed as much. Morn asked. Where are you that you can hear them? In the building, where else? Wathin replied. Why are you in the manufactorum? Morn asked. 
educating a fetching young biologous lass on the finer points of a start's anatomy, clearing up a few misconceptions. Wathin replied. Morn paused for a moment. Very well. Meet us in Central Command. We must evaluate the situation in more detail, and for the Omnigia's sakes, wear your helmet, the enemy may have heavy bolters now. The kill team ray assembled in the central control room, where already several monitors displayed various tech priests, as well as the canoness of the Cathedral of St. Augustina. Constantine nodded at her as he entered. The Emperor protects. Indeed he does, though several of our younger sisters have been given his peace, for their faith was not strong enough. It is the entire city then? Morn asked as he entered, face grimmer than usual. Not merely the city tech brother. The local Margos, a mess of wires and tubes that was only vaguely humanoid, replied. The attack has fallen on all remaining hives. Planet wide? That shouldn't be possible. Morn growled. Well it has been done. The Margos replied. You're both correct, it shouldn't be possible, but somehow it's been done. Andriel replied as he entered the room, Matthias trailing close behind him. It was a single cyclic attack, targeting the entire planet. I can feel it in the air, tense as a wire. Whatever is doing this has stretched themselves thin to accomplish it, but it's been done. I suppose that explains why they targeted our astropaths. If it's spreading itself that thin, then any sicker could pierce it. Atra acknowledged. Yes, but that doesn't explain why none of us were affected. It targeted me, but that was a direct attack not part of the wider spell. Andriel explained. I brushed that off without any difficulty at all. However it didn't affect any of us, or the Mechanicus, or Atra. To put it in low gothic, it's hard to mind control a toaster, but that can't be all of it. What's a toaster? Constantine asked. Irrelevant. The Margos replied. The Omnigia protects us with logic. Clearly he has also shielded the Guards woman. That leaves us. Ishvan replied as he entered, donning his helmet as he did so. Is everyone going to announce themselves by cutting in on the conversation? The Margos replied, mildly annoyed at how cramped his control room was starting to get. Ishvan politely ignored him. Andriel, do you think it's synaptic in nature? Possible. It certainly felt like the hive mind, but, he frowned. There is something else. Something more than the mere animal mind directed. It is something else, something more, something worse, and I do not know what. For the first time, he sounded concerned, almost afraid. There was something in this alien even to him. If the Tyranid could do this, it would do it more often. This is something else, something using the Tyranids as much as our guardsmen. Regardless of what it is, the real question is what do we do? Constantine asked. The Manufactorum is a formidable defense, but it cannot hold forever. Bring up the long range or specs. Morn ordered. Show us the status of the fleet. A nearby screen appeared, flashing through images with incredible speed. Even the other Astart struggled to keep up, but Morn watched with cold analysis. The high fleet is scattered, the main forces are now moving to provide relief. He explained. However, the enemy controls the planetary guns, and we have no way to contact the fleet. They're walking right into a trap. Constantine growled. It will be a massacre, and without support from the fleet, Elvira will fall. Then holding out is not an option. Morn replied. We will find the source of this attack, and destroy it. For the Emperor. Alright, all very dramatic and all that, but how exactly do we plan on doing that? Constantine asked. We are currently trapped in a factory with all the defenses we constructed shooting at us. We don't know what's responsible, where it's coming from, or how to stop it. It's coming from the central hive, and whatever vector they're propagating the synaptic signal with most likely came with the rain. Ishvan, after several minutes of pondering. Andriel blinked. Brother I will not fault you for your poor understanding of psychic powers but you cannot convey them through water. It only looks like electricity. Not the water, what's in it? Ishvan replied. I hypothesize that the synaptic relay is being bounced through a waterborne tyrannid microorganism, 
one hour enhanced physiology and the cybernetics of the Mechanicus kill. Some sort of variant on the same organism they used to break down a planet's microbiosphere. That's, HM. Well considering they can engineer a psychic hood to be grown like an organ, and their brains are designed in arcane sigils. Andriel grumbled. There isn't enough mind in a bacterium to have any psychic potential. It would be utterly fantastic for there to be telepathic germs. A single one perhaps, but a collective of millions, billions, trillions, operating within a local structure, rapidly reproducing inside a host body, a network within the larger network, Ishvan explained. A microcosm of the Tyranid on a microscopic level, all to act just as a connector. Andriel pondered for a moment. Yes I can follow your logic, but how exactly did you come to this conclusion just on the rain? Simple. There are no Tyranids in the Hive City, but there must be Tyranids in order to project the Hive Mind. We eliminated their forces in the Underhive, and considering we have a Titan protecting that entry point now, we'd have known if they moved something in. It therefore had to infiltrate by another method, and the only new variable is the rain. Ergo, they came in through the rain, ergo they must be some manner of microscopic organism. Furthermore, the storm came from the direction of the capital, which the Xeno retains control of. Yes, that does make sense. Which means the origin point of all this blasphemy is there, in the fallen capital. Constantine agreed, and slammed his fist into his palm. Which means we can crush it. Margos. We require your fastest ship, ours has been destroyed. You are in my Manufactorum Templar. The Margos replied with a binary snarl. I am not some chapter surf you may compel. Beyond that, we do not manufacture aircraft or voidcraft here, only seafaring vessels. If you attempted to cross the seas with both the Xeno and the Alvaran navy against you, you would almost certainly be destroyed. Additional point. The Margos of Alvara Tetris cut in through the view screen. Your absence will jeopardize the STC. Morn have most certainly calculated this. I have. Morn replied. However, if we remain here then we will almost certainly be overwhelmed. Even if we had the numbers to repel the guard, or the prepared positions, we cannot face both Alvarez military and the Tyranid at once. No support is coming that will not be obliterated by the city's defenses. Adopting a defensive position will result in our defeat and the loss not only of the STC, but the entire planet in 100% of cases. I calculate if we can find a way to reach the central hive, we have roughly a 7.689% chance of achieving limited victory. At this stage, absolute victory is an utter impossibility. The mood became, if at all possible, even more grim at that statement. Absolute victory was impossible. Even if the invasion could now be stopped, Alvaro would never be the same. In all likelihood, every man, woman, and child that remained entirely human was already damned. Morn pronounced their doom with grim resolve. Woth invisibly gripped his teeth, fists clenching. Ishvan was utterly silent. Andriel nodded in solemn agreement, and Constantine fumed in his armor. Atra simply stood shell-shocked by the pronouncement. She was still attempting to process the entire situation, there was simply too much that had occurred over the past few days. She sat down, eyes staring off into nothing, and went exceedingly pale. Matthias was little better, still rattled from the attack and his subsequent revival, he nearly fainted. Then he paused, and spoke. No, it's not. You can break the ability. That's why they tried to kill all the sickers. I'm free of it now. So, if we can find some way of neutralizing the Tyranids, we may still be able to revive our people. Andriel turned to the noble. Your Ray Awakening nearly destroyed you, and I do not have the ability to project it on a wide field. The counter prevailing forces are too strong. He explained. I cannot save your people. So we find the thing responsible and we kill it. If it's something this powerful then it would throw the high fleet into disarray, and allow the reinforcements fleets to land and retake Alvara. Then we could fix my people. The psychic backlash of the entity's death will very likely kill most, and drive most of the survivors insane. There will be very few left. Andriel replied. But there will be some. Matthias answered, not budging. 
and perhaps the mad ones can be helped. I will not allow you to write off my people, to write off my planet is lost. Morn turned towards him. Your planet is lost, in all probability. We cannot change that. Matthias turned, and flinched under the Tetchmarine's glare. He looked away, breathing heavily, then gathered his courage and stared the marine down. You came to protect this world. You have fought alongside us, and you know that we are worth saving. You didn't abandon Atra. Don't abandon the rest of us. We are loyal. I have been under this spell. I know every last one of the men firing at you is screaming at themselves to stop. We are not traitors, and we are not lost. Morn looked down at the furious adjutant, and a kernel of respect blossomed for him. Yes, he was loyal, overly loyal to his own world perhaps, but such was to be expected. There were also benefits to keeping some survivors, they could be screened, processed, the resilient determined for what they were and used to compose new generations of resilient individuals. Even the weak or mad could be useful to analyzing this new weapon of the enemy. He nodded. I give you my word. I will protect your people, for they are the emperors. Matthias nodded. Check the territories of the noble houses, they maintain private craft, some for more militaristic pursuits than others. You might find something you can use there. We can use. Morn corrected him. We will require every available asset for this mission. You and Atra will both be assisting us. Psychological profile indicates you are not stupid enough to attempt to order the Mechanicus in this manner Morn. The Margos intervened. We will prioritize protecting the STC at any cost. This world may burn for all we care, but the STC must be preserved. I expected no less. Morn replied. My advice, not order, is that all available forces rally here, and you construct a vehicle capable of escaping orbit. If we fail, this planet will fall, and to prevent the spread of this scourge to other words, it will most likely be subjected to the ultimate sanction, no mere cleansing with the life eater virus, but the total destruction of the world. Wathen growled in agreement. The Inquisitan have sundered worlds for less than what has occurred here. Best to leave now and start running, they'll be on your scent once they learn of this. Matthias looked to Ishvan, who nodded. The officer returned the nod gratefully, and then helped Atra to her feet and out the door. He sat her down on a nearby bench, and checked her over. She was still completely out of it, overwhelmed by the stress of the past few days. Atra? Captain Atra can you hear me? He asked. Atra looked towards him, seeming to come back from her trance. She closed her eyes, and breathed slowly and deeply. Her emotions still raged within her, a torrent of anger and fear and sorrow that threatened to overwhelm her. She couldn't even begin to process all of it, it was just too much. She wanted to break down and cry, or scream, or break something all at once. Then she recalled what had just occurred. She'd gone out of it, completely gone, and left Matthias to cover for her. Shame and anger filled her, and gave the anger response the leverage it needed to overwhelm the others. She shook with fury, her arm burned. Matthias stepped aside, and she snapped, exploding outwards in a moment of violent rage. Her metal fist hit the opposite wall with enough force to crumple it. Her arm cooled, blue light within dimming. She paused, breathing heavily for a moment before she composed herself somewhat. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have made you face them yourself. I'm the superior officer now, I'm supposed to act like it. I don't blame you at all. Matthias replied. All this, it's just too much. Maybe they are made for it but you and I, we're mortals. This is something nobody should have to deal with, let alone that on top of what you've been through. God Emperor, I almost didn't recognize you. That was the wrong thing to say. Atra visibly flinched, the grinned bitterly. I mean you're not wrong. I don't even really look human anymore. Like one of their bloody servitors. Wonder if my hair will ever grow back, or will I need to get one of those ridiculous wigs? I know a good manufacturer. Matthias replied kindly. And you'll be able to afford it with officer's pay. Atra snorted. I suppose, assuming there's a regiment left to lead. Still got me captain. Matthias replied. Yeah. I guess I do. Atra replied, smiling slightly, 
tiredly. God I need an Amzek, or to sleep for a month. Don't think we'll have time for the former, but I'll see what I can bring up for the later. Not good to drink on mission, so we'll set it aside for when we've won. 7% chance of even partial victory. Ata reminded him. I'll get the good stuff then. 7% is really worth celebrating. Meanwhile, back in the command room, Morn was flicking through the extensive lists of properties owned by the Spire Nobles. They flew big at speeds only a superhuman could process, and he examined each in turn. He frowned, there was nothing that truly suited their purposes, but then he found something interesting. Access denied. The cogitator beeped at him pleasantly. Something we don't have access to? Constantine asked, surprised. Did you accidentally check an inquisitor's file? I do not cause accidents. Morn replied. And you forget we are an order militant. We are, in some manner, an arm of the inquisition, there should be very little we cannot access. No, we aren't, and I never will be. Wathin replied, snarling. His long fangs gleamed. And imply I am again and you and I will have words. Noted. Morn replied, and began attempting to access the restricted file. Access denied. Access denied. Access denied. Morn simply placed his hand to the screen, and a terrible piercing whine resonated through the air, so loud even the astards reflexively cover their ears. Recognized. The mechanical voice replied, Welcome Screely. And then it faded. Was that really necessary? Wathin asked, shaking his head to clear the ringing. Something of a last resort to get through. The file, whatever it was, was heavily encrypted. I simply overrode it through brute force. Morn replied. Let's see here. Yes, I think we might have an answer. Lord Morath was hiding something, some manner of advanced prototype. Project Equinox. Double quote. Prototype? Is it a weapon? Ishvan asked. Better. It's some sort of stealth ship. Morn replied. Though considering some of the details, I see why he kept it secret. Its armament's ability is only matched by how restricted it is. Nothing of the warp, but some of the technology appears to be based on Elder Designs, assuming he wasn't foolish enough to use their technology directly. Constantine blinked. You expect us to use an Elder ship? Those things run on witchery and blasphemous sorcery. No. I expect you to use an Imperial ship that may have some designs based on Elder technology. Considering we do not have access to Wraithbone, there will be no arcane components. I suspect it is an imitation. Simply because someone other than me would have shot him by now if it was fully Zenitech. As it is, this seems to dance dangerously along the line. And we're going to use it. Constantine sighed. I shall have to make an additional appointment to use the pain glove for purification. Wait that actually exists? Andriel asked. I thought it was a myth. It exists. Constantine confirmed. It is a highly effective form of mediation. Alternatively, Njod. Wathin suggested. If pain is weakness leaving the body, best to have it go all the way through. I don't think that's pain. Ishvan replied. Lightweight. The Astartes began to depart, discussing the optimal route to the hidden hangar. Atra rose, raising her arm in a salute as they passed. Ishvan paused for a moment. I will be a moment, Atra, a word. He replied. Atra nodded, and followed the marine as he stepped aside. If even Ishvan was angry with her, then she was well and truly doomed. Still, she did her best to hold herself upright. Milord. Before anything else, I wish to sincerely apologize for my moment of weakness. It was utterly inappropriate for an officer of the guard and... Ishvan raised a hand for her to stop, then stepped forwards and wrapped his arms around her. He drew her into a gentle hug, holding her close. There is nothing to apologize for. What has occurred is a horror which would break any mortal, that you still stand as a testament not to your weakness, but to your strength. Atra shook for a moment, and then collapsed, sagging forwards and beginning to cry. It's too much. She said quietly. My world is gone, my comrades are gone, even my body is gone, and my duty is greater than ever before. 
It's too much. I'm not strong enough to deal with all of this. Considering the dents you keep putting the walls, I think you may be stronger than you give yourself credit for. Ishvan replied. But yes, it's a heavy burden. I'm not even entirely certain I and my brothers can bear it. But we're the only ones who have a chance. The strong have a duty to fight for the weak, even when the odds seem impossible, even when they can barely move under their burdens, we must keep fighting. Because we are the only hope for the world. You are a miserable comforterish. It's not as though there wasn't enough pressure already. Pressure creates adamantine. The salamander replied. And perhaps it will not make you feel better, but it must give you the strength to keep moving. Duty is not a burden, it is the strength which pushes us to become more than we are. That is the true power of humanity, to continually evolve and improve, to face the impossible challenge and to make it possible. No foe shall be beyond our wrath, and no star beyond our grasp, for it is our destiny to claim the cosmos, and defend it against all invaders. I'm not even sure if I really qualify as human anymore. Atra confessed. Am I not human then? Ishvan asked. What makes a human is their soul, and neither steel nor gene tailoring can alter that. We are all human, each one in the god emperor, and together we will be stronger than the trials which surround us, even if we stumble or crack. We are both the defenders of humanity, angel of death, and hammer of the emperor. While we yet draw breath, until all our blood is poured out and every bone is crushed, Alvaro is not yet lost. Atra raised her head, face set with determination. Alvaro is not yet lost. The time had come for desperate maneuvers. The hive, fallen by treachery and sorcery where flesh and violence had failed, was against them. All remaining free souls on the planet were now pinned down, the Mechanicus and their Manufactorum, the sisters of battle in their convent. In but a few days, the relief fleet would move into geosynchronous orbit to deploy the relief force, and be torn to pieces by the now corrupted defense guns. Already, the forces of the hive fleets were pushing towards the hives. The guns were silent, and the Xeno would soon walk the streets unopposed. But Alvaro was not yet lost. The kill team, Wathin, Constantine, Ishvan, Andriel, Morn, Atra, Matthias, still stood. The last hope for this dying world still stood, and readied themselves for an impossible mission. The Mechanicus would give them all the support they could, but they would not dedicate their forces. Every single Skateri and Adept would be dedicated to the defense of the STC still hidden in the bowels of the Manufactorum, a single device worth an entire sector of planets. But in the meantime, they would have their pick of any arms and material the Adepts could offer. For the Space Marines, this primarily meant a ray supply on their stock of grenades, bolter shells, and power packs. They already possessed the finest war gear the Imperium could offer, and nothing the Mechanicus could offer them would surpass it. The exception was Ishvan, who supplemented his heavy flamer with a rocket launcher. It was originally meant to be used by two guardsmen, but for the mightier starts, it could be easily fired with only a single hand. He carried with him as many crack missiles as he could which considering his great strength was quite a few, drastically increasing the kill team's potential anti-tank firepower. A necessity now that they would face not merely the bio-forged bulk of hive tyrants and carnifexes, but also corrupted lemon rust and potentially even Malkada heavy tanks. To Atra and Matthias, it instead brought a substantial upgrade in the quality of their war gear. Allowed to take the best of the armory, they were quickly fitted into suits of carapace armor. This more advanced form of protection, normally relegated to stormtrooper elites, provided far greater protection than their previous flak armor, which provided about as much protection as the Imperial Guardsman's uplifting guide provided useful information. Matthias, considering his aptitude with dueling pistols, was equipped with a pair of rare and valuable plasma pistols, with the express instruction that they would be returned once this mission was done, whether Matthias had survived or not. As for Atra, her skill with the blade led her to being granted an officer's power sword. Upon receiving it, she flicked the switch, and felt the comforting hum of the energy field. She aligned her block as she had been taught, and practiced a few swings. It was light, feather light compared with the monstrous bulk of the chainsword she had learned with, 
Or perhaps she was simply far stronger now. She could even wield it one-handed. She began to look for a pistol to supplement it, but the adept stopped her. That will be unnecessary. She informed her. She, Atra could recognize that this one was a female, though she couldn't quite tell how. You already have a ranged weapon. What are you talking about? Atra asked, then looked towards her arm suspiciously. Lord Ishvan integrated a plasma gun into your new prosthetic, owing to your preference for the weapon. However, for obvious reasons, the supercharge function has been disabled. The investment placed in you is too high to allow you to destroy yourself again. I wasn't exactly planning to blow myself up the first time. Atra said. She wasn't entirely certain of whether that was true or not. Her memories of the battle were hazy, owing both to the injury to her head, and the vaguely blurry state her battle rage gave all memories. She wasn't certain whether the overcharge had been a deliberate move to bring the lictor down with her, or a simple error that gave the impression of great sacrifice. Regardless. It has been implanted, you should be able to activate it at will. The adept advised her. Curiously, Atra began to consider how that would work. As the thought on it, she could feel it, the weapon in her arm, almost like a new muscle, strong but untrained. She focused on it, flexing the weapon in her mind. She could feel tension, a rising heat in her arm, blue lines began to course across the arm and a door in her palm clicked open. Not in the armory. The adept shouted in alarm. Atra quickly realized her mistake and cut the power to the shot. Sorry. Sorry. Didn't mean to activate it. Still new to this. She apologized profusely, raising her arms and waving them in a motion of denial in an attempt to calm the tech priest. The adept quickly escorted her away from the high explosives and towards a practice range. The plasma screamed across the distance between her and the target, a crudely built scrap sculpture of an orc. The lovely thing about it was that it was just as ugly and ramshackle as a green skin, and they probably would have found it quite flattering. Or in their own words proper orky. Though somewhat less so after the plasma struck the steel skull and melted it, sending dripping steel and blue fire to the floor. Atro pulled back. It was easy, almost instinctual to fire. Her arm shifted to target even more swiftly than when she'd held it both hands. The recoil, however little there was, spread through her body evenly, and she could feel herself automatically correcting to the shot. It was as though she had been using the weapon for a lifetime already. It concerned her actually, how quickly she seemed to adapt to these unnatural augmentations. She thought on this, and on her newfound ability to understand Beneric. Morn had been responsible for her reconstruction, integrating steel and flesh as only a tetchmarine of the Iron Hands could. Her new body was a masterwork, but she wondered how the marine had tinkered with her mind. The damage to her had affected her brain as well, and that too had been reconstructed. What else had the marine left in her mind beyond her new capabilities? You adapt quickly. The Omnigiamus have blessed you with a uniquely cooperative machine spirit. A familiar voice spoke from near her. Atra turned, and smiled. Mara, metal eyes and all, approached. It really is spectacular, some of my finest work. Astounding what we can do under a veteran's guidance. Good to see you too Mara. Atra replied. I take it you were also part of my repairs? She still wasn't entirely certain for the terms involved. Of course. I am the only one who'd worked on you before. On the upside, I made sure that you won't have to worry about needing glasses anymore. She replied, having made an attempt at a joke. He- This is your doing then. Atra replied, tapping the side of her head where the metal replaced her flesh. Do I have you to blame for losing all my hair too? Oh it's not lost it's just shaved. It should grow back, and grow over the metal to cover some of it. Skull work is usually ugly because the hair or hoods cover it. No offense but it all seems fairly ugly to me. Not that I'm not grateful to still be alive, but... The tech priest nodded sympathetically. But it's not you. Of course it isn't. She explained. You aren't Mechanicus. This isn't something you asked for or understand. Even if you were an acolyte, or a skiteri I more likely, augmentations like yours would have been added gradually, probably over the course of a decade. You might even have more than me, all at once. 
Heh, well that's a thought. I go from myself to less oh. Right. Sorry. She started, then stopped when she saw Mara's eyes narrow. Less human. Mara replied, with no small amount of anger. Never allow that lie to take root Atra. It is the most vile deception. The words of the great enemy, the flesh lord. It is an abomination, a pervasive heresy that will destroy you if you heed its words. Never allow yourself to think of yourself as less human because of your augmentations, and never allow it to distance you from your brothers and sisters. If you believe the machine has aliened you, that you are machine more than human, you will become that. A machine with a mind, an abomination. She spoke with a ferocious warning, fervent and angered, but warning, not condemning. Atra was taken aback, she'd known her poor choice of words would offend the tech priest, but this level of fervent fear and anger. Well, it seemed Constantine didn't have a monopoly on faith. She felt awkward. She of course worshipped the god emperor, everyone did. But it was never really a great part of her, there was too much practical to be done to make sure she didn't die in his name too soon. That fervor, that anger. It reminded her of her battle rage, and wasn't sure how anyone could sustain that, it must be exhausting. I'm sorry. She said, not really sure what else to say. Don't be sorry, be better. Mara warned her, then sighed. Time's running out, we've both got our missions. Before you go, would you allow me to pray for you? She asked. Atra considered it. It was rare that anyone asked to pray for her. The litanies were chanted, the priests gave their sermons. It wasn't asked, and it wasn't personal. It was for the guardsmen. Never for a guardsman, certainly never for Atra personally. It was given, expected that she would receive it and be thankful. This was different, personal. I would be honored. She replied at length, and bowed her head and closed her eyes. Mara stepped forwards, and laid a hand on the Guards woman. She anointed her with oils, and spoke quietly in holy binary. Atra should not have been able to understand, but did, and the words touched her. Omnisia, shield this loyal servant from all weakness. Preserve her from the lies of the anti-path, and cleanse her of all deception. Shield and protect her from the beast and destroyer. Empower her weapons to strike down the foe. Ward her mind from the insidious Zeno, and let holy fury cleanse all fair. Watch over her, the last daughter of Alvara, and set us free from the domination of Flez. She removed her hand. Now rise. You are, and always will be, Alvaran, son of Storm, daughter of the rain. While you draw breath, Alvara is not yet lost. But now know you are also a child of the Omnisiac, blessed by his sacred machinery and a fragment of his all-providing essence. Go forth, and destroy the enemies of mankind. Atra rose, and the two women embraced before heading on their separate ways. The kill team assembled by a lower sally gate. Even as they stood there, less than half a day passed from the beginning of the attack, the bombs continued to fall. The ancient manufactorum shook pieces falling from on high down towards the floor below. It was sturdy, and built to last, but the firepower of the Imperial Guard, now turned to the Xenos, was overwhelming. Their plan was simple. First, they would break from the Sally Gate and push into a nearby spire. They would then battle their way up that spire until they reached the level of Project Equinox, and continue the rest of their journey to it from that elevation. It was a calculated risk. Much of the heavy artillery was dedicated towards the lower levels, but the heights were still vulnerable to attack from many mantic or missile batteries, and heavy armor could be moved up to secure the bridges between the upper spires. Still, it was either that, or face the full might of pre-sighted artillery and overwhelming mechanized formations. Even the Astartes could not withstand that kind of punishment. It was 140 meters from the sally gate to the target spire. If the guard were still possessed of their own minds, it would be clear. That near to the target of the artillery, they would be in danger of being struck by their own guns. However, the hive mind now dominated, and would fearlessly expend its puppet forces to delay and destroy the Astartes. From there, they would need to ascend 8 stories on foot to reach a lift platform take that another 82 stories to reach the upper spires and traverse 4 kilometers of bridges and spire fortifications to reach the concealed hangar. 
Morn would then grant them access, and using the stealth fields on the equinox, they would fly low through the city, and escape out onto the seas. It was a desperate plan, perhaps even a foolhardy one. If they were blocked on the approach to the spire, they would be obliterated by the artillery. If the enemy had heavily garrisoned the spire, they could be checked, and crushed under overwhelming numbers. If the puppet guard could react quickly enough, they could be ambushed when they exited the lift, or targeted by Valkyrie elements or even tanks on the great bridges. If the Equinox's stealth fields failed to protect them, they would be blown out of the sky by their own AAA. It was a dangerous gamble, but a necessary one. Even if they managed to escape, their remaining task seemed no less insurmountable. They would have to infiltrate a hive city infested by Tyranids. They would have to locate the source of the signal. They would have to fight their way to it, destroy it, and then escape. For anyone else, it would have been impossible. So few against so many. Even other Astartes might have balked at their task. But they were Death Watch, and today they would show this galaxy why they were the greatest and most skilled of all the God Emperor's servants. And not merely the Angels of Death. At their side, Matthias and Atra, the last two free Alverans, stood ready. Even with Atra's new enhancements, they would not match the skill, experience, or raw power of the Astartes. If they fell behind, they would surely perish. But even so, they were Alvaran, son of the storm, daughter of the clean rains. They would not sit and cower, only to die at last under Xenoclaws or their own brethren's guns. They would go out to meet them, as fearless in battle as their Cadian ancestor. With faith, steel, and plasma, they would go to set their world free, or to declare the courage of her last free children to the god emperor himself. Constantine thumbed the activation switch on Vigil, wreathing the blade in fire. Ishvan primed his pilot light. Morn ran calculations at incredible speeds, taking an audio, sonar, and visual data from all along their path. Wathin donned his helmet, grim grey face vanishing under cold blue ceramite. Anbiel raised his staff, the power of the warp wrapping around the group in a kind shield. Matthias checked his pistols, Atra charged her arm. The gate opened, revealing a scene of grey smoke and shell craters. The overwhelming noise of the barrage hit them like a solid wall of sound. It was virtually deafening, even muted as it was through the protective warp bubble. Constantine raised his flaming blade, and let out the cry to move forth. For Alvara. For the Death Watch. For the Emperor. The first leg of their mad dash truly was nothing more. Even the Astartes, bold and disciplined as they might be, were nothing more than target practice for the wall guns of a prepared hive city. They burst from the Manufactorum at top speed, Wathin and Constantine leading the way. Morn and Andriel kept up in the center, the Tetchmarine carrying both mortals and his Macadendrites. Even with her enhancements, Atra would never be able to match the sheer speed and ferocity of the Astartes, and so was carried for this first, explosive section. Ishvan brought up the rear, both heavy weapons mounted to allow him to move unimpeded. For the first few moments, the roar of guns and the continual smoke and mist seemed to cover them. Shrouded as they were, it might even be that they could reach the spire without being fired upon, but it was not to be. Raven Guard notwithstanding, space marines are far from stealthy, and even the sons of Korax would have struggled to maintain stealth at a dead sprint. Fortunately, the day was just enough, grim with smoke and fog, to keep the guns from getting an easy lock. The first shell soared past the space marines and landed behind them, scattering shrapnel everywhere. The flecks of permacrete and steel were small though, easily warded away by the kind shield. Then another came, and another and another. At their intense speed, with low visibility, and with little time to prepare, the odds of the enslaved guardsmen landing a direct hit were exceptionally low. But even a 1% chance of success becomes a sure thing when 100 guns are fired. It was simply a question of how many guns could be brought online to turn the odds from a dice roll, to a coin flip, to a sure thing through weight of fire. Though the kill team would not give them much of a chance to do so. At top speed, an Astartes moves nearly three times faster than the fastest mortals alive. Up to 30 miles per hour is not merely reasonable, but perhaps a bit slow. 
Constantine was easily reaching 35, young, limber, and blood running hot. The door to the spire was shut, but not shut well enough to resist bolt of fire. Well, let us not be unfair. It resisted the shells fired into it from Morn and Wathin's bolters, but not the half ton of power armor, superhuman flesh, and zealous fury named Constantine that shoulder checked it with the force of a small tank. The door remained intact, but was simply blasted, hinges, frame, and lock, out of the permacrete wall and across the room. Constantine swept the area as he took a few steps inwards, scanning through the newly powdered wall for any threats. Once he had, and the rest of the kill team caught up, he rolled his shoulder with a light grunt. They built that door well. If not for the bolt of fire it might have taken a couple seconds more to open it. You'd know. Andriel replied, dropping the kind shield back to around himself. It wasn't overly strenuous to extend the psychic barrier over the rest of the kill team, but it did potentially stretch it thin. Cut the chatter, interception forces will be on their way. Morn ordered. The kill team nodded, hefted weapons, put down the mortals, and moved out. Following the plans, they moved through the first floor efficiently until they came to a large stairwell. This area was tight, not built for the space marines bulk, and they proceeded upwards in single file. They made it up four floors, before Wathin's keen ears picked up a sound. It was a rattle of several metal objects striking against one another, then the clicks of multiple smaller bits of metal hitting the floor. Grenade bouquet. Get down, he shouted. An instant later, a bundle of crack grenades dropped down the center of the stairwell towards them. The Astartes took what little cover they could, and Aishvan moved to shield the mortals with his body. All save Andriel, who watched the falling grenades with contempt, then smirked as their flight reversed, and they hurtled back up the stairwell. Constantine, disruption. Morn nodded, and the Templar nodded. Stepping through the guardrail as if it were little more than a strand of thread, he leapt into the air in the center of the well. Above him, the grenade bouquet detonated. The shockwave passed over him, and he fired his jump pack. Surging through the aftermath of the explosion, he struck the ragged remnants of the guardsman squad without mercy. He announced his arrival knife first, stabbing it into a guardsman's chest and hurling him across the stairwell. His flaming blade swept forth in three great arcs, ripping through flak armor and flesh like tissue paper. The one surviving guardsman fired his last gun repeatedly into the marine, but it had no effect. With no concern for his life, he charged, bayonet lowered. He had the high ground, and sought to drive the blade into the weak point where Constantine's helmet met the rest of his armor. But the marine was too swift, cutting through the last gun with a single blow, that also removed the enslaved guardsman's head. As Constantine held back, or more accurately slaughtered, the first wave of the ambush, the rest of the kill team pushed forwards. Wathin moved forwards with all speed, and then paused as he heard yet another familiar sound. Ogrins incoming. Above and below. He warned, and the team whirled to deal with the new threat. Wathin dealt with the one in front, as it stepped onto the stairwell between him and Constantine. His bolt pistol barked twice, smashing craters into the abhuman's chest, but it charged anyways. The space marine stopped short the Ogrin sweeping down and striking the stair just in front of him. Wathin took a step forwards onto them all, trapping it, and decapitated the beast with a single blow. As he carried onwards and upwards, he turned as another one charged him, smashing through a door onto the stairway. He blocked a clumsy overhead strike, but the abhuman was ferociously strong. He pulled his bolt pistol and fired from the hip, two shots into the Ogrin's stomach. It didn't put the monster down, but it did stagger it. Returning the pistol to his hip, he balled his fist and punched the enslaved abhuman and the same wound he had just created. The already ruined flesh snapped, and the ogrin broke in half at the waist. With a heave, he tossed the upper half of the abhuman over the side of the stair, sending it crashing to the floor below. Meanwhile, Aishvan faced the lower ambush. This ogrin came with fire support, a squad of guardsmen all reaching for their grenades. The salamander hesitated for only a moment, before pulling the trigger on his flamer. Cleansing Prometheum instantly released the guardsmen from their enslavement, and sent them quickly to the Emperor's side. 
Andriel vaguely noted the flame as he moved upwards. It was far hotter than the salamander's usual mix, bringing mercifully quick death. Even still, it was not enough to stop the ogren. The beast raised its slab shield to block the flames, and charged towards the salamander, swinging its maul. Ishvan released his grip on the flamer with one hand, and caught the falling mace by the arm. He had the leverage, and the high ground, but could not bring the flamer to bear. Atra, seeing this, charged back down the stairs. Dropping into a slide, she slipped between the two giant's legs. She rose, igniting her power sword and cutting through the ogren's knee with a single blow. As the giant fell, it swung wildly, but the hours of training with Constantine kicked in. Reflexively, she blocked, shearing the primitive weapon in half, and countering with a decapitating strike. Looking up, she saw Mathias with pistols pointed at her, and moved to the side flattening herself against the wall. She watched two blasts of blue flame streak across the space she had just occupied, down the stair, and into the raised grenade gauntlet of an ogrin bonehead. The superheated hydrogen cooked off the grenade while it was still in the barrel, blasting the ogrin to pieces and giving her a moment of reprieve. She raced up the stair, then turned and fired back into yet more oncoming guardsmen. With Atra in the field of fire, and no chance for her to move back over Ishvan into position, the two mortals took up rearward fire support, blasting their enslaved comrades apart with disciplined volleys of plasma. Up the stair, Constantine reached the 8th floor and moved for the door. But as he turned, he felt a sinking feeling in the depths of his being. Somehow, he sensed he was in great danger, and flung himself to the side as he entered the room, unable to stop his momentum. There was a roar of superheated air, as a Lascanon in the back of the room fired. If he had been an instant slower, it would have punched through his armor and killed him instantly. He had no time to process this though, as the Lascanon was hardly the only weapon the enslaved had prepared. Constantine came up from his roll to his feet, and ducked behind a pillar. The thunk 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 of an auto cannon trailed his steps, shearing the ground behind him. He had to keep moving though, as a heavy bolt roared to life and traced his path with high explosive shells. He quickly evaluated his situation. Three heavy weapons emplacements formed a triangle in the room, each one supported by a full squad of guardsmen. The guardsmen were also firing their last guns but, well, they weren't nearly as threatening. Morn, requesting support. Constantine almost sheepishly admitted as he rolled to evade another Lascanon blast. Sending visual data now. Transmitting his visual feed from his helmet to Morn's, he informed the Tetchmarine of his somewhat awkward situation. Acknowledged, T-10 seconds. Wathin, to the side. Morn replied as he shifted into a sprint. Wathin nodded, and leapt across the stairwell, landing a floor lower, in the middle of a guardsman squad. Matthias and Atra held their fire, not wanting to risk hitting their ally but he didn't really need fire support to deal with guardsmen and melee combat. It was a long 10 seconds for Constantine. His superhuman senses worked to their limit, moving out of the way of the oncoming fire storm. He moved as quickly as he could, focused entirely on avoiding the three emplacements fire. The Lasgans were little more than an annoyance, but with 30 of them firing at fully automatic, a few minor blows slipped through inflicting annoying burns near his elbows and armpits. He could not risk advancing into melee, as the enemy fired with a complete disregard for their own men's lives. If he were to become entangled, the Lascanon would kill him. The guardsmen advanced, attempting to corral him, but then there was a roar of new bolt of fire. Morn had arrived. With access to Constantine's visual data, and time to prepare, his cogitator set perfect firing conditions. He blazed away at virtually full auto as he entered, each round smashing into an enslaved guardsman's head and scattering them to pieces. It had taken him 10 seconds to reach the room, and a fifth of that to kill everyone in it save Constantine. The Black Templar looked around at the carnage, then at Morn. Efficient. He noted. Of course. Morn replied. With the path to the lift platform cleared, the kill team quickly assembled on said platform and sent it upwards. It traveled at a terrific rate, but still permitted a moment to catch their breath and reflect. One thing had been made uncomfortably clear. 
The Alverans had not lost a single scrap of their skill or ingenuity due to their enslavement. They fought just as well as they had while free, and with their now utter lack of regard for their own lives, perhaps even better. I never bothered to question it before. Wathin noted as they screamed skywards. But why in russes and washed boots are there so many ogrins in this city? They aren't uncommon anywhere, but this seems to be an excessive number of them. They were mostly fishermen. Atra explained. We produce all our own food from the seas here, and there's some big things that need dragging up. It doesn't take many brains to haul up a net, and they obey orders quickly. They're great workers, and we needed everybody we could get. Unfortunately, the same pliability that makes them so loyal also makes them uniquely vulnerable. Andriel noted. Though I would have thought their bow needs would have been more resilient owing to their mechanical alterations. It's possible that they did, and are simply doing what Ogrims do, following orders. Ishvan noted. The poor brutes don't know any better. Nicely done with your Zetra, a good use of your somewhat smaller frame. Picked it up in a campaign against the greenskins. Doesn't matter how big it is, if it's only got two legs going for the knees will bring it down. Atra replied. This is technically correct. Morn noted. However some knees are more difficult to remove than others. That's blatantly obvious Morn. Why would you even need to state it? Wathin asked. In case you and Constantine decide to go titan hunting again, if we encounter another titan, we'll go the other way. We're on the offensive now, not the defensive. I'm certain you will. Morn replied, and not even Andriel could tell whether he was being sarcastic or not. Andriel looked up towards the quickly approaching exit. They fortified their positions. Hold on to something. He warned the rest of the kill team, then pulled his inhibitor hood down. I will remove the obstacle. The kill team recognized the action, and quickly locked themselves to the floor. Morn once again took hold of the mortals, and mentally prepared a firing solution for the sicker. Andriel closed his eyes, and took several deep breaths. Ice began to form on the ground around him, and his staff glowed with eldritch light. They began to reach the lip of the last floor. There was indeed quite the welcome prepared for them. Five squads backing up multiple heavy bolter emplacement, along with a lemon rust battle tank. It was quite the kill zone they were rising up into. But Andriel cared not. He opened his eyes, cut the staff down, and in a motion annihilated the entire formation. An ill wind blew away from the sicker, and frost covered everything near him. The world seemed to shake, and with a ripple, two thin lines in reality appeared, just over the top of each other. They split open into gaping black moors, and the winds howled as everything was ripped towards them. Guardsmen were torn from their feet, the heavy bolters were uprooted, and pulled towards the spiraling doom. The inexorable forces lasted only for a moment, before they pulled each other into themselves. With a flash of brilliant white light, and an anti-sound that annihilated all others, they exploded in a powerful shockwave. Everything that had been drawn towards them was annihilated by the backlash. The bridge shook and cracked, the lift jostled and wavered on its wires. The lemon rust tank, directly beneath the blast, crumpled like a tin can. Andriel's hands shook for a moment, before he returned his hood to its previous position. What? Constantine asked. In the god emperor's name. Was that? What happens when you put two predatory gates of infinity on top of each other? Each one was linked to the other, causing a feedback loop that drew everything in. Once they met, the link collapsed, violently. So no, not a warp rift, simply a deliberately caused malfunction. Read my mind again and I will throw you off this bridge, sorcerer. Constantine snarled. I don't have to. I know what it looks like, and I know you will only ever see what confirms your suspicions. Andriel replied. Apostle. Enough. Wathin shouted, slamming his axe into the ground between the two bickering astarts. This world is on the brink of collapse and you waste time and breath comparing your brother to the worst of traitors. This sorcerer opens portals to the warp and hurls the guardsmen we are meant to protect into them without hesitation. Constantine roared, leveling his blade. Andriel's eyes blazed, and arcane power swirled around his staff. You ignorant, superstitious barbarian. I just told you what I did. Are you as deaf as you are stupid? 
Wathin stepped between the two, looking from one to another. You arrogant, self-obsessed children. Take a look around. We are fighting guardsmen, fellow loyalists, because of the true enemy, and you cannot save your fury for them. Do you think this is a training mission? Do you think you are still scouts? No. You are Death Watch, and if you continue to disgrace yourselves and jeopardize this planet I will see you both return to your chapters in shame. This is no way for brothers to treat one another. I am a son of Dawn, a Black Templar, loyal and above reproach. Constantine snarled. I am no brother to any who traffic with the powers of the warp. The feeling is mutual. I am a son of Caliban, a true son of the most loyal of all the Primarchs. Andriel spat back. Our world was so primitive they had not even power weapons, and still we did not reach the depths of folly and superstition you have achieved. I am no brother to any blood-mad barbarian. Wathin took each of the bickering brothers by the head, and with only just enough restraint to not truly injure either, he smashed their heads together like a pair of coconuts. You idiots. He declared. Snarling like a pair of blood claws. You are a dark angel, and will be again. You are a black templar, and will be again. But now you are death watch. The two marines were simply too stunned from the sudden blows to the head to continue arguing. You are battle brothers, whether you like it or not. Do not shame yourselves further with this fractious behavior. Hatred is a valuable tool, but to turn it against fellow sons of the emperor is the path to damnation. He turned to Constantine. Do not become so assured in your supposed purity. You would not be the first to fall. If you do not control your rage, it will blind you, until you find your feet on the eightfold path. The god of blood hates sorcerers also, do not become kin with such heresy. Then he turned to Andriel. And as for you, librarian, do not become arrogant in your knowledge and power. Remember the sagas of Prospero, and the fate of those who became too assured in their mastery of the warp, and who did not heed the warnings of their brothers. He sighed. Both of you are so obsessed with the other's faults that you are blind to your own failings. Your pride weakens you, makes you unfit for purpose, and will see to it that by the time you realize how far you have strayed, it will be too late. You are both loyal sons of the Emperor, do not allow yourselves to stray because of selfish pride. The two marines stagger to their feet, still fuming, but less so than before. The blow to their heads had broken the worst excesses of the emotion, and allowed Wathin's warning to sink in. The Astartes rarely knew fear, but to the loyal sons, the thought that they might one day become disloyal filled them with an unearthly dread. Constantine looked Andriel in the eye. He would prefer death to the loss of his pride, but there were far, far worse things than death. He extended his hand. I retract my previous comment. He said through only half gritted teeth. Brother. Likewise. Andriel offered, liking this no better than Constantine. But he took his brother's hand, and they shook. Brother. The kill team began moving again, but Morn hailed Wathin on a private vox. You speak of dangerous things brother. Sometimes you need to be reminded of hell to break free from your failures. Thank the Owl Father that they're too young to have truly faced the things they are calling one another, or they would have killed each other. Indeed. Foolish, but perhaps innocently so. If any of us are. Come to think of it, I should teach Constantine the sagas of Prospero as well. Why? Morn asked curiously. The sagas are not merely to teach of the dangers of the warp and of arrogance, but also the costs of misdirected fury, and moving too swiftly upon it. The kill team, now slightly chastised, set out quickly across the high bridges that linked the tall spires. The sun was approaching its apex, but the day remained grim and dreary. Even the brilliant golden light could not pierce through the xeno-tainted clouds. Andriel looked up at it and thought to himself that it would make a pretty fine, if grossly overdone and cliche point in a sermon about the light of the emperor or some such bunk. He had seen the light of the god emperor in a more intimate way than any mewling preacher would ever be able to. The metaphor to a son was actually quite apt. It was a brilliant light, a necessary light for all life. But it was not a kind or gentle light up close. To have drawn near, or more accurately been dragged near, was like dangling inches from a sun, buck naked. 
In front of you was an obliterating light and heat that destroyed everything and consumed all existence. But not quite. It was right in front of you, always, but the very shadow of your body preserved spots of freezing icy darkness on your back, stealing your breath as much as the omnicidal light burned it. As he ran, he wondered what Constantine would have thought of it, to have that singular union, even for a fraction of an instant, exposed to a merest sliver of the ultimate soul. He couldn't tell whether it would have made the Templar even more fanatical, or shattered his faith into countless tiny pieces. As for Constantine, he saw the clouds and thought of the same overwrought metaphor. But it did not seem quite so overwrought to the Templar, rather a divine sign. Indeed, the light of the Emperor was slipping away from this world, drowned in Xeno heresy. He thought on the Guardsmen, and gathered his hatred yet further. He remembered their faces. He would always remember them. Among the countless blessings the God Emperor had granted him, and all the starts, was a perfect edetic memory. Every detail of every battle, every piece of information ever absorbed, every world he had ever strode upon since becoming a full battle brother would follow him all the days of his long service. He would remember the faces of the guardsmen. He had killed them without hesitation, for that was what the god emperor had required of him. They had fought valiantly, even while enslaved, and lost none of that cunning which enabled humanity to dominate the galaxy in the face of the orc the Elder, and even the Tyranid. Perhaps it had been a mercy to release them, to set their souls free from their enslaved bodies to the God Emperor's side. But it did not change the fact that the first blood his new blade, the blade of his vigil, had taken, was human, and not Xenos. It gnawed at his mind, but did not diminish his steps. His duty remained before him, and what Ishvan had told Atra was a truth Constantine knew too. Duty is not a burden. It is a source of strength, for when one must do more than they are able, they draw forth new reserves to accomplish what they must. Mortal or of starts, for all duty granted strength beyond oneself. They thundered across the bridges at remarkable speed. While not reaching the same strides that they accomplished in that first, desperate break from the manufactorum, they nonetheless drastically surpassed a normal human. As such, Matthias continued to dangle nauseatingly from Morn's macadantrites. Atra, by contrast, continued a pace on foot. Her new body could not match the Astartes at full speed, but she was able to keep pace at half stride. For a few blessed minutes, they did not encounter further enemy resistance. The gate of doom Andriel had unleashed upon the enemy had shattered every element the enemy had been able to assemble on short notice. Undoubtedly, the hive mind had begun scrambling new interceding forces as soon as the first had fallen, but even that supreme command and control structure could not reduce the distance any new forces could travel. There was also a certain arithmetic to it. The kill team, while most likely the greatest threat to the hive mind, was not overtly threatening. Yes, the Astartes were supremely dangerous, but there were only four and the two mortals. Compared with the thousands of Mechanicum still bottled up in the Manufactorum, they were not nearly so much a threat. And destroying the machine cult would be an absolute priority to the hive mind. Not only were their forces the most skilled on the planet besides the Astartes, they also boasted the hive armory, and the strongest defenses. They would bleed the hive mind dry if they were not systematically reduced, and they might even still be strong enough to stage a breakout. There was also the matter of the Abbey of St. Augustine of the Silence to consider. The Sisters of Battle, while numbering perhaps only 500, were each as heavily equipped as a member of the kill team. Furthermore, their faith granted them a measure of resistance to psionic powers, allowing them to resist the hive mind's touch, and forming an elite and unbreakable bastion in the center of occupied territory. Even as they ran, the kill team could watch the Priory shake under the fire of every gun in range. Fear not. Constantine remarked. The Emperor knows his own. He has preserved them thus far, and granted us the duty of delivering their salvation. Let us not leave the Alfather too much work to do then. Wathin replied. I imagine miracles are tiring work, and they can be frighteningly impermanent in the face of massed artillery bombardment. A minute later. There was a sudden and thunderous explosion that nearly threw Atra from her feet. She looked about for cover but found little on the open expanse of the bridge. Switching tactics, 
she swept for the artillery that had fired on them, and stared in shock. The bridge that they had just crossed was gone. Its twisted wreckage was still falling from the sky towards the distant ground below. What the feth was that? Atra shouted. We don't have guns that big, or, didn't rather. No. Morn remarked. But I still have the detonation codes for every bridge in the city. You what? And furthermore, why did you only blow up that one just now? Atra asked, then remembered herself. Sir. I have been detonating them across the city as needed. As for why I removed this one, because there is an enemy spearhead coming up through the connected spire, and I would prefer it not reach us. You could have mentioned that before. Ishvan noted. I had calculated that we would evade the blast and the spearhead. It was a flanking maneuver. Nothing more. Morn replied. Another dull boom, like thunder, reached them. Turning, they saw another bridge falling away from a massive fireball. That was the bridge the blocking elements, including a Malkada, were on. I don't suppose you can just blow up every bridge the enemy can use to get to us between here and the equinox can you? Andri asked hopefully. I could blow up every bridge in the city, but that would only reveal our path to the enemy. As it is now, they do not know where we are, as evidenced by their troop movements. Morn replied as they crossed another bridge. This one, thankfully for Matthias's eardrums, did not explode. Ishvan smiled under his mask. Ah, you are still patched into the Arbite surveillance network aren't you? The Arbites have also fallen to the enemy, but do you really think that they, even with the hive mind behind them, will be keeping me out? Morn asked. Nobody could see under the Tetchmarine's helmet, but everyone could tell that he was doing something most unusual. Morn was smiling, or smirking might be a bit more accurate. It was almost more frightening than his usual inhuman donus. Repeated booms filled the air as Morn systematically cut off any counterattack. Diverting the kill team out of the way of enemy thrust he could not simply blast to pieces. The bridges had been rigged to blow in the event that the Xeno attempted to lead a thrust into the hive through the upper spires. Unbeknownst to anyone, particularly the spire nobles, several upper spire sections had been filled with Prometheum, and also rigged to blow, including the governor's palace. Fortunately for her tulips, Morn did not seem to find it necessary to detonate that particular set of explosives. Dot. But bit by bit, as they drew nearer to their destination, it became painfully clear that the enemy was closing in. Every detonation shattered another counter strike, but the Xeno had control over thousands of guardsmen. But every detonation cut off another route, meaning the remaining paths became fewer and fewer. At the same time, these limited routes were becoming home to even fiercer centers of resistance requiring them to be destroyed lest the Astartes be overwhelmed by a tide of bodies. Then, as they drew near to the spire in which the Equinox's hidden hangar rested, disaster struck. It began as a buzz, then grew to a roar. Get inside. Ishvan shouted a warning. Valkyrie's incoming. The kill team once more broke into a dead sprint across the open bridge as the gunships drew nearer. Soon bursts of bolt of fire began to cover the bridge. Ishvan switched from his flamer to the missile launcher, managing to hold up the heavy weapon with one hand. He crouched for but a moment, sliding almost gracefully into a kneeling position as he tracked the barrel of the launcher towards the lead Valkyrie. Unfortunately, the launcher was dumb, firing undirected munitions rather than the guided or homing missiles available to some regiments. Still, while the weapon might be lacking, the one firing was not. Ishvan quickly calculated the speed of his target, his munitions, the wind, the effect of rain, and of course accounted for the planet's slightly above average gravity. In approximately 4 seconds, his calculations translated from the theoretical into the practical, as he shifted his aim and fired. The Devastator's aim was true, sending a crack missile screaming across the sky towards the leader of the oncoming formation. The pilot attempted to evade, but that had been accounted for as well. The missile struck the rear of the craft and obliterated it, sending the transport and its cargo spiraling into the side of a building. But this moment had taken valuable time, and the other ships raced into range. Ishvan rolled to the side and came up sprinting as Bolt of Fire bracketed him, sparking off his armor and leaving deep gouges. 
A bolt shell seemed destined for his skull, only to be deflected at the last moment by a sparkling eldritch shield. Andriel shouted across the bridge for the salamander to hurry, and he sprinted for all he was worth towards the final spire. Under the protection of the kind shield, it seemed he would reach it. But Constantine saw it, his instinct screaming at him that even this would not save his brother. Morn turned and shouted, as the Templar sprinted back out onto the bridge towards the salamander. Has he gone insane? Morn asked. Wasn't he already? Andriel asked, then grit his teeth as he pushed himself to extend the kind shield to cover both exposed astarts. Why in the lion's name am I stuck giving myself such a headache to protect an even larger headache? He grumbled under his breath, but kept the shield up. Ishvan watched the charging Templar at first with confusion, and then alarm. Irrational behavior was not exactly outside of Constantine's modus of parody, but this was unusually so. He checked behind him, half expecting to see a hive tyrant, but the bridge was empty. He looked back towards Constantine, but noticed something in the corner of his eye which made him look twice. There was a Valkyrie headed for him that was unusually close, and it wasn't slowing down to drop troops. Oh. That's what it is. He noted then ran faster. However the same superhuman calculating capacity that had allowed him to strike down the first bird also assured him that he was still going to be hit. The Valkyrie was too close, too fast, and too large. Even if he locked himself in place and braced, the impact would tear him in half. If he didn't, he was going over the edge and plummeting to his doom. What's worse, Constantine would too. But Constantine had other ideas. Coming to the same conclusion as Ishvan, he turned towards the crashing Valkyrie and charged it. With a prayer to the Emperor and a scream of defiance, he launched himself into the air with his jetpack, sword raised high. Yep. He's definitely gone insane. Wathin remarked. Constantine crashed headlong through the cockpit of the Valkyrie, and also her pilots. He hit the metal floor at a roll, his sudden arrival throwing the weight of the craft off catastrophically. He tried to come to his feet, but the craft began to spin unpredictably. He had planned to leap into the cockpit, land, and seize control. Instead he went through the cockpit, pilot, and door into the back of the craft. The enslaved guardsmen sitting inside stared for a moment, as if even the hive mind couldn't quite process what had happened. But in that moment, Constantine, rather than butchering them all, hit the back of the aircraft with enough force to knock the wind from his lungs and force the Vorkii's nose up. He pulled his arm and sword back through the hole he had punched in the loading ramp, and turned to see nine guardsmen throwing themselves upon him. As the craft spiraled up and out of control, his feet left the floor. Disoriented and angrier than usual, he began to throw the guardsmen off of him, before the tenth guardsman managed to reach the deployment button. With a groan, the back of the aircraft opened up, dropping Constantine and all the guardsmen out into the air. The marine span in the air, still disoriented and uncertain of where exactly he was. A guardsman still clinging to his faceplate obscured his vision, keeping him from determining when he was facing up. He seized the mortal in one hand and hurled him away like a toy. He oriented himself, just before something new and disorienting struck him instead. He suddenly stopped falling through air and fell through a kaleidoscope of impossible colors, then deep darkness, and then struck the floor of the inner spire with a thud. He lay there for a moment, watching as a gate of infinity shut above him and revealed a bare ceiling. The void was then filled by the face of Andriel leaning over, smirking slightly. You're welcome. The sicker told him. I have a jetpack. Constantine reminded the dark angel. Had. It's currently rather flat, and I think one of the mortals stuck their hands in the vents so it wouldn't have worked regardless. Andriel noted, then offered the Templar a hand up. Grudgingly, Constantine took it. I appreciate it cousin. He said through gritted teeth. Well if nothing else you're simply too entertaining to let die. That was insane. Even Wathin agreed. Andriel joked. As the Templar hauled himself to his feet, he flinched as a piercing screech filled the air. He looked towards the source, and frowned at Morn. Brute forcing it again I see. There are seven Malkada defenders heading up this spire. Would you have preferred I took my time? The Tetchmarine asked. Point taken. 
Where's Aishvan? Constantine asked. Fortifying this position. Aishvan replied, hauling a rather large computer bay towards the door and leaning it against it with some effort. Normally your job but you seem to be rather busy demonstrating your ability to engage even aircraft in glorious melee combat. You're welcome brother. Constantine replied. And the mortals? Manning the guns. I've informed them that you survived, and they were both quite relieved. Andriel replied. I thought I heard Hydra fire. It is pleasant that it's on our side for the first time today. Send for them. Morn ordered. I have unlocked the door to the eclipse. What door? Constantine asked, and then he heard a hiss. As he looked towards the source, an entire wall began to descend. That was load bearing, that shouldn't work. He noted, then looked up, and saw that instead a long beam held up the weight of the remaining spire. Never mind. But in any case, woefully insufficient if the spire begins to suffer bombardment. At this height, only orbital bombardment would be able to strike the spire, and that would strike the void shields. Matthias noted as he entered the room, followed by Atra. Any shield can be broken with sufficient firepower. Constantine replied. I swear I heard a colleague in the artillery corps say much the same thing. Atra replied, then turned towards the descending wall. Typical spire nonsense, they sure do love there. And then she saw what lay behind the wall. The slowly descending wall revealed a masterfully crafted ship. She was surprisingly large, easily the size of the Storm Clan, but rather than being built like a brick, this craft was shaped like an aquatic creature. It was all sleek curves and smooth edges, almost beautiful to behold in spite of its size. It seemed to bleed swiftness and agility, like a fighter raised to the size of a dropship but maintaining all her grace. She was still largely unpainted, but her name was etched in gold characters along her prow. Equinox. Dramatic reveals. Atra concluded, stepping forwards. Silver Reigns, I've never seen anything like her. She's beautiful. Agreed. Matthias said in some awe. I've never seen anything in this style, and certainly never built to this size. You could transport 40 men in this, faster and quieter than a stripped down Valkyrie. I have. Constantine growled. This reeks of Elder design. The Elder don't build anything this big, at least not for an atmosphere operations. Wathin replied. But this one, he looked over the shapely craft. It's atmospheric and void. This, he shook his head. Something like this should be well beyond the grasp of even a spy noble to construct, even if it were entirely imperial in origin. It might be Jakaro. Aishvan observed. They are famed for their craftsmanship. Jakaro make digi weapons, not starships. Morn replied. It appears to integrate Eldari and possible to your designs, and has fused them with an imperial philosophy. He remarked. This is almost certainly tech heresy. And you expect us to fly in it? Constantine sighed. Absolutely. Morn replied. Load up. As they loaded into the ship, some more readily than others, Atra turned to Matthias and whispered a question. What the devil is a Tior? She asked. I think there's some minor Xenos race near the Damocles Gulf. I think a crusade wiped them out a few centuries ago. Matthias replied with a shrug. Then again they're the Xeno Hunters. I suppose they know a lot of those obscure minor aliens. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Bell Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. The interior of the Equinox was surprisingly spacious, or perhaps surprisingly sized would be more accurate. The interior was not simply a single drop area, but was in fact surprisingly diverse. The craft was divided into two decks, each large enough for even Aishvan to walk about with relative comfort. The bottom deck, 
where the kill team entered, was primarily comprised of seats, once again size for transhumans rather than mere mortals. This is intensely suspicious. Or auspicious, depending on your point of view. Wathin muttered. I am inclined to agree. Why would a mortal build a ship sized for space marines? Andriel replied. Particularly given how hostile Lord Malthus was. Morn said nothing, but observed the ship with exceeding care. It was, without any shadow of a doubt, imperial in design. It was heavily armored, meant both for fire support and troop transport, not unlike the unfortunate Storm Talon. VTOL capable, and equipped with substantial and advanced weapon systems. A twin linkless cannon, though of an unusual design, for anti-hard target, with two additional rotary plasma cannons on the underside. Missile racks under the wings, equipped with six Hellstrike homing missiles each. A worthy armament, highly advanced, but almost a bit light for a craft of this size. Aishan continued to explore the craft curiously. Opening a door and finding to his delight the lower deck also included a fully functional armory, complete with weapons and armor maintenance stations. He then turned from this and ascended up the ladder towards the second deck. There Andriel had already arrived and begun examining various compartments. At the press of a switch, the walls rolled out to reveal beds, also sized for larger than average humans, a small shrine to the god emperor, a storage cabinet filled with food and medical supplies human grade, and even a small stove, table, chairs, and sink, though small is relative. Everything including a kitchen sink. This was clearly meant to be far more than a transport. Andriel remarked. Curiously, he checked one of two doors towards the back. It led to a waste reclamation unit, or latrine to be more specific. He then checked the other door towards the rear and stared in amazement. The interior of this room was dominated by and packed to the brim with arcane machinery he had no understanding of. He was not ignorant in mechanics, but this was well and truly above his pay grade. Not that he was being paid. Ishvan, I require your assistance. He requested, and the salamander also entered, making the room somewhat cramped. It was a large ship, but not at large. What is this? He asked. It would appear to be an engine compartment. I think. Ishvan replied. And you have no idea what any of this does do you? Not much. I believe that might be a warp drive, but on something this small, I would be amazed if it was. Though, HM it just might be able to- He began to mutter, and removed a panel to take a closer look. There was a large hisser several feet of plating retracted away and a module raised up, and then moved towards the hatch. He peered in and saw a large bright orb spinning very quickly, suspended between two rings. The orb hummed pleasantly, but for being no smaller than a mortal's fist, it was surprisingly loud. He examined the rings closely, then stood back up, and shut the panel. I have no idea what that was. He said frankly. I've never seen anything like it. Well don't take it apart yet. Constantine called from the front of the ship. We still need the damn thing. The Templar was situated above the pilot's seat, quickly going over everything and preparing to launch. Morn was standing next to him, integrating himself further into the machine. The two were standing, as it seemed the pilot and co-pilot chairs were the only parts of the ship actually sized for mortals. You fly? Andri asked in surprise. My chapter is based out of a gigantic crusading fleet. Of course I fly. I'm simply better with a sword. Constantine replied. That and I have never piloted a Stormtlan, hence why Morn took it. You haven't ever flown a, well all things considered it's probably an Equinox class. Atra remarked. If even you haven't seen anything like it before, it must be some sort of experimental prototype. Quite so. Morn remarked. Also yes, it is warp capable, though I don't entirely know how. The entire ship appears to be powered by several antimatter reactors. So really don't touch anything. Wathin clarified. Or we'll blow the whole spire in half. Good to know. Andriel replied, and very quickly left the engine compartment. Weapons maintenance, top of the line firepower, transport sized for a start, and a warp drive. Constantine grumbled. 
on a ship that looks like it was half designed by Xenos. I like this less and less. Matthias looked around with growing discomfort. He's right. I thought this might be some sort of ship for a personal guard, a helpful tool in a spy war. But this, he shook his head. This is more than I could have possibly imagined. Where did Malthus even get all this? And why? It's not just overkill. It wouldn't work for a spy war. Not enough troop capacity and too many luxuries, without even mentioning the warp capabilities. Atra paused and considered. It's not a war craft, it's his getaway. She growled. Warp capable so he can slip away to anywhere in the Imperium. Oversized facilities for Ogryn bodyguards. As for the materials, a space hulk, he must have acquired some salvaging rights to one and taken the material from there. Which would also bring in a fabulous amount of money from selling off the rest of the hulk as scrap. Meaning nobody would notice if he kept any functional technology for himself. Morn concurred. Which he then pulled together to make this. In fact since you mentioned it's strange design, I wouldn't be surprised if he just pulled it half out of a hulk altogether. Atra concluded. As for why? Smuggling among other things. Stealthy, warp capable, and able to make long journeys running basically dark. A perfect craft for moving more Zenitechen, or getting him out if anyone ever found out what he was doing. Wathin nodded. A fine set of reasoning. It would also explain why he wanted to keep his troops back. If he lost this, it would be a truly fantastic investment gone, and if it were discovered, well, the Inquisition would have run him down like a pack of particularly slimy and arrogant wolves. Everything comes back to wolves with you doesn't it? Andriel remarked. Look I could have used a dozen other metaphors but none of you whelps except Morn would understand it and he doesn't care. Wathin replied grumpily. Correct. Morn replied from the front seat. Ah, this should be the stealth field. There was a brief hum, and Andriel staggered, somewhat nauseated. No, that would be the Geller field. So you're sort of right, but we want to hide from Xenos, not demons. We're the Death Watch, not Ordo Malice. What is the Ordo Malice's chamber militant anyways? Aishvan asked curiously. They're equivalent to us? I know the Sororitas are the militant for the Ordo Hereticus, but I don't know for the third. Hence why you're still breathing laddie. Wathin growled, with old grudges and fury in his throat. I've met them. Once. You don't want to. They're colder than a winter's midnight, more arrogant than a dozen elder, and while they don't have nearly the bite to match up their bark, they can hide behind inquisitors with truly infinite resources. If you ever meet one, forget it or be ready for the fight of your life. Aishvan felt a chill run down his spine. The old wolf spoke from experience, but clearly to speak more would be more than either were able. How did it happen? He asked. He could gather this much, Wathin had faced this mysterious chamber militant, but what could have caused a confrontation like that? Better for us all that that saga is never told. Wathin replied carefully. But I'd like to think it was a situation where you'd have the done the same thing. Be ready, it may happen again, sooner than you think. The Inquisition acted suspiciously and self-righteously with their heads lodged firmly in their well-appointed backsides. Nobody is surprised. Constantine grumbled from the cockpit. Atla looked at him with surprise. She would have thought the Templars and Inquisition would have gotten along fairly well. Assuming Constantine was representative of his chapter, both were unmatched in zeal and hatred for the unclean. Then again perhaps they were competing over who could be the most zealous. Strap yourselves in. We're almost ready for launch. Morn ordered, then paused. Actually, find out how to open the hangar first. Best not to waste ammunition blasting our way out. Atra facepalmed, and nearly knocked herself over in the process. She regained her footing and headed out the back to find the release for the doors. Note to self. She grumbled as she rubbed her face. If you're going to do that, use the other hand. As she headed back to the control panel, she scanned it quickly. Almost instinctually she recognized the necessary switches and levers needed to open the doors. It was a surprisingly complicated process all things considered. She began the process, then paused. She knew this. But how did she know this? She looked again. 
she didn't recognize anything in this panel, and could barely understand what each item did, but she knew how to open the door. The more she thought about it, the more concerning it became. Yes she knew how to do this, in the same way she knew how to walk, or tie her boots. She couldn't say how it worked and it was almost an unthinking process, but she certainly hadn't worked with enough of these to understand it. And she didn't understand it, she didn't know why this would do what it did, but she did know how to do it. She began to feel ill the more she thought about it. Then she shook her head and finished the process. She quickly ran back towards the ship and leapt aboard. The boarding ramp quickly closed behind her, as the Equinox fired her engines for the first time. The craft slowly, almost gracefully lifted off the ground as she took her seat and strapped herself in. The rest of the kill team had also taken their seats, which vibrated softly from the engines. Matthias looked towards Atra with concern. Are you alright? You look sick. Atra shook her head. Fine, just confused. I, I know things I don't think I should now, and I don't know how I know them. She admitted. Andrea looked at her with some concern, and extended his gaze into the arcane. There was no lingering sorcery or any sort of unnatural effect upon the Guards woman that would indicate a warp-born source of this newfound knowledge. In fact, she actually seemed dimmer in the warp, her spark greatly diminished from when he had first encountered her. He could not tell whether it was a result of her cybernetics, or if the trauma of the past few days had diminished her. You are not under the influence of any psionic force. He diagnosed. The source is therefore something material. I shivan sighed. Why do I get the distinct feeling Morn was perhaps not as careful with what he gave you as he should have been? I'll be fine. I can still fight. Ata replied. We can deal with me after we save my planet. The Equinox slipped out of the hangar, then suddenly dived. The mortals jerked forwards in their oversized seats, cursing. What the hell? Matthias demanded. Dropping to evade triple A. We'll pull up momentarily. Constantine replied. The Equinox dove quietly down, chasing the raindrops towards the pavement. Fortunately, Morn blew most of the bridges so there's nothing in our way. The ship dove into the mists, throwing them all about in a great swirl of silver white. It seemed almost tranquil for a moment. Then the first Mantacor shells hit the spire where it had just been. Shame. So much for making this clean. Constantine grumbled, as he began to pull out from the dive. The Equinox settled through the city at dangerously low altitude, hiding its large profile in the mists, and flying low to evade the worst of the anti-aircraft fire. Constantine began to accelerate, leaving behind a trench of mists whirling through the air. They won't have much trouble tracking us. Morn noted. That's why I haven't turned the stealth field on yet. Constantine replied. Sensors are picking up three bogus coming in from 6, 3 and 8. Morn reported. Speed and profile indicate Valkyries. Guess they haven't scrambled the lightnings quite yet. Must be the remnants of the ones that tried to delay us on the bridge. Don't go trying to take a sword to these ones. No need. This time I have a Lys cannon. Constantine replied, then banked the Equinox off to the side. He would deal with the one coming in from 3 o'clock first. He spotted the incoming craft above him, and smiled. The Valkyrie opened fire with its multi-laser, but the Equinox simply dipped lower still, slipping under a bridge linking two towers, and then pulling up the other side nearly vertical. The Lascanon fired once, nearly splitting the Valkyrie in half. You do know that we are in atmosphere. Morn advised his over-eager pilot. Stalling is a danger here. I know that. Constantine grumbled in reply, quickly flicking several switches to adjust the Equinox's rotating wing engines. But this is a VTOL, you can do a few tricks with it. The rotary engines turned, then fired, forcing the Equinox's nose down, then pushing it forwards out of the stall. However, while they were no longer in danger of plummeting out of the sky, their delay had allowed the other two pursuing craft to catch up. Constantine pushed the Equiniarchs even faster, using the craft's surprising agility to whip around towers and pull away from the enemy. However, not quite swiftly enough. The sensors began to beep loudly, indicating one of the pursuing aircraft had fired one of their Hellstrike missiles. Locked or no? 
Constantine asked, pulling to the side. Locked. That was quick. Morn noted, shifting power to the plasma blisters. Deploying flares, and targeting enemy missile. Pull up then keep us steady. Constantine complied, as a series of brilliant lights fanned out from the equinox. The pursuing missile wavered for a moment, the machine spirit struggling to find a lock, but it pushed through and continued towards the Astartes craft. Still, the flares had bought Morn the precious few microseconds needed to make a lock of his own. The twin plasma blisters on the base of the craft opened fire, sending a spray of blue fire towards the oncoming missile. It was a small target, but weight of fire combined with inhuman accuracy can make even the most difficult shot possible. It wasn't a clean hit, but one bolt of plasma scored a grazing blow, snapping off one of the fins of the missile. Suddenly destabilized, the projectile spiraled out of control, whirling off into a nearby building. Morn, that bridge ahead of us, is it rigged? Constantine asked, pointing towards yet another long bridge spanning the gap between two towers. Negative. That one is instead guarded by four heavy bolters. Don't go over it. Morn advised. Wasn't planning on it. The Templar replied, slowing the craft slightly. The oncoming Valkyries came on, drawing closer and closer, but it was just as planned. Shifting the nose of the craft left, then right, Constantine fired two shots into the supports of the spanning bridge. With a grinding crash, the massive structure began to fall. Constantine dived beneath the crashing expanse, the Valkyries in hot pursuit. One enslaved pilot still had enough sense to recognize the trap and pulled up, slowing their speed, but the other was clearly more aggressive. Unfortunately for him, his craft was not quite up to the standards of the Equinox. The collapsing structure clipped the back of the Valkyrie, and sent it spiraling down, where it struck the side of another hive tower with a satisfying explosion. Constantine had little time to savor his victory though before something struck the side of the equinox and nearly flung it out of the air. Constantine fought for control, and only his skill and Morn's integration with the craft saved them. The equinox fell down from the middle mists and towards the grimy artificial floor of the hive. Pulling up and to the side, it barely evaded death, slipping mere feet from the side of another tower. What the hell was that? Constantine asked. Based on our current elevation, an earth shook around from one of the basilisks. Morn replied. How are we still alive? I have no idea. The emperor protects, now pull up before we need another miracle. The equinox soared up, slipping back into the cover of the mist and out of the range of further bombardment. The walls of the city were quickly approaching, so Constantine pulled her up even further. More incoming. Twelve more. We are also approaching the elevation at which the manticores will be able to fire upon us once more. Well I have to get over the wall, I don't think I'm going to be able to punch through it. Constantine replied. Engage the stealth fields, and start praying. Stealth fields engaged. Beginning the rite of consistency and constance. Morn replied, anointing the control console with sacred unguents. The smell of incense began to fill the cockpit. The equinox's form flickered, then vanished under a shimmering blue cloak. There was a great eruption of mist as it left the cover of the cloud once more, then nothing. Save perhaps a slight discoloration in the air, traveling so quickly that none could say for certain whether they had truly seen it or not. Constantine held his breath and offered a prayer to the god emperor that the stealth field would continue to work. The edge of the walls approached, and then in an instant, they were over and clear. The Black Templar guided the ship downwards, below the range of the city's sensors, but far enough above that they would not leave a wake upon the storm to seas. The wind jostled the craft here and there, but Constantine kept it steady. Compared with the chaos they had just escaped it was almost peaceful. Only when they were almost 30 kilometers from the city did he at last disengage the stealth field and pull up above the clouds to a stable cruising altitude. That accomplished. He activated the autopilot, and let out a sigh of relief. I hate atmospheric flying. Morn paused, and looked over the instruments. We could achieve space flight with this. He noted. Take us to orbit, we must warn the fleet of what has occurred and keep them out of range of the city guns. 
If we do that, then what is to stop Inquisitor Marcus from simply unleashing the ultimate sanction upon this world? Constantine noted. It would not be outside of the Inquisition's tactics. Morn shook his head. I have collaborated with Marcus before. He wields his power with respect. Furthermore, there are three things that currently make Alvara too valuable to destroy. Firstly, no other world in the sector can match its combined industrial and agricultural output. Secondly, the STC remains on planet. Thirdly, the source of this planetary domination is still on world. It must be captured for study if possible, and destroyed, its corpse recovered, if not. This cannot be allowed to happen again, and we're the ones they're going to send. Constantine guessed. Of course. Morn replied. We are Death Watch. Then let us hope your Inquisitor is as reasonable as you suggest. Constantine growled. For I will take this ship back down to slay the enemy, coming doom or no. I concur. Morn replied. I have sworn to protect this world and its people, and this I will do. His voice was iron hard and unyielding. Not even the god emperor himself would sway a son of Ferris from their chosen path. It has too much potential to waste. Then we go up. Constantine replied, shifting back to the controls and placing the ship on an orbital heading. And back down again. As far as I can gather this thing hasn't used hardly any fuel, if it even does use fuel. Antimatter isn't stable, but a remarkably efficient form of energy production. Though I am uncertain of what exactly protected us from that Earthshake around. He noted, still scanning over the ship's controls. This craft has no void shields. Then it's almost certainly Zenatech. Well, we can dismantle it after it has served its purpose. Constantine replied. Because I get the distinct feeling we will need the Equinox yet. The Equinox soared over the clouds of Alveria, breaching into low orbit. From here, they could see the great blue marble of the world slowly spinning beneath them. Yet sickly brown grey patches could be seen here and there, the outlines of hive city pollution. Worst of all was a large, central mass, mixing green in with the brown and grey, like a perfidious tumor on the surface of the world. Hive Tempestus, capital of the world, and the eye of a great storm spreading out over the world, covering the planet with the taint of the tyrannid enslaver spores. In the distance, the stars were filled with the lights of briefly flickering lances as the Imperial Navy and Hive Fleet continued their by now weeks long skirmishing. However, they also saw the lights of oncoming craft, as the fleet once again made a move towards the planet. Long range scanners, now free from the jamming influence of the world below, detected that the Tyranid had made what appeared to be an error, allowing the Navy a path towards the planet. Even now the slower Hive ships harass the back lines of the naval elements, but the fleet was burning towards the planet faster than the Xenos could hope to keep up. Once they arrived, there would surely be a decisive engagement, as the navy rounded, with the planet's orbital defense silos at their back, and finally brought a decisive end to the high fleet, or at the very least bloodied them while allowing the transports to deposit their badly needed reinforcements. They had managed to deposit the Astartes and Titans already, largely due to the fact that those forces could be de facto fired at the planet like so much ordnance, but guardsmen were not well suited to the same sort of violent transit. If not for the treachery of the Xenos and their strange mind controlling spores, it would have been a victory. But with the planetary defenses that would have granted the forces of humanity their victory under the dominion of the alien, it would be only a slaughter. Atra's fear was dimming now, gazing down upon her world from the cold of space, also her sorrow. First it had been agony, then dread, then sorrow. Now a zealous rage was filling her heart, burning as quietly and fiercely as the plasma in her bionic arm. Hatred, pure and hot, nursed her soul. She looked back towards her home, eyes hard as she gazed wrathfully upon the fallen hive. Do you remember the first time you saw her? Matthias asked quietly. From up here, that is. Yeah. Ata replied. It's still really something, no matter how many times you look at it. It's home. All of it at once, all the great towers and bridges are so small, and even the whole world is so tiny. Not even a dot in the heavens by the time you're to the translation point. How many of us never saw her again? Emperor only knows. Matthias replied. 
Maybe they were the lucky ones. To not have to see her like this. No. Atra replied, clenching her fists more tightly. She's not lost yet. We'll save her. We fight with the angels of death. We can win. I don't know how, but we have an experimental stealth ship, a kill team, and one ocean of holy fury. We can do something with that. I'm not giving up. Not while I'm still breathing. So, I have to keep believing we can do it, even if I haven't got a clue how. The Emperor protects. Matthias replied. Perhaps today he's using us to do it. Perhaps? But regardless. Failure is not an option. It is not even a possibility. No matter the price. Because anything else is too horrible to even contemplate. Towards the front of the ship, Aishvan's enhanced ears picked up the mortal's conversation and he looked with a faint smile towards Constantine, the Black Templar sighed, and raised his hands in defeat. Fine. You were right. About what? Aishvan asked innocently. Don't be that way brother, I'm not going to say it again and I have no patience for such foolishness. It does not suit you. Constantine grumbled. It was time well spent to train her even if she is going to die. Everyone dies brother. Aishvan replied. Even us. So, spend it well. It is the emperor's currency. Some of us die more easily than others, and sooner. Constantine replied. Though you aren't wrong. His thoughts turned dark. Though vengeance is time well spent. And real, enjoying the momentary release from the pressure of the hive mind above the planet's reach caught a rare flash from the Templar's normally warded mind. It was a painful memory, sharp with bitterness and even a twinge of sorrow. He saw a black knight fall from a slender sword, blade flickering as the power armor slid past. The knight fell before a portal of swirling light, past tortured bodies strung to the hull of a cruelly elegant craft. Before the light took it, and it was gone, the smirk of a fair yet foul face burned into his enhanced eyes. So that's why he fights like an elder. The librarian muttered. The time for idle conversation is over. The fleet is receiving our transmission and we are being directed toward Inquisitor Marcos. Mon reported, turning one of his macadam trides in the socket of the ship. Switching to comms in 5 seconds. That fairly quickly shut everyone up. There was silence, and then the craft speakers began to sound. Watch Sergeant Morn. This is Inquisitor Marcos. The voice was astoundingly normal, the sound of a man who seemed to be in his mid-forties from the guess, neither particularly gruff nor strained, neither quiet nor loud. It sounded like, well, a fairly ordinary human. Atra wasn't exactly certain what she had been expecting, and was somewhat embarrassed to think that yes, she probably had expected him to speak in some manner of sinister whisper if she thought about it. We receive you. Morn replied. And I will confirm, the planet of Alvara has experienced a massive cyclic attack, resulting in the mental domination of the vast majority of the unaugmented human population, including the Ogrins, though I cannot confirm if any other abhuman strains are yet infected or not. We believe this to the result of a synaptic fungus spread through the rain, and the source of the attack to be a Norn Queen most likely located within Hive Tempestus. However, we must recommend at all costs that the fleet not enter orbit as the enemy most likely controls the planet's orbital defenses. Acknowledged. The Inquisitor's voice replied. The status of the Titans and the STC? The STC remained secured in Alvaro Secundus. I am unaware of the status of any Titans, but I suspect that any who came under attack would have been able to raise their void shields and evacuate below the water. So far, no submarine elements, either Alvarin or Tyranid, have demonstrated any ability to match them. And as their princeps and crew are all augmented, they would be immune to this psychic attack. I see. Your ship successfully escaped Alvaro Secundus. Can it infiltrate Hive Tempestus? I believe so. What is its capacity? Beyond the current team, 38.5 mortals. Ogrins count as 2 and rattlings as 0.5. We don't have any rattlings. Maneuver towards the fleet. My retinues shall join you and we will attempt to assassinate the Norn Queen. Should we prove unsuccessful, the fleet will enact a sentence of exterminators upon the planet via virus bomb and Mechanicus elements may retrieve the Titans and the STC. 
Then the transmission ended. That was quick. Constantine noted. Marcos is decisive, even by the standards of the Inquisition. Morn agreed. But his plan is sensible. Destroying the Norn Queen is our best chance to save Alvara, and if we fail, then this infection must be destroyed, even if it costs us the world. And he is joining us. Andriel noted. His fingers drummed the hilt of his sword. Wonderful. I am aware of his effect upon you. It will also affect the Xenos. Morn replied. I know, hence why I am not wringing your neck for bringing that thing onto our ship, even if it is an Inquisitor. Andriel snarled. Atra focused on that, pushing the discovered that Exterminatus was real to the back of her mind. Much like any other consequence of failure, that was simply too horrible to even consider. If she allowed herself to realize it was a possibility, she would freeze, and then she would die, and her world would die, and that was not a possibility. She spoke, voicing a guess. The Inquisitor has some ability to nullify psychic powers then? She asked. Is he from the branch that deals with the black ships then? The black ships are not the domain of the Inquisition. Andriel replied, still tense as a razor wire. But yes, he is soulless. A blank to use the technical term. They are. Unpleasant creatures. Atra raised an eyebrow at that. Andriel stared at her balefully. Imagine standing in the same room as a black hole. That is what being near one of those is like. It is destruction, swirling darkness that inexorably draws everything to it. You wish to reach out and destroy it, but know that the nearer you draw to it, the worse it will become, as it tears things off of you, ripping the skin from your face and your bones off the marrow, and everything you understand about the world falls into chaos around it. That is what a blank is to a sicker. They are anathema to us. Atra shuddered. I see. Unpleasant. Indeed. Constantine stepped back out from the cockpit, and surveyed the room for a moment. There will be no space to train further once we arrive. Andriel, Matthias, please provide us with space. Andriel nodded and stepped aside, as did Matthias. He could sense Morn's frown, but also his understanding. Atra might have needed more time to recover, but that was something they did not have. She needed to acclimate to her new body, and Constantine would force that, or break her to the point where she would be forced to remain behind. Then again, he considered the Templar's memory, that might be what he intended. It would not be out of character. The Templar drew his blades, but did not activate the power sword. Both were still dangerous, but unlikely to simply shear lines through the ship or Atra. Atra drew her own weapon, and took her stance, breathing in deeply, then releasing it. She focused on the towering black knight before her, watching him as he stood at ready. She felt her mind narrow, closing off everything not directly applicable to her training. The countless hours of drilling, the slight, almost imperceptible shift in stance and grip to bring it into the Templar's perfectionist alignment. There was almost a sort of peace there, in the incredibly minute focus required to match his standards. She smiled, he knew exactly what he was doing with this, and she thanked him silently for it. The two held position for a moment, Constantine watching the good woman's form, silently judging. Then he offered a slight, almost imperceptible nod, and struck. This time, she saw it. Not the blow itself, still faster than even her bionic eye could follow. But what led to it, the shift in the muscles, the way the dots of brilliance cast by the artificial lights onto ceramide shifted, indicating motion in that split instance as the arm beneath the armor moved. The thousand tiny movements before the movement. Then in a fraction of a second, collapsing into a single, almost beautiful moment of almost graceful yet supremely violent motion. Her body moved on reflex, snapping into position. She felt the strike, and held it for a half second. She understood the blow in that moment. It had been too much for her to recognize before, but now, muscles woven through with bionic enhancement, she could feel the strike, the incredible strength of the marine crushing down on her guard. Before, the sheer gap between them had been so great she'd been unable to comprehend it, like looking out at the ocean and being unable to understand how massive it truly was. Now though, she could see how ridiculous what she was doing really was. She was like a child trying to fight an adult. 
She gave ground before the blow, pulling back and focusing on deflecting the strike, just as she had been taught. Even with every once of leverage she could muster, she just managed to keep her balance as the blow ripped through the air where she had just been standing. But she was still standing, and the next attack was already on its way. Again, she was ready, and again she gave ground, backpedaling step after step, but keeping her feet and keeping her guard up. Then she ducked, shifting into a hanging guard that pushed the strike over her head and her down to a knee. But she was inside his reach now, and swung, aiming for the marine's ribs. Constantine's knife stopped her, flat to the blade hitting her in the throat. She stumbled back, gasping for air, before a decisive strike knocked the blade from her hands and threw her to the floor on her face. She took a moment to regain the ability to breathe, then pulled herself to her feet. She had been so focused on the marine's sword that she hadn't even noticed his knife. He'd let her inside his guard specifically to bait her into range. If the blade hadn't been turned, it would have cut her head from her body before her blade even scratched his armor. And he'd moved as well, pivoting to the side and away from the strike as he delivered his counter. Even if she'd been able to block the knife, she would have missed him by almost a foot. Good. Constantine noted. Get up, and do it again. I'm not sure if I agree with you that it was good. Atra coughed as she pulled herself to her feet and took a few deep breaths to make sure her throat still worked as intended. I missed you by half a subsector. Yes, you did. But you managed to acquire enough space to attempt to hit me, and your thrust, while sloppy, was not entirely terrible. High praise. Atra noted. Considering how you started, yes it is, now prove it wasn't a fluke. The pair continued their sparing for another hour, during which Atra made space rice more to strike at the Templar. All failed, fairly spectacularly, but each time, Constantine nodded approvingly. But then, they were near enough to the fleet that the time had come for Constantine to return to his pilot's chair. The Equinox was not small. In total, the ship probably contained more square footage than the small apartment she had lived in with her mother before she departed to join the guard, and with a father in the guard and a mother in the PDF, it was relatively comfortable. They even had their own washroom and kitchen. But the ship was completely dwarfed by even the smaller frigates which passed by, and seemed nothing but a gnat before the truly spectacular mass of an imperial battleship. They did not arrive in a time of peace, as the void was bright with lances. As they moved in, they watched as a gigantic Salafic bioship exploded, one of the high fleet's lesser forward scouts, torn asunder by the overwhelming firepower of the Imperial Navy. Constantine smirked under his helmet, and his fingers tapped twice on his armor. By the God Emperor, this is a good fight. If not for what awaited us below I might have been tempted to test this craft's dueling prowess yet further. It is hardly the match of my old Stormhawk in speed, but the stealth fields provide intriguing possibilities and her firepower is impressive. I doubt we have seen the full extent of her powers. I highly doubt that myself, and given the time I would gladly examine every inch of this holy machine, but we have a duty to fulfill. Morn concurred. Initiating docking procedures. You two have come around on this girl rather quickly. Wathin noted. Then again. She did pull our collective asses out of the Prometheum. You have not heard her. Morn replied. Her machine spirit sings. Young and fair, cunning and bellicose. This working is indeed blessed by the Omnisia. Even if her birth was in secret, he knows her, and has known her from the moment of her discovery. The interplay of her components is like a Terran concerto from days of old. Each portion of it interacting in ways even I had not considered. And while her machinery is young, the spirits and secrets woven into her are ancient, like a relic reforged for the modern age. I do not think that I should say all that. She is simply a joy to fly. Constantine replied with a shrug. Though it must be impressive if it can make Morn a poet. I take no offense at that statement simply because you are too deaf to hear the poetry in binary. Morn replied. And because taking offense with a brother for ignorance is a waste of time and energy. And I'd beat you if it came to resolving that offense. Dependent on who chooses the weapons. Ishvan smiled, and shared a knowing nod with Wathin. Then they passed into the hangar of the mighty battleship, and landed with a soft thud. The moment passed, 
as professionalism replaced the brief moment of levity and brotherhood, and the kill team plus mortals assembled. The boarding ramp lowered, and a sudden tension filled the air. Atra's arm began to hum subconsciously, and Matthias laid a hand on his pistols. Constantine's hand twitched slightly towards his sword and knife, and Wathin growled softly in the back of his throat. Anbiel took an unconscious step backwards, and Aishvan won forwards to interpose himself between the new arrival and his brother. Only Morn seemed unaffected, as he stood by and nodded towards their guest. Inquisitor Marcos, welcome aboard the Imperial Equinox. The Inquisitor was difficult for Atra to look at. Not that he was particularly ugly or in any way disfigured. But her eyes seemed to slide off of him, as if her brain refused to acknowledge that he was even there, and yet paradoxically registered him as a threat that had to be removed or fled from at once. Her eyes slipped towards those around him. Inquisitorial stormtroopers, heavily armored, by mortal standards, and equipped with a wide variety of weapons. Each man carried a high-powered hotshot Las Ganolas pistol, six grenades of two different types she did not recognize, and another secondary weapon. She spied flamers, plasma, melter guns, and more esoteric weaponry unlike anything she had seen before. She also noted that their eyes were unusual, not biological, but each man and woman's eyes had been replaced with advanced cybernetics, close enough to human to be uncanny. Undoubtedly these replacements provided more accurate vision in a wide variety of environments, and could potentially even supply useful information in an integrated HUD. The she noted Morn's calm, and hazarded a guess at one more reason for the stormtroopers enhancements. She shut her biological eye, and turned her mechanical gaze towards the Inquisitor once again, her arm cooled as she watched the Inquisitor. He was a shockingly normal looking man, with short black hair, and a stern, handsome face. He was clean shaven, and his face included several faded scars. His face and body seemed young, perhaps in his mid-thirties, but the scars showed a long history. And his eyes, his eyes were the eyes of a man far, far older than he appeared. They were filled with the wisdom and pain of long years in the Emperor's service. She might have expected piercing blue, or a steely grey, but no, simply fairly ordinary hazel eyes perpetually weary, but filled with resolve. He was clad in an intriguing sort of battle armor, close to her carapace armor and that of his accompanying stormtroopers, but of a significantly higher quality, and far more advanced and esoteric. Where there might have been a flak jacket there was something far closer to a breastplate, supplemented with pauldrons, boots, greaves, and braces as if her were a knight of ancient terror in a suit of half plate. Underneath, there was a layer of some form of body glove, which the mechanical eye registered by its movements to carry several layers. The uppermost was leathery, like the skin of some strange Xenos creature, most likely highly resistant to heat and toxins. The layer below she could not guess at, but beneath that, an intricate web of muscle fibers not unlike the ones now woven into her flesh. He wore a cloak of red interlocking scales, which shimmered as he walked, and beneath it hung a power sword and a selection of three different pistols, one clearly a hand flamer, but the others she did not recognize. At his side was a helmet, shaped almost like the barrel of a gun mixed with a grinning human skull, which Andriel saw and visibly made a common sign of warding against evil. Lost Caliban, is that even you couldn't acquire one of those? An edge crept into the librarian's voice, one that utterly terrified Atra and Matthias alike. Andriel was afraid. More than afraid, whatever that helmet was, it terrified the sicker. No, even I couldn't. Marcos replied. It simply looks like one. Quite effective as a terror weapon even without any function though. Particularly effective against the Eldery. But do not concern yourself. Even if it were, I have no reason to use it against you, or even the ability. Once we engage. I shall place myself on the opposite flank so as to interfere with your abilities as little as possible. Our combined abilities will be necessary. He then returned his attention towards Morn, and approached. The Tetch Marine approached him in turn, and the two men shook hands, Morn being careful to not crush the mortal's entire arm in his gauntlet by accident. Equinox? Let us hope it is the Vernal One, the Inquisitor remarked. We will make it the Vernal One. Morn replied, 
then nodded towards the stormtroopers, who silently began to embark the craft. Ever the optimist. Marcos replied with a faint smile, then his grim expression returned, and he turned towards Matthias and Atra. Who are these two? Colonel Atra Germanicus of the Alvaran Dragons, and her Lieutenant Matthias. Morn replied. Of the only regiment remaining. They are the last two free Alvarans not affiliated with the cult Mechanicus. Not ah, I see. And Salamander work as well as yours. Interesting. He replied, noting Atra's bionics. Colonel, we will speak on the transit. I want a full debrief on everything that happened on that planet. I already have watched Sergeant Morn's report, but a mortal perspective may be useful. Atra nodded, continuing to keep her biological eye closed so she could maintain eye contact with a blank. As you wish Lord Marcos. She replied. This was going to make the trip interesting. The strike team quickly reboarded, Andriel remaining as far from the Inquisitor as possible, and after a quick pre-flight check, they lifted off, pointed back towards the planet. As they traveled, Atra explained everything she had seen to the best of her ability. So, that's everything, and I'm a colonel now, more by default than anything else. Congratulations on your rapid promotion. Marcos remarked dryly. The Inquisitor did seem to demonstrate a certain sense of humor, though none of it ever seemed to land. You have provided me with much to consider. Really? I would have thought that Lord Morn's report would have been far more extensive. In some matters yes, in others no. Marcos replied. But one thing at a time. We have an impossible suicide mission to complete with the fate of a planet hanging in the balance before we do anything else. There was silence for a long moment, then Atra dared to ask a question. Milord, what happens? After this? After we stop them, the Xenos I mean? There are far too many variables and too many unknowns for me to give a certain answer. Marcos replied. I suspect it may take months, possibly even a full conclave to answer that in full detail. There are too many things we do not know for me to answer that for you. And that includes the fate of your people. It is entirely possible that the death of the Norn Queen will cause a psychic backlash powerful enough to kill everyone and everything connected to the hive mind, and even the survivors may be driven irreparably mad. Even if they are not, it is still complicated. More than likely the planet will be quarantined until we can find a cure for this infection that doesn't involve Prometheum, assuming the psychic backlash doesn't kill the spores before we can get to them. Atra nodded, visibly wincing, but internally having already concluded that the planet's population was most likely doomed no matter what they did. At least now they would die free from the Xeno's filth. At least now she would have vengeance for Alvara. Then I have only one request my lord. Do not let us become forgotten. Remember the sons of the storm and the daughters of the rain, even after we are gone and replaced by new servants of the emperor. Remember that we fought. And remember that we were loyal even to the point where our last free son and daughter burned the world to set Alvara free to the Emperor once more. Remember us. Remember we were loyal even to death. Remember we bled these bastards, and broke a hive fleet on our seas even though it cost us everything. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 26, The Fallen Hive. The Equinox once again descended from the heavens unto the seas of Alvara. Shading the blazing heat of ray entry off her shields and vanishing into a cloud of steam. Stealth field online. Constantine reported. Emperor willing, they will not see us. Nor sense us by other means. Wathin noted, with a slight glare towards Marcas. The space wolf sack seemed dimmer in the man's presence, the Fenris and runes etched into blade and handle no longer gleamed quite so brightly, becoming nothing more than scratches on the metal. What do those mean? Constantine asked, indicating his head towards the runes. My finrision is somewhat lacking. It's the blade's name, of sorts, and the names of everyone who carried it. Wathin explained. First it was called Fimblewinter, after an ancient finrision myth of a winter that would cover the whole of the galaxy for three years, and that this would herald the beginning of the wolf time. The wolf time. Constantine repeated. Is that something that just doesn't translate well into gothic? Aye. Wathin repeated. But it's a fell time to be certain, regardless of what it's called. 
the icy hand of the dark gods will stretch out over the galaxy, and their leering grin shall sunder the heavens. For three years, or maybe three hundred, the Eddas are a bit rusty, there will be great catastrophe on every world but then, things will change. Lemon Russ will return, and bring with him the fruit of the tree of life which can heal any harm, and by that restore the Owl Father to his full power. And then there will be a new and final crusade, greater even than when the Primarch stood with us, and it shall take back the galaxy and wipe the powers of chaos from it forever. An interesting prophecy. Constantine replied. You and Ishvan both seem to have oddly optimistic views on the future. I suppose not having the corpse of your gene father helps, at least what's left of one. True, and the Sons of Dawn are always practical sorts. I think I met one once who said, I've no need for prophecies because I build for every eventuality. Constantine smiled at that. Yes, that does sound like something our older brothers would say. Still, a fell name from a fell time. A fell name for a fell blade. Wathin replied. They're all fell, and no sense in pretending otherwise. Weapons aren't made for times of peace, if such times even exist. We make them for the fell days, for if those are ended, we have no more need for them. Their chatter dimmed as they breached the clouds, and came on unseen wings towards what was left of Hive Tempestus. The first thing that struck them was the silence. Hives are unimaginably loud and busy places, but now, there was only dead silence. The Tyranid had no need to speak, and nothing could be seen moving about in the spires. The grey-black smoke of the hive's industry was gone, replaced instead with the fetid green miasma of Tyranid digestion pools. The acidic stench of the Tyranid industry was so profound they could smell it through their void hard and hull while still kilometers away. There was little movement to be seen inside the city, but a great deal beyond it. The bridges teemed with Xenos bioforms. Diving repeatedly into the seas, or spreading out further to expand their fishing grounds. Morn issued a cursory visual scan, and what returned showed the unnerving adaptability of the Xenos. Already, the fishing bioforms were becoming more adapted, with long tails, maneuvering fins, and bioluminescent lures. They were not perfectly adapted to the seas yet, still capable of moving on land and sea alike to drag their quarry back to the digestion pools. Much of the city was still intact. The Tyranid had yet to focus their efforts on breaking down the steel and stone, though they would devour even that, given enough time. However, there was one massive, notable exception. The central spire of the city, once the seat of imperial power over the entire world, was completely unrecognizable. It was completely covered in Xeno's flesh, a massive tower of meat wrapped about the once proud imperial bastion. The sight of it set everyone save Marcos's teeth bussing. Even through the blank snull aura, the raw psychic energy emanating from the structure was impossible to ignore. That explains why there were so few Tyranids. Most of the biomass they harvested must have gone into creating that. Morn noted. And real, I hypothesize that it is a massive psychic amplifier. Can you confirm that? Yes brother, I certainly can. Andriel replied. The tower was an entirely different thing to his eyes. The raw power coming off of it changed the world. It was less a thing of flesh, bone, and steel, and far more akin to a gigantic pillar of black flame. It drank deeply from the warp, from the depths of the immaterial. There was almost a purity to its power, untouched by the flickering strands of chaos. Pure warp energy, unlike anything he had ever seen before. This would certainly provide the Norn Queen with everything she needs to dominate the planet. It is also likely the source of the spores. Can you pinpoint the location of the Queen? Marcos asked. Inquisitor, what I am looking at is a psychic pillar of energy that can only roughly be compared to a miniature heretical version of the Astronomicon. Andriel responded curtly. But judging by the direction of the energy flow, most likely near the top. At this, lightning flashed dramatically behind the dark tower, its pinnacle hidden amidst the fiercest portion of the storm. Atra looked up at it, and if not for the grim circumstances, might have laughed at the absurdity of it all. They were officially living in a propaganda reel. Because of course she is. Well, let's get up there and kill the bitch. I can't put us directly there, the storm will tear us apart. Constantine noted. 
but I can probably get us up to within 5 levels, assuming they don't detect us. Once they do, things will become complicated. We will have 64 minutes to reach the queen, kill her, and evacuate before the hive mind is able to redeploy sufficient forces to overwhelm us. Mourn noted. Resistance will increase exponentially from the moment we arrive, and after that point, the possibility of survival and successful completion of the mission reaches zero. Resistance will likely consist initially of Hive Guard, Tyrant Guard, and potentially Hive Tyrant and Tyranid Prime Subcommanders. Actually killing the Norn Queen herself will likely require the use of Melter Bombs. We face their most powerful and adept forces thus far. Marcos noted. Fortunately, the fleet is small enough and has proven successful enough that it is unlikely that they will deploy any form of impossibly dangerous creature. Once we land, the Astartes will take point, and the rest of us will cover them. We move with all possible speed. Constantine, is Sergeant Jenkins an acceptable substitute to pilot this craft and keep it out of the way of the enemy? Constantine checked his armor's data logs, skimming through the man's history in a few seconds. If he breaks my ship, I'm going to break him in half. But he's the least likely of any of you to do so. Duly noted my lord. I'll take care of her. Jenkins replied. Do tell her majesty that I send her my regards. I will be certain to sergeant. By the way, if anything unusual occurs, keep note of it. Constantine replied as the craft drew closer. T-30 seconds to engagement. Invoke your litanies to the god emperor, for even in this blighted storm he sees. All men, prepare your hearts and souls for battle in his holy name, and for the glory of his imperium. For on this day, he has granted us the privilege to be his vengeance upon the Zeno, his fury made manifest. The enemies of man shall be crushed beneath your boots, and their mightiest warriors shall fall by our sacred blades. This the holy emperor shall accomplish and those who die, he shall bear swiftly to his side and to rest eternal. For all those who die this day die in glory, and all those who live, live to bring death unto the enemies of man. Today, we are his angels of death, today, we are the wings of vengeance. Vengeance for Alvara. Death to the Xenos. Glory to the Emperor. Then with a roar of vengeance. The fervent marine pushed the equinox out of her stealth fields and fired her towards the tower at incredible speeds. The weapons needed a moment to come online, then brilliant beams of light struck from the craft and lanced through the corrupted side of the tower. Alien flesh burned to ashes, steel and gold melted and ran like water. Yet the craft was already cutting speed and coming about. By the time the high fleet could react, the Equinox was flying backwards into the Hive Tower, engines firing to slow their arrival. The resulting maneuver set even the Astarte staggering, and more than a few of the mortals were violently ill, but they quickly recovered as the Equinox touched down. Constantine nodded to a somewhat wobbly knee Jenkins as he stepped from the cockpit. I don't recommend trying that. You probably won't survive. Wasn't planning on it my lord. Jenkins burped. Show off. Andriel grumbled. Alright chaplain, let's get to work. The fiery arrival of the Equinox had left few survivors. One of the few, a singularly unfortunate hive guard, raised its head, and was greeted with a bolt round as the boarding ramp dropped and the Astartes charged forth. Morn led the way, cerebral cogitator already plotting a course to take them up the 30 floors of the hive spire as quickly as possible. They sprinted through the scorched ruins of two floors quickly approaching a set of lift shaft doors. Morn lowered his shoulder and smashed into the doors, bending them back. He then stepped back and booted them open. He checked the shaft, then stepped out, boots maglocking to the metal walls of the shaft and charging upwards. The mortals followed swiftly behind, firing climbing cables up the sides of the shaft and beginning to make their way up, save for Jenkins, who raised the boarding ramp and made ready to take off. Once the strike force was clear, the engines fired, and the Equinox slipped clear of the spire, vanishing once more beneath the cloaking field. Resistance arrived almost immediately, coming at the strike team from both sides. Above, the doors began to blow out as the Tyranid started to break into the shaft, large, 
six-legged creatures, Hive Guard, emerging from the breaches with Impaler cannons leveled towards the team. From below, the sounds of many skittering creatures could be heard. Morn raised his bolters, and opened fire, hellfire rounds slamming into the Tyranids as they emerged. A few managed to fire, huge bone rounds whipping through the air at deadly velocity. One tore through the side of Morn's arm, ripping away ceramides and the steel beneath. His bolter span from his hand, and the Tetchmarine staggered. A mechanical tendril whipped from his back and caught the falling weapon, as several more set to work repairing the damaged arm. A bolt from Wathen finished the alien. Below, a wave of Termagords, armed with their strange bone rifles, arrived and began to open fire on the mortals as they climbed. Their weapons scratched against the stormtroopers' armor, as several removed grenades and hurled them down into the oncoming horde. There was a violent hissing sound, as a deadly green gas erupted from the canisters, melting through tyrannid flesh and making it run like water. What was left of the termagants fell in a disgusting rain from the deadly cloud, even their bones liquefied. Aerosolized form of the same thing they use in their digestion pools. Marcos explained to Atra. There is a certain irony to destroying the Xenos with tools of their own creation. The goods woman had little time to respond, before the next wave of attackers arrived. The enemy hurled themselves at the oncoming strike time, quite literally. Huge, hulking walls of flesh and carapace, the tyrant guard, flung themselves like living missiles into the shaft, their sheer weight serving as potent weapons in the vertical environment. Constantine leapt aside from one, landing on the other side of the shaft several feet below. One on a collision course with Wathin was blown aside as Ishvan fired a crack missile into it. The Xeno fell, bouncing off the sides of the shaft and smashing two stormtroopers to paste. More of the living missiles continued to fall, too many to continue to progress up the shaft. The Astartes broke for one of the doors the Hive Guard had appeared for, leaping through to escape the Onslaught. The mortals, slowed by their climbing harnesses, were not so swift. Recognizing they had no time to make for an entrance, Marcos ordered two of his men carrying melter guns to make them an entrance. As they turned the beams of intense heat to a wall, searing their way into a floor two stories below the space marines, another tyrant guard fell towards them. Marcos quickly pulled one of the strange pistols from his hip, aimed, flicked a switch, and pulled the trigger. Atra didn't see any projectile or beam appear from the gun, only a loud bassy sound that reverberated through the air, and a certain distortion, like heat haze. One of the falling Xenos slowed, as if its progress was arrested by some invisible force. Then Marcos jerked the weapon to the side, throwing one tyrant guard into another and sending both out of the way of the stormtroopers. The hole was opened, and the mortals quickly leapt through, moving from one attack to another. The floor they leapt onto was almost instantly filled with the sound of scuttling, as thousands of tiny, scarab-like bioforms began to crawl from every vent and electrical socket. They swarmed towards the stormtroopers, who quickly answered with more acid grenades. Those equipped with flamers stepped forwards, clearing a path with Prometheum. Marcus drew his own hand flamer, scouring any that drew too near, when a thud came from the hole. One of the tyrant guard had caught the lip of the stormtrooper's entry, and was pulling itself up. The inquisitor flicked the switch on his unusual weapon, and then fired again. The tyrannid suddenly broke inwards, as if crushed by an incredible weight, and the metal deformed, ripping clear as the creature's weight suddenly increased tenfold and it fell with concerning speed down the elevator shaft. Gravity gun? Atro asked as she vented steam from one arm. Gravity gun. Marcos confirmed. Two stories above, Andriel smiled. The Inquisitor's ability to suppress his powers dropped off with range, and at this distance, the effect was lessened substantially. He was still only operating at around 50% capacity, but it was something. He drank in power, like a swimmer taking a deep breath before being submerged once more, and held it close, shepherding it for when it would be needed again. He let it flow through his body, the power of his mind enhancing the strength and speed of his body. The Dark Angel drew his ceremonial sword, and charged alongside his brothers into the aliens as they swarmed to stop them. The creatures here were a step above the gaunts which haunted them before, 
powerful warriors armed with scything talons and flesh hooks not unlike the ones wielded by the lictor. He deftly tilted his body as he charged a group of three, deflecting the hooks from his armor as he rushed into melee. His force staff swung, impacting the body of one and hurling it back with a crater where its chest used to be. His sword ignited in warp fire and crackling lighting, lashing out to strike the head from another warrior before the third struck. The blows were foiled by his armor, but the monster was almost as big as he was, pushing him back on his heels before he let the power of the immaterium flow through him. He hurled the creature back and ripped it apart with a bolt of lightning from his sword, moving on without hesitation to the next creature opposing his path. Ishvan and Constantine moved up as a pair, flame heralding the Templar's descent. The pair rounded a corner, only to be confronted by a horrifying abomination. A Xenos that crawled on many limbs, back disgorging spider-like living minds that raced towards the pair with suicidal frenzy. Ishvan's flame roared, sweeping away the first wave, then without any wasted motion the devastator marine shifted his missile launcher from his back, loaded, and fired a crack missile into the monster's face. The creature staggered, but did not fall, but Constantine made to remedy that. He charged forwards, blazing blade raised high. Three warriors moved to intercept, but he cut through them with utter contempt, splinting toe in half with mighty blows. The third lunged, but was thrown back, stumps where its limbs had been blazing like paper left near a half. Taking his sword in both hands, Constantine drove the blade into the mine carrier's side up to the hilt, and kept moving, ripping it along the whole length of the monster. The mine scuttlers within exploded from the heat of the bleed, ripping the abomination apart in a cascade of fire and acid. Morn moved forwards without hesitation, his wounded arms functions already restored. His bolters roared without ceasing, but even the potent hellfire rounds required several hits to bring down a warrior. The deadly chemical mixture ripped through their flesh like it was paper, but the beasts refused to go down until they had been reduced to nothing more than a splatter on the floor or their heads had been pounded into paste. Even so, he keep firing and did not miss, even moving at a full sprint towards the staircase, he did not miss. Wathin moved up alongside him cleaving anything that got too close away with swings of his mighty axe. As the pair approached the stairwell, two tyrant guard crashed through the ceiling above, followed by several warriors, one particularly large one in the center, as if the others were trying to protect it. The space marines exchanged a nod, and split. Wathin went left, and Morn right. The tyrant guard interposed themselves between the deadly fire of the Tetchmarine and their charge, while the warriors rushed for Wathin. He met them with a howl and a laugh, smashing into the center of their formation with a deadly blow that nearly cut the center warrior in half. The others quickly moved to flank him, but Wathin seemed unconcerned. The space wolf stepped forwards, and drove his bolt pistol through the rift he had cloven through the warrior's body. His fist and gun punched through the monster, aimed directly at the Tyranid leader, and he emptied the clip. The death of their leader sent a brief shock through the Tyranid forces, delaying them for but a few seconds, but that was all the marines needed. Wathin tossed the corpse of the warrior aside and got clear as Morn opened fired into the stunned remnants of that squad. Instead, he made his way for the stunned tyrant guard, striking the heads off of the stupid creatures before they could recover. Then they heard a loud, low droning, the sound of great wings beating at extreme speed. They felt a rush of wind and watched a blow rip through the staircase in front of them. It took them both half a second to figure out what the hive tyrant was up to, then then realized and moved, hoping they weren't too late. The first three stormtroopers up the staircase died instantly as the hive tyrant arrived, splattered against the wall and stairs like so much red jelly. Those nearest the door caught a brief glimpse of the barrel of a venom cannon, before it fired and melted everyone in a line stretching back to the other side of the floor. Save for Marcos, who had drawn his Xenoscale cloak about himself, and while the bioacid barrage drove him back several feet, he kept his footing, and cast it aside, scales unmarred by the tyrant's attack. The hive tyrant came through the door, and the surrounding wall, two massive claws lashing out at everything around it. It tore four more stormtroopers in half before the squad fell back and opened fired with everything they had into it. Melter, Flamer, Plasma, 
and grenades exploded off the monster's hide as it rampaged forwards. It shrugged them off, wings bearing it aloft as it moved to rip them apart. Then it fell, crashing into the ground as Marcos's grav pistol caught the alien in its deadly grip, pinning it to the ground and slowing it significantly. The Inquisitor drew his third pistol with his free hand, and fired. A beam of unbearably bright light erupted from the strange, vaguely serpentine pistol, brighter than a relay's beam, even brighter than plasma. And it did not stop, a continuous beam of deadly light and radiation that struck the monster's wings and deflagrated them. The membranes seemed to disintegrate under the strange weapon's touch, exploding into fire and smoke and permanently grounding the beast. The tyrant let forth a storm of psychic lightning towards the Inquisitor, but it fizzled out in the air, fading away into nothing mere inches from his face. Marcos's helmet seemed to be grinning, as he turned the deadly beam downwards towards the Xenos's face. It hefted the venom cannon towards the Inquisitor again, while also raising its great talons to hold back the lethal ray. But Mathias was at its flank, and opened fire with his plasma pistols, aiming for the joint which held the bio-weapon up. It weakened, and then, unable to bear the weight of the weapon under the effects of the grab gun, it snapped and fell to the ground with a crash. Atra struck as well, power blade cleaving through one of the monster's ankles as it focused on the Inquisitor. The leg splinted under its own weight, leaving the monster crawling towards the skull-helmed instrument of the Emperor's Wrath. It screamed as it drew near, and Atra almost felt as if it were trying to scream something. But then the flesh on its face boiled, and its brain was turned to nothing but fire and ash, leaving only a charred skull as the body fell to the floor. How many casualties? Marcos asked. Twelve see my lord. Atra reported, cerebral cogitator providing her the answer automatically. Unfortunate. We need to keep moving. This won't be the last one. The kill team proceeded up the stairs, quickly rejoined by the Inquisitor and what remained of his retinues. They exchanged a brief nod, and proceeded upwards. As they moved, blasting their way through yet more Xeno's filth, a growing sense of dread began to seep into the whole team, setting the hair on the backs of their necks on edge. Only Marcos was entirely unaffected. I don't suppose that'd be your doing Marcos? Wathen growled quietly. You set my teeth on edge enough without trying to. It's not anything I'm doing. We must be getting close. This near to the Norn Queen, her powers may even be able to have a limited effect even within my aura. Marcos replied. Our data on this particular breed of Xenos is understandably limited. The shadow in the warp grows thicker, but there is something more here. Andriel replied. My vision is stifled by your presence, but even through this suffocating veil I can sense it. I do not believe this tower is an amplifier as I once believed. The energy here is focused inwards, as if it's trying to contain something rather than push its energy outwards. But in that case, how is it able to sustain the attack? The librarian shook his head. This makes no sense. We've missed something. I can feel it. We are dealing with remarkably abnormal behavior for the Tyranid. Deploying a Norn Queen is strange enough, and the nearest report we have to similar behavior would be High Fleet Shyamut which constructed a similar structure to this one. I do not know. Andriel replied. All I do know is that there is something fundamentally wrong with this hive, and the way that the Tyranid have behaved. We're nearly to the top. We can find out from the Queen's corpse. Constantine growled, and they pushed on, reaching the top of the stairwell. More were coming up from behind, and the aura of dread grew even greater. Even Marcus began to sweat under its effect. He ordered his men to use the grenades they had left to collapse the staircase and keep the aliens back. It wouldn't hold them long, but every second counted. The door out of the stairwell was jammed, so Aishvan simply tore it off its hinges, revealing a wall of tyrannic biomatter barring their path. Undeterred, the Inquisitor leveled his pistol and fired, burning a hole through the wall of meat. Lord Morn, what exactly is that thing? Some kind of advanced LAS melter hybrid? Atro asked over a closed comb. Vokite. Morn replied. Very old technology, not manufactured since the Great Crusade. Supposedly, the tech priests of Mars originally intended for such weapons to be the standard for the legions, 
but they were too expensive to manufacture when Bolters were equally effective, if not more so in certain instances. A pistol almost 10,000 years old, and still in good working condition. Imperial technology was rarely pretty or sleek, but it was remarkably rugged stuff. Aitra shook her head at the realization, and vented her arm anew. The strain the running battle was already putting on the freshly forged connections between flesh and steel was notable, but not concerning yet. The light faded, and Mark has slotted in a new power cell, nodding to the Astartes. The Emperor protects. The Emperor protects. Constantine responded, taking point into the breach. Astartes and mortals alike moved through meters of cramped passageway, moving single file, flanked by cauterized meat. The stench was awful, permeating even through sealed helmets. Then they were through, stepping out into a wet, damp, and foul chamber. This had once been the uppermost floors of the highest spire on Alvara, a mighty palace that housed hundreds if not thousands of servants, and represented the pinnacle of wealth and power. Now it was the den of Xenos, a festering, fleshy hive, with golden marble hanging like flies in countless webs of Xenos mucus. The lights, somehow, still worked, casting weird beams and long shadows across the vast chamber. As the Astartes watched, they felt the strange familiarity of information imparted through hypno-indoctrination. Picked scans taken from devoured Imperial ships recovered from the bowels of the Tyranid hive ships, then burned into their minds layered over the space. They were standing inside a bioship, or at least part of one, fallen to the surface. The meters of tissue had been its skin, and now they stood inside a massive, living organism, playing host to many more. For the center of the vast chamber was well lit, but not by any natural light. Instead, the slender, centipede-like forms of zoanthropes, lesser xenosickers, emitted powerful bolts of psychic energy, leeching power from the walls around them. Multiple hive tyrants flitted here and there around them, administering bolts of their own with odd care. For their target was something most unsocial, and most horrifying. The whole of the Xenos Conclave had their efforts focused on a single being, or rather two entangled beings. The first, and one the Xenos were careful not to harm, was an ugly thing, a massive, bloated alien dozens of times larger than any they had seen thus far. It had wrinkled, pink skin, and a massive abdomen. It seemed too huge to possibly move on its own, though many vestigial limbs indicated that it might have once been mobile in a younger state. Tubes, not unlike massive blood vessels, ran to it from the floor of the crashed bioship, supplying the creature with nutrients, even as sacs along its massive being burst, revealing more larval tyrannids, which were quickly removed from the Norn Queen's side by attendant drones. The second thing was smaller, though still massive, and attached to the Norn Queen's head. The lesser tyrannids all seemed to have their efforts focused upon it, trying to remove it from their mother. It vaguely resembled a gorge tick mixed with an octopus, with a huge spherical body terminating in many tentacles, which were wrapped about the Norn Queen's face. It was roughly 6 meters in height, and half that across, and its strange body glowed with the impossible colors of the warp. By the God Emperor. Marco swore. Nobody move. Everyone, as close to me as possible, especially you and real. The librarian reluctantly complied, though he began to breathe heavily this close to the pariah. Blood of the lion and blasted curs, that explains a great deal, and also raises far too many questions. Namely, how the hell did one of those get there, and how do we kill both of them? Wathin concurred. Not to show my youth of much, but what in the warp is that thing? Aishvan hissed. I'm no sicker, but even I can see that it quite literally glows with the power of sorcery. An enslaver. Sort of a warp-born Xenos, not a demon, but not really properly a creature either. Wathin noted. Never fought one, really hoped I'd never have two. I have, and this one is different. Marcos replied grimly. It's about three times bigger, and judging by the amount of effort the Tyranid seemed to be exerting against it. I suspect it is exponentially stronger. I cannot tell if it has managed to dominate the hive, or if the hive has adapted it. Neither. Andriel replied. They are fighting, evenly matched. He remarked. Which is also why they have not noticed us yet. 
the attacks launched thus far must have been under the direction of lesser synapse creatures. Even the spawning of the hooded lictors, it wasn't preparation for the cyclic attack, it was an attempt to keep this thing from calling forth any of its brethren. Are you certain this isn't a demon? Constantine remarked. Because this sounds increasingly like possession. Close, but not quite. I think this one may be older than demons. Andriel replied. It's aura is utterly incredible. I've never seen anything like it. It's easily the equivalent of an alpha level sicker, possibly even alpha plus. The amplifier they've built here, it isn't for projecting an attack out, it's for keeping the enslaver in. At the risk of sounding like an ultramarine, this is largely theoretical. Ishvan noted. Practical, it doesn't appear to be able to move, and I have a rocket launcher. Andriel shook his head. Even I could stop a crack missile or divert its course. This thing wouldn't need to. If it forms a kind shield, that's going to be on par with the titan's void shields. Another practical my lords. One of the stormtrooper reported. We're out of grenades and there's a lot of them coming in fast. Whatever we're planning on doing, we best do it quickly if we want to get out of here. Marcos nodded. Morn, where are this hive's primary plasma reactors? 270 floors below us. Morn reported. Overloading them would result in the destruction of the hive spire, along with all nearby spires, with a 90% mortality rate for everything in hive tempestus. The damage will also be irreparable. So is the life eater virus, and aside from that if Andriel is correct this is our only other option. Fall back, we'll leave out the side and move on the reactor core. Once we arrive, Morn will set it to overload, and then if that doesn't do it I like our odds of killing it after we've dropped it several kilometers a hell of a lot more than trying to fight it and a coven of Xeno sorcerers at the same time. Constantine looked at the Xeno, and then at the Inquisitor. You are telling us to retreat without even facing the enemy in battle, after all that we did to reach here? He snarled incredulously. There is no shame in avoiding a battle you cannot win to fight one that you can. Marcos replied. So yes, I am ordering you to retreat so that we can kill this thing and save this planet. Unless you would prefer to die pointlessly when the world eater virus rips its way into your armor and puts an end to your miserable existence as nothing more than that creature's pawn. Constantine's stance shifted dangerously, and for a moment, there was an extreme tension as it seemed the Black Templar might actually attack the Inquisitor. I will remember this. He snarled and backed down. Good. Learn from it. Now move before the horde arrives. Marcos ordered, and began making his way back through the hole. Constantine cursed the inglorious and anticlimactic retreat, but recognized the wisdom of the plan. The group pulled back, and the Templar paused only for a moment to turn his hateful gaze towards the creature and curse it. That was very nearly a fatal error. This close to the creature, he slipped slightly from the most intense area of Marcos's anti-psychic aura. As he focused on the creature, his hatred caught a flicker of its attention. Constantine began to scream. None of them had ever heard a space marine scream. It was something fundamentally wrong, but it was there, and it was terrifying. Andriel felt the awesome power of the Xeno's mind brush against them, sensing them even through the muffling aura of Marcos. Constantine was fighting it, Fighting it with all his hatred and fury but he was a man trying to hold back the ocean. Marcos drew nearer, and Andriel threw his own weight behind the Templar. He felt the rage of the Templar, so bright it made his skin blister, and the ancient, unknowable mind of the enslaver. It turned towards him in turn, but something was holding it back. Then he saw the Norn Queen. And he saw the enslaver. The sicker ceased to see the physical world and his vision became plagued with memories not his own. Countless eons in the blackest void, a flare of light in the darkness, a turning, motion, then 10,000 years of darkness. The memories also of the enslaver, strange and impossible. The very stars themselves were different, the warp was screaming, screaming with the souls of a war apocalyptic beyond imagining. The darkness there, beneath it all, before the gods, stirred by the arrogance of mortal races. He was vaguely aware that he was falling, that they were all falling. The mortals were all dead, save for Atra and Marcos. The refractor fields of their Aquila and Rosarium respectively had protected them. 
Several things were broken. His armor was scoured black. His staff was gone. His sword was molten slag. He was falling. Falling but he could not escape the memories. He drowned in them. In the war between the two unfathomably ancient minds. They were older than the gods, though she was younger. She was but a body, a daughter born with the memories of millions of years. They were all that, all parts of the great mind, the mind of quadrillions of minds. Vast as the Imperium, so many, still waiting there in the dark. He saw how she touched the warp, how they all touched it, and stirred it up in their passing. They drank deeply from the immaterial, from the deep warp, where even the young gods dared to tread. It was there before him, and beneath him and within him and around him, the tower as an amplifier. It was a door. Then the attack of the enslaver redoubled, filling his mind with fire. He reached for the warp, reached for power as he fell past Marcos and out of his range. He outstretched his psychic grasp towards the Tyranid tower in desperation, raking at the energy there and drinking it in. It burned and tore at him, the screaming of minds beyond minds, innumerable, but only the surface. Then he was beyond it, drinking in the purity of the deepest black. Yet it was not alone there. Even as he drank it in, that stikes and might, he would not drown in it. For he was soul bound, a seeker of the Imperium, and a son of the God Emperor. Even this deepest darkness could not devour him. Golden and black fire ran through his mind, as he released a scream of utter defiance to the heavens, joining his voice to Constantine's as the two men fought back the enslaver, hearing the choir of the Astronomicon echoing behind them. The effort blew out one of Andriel's eyes, and he fell in a corona of warp fire, but they had pushed the enslaver back for a moment, hurling it from their minds. The ground was swiftly approaching, as certain the death as by warp fire. So, he drank in his power, and with the last of his strength tore open a gate between the earth and what remained of the strike force. Darkness swallowed them, then there was cold blue light, pain, and he knew no more. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Morn was the first to regain consciousness, rising with a groan as his internal diagon stick beeped binary warnings on the status of his limbs and armor. The damage was extensive. One of his bolters had exploded in his hand, mangling the gauntlet and fist beneath, and his other bolter was missing, though a lack of damage to that limb suggested that he had merely dropped it. His lower body was operating at less than half its normal capacity, and the integrity of his armor was compromised. He pulled the helmet from his head. It was so badly cracked that a single blow might easily shatter it. Worse than useless now. He surveyed his surroundings. They were located in the hive's main plasma plant, and Riel must have transported them there midfall. He reviewed his logs, noting a massive surge in energy less than a minute ago. The Enslaver, or perhaps the Norn Queen, had unleashed a remarkably deadly psychic blast, throwing them all from the spire. The rest of the kill team was scattered about him, alive, but badly injured. Their armor was all scorched black by witchfire. Of the mortals, only Marcus and Atra remained. Both carried a form of refractor field that must have protected them from the explosion. He approached Andriel first. The Dark Angel was badly burned, one of his eyes were missing, and his psychic hood and staff had been destroyed. All the hair he had previously was burned off, leaving his face and head a charred mess. He was still breathing, and initial scans showed that while his injuries were severe, he would most likely make a full recovery given time and proper treatment. The Tetchmanine removed his gauntlet. While much of his equipment had been destroyed in the blast, the systems protected by both armor and his iron limbs remained intact. The injector array emerged from the metal limb, and he selected an adrenaline injection to rouse the sicker. No effect. Morn frowned, that should have woken him. 
It seemed his injuries were more than physical. He was distracted by the groan of Ishvan coming to his senses. Unsurprising, the salamander was stronger and tougher by half than any of the rest of them. He pulled himself to his feet, removing his helmet, and tearing away a collapsed pauldron that had become wedged in the rest of his armor. The salamander cracked his neck, then turned his eerie burning eyes on the rest of the group. This is all that left? He asked. It seems so. Morn confirmed. I see your point now about overloading the reactors. Ishvan replied with a groan. I suspect that my missile launcher would have only annoyed it. He checked for it, and was pleased to see the weapon was still mostly intact. It wouldn't be nearly as accurate, but it was unlikely to explode. Similarly, his heavy flamer had also survived, though one of the fuel tanks was ruptured. Not going to get much more out of this. Indeed. Morn noted, as he removed Constantine's helmet and prepared to minister to the fallen Templar. His arm was blocked, as Constantine's eyes opened, face twisted in fury. His sword ignited, preparing to sweep up, before he recognized Morn and his wrath abated. Morn, given you look like he just crawled out of a grave, perhaps have a care for when you wake people. The Templar growled, deactivating his sword. Are the rest alive? I'm here. Ishvan reported. And Wathan is still alive, though in bad shape. That was an understatement. Half the space wolf's face was simply gone, burned down to the bone. His armor was also badly dented, breastplate caved in, his breathing was labored, and he began to cough violently as Ishvan tore the destroyed armor off of him, removing the pressure on his hearts and lungs. What about Andriel, and the mortals? Also, get off of me I'm not dead. Constantine asked. Obviously. Morn responded with what the Templar might have taken for a hint of snark if he didn't know him better. Marcos and Atro are the only ones to have survived. Well at least the useful ones are still around then. Constantine growled, pulling himself to his feet. Andriel. Get up. We have work to do. He shouted to the sicker, who remained unresponsive. He marched over to the unconscious marine, grabbing him by the shoulders. Andriel. Andriel. Get up. Your duty is not yet ended. Andriel floated, drifting in the darkness, but not a realm of pure darkness. It was a world of black and white, the two colors entangled in one another, crossed through with things like silhouettes, moving from white to black as they shifted between bands of light and shadow. Beasts that he initially mistook for tyrannids, six-legged and chitinous, some with mantis-like talons. Others resembled emaciated bird-like humanoids, with long tentacles in place of arms. Then a shadow moved, and he beheld that it was a massive creature, with no face, but a smooth, blank slate, a great humanoid body that terminated in goat-like hooves, and a long tail that moved like a serpent and ended in a body that resembled one of the lesser mantis-like creatures. It held a curved sword in one hand, and a long polyam that ended in a shape like a crescent moon in the other. It looked towards the sicker, hanging naked in its domain, but did not attack. Anathema. It said. Andriel felt his gaze turned upwards, or perhaps downwards. Direction had no meaning in this place. He was perhaps below the universe, or above or behind it. This was the deep darkness, the realm below realms. He had opened the door that Tyranid had built, diving beneath the shadow and the warp. The Tyranid did not serve this place, but they drank from it from old power, from places where gods feared to tread. He could see the warp as he knew it stretched out below or above him, the myriad lights of the great game, cut through with the blinding light of the god emperor's power. Then a voice spoke, roaring through the void, golden light reaching into the darkness not by might or wisdom, but sheer bloody minded stubbornness. It spoke the name he had taken, not his true name, but one adopted. Andriel. It roared. Your duty is not ended. The voice seemed so very small before this primordial realm. Before the might of the primordial annihilator. But it did not cur. Perhaps from ignorance. Perhaps from folly. Perhaps even from courage. The faceless lord turned, half black, half white, standing between everything in impossible anarchy. It is only beginning. Then Andriel awoke, breathing heavily. See, told you it would work. 
Constantine said, before offering the Sicker a hand up. On your feet brother, we have more Xenos to purge. The Sicker shook his head. Already, the fearsome visions were gone, faded like a dream on waking. Only one thing remained that he knew for certain. He had opened the door. And if he needed to, he could open it again. Of the two surviving mortals, Atra was the most easily roused. A simple override code sent to her systems brought her back online, not unlike rousing a servitor. Her head, scratch that, her entire body ached. It was more than just an ache in the mechanical parts, more like a blaring klaxon warning her of the intense stresses her body had just undergone. She silenced the alarm, and then felt a rush of euphoria as doing so also silenced her pain responses. The sudden relief was enough to make her fall to her knees, almost ready to weep. Marcos was somewhat more complicated to rouse. The Inquisitor's Reserius had turned injuries that would have reduced him to paste into simply agonizing ones. He had a concussion, a severe gash along his neck, a fractured skull, all his ribs were broken, and hairline fractures persisted across his limbs, making any movement exceptionally painful. Roused Morn's nun to tend administrations, the Inquisitor nonetheless grit his teeth and managed to stand. Atra recovered from the initial bliss, and rose as well. Surveying the environment, she realized that they were the only survivors. Matthias was gone, as was the entire rest of the strike team. Lord Marcus, what were the names of the men who died? She asked. She would not mourn them, not now. Five years in the guard taught you quickly to deal with casualties. If you got broken up over every man who died, you'd never be functional. But they needed to be remembered. Someone had to remember their names. A real person, who remembered they were people, not numbers on a sheet crossed off by a scribe servitor or administratum drone. Not that there was much difference. Well, some difference. Nobody was afraid of a clerk. I'll forward you the details when we're done here. Marcus said, grimacing even as the painkillers took their effect. Fortunately, we are at our destination, and the enemy does not appear to know it. Morn, can you overload the reactors from here? It will take a few minutes, and I will have to be... creative. It will also make our presence blindingly obvious as power output will increase dramatically. Once it begins, we will have 642 seconds to board the Equinox and then leave at maximum velocity, otherwise the explosion and resulting shockwave will kill us as well. I estimate it will take at least 300 seconds to reach a point where the Equinox can land, affording only 342 seconds of error. This is normally within accepted parameters, but we are largely down to melee weapons, and are all badly injured. You aren't wrong. I've got maybe a dozen shots between my remaining pistols. Almost all my ammunition appears to have been lost during the fall. Atra, how many shots does your arm have? None. The Guards woman replied. It's got ammo, but any shot I take with this it's going to be 50-50 whether it goes off at all, and even if it does, the power regulator is damaged. It's about as consistent as an orc sniper at this point. I would advise against underestimating those. Morn reported as he labored over a nearby command console. They can prove unexpectedly dangerous. Work. Wathen growled as he began to sit up. The bloody cog laddie must be more banged up than I am if he's then his response was cut off by a fit of ragged coughs, blood and acid flicked from his mouth. Ah, shouldn't talk, only hurts when I breathe. The old wolf sat back down, saving his strength. Atre stared at the old warrior, genuinely amazed he was still alive. He smirked at her through the half of his mouth that could still move. Don't worry about me lass, space marine, remember? We're invincible. She knew it was a lie, but appreciated the attempt to console her. The screech of Morn's override filled their ears again I am beginning the process. Unfortunately, subtlety is not something we have time for, but I can at least suppress the klaxons from going off, and the Xenos have most likely already disabled the defenses. Energy production is beginning to rise. Contacting Jenkins and the Equinox. Get ready to move. Then the ground began to shake. This is a bit faster than expected. Constantine noted. This isn't me. Morn replied, and began repeatedly stomping on the ground. 
Trigon incoming. It must be attracted to the energy buildup. Have to draw it here. If it goes for the generators, they might not reach a sufficient charge to catastrophically fail. A what? Atra asked. Then it appeared. A gigantian serpent like Xeno, burrowing through solid steel, emerged from the ground near Morn's position. It was larger even than the mighty Carnifex, only part of its body emerging to strike, but that one part was easily three times the size of an imperial tank. It was covered in layers of thick black carapace, boasted two colossal scything talons, and just to add insult to injury, its body crackled with powerful static electricity like certain varieties of eel. Oh, for crying out loud, how many different kinds of bug do they have to throw at us? If I started listing them, I wouldn't be done by the time we've blown up. Ashvan reported, training his missile launcher on the creature, waiting half a beat, and then firing. As the beast roared, the missile went down the back of its throat, blasting out the back of its head with spectacular gore. Fortunately, they all seem to like roaring unnecessarily, and their throats aren't as well armored. The ground continued to shake, and another soon appeared near the salamander, and lunged with its mighty claws. Ashvan had no time to dodge, so he stood his ground, dropping the missile launcher and catching the monster's claws with his gauntlets. His armor began to screech as the strength of the Xeno pushed him to his knees. Atra intervened, power sword slashing through one of the talons, unbalancing the creature and allowing Ish to roll clear. He grabbed the rocket launcher by the barrel, and threw it across the room towards Morn. The Tetchmarine caught it, and began to reload as the shaking intensified. Another broke through the selling, lunging down at the marine. Why do they even have this many? Constantine demanded to know as he activated his jump pack and leapt onto the one attacking Ishvan. He drove his burning blade into a gap in the monster's armor, ripping a plate free. This is a water world. There's nothing to dig through. The beast thrashed, throwing the Templar into the ceiling, where he crashed down amid a rain of broken pipes. His fall was arrested by an unseen force, as Andriel stretched out his hand and caught him. The Dark Angel set his brother down then twisted a pipe into a crude spear with telekinetic force. Taking aim, he flung the spear across the room, driving it into the weak point in the armor Constantine created. Ashvan spied the spear, and tore it free, before charging across the room towards Morn. The Tetchmarine retreated, pursued by his beast, before Marcus fired his grav pistol. The arcane weapon tore the trigger out of the ceiling, bringing it crashing towards the floor. Wathin, limping badly but still fighting, took a wild swing at the alien's side, ripping apart the flesh and scattering armor before the monster's static fled and threw the injured wolf across the room. Marcus drew his Vokai pistol and fired towards the wound, deflagrating the alien's insides and causing it to turn from morn, vomiting smoke and lightning like a dragon out of ancient Terran myth. Yet where one dragon charged, another met it. As Ishvan stepped between the Xeno and the Inquisitor, improvised spear braced. The weight and strength of the monster's charge drove Ishvan back on his heels, but with the increased leverage, he was able to keep the monster pinned down for a few precious moments. That was all more needed, as he came about the side, and fired a missile into the monster's temple, blasting it asunder and dropping it with a crash. The rumbling did not cease, and the sounds of many more creatures rapidly approaching could be heard. More were coming, and coming quickly. No sense in staying here to burn with them. Ish, get your flamer and help clear a path out of here. Marcus, if you've got anything left in that tiny one of yours be ready to use it. Wathin ordered. Marcus blinked at the audacity, but now wasn't the time for it. Morn and Andriel, take the rear, Constantine, Atra, Mid, and move to the front once the flamers run dry, move. Marcus and Ishvan prepared to move, but Morn hesitated. If the Tyranid damage the reactors before they can reach critical energy, they won't. Go. Wathin ordered. My gene seed is already safely in the vaults of the Fang, and I don't fancy becoming a dreadnought with these injuries. They always seem to be miserable bastards. Like hell. Ata replied. If someone needs to stay behind it shouldn't be you. You're too valuable. I appreciate the offer, and your courage lass. Wathin coughed. But you couldn't hold them long enough, 
and Mornindish put in too much work for me to just let you throw yourself away. Besides, there has to be one of you there, after all this, and you're the last one. One of a kind, doesn't get more valuable than that. It has been an honor. Ashvan began, but Wathin cut him off. 500 seconds until this whole hive burns laddie. Don't have time for sentimentality. This is how we all go, and I can't say there's many better ways to go. We'll have time for honors and all that around the Al Father's table. That's not exactly it, but close enough. Morn remarked as he departed. Die well. I plan on it. Ah, Constantine, I'm afraid I'll have to defer our honor duel. The Templar shook his head. The insult is forgotten brother. I shall see you again at the God Emperor's side. Then he turned to go, and heard a sound whip past his ear. The old wolf sax, runes bright, struck into the wall as he went. Carve my name into it, and carve it into the memory of the Xenos across the whole of the galaxy. Wathin bad him. No sense in letting it die here with me. I've been killing Krakens and my Skyvies with a spear since I was a blood claw. The Templar nodded, and then they turned and ran. As they fled, yet another Trigon burst into the control room, this time bringing a horde of smaller creatures behind it. The old wolf raised his improvised spear, and grinned through what was left of his face. Come on you ugly bastards, come and see whether you can face the son of the emperor. For us. For the Alfather. For the Imperium. Suffer not the alien to live. He howled the battle cries of two chapters, and threw himself into the foe. The kill team pressed on, fighting their way out of the power station and racing with all speed towards the exterior. Ashvin and Marcus led the way, flamers opening a path through the tide of lesser tyrannid, scorching aside two waves of charging Jenna stealers. Yet at the third, Marcos's hand flamer sputtered out as its canister ran dry. Undeterred, the Inquisitor drew his power sword and cut down one Xeno, caught another's claws on his cloak, then decapitated it in turn. Ashvan's own flamer ran dry after two bursts more, and the swift Xenos quickly closed the gap as he cast it aside. One drove its razor-sharp claws through the salamander's breastplate, yet its momentum failed before the Xeno could penetrate his ribs. Ashvan then wrapped his arms about the Jenna Stealer in what seemed almost like an embrace, crushing it flat against his chest and dropping the broken thing to the side. He pressed on into the foe, grabbing one by the arm as it struck, though it cut open his palm. He swung it like a flail into another, breaking both open like bloated water balloons. Then he caught a fourth by its head, and crushed it in one mighty gauntlet. As the next wave of Xenos approached, Constantine blew past him. Fimble Winter in one hand, and Ad Vigilum in the other, he fell upon the enemy in a whirlwind of rage. The axe tore the Xenos apart, freezing their blood in its veins and dropping corpses blackened with frostbite. Its runes gleamed with fury, bright with the spirit of Frenis, and its breath was long winter. The blade was its equal and opposite, hewing the foe with utter contempt. His blows with the burning blade needed not to be instantly lethal, for fire roared across Xeno's flesh like oiled wax, melting the flesh from their wretched bones. Yet the fury was not without price. Constantine had dedicated himself fully to the offensive, and with his armor already damaged, he began to bleed as the Jenna Stealers swarmed about him. Blows to his body, legs, and arms, none severe enough to cause serious injury, but each one adding up. Then Andriel and Atra came to his aid. The goods woman had loaned the marine her power sword, though it was more of a power knife in his hands. Even so, he wielded it with all the skill and ferocity expected of a knight of Caliban. As for Atra, her metal claw served ably, driven by vengeance and wrath to rip and tear the enemy like a wild animal. She screamed death and bloody murder like a banshee as she tore into the enemy, matching their own feral rage with her own. A Jenna Stealer opened its mouth to bite her, but she drove her arm through its mouth, claws appearing in the back of its throat. Then she closed her fist, and tore the monster's spine out. Covered in alien blood, she seemed utterly unfazed as the wall in front of the lead sortie exploded. A massive carnifex roared as it broke into the hallway and turned to face the party. Come on then you ugly bastard. She screamed. You killed my planet, but you haven't killed me yet. The Xeno lowered its head and charged, 
A living battering ram too massive to possibly be stopped, no matter how much righteous fury Atra might be able to muster. But while it couldn't be stopped, it could be checked. A crack missile roared from Morn's missile launcher, smashing the beast in the eye and making it stagger. It kept moving forwards, but there was its folly. Constantine countercharged into the creature's blind spot, and taking Wathim's axe in both hands, he clove the beast's leg, severing it at the knee. The monster toppled, rolling down the corridor towards the kill team. Andriel lashed out with what power he could muster against the monster, hoping to stop it. But so close to Marcus, his powers were weak, and he only managed to slow it. But that was enough, as Ishvan charged forwards, and set himself. Catching the living battering ram as it hurtled towards him, he turned with its momentum, and with a shout of extreme effort, hurled the beast over his head, and over the heads of the kill team. He let out a pain dack sound as he recovered. The effort had thrown out his back. Throwing 9 tons of charging alien was a strain even for him. That's what you get for showing off. Andriel noted with a hint of snark as he ran, joined by a slightly slowed and out of breath salamander. Though I appreciate the assistance. The kill team proceeded forwards, approaching the wide exit arch leading out towards a great bridge. Unfortunately, the bridge was of course covered in tyrannids, led by a massive hive tyrant. Absurdly outnumbered, exhausted, and badly wounded, the kill team prepared themselves for one last desperate push. But as they prepared to make a valiant attempt, knowing that their luck was more than likely all but run out, fate smirked. With a blast of blinding light, the equinox appeared, all guns blazing away. Caught entirely by surprise, the hive tyrant vanished under the ship's less cannon blasts, falling to the ground with its entire body shorn in half by overwhelming firepower. The craft hovered over the staggering swarm, all weapons blazing away with utter abandon. The boarding ramp lowered, and the kill team made their move. With the foe scattered before them, they leapt aboard. Sergeant Jenkins grinned as he saw them. Boy am I glad to see you my lords. I have no idea what I'm doing flying this thing. It damn near seems to aim itself. Then his grin faltered. Damn, all dead then. This is starting to become a bad habit. My work, or you surviving it? Marcus asked. Get out of the cockpit Jenkins, the city is about to explode. The either very lucky, or very unlucky, soldier complied, and Morn and Constantine took their seats. The equinox turned, and her engines roared. They did not bother with any attempt at stealth, focusing their efforts on escaping the city. No tyrannid force could catch them, though many an alien eye turned. As they fled the city, they could almost hear Wathin's laughter following them. Then, the world turned blue and white behind them. Everyone brace. A massive orb of blue fire, 10 miles across, covered the city. The entirety of the central spire simply vanished, evaporated by an explosion not dissimilar to the most powerful nuclear weapons possessed by ancient terror. Only the extreme speed of the equinox preserved them, as the shockwave flattened the city, and the wave of blossoming heat, though not the disintegrating fire, melted towers to slag. The great storm over the city was blown away by the shockwave, alien spores perishing as the heat blossom moved outwards. Below, the great bridges were caught up like toys kicked up by an impudent child, thousands of tons of permacrete and steel flying miles into the air. For hundreds of miles, the magnificent constructions from the dark age of technology were utterly destroyed, never to be rebuilt. The death scream of the city, the howling shockwave, tore up the sea, sending waves hundreds of feet high crashing down on the bridges. The blast rippled through the sea, disorienting everything that relied on sonar and effectively deafening all of it. Even in the deepest reaches, the shockwave could be felt, leaving abyssal ears ringing. The blast traveled around the globe six times, each time throwing up titanic waves on the shores of the other hives, killing millions of tyrannids more beyond the billions which had perished in the initial fireball. But even those who escaped that could not escape the psychic backlash as the two creatures all this death had been unleashed to kill perished. Andriel felt their last moments, the last memories of a queen projected out to the galaxy that the whole of the hive mind might known and grow stronger. 
the pinnacle of the hive spire had begun to fall, searing fire reaching inescapably up to consume them. The enslaver had tried to flee, but now the queen turned her mind upon it in turn. Using all the immense might and unholy spite of the hive mind, she held the creature in place so it could not flee back to the warp from whence it came. Andriel felt something like satisfaction come from her as she died, and felt it himself as the agonized death scream of the ancient enslaver echoed even through the muffling aura of Marcas. Across the planet, any creature with a strong connection to the hive mind perished, as the backlash of their queen's death burst their heads like rotting fruit. The lesser creatures, reverting to feral instinct, fell upon one another, stalking each other through the city streets and also the badly disoriented and half-mad Alverans, what few remained. Hidden in their fortifications, the Adeptus Mechanicus knew that the kill team had succeeded. Even in orbit, it was known, as the Hive Fleet suddenly flew into chaos at the death of their queen. Half the navigators and astropaths in the Imperial Fleet instantly went mad or died as the death scream of the enslaver ripped through the Immaterium with the same force as the explosion that killed the Hive. Yet the effect upon the Hive Fleet was far worse. Imperial captains, recognizing their chance, burned full, driving into the heart of the enemy fleet and laying all about with all guns. Broadsides powerful enough to scour all life from continents roared again and again in the night, utterly shattering the Hive Fleet and bringing all within it to ruin. Yet the kill team themselves had no time to celebrate their victory, as the shockwave at last caught up with the Equinox and threw it aside like a toy. All the void hardened glass in the ship exploded, as did everyone's eardrums. Even the enhanced ears of the space marines could not survive the sheer amount of noise caused by the explosion. Atra and Marcus were instantly knocked unconscious, and Andriel succumbed a few moments later. Constantine fought for vision valiantly, falling deaf as earth and sky spun around him. Morn's own systems, already on the brink of collapse, began failing, and backups and secondary backups also began to fail. Even so, they fought through the pain. Constantine valiantly managed to stabilize the craft as it spiraled downwards, beginning to pull out of the dive before the incredible forces caused his vision to blur, and he lost consciousness. The Equinox continued its dive, falling out of the sky as Morn's systems finally collapsed utterly. He remained barely conscious, but was barely able to think let alone move. He only vaguely perceived it as Aishvan, the only member still functional, managed to pull Constantine off the stick, and take it in a massive hand. Pulling back and to the side, the salamander barely managed to pull the Equinox's nose up. With a scream and crash that nearly flung the salamander out of the front of the cockpit, the Equinox crash landed on the rubble-strewn remnants of one of the great bridges. It screeched to a halt, sparks flying about her, but she did not break, nor catch fire. Instead, she slowly span to a halt. Ishvan, legs flung through a bulwark, attempted to rise, and failed. The Emperor protects. Fuck me. Equinox lives. Then he tapped twice on the floor, and finally passed out. The victorious kill team in their battered, bruised near wreck of a craft, lay in victory, laying bright in the dawn of a new day, amid the scattered rubble of infrastructure that could never be repaired, in a world that was all but dead, in the shadow of an utterly gutted and completely unrecoverable hive. The price was high, but by the Emperor, Alvaro was not yet lost. At least not to the Imperium. Aitra awoke to the sight of metal eyes, and the clicking of something mechanical in her ear. Ag, turn that racket off Al. She shouted, as Mara turned something, and her ear popped. There was a brief ringing, and then normal hearing resumed. Metal eyes, if I weren't so happy to see anybody close to normal, I'd be half tempted to punch you. What even was that? Calibrating a replacement for your eardrum. I'd advise not looking at the side of your head, I still have it mostly open. Mara reported. Atra complied. Feeling a bit odd as she felt only a minor sensation as complex and delicate machinery ray assembled her ear. She was quiet and still throughout the process, mulling over the last moments she could remember. It took about 10 minutes to put her ear back together, then Mara pulled away. Maybe avoid throwing yourself into more suicide missions until after you've recovered. You're genuinely quite lucky you didn't start coming apart at the seams, quite literally. 
I'll try to avoid it as best I can. Atra groaned, trying to sit up, then noticing something rather important was missing. Two things. One, where are my clothes, and two, where is my arm? Next to the bed, and undergoing repairs. Lord Ishvan and Morn were the ones to create it and their craftsmanship is as difficult to maintain as it is exceptional. Both are recovering as well, though Lord Morn should regain consciousness shortly. How long are we out? Atra asked. She swung her legs over the side of her bed. If she was as she had been at the start of all this, it would have taken her more than a month to fully recover. But now she did not heal, she was repaired, and that was far quicker. Three solar days. Mara explained. At least that's how long it's been since we achieved victory. Though it looked like you had all been out for a while when we found the Equinox. Are Jenkins and the Inquisitor alive? Atra asked, donning the robes by her table. There was something to be said for robes. Much easier to put on with only one arm, and quite comfortable. Yes, both survived, and Lord Marcus has, officially, already made a full recovery. Even faster than the marines? Atra mused. Though the way you say officially makes it sound like he ordered someone to say he was fully recovered. He's currently in a wheelchair. Mara explained. But that hasn't stopped him from getting back to work. I can appreciate that. I'm guessing we're on the fleet? Atra hypothesized, and Mara nodded. Well, glad to see you made it out. What happened after the, you know? She made an expanding gesture with her one hand. Boom. You know that time you went utterly berserk, and it took half the command squad to hold you back? Mara explained. That, but for everybody on the planet. It seems most of the humans avoided fighting each other, and for the Xenos, who started fighting each other. We took our chance and took everything void capable we could get and left. We lost a lot of good people in the chaos. But everything important got out, and the defenses we left should keep the ferals from causing too much damage. Atra let out a low whistle. Well, I don't know quite what I was expecting, but it probably should have been that. Makes sense. Any idea how many are left? Surveys are still early, but it looks like only between 6 and 9 billion from early estimates. Mara replied. I'm sorry, there just aren't many left and I don't know if any of them will ever really recover. We also lost two titans, and pretty much all the heavy equipment and fleets. Six to nine billion, from a population that had previously spanned in the tens of billions. The sheer level of those casualties were beyond human comprehension. It was as a certain warlord of ancient terror had once said, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths are a statistic. Wathim's death had been tragic but it paled before the sheer scope of loss the Imperium had suffered. Nearly the entire population was simply gone, and two titans, each of which was worth an entire army of men, had been destroyed. Atra sat down, attempting to process the extent of the catastrophe. Her first thought was to go back to sleep and never wake up. Her second thought was to go find enough Amzek to make sure she never woke up. Then her third thought stopped that. She was... For all intents and purposes, the last Alvarin not apparently regressed into a feral state by the backlash of the enslaver's death. She could not allow herself to succumb to despair and die. So long as she lived, so long as even one free Alvarin remained, Alvaro was not yet lost. And she had not given everything. Her life, her body, her world, and billions of lives just to lose it now at the 11th hour. She had to keep living, until Alvaro lived again. She sat there, considering what to do next. It seemed like an eternity since she hadn't been actively fighting, or preparing for the next fight. For this moment, certain to be temporary, there was peace, and she had no idea really what to do with it. Then, she came upon a simple direct answer. You want to get something to eat? She asked. She was broadly left alone after the pair enjoyed a brief and spartan meal together. Her arm was returned and Ray fitted by a selection of tech priest, in a ritual that left her smelling on incense and sacred oils. Apparently being one with a holy machine meant that no, the same amount of incense, oils, and ceremony even went into the maintenance of her own bionics. She spied more once, but the two did not speak, and she saw nothing of the Inquisitor, 
which suited her just fine. She was broadly speaking left in the dark, uncertain of what was going on even in the wider halls of the ship, let alone beyond. Still, various serfs here and there treated her with unusual respect, bowing as she passed them. None barred her passage, and crew parted before her. Whatever was going on, she clearly had the freedom to go as she liked, a truly rare privilege. Most would answer her questions, but often knew nothing. Curious at this turn of events, she began to explore the ship with greater confidence, accessing cogitators and beginning to mentally map the kilometers of passageways, gathering scattered reports on the appearance of the Astartes of the Inquisitor. There were several spaces she was still barred from reaching. One, based on the particular noise and high presence of Mechanicus, was most likely the Inginarum, restricted for obvious reasons. Another she did not understand at first, until she recognized a series of sigils on the door as similar to the ones near the astropathic choir on Alvara. That must be the location of their choir in turn. She considered what to do next. She wasn't even entirely certain what she was searching for as she explored the craft. She wanted to know what was going on, but the crew were broadly ignorant. They knew that they were still in real space, but most didn't even know what system they were in. There were likely only a few people on the ship who knew what was really going on both with Alvara and her personally. And as evidence increasingly suggested that the space marines had left the ship, moving to one better suited to aid their own recovery, that meant there was just one, which, given his ability to suppress psychic powers, would probably be found as far from the choir as possible. Following that logic, she began to investigate from the furthest points possible from the choir, working her way inwards. She interrogated crew on any senses of unease or areas where increased superstition seemed to be occurring. Tracing the patterns of disturbances, she at last found her quarry. Opening the door into a small room in an otherwise insuspicious corner of the craft, she found the Inquisitor sat behind a small desk, accompanied by a small mountain of paperwork, a servo skull, and a whirring cogitator. Well done. He remarked with a faint approving smile. Of course you're expecting me. So, before we get to what the point of this little test was, the actual reason why I'm here. What in the god emperor's name is going on with my planet? Well, it is my job. Marcus said with a shrug. As to your question, I'm in the process of trying to figure that out. At the moment, we're still gathering information, and as many Alvarans as we can. We're moving them off-world onto holding vessels until we can determine their state. This isn't exactly a standard enslaver invasion, and your people are proving themselves to be remarkably resilient. They've begun forming into bands, and attacking anything Xenos that they come across, but don't attack any Imperial forces and have been docile thus far in captivity. It's too early to say whether any of them will make a full recovery, but their loyalty is still fully intact even if their minds are not. As for planetary infrastructure, the bridges are largely damaged beyond recovery, all hives have suffered extreme amounts of damage, and hive tempestus is completely irrecoverable. That pile of paperwork there, from inches 2 to 6, are documents pertaining to scrapping it. Worse, the tyrannid organisms appear to be fleeing into the oceans and becoming part of the ecosystem. We'll never be able to properly root all of them out. If I had to guess, within a few centuries of recolonization the system will be redesignated as a death world. Recolonized. Ata repeated. So then, what is it now? Officially, it is now listed as unpopulated. We are pulling out as many Alvarans as we can, but there are so few left that within a few decades any left on the world will have gone extinct. Repopulation will have to come from other sources, most likely a combination of Caden. That was the stock for this most recent colonization, and probably Catalchins. The Administratum seems interested in crossbreeding those two stocks to see what happens, and if it is redesignated as a death world, it will likely produce some of the finest soldiers in the Segmentum. Though with the paperwork involved, that likely won't occur for at least 200 years. The planet will likely never fully recover, but we might hope for 60% output after about 500 years. So that was it then. Alvara was not yet lost, not to the Imperium, but to the Alvarans, who themselves might be beyond recovery, it certainly was. The planet itself would live, but forever altered by the alien invasion. 
Alvaro had passed a Rubicon, not unlike her last daughter. Neither would ever be the same again. You will be remembered. I fully intend to see to it. Marcus said after a long moment. Your sacrifice will not be forgotten, and I will do all that I can to help your people. It is my duty to protect the loyal citizens of the Imperium, and while many may be sacrificed for the wider whole, such sacrifices are never to be made unnecessarily. Your people's loyalty, and your own, is without question. Which brings us to the purpose of this test. Your loyalty and courage is exceptional, particularly among the standards of the guard. Your service record is remarkable, and you have demonstrated extreme intelligence, drive, and faith, as well as a hatred for the Xeno that I have rarely witnessed outside of the Adeptus Auratus. Furthermore, you clearly possess information gathering skills, as can be demonstrated by your ability to find me on a Lunar class cruiser. All these skills indicate that your potential far surpasses the normal requirements of the Imperial Guard. I would therefore offer you the opportunity to serve the God Emperor more directly, as an acolyte of his most holy inquisition. Atra blinked. She had a feeling that this was some manner of test, but had not expected her reward to be such a singularly high honor. While she knew relatively little of the Inquisition beyond its fearsome reputation, it didn't take a genius to gather what acolytes might one day become. A full Inquisitor, one of the most powerful individuals in the entire galaxy, answerable only to the Emperor himself. I appreciate the offer. She replied. What would my duties in this new position entail? The Inquisitor smiled at that. Acolytes fill a wide variety of roles, each according to their own particular specialization. Given your skill set and the fact that you're one of the few mortals to have earned the respect of the Space Marines, you would most likely continue in your present role alongside Kill Team Equinox. You would officially act as my liaison, my eyes and ears, and given prior command experience with the Guard, also could potentially be deployed alongside Imperial Guard formations in particular engagements. You would act as representative, warrior, and part of Forward's intelligence. Continued training will of course be mandatory, and you may also be deployed independently for your own missions, or alongside other acolytes, which you will learn more of as is needed. For operational security, my acolytes are broadly ignorant of one another unless required for a particular mission. Atra considered. So, do what we just did, again? Well, this last mission was abnormal, in many ways. Marcus admitted. I figured as much. Based on how you all reacted, finding one of those enslavers stuck on a Norn Queen isn't exactly common. Unheard of, actually. I fully intend to continue investigating the cause of this abnormality, though I fear it may be the work of a fouler design. Then I have one condition. Ata replied. When you find whoever was responsible for creating that thing, for unleashing that horror on my world, I get to be part of the team that brings them down. Your only request is for vengeance? Marcus asked. I think I see why Morn likes you. He offered his hand. You will have it. Welcome to the Inquisition. When Atra set out on the first day of her new job, she went out in new armor. Closely based on her new master's own Xeno hide armor, and formed of Harley plates even stronger than her old carapace armor, the armor was all black and silver, freshly painted and anointed with all sacred rites. On her left shoulder, she bore the stylized eye of the Inquisition, and on the right, the swirling blue dragon of Alvara, a standard that she knew now she would not be the last to bear. Power sword at her hip, mechanical arm charged. She entered the hangar of the Lunar class cruiser, watching with a wide grin as their ship arrived. She had been freshly painted in the colors of the Death Watch, poured over by the adepts of Mars and found worthy of service. The proud young craft set down, and boarding ramp lowered. From her depths emerged four warriors, armed in divergent colors no longer, but now united in the colors of their newly forged brotherhood. Only their right shoulders bore the marks of their parent chapters. The cross of the Templars, the dragon's head of the Salamanders, the iron fist of the iron hands, and the wings of the dark angels. Constantine walked with his sword at one side, and his axe at the other, a new set of runes graven onto the bleed, the name of an old and mighty wolf, whose owl had shattered a hive fleet and set a world free. Aishvan bore a new, slightly tweaked heavy flamer, with a head like that of a roaring dragon. 
Mons Panopoli was as simple and effective as ever, though Atra did note with some amusement that he kept the missile launcher in addition to his twin bolters. Only Andriel's weapons had changed. He bore his staff no longer, but now carefully forged for sword, similar to her own power weapon, but specialized to channel psychic powers. She saluted, but did not bow, and neither did they. Acolyte Atra. Constantine mused. I see you have made a full recovery. We may resume training with full intensity. He's getting tired of knocking the rest of us down. Andriel replied with a slight smile, then a nod towards the acolyte. So then, I believe we have Xenos to kill. Well, at least you aren't trying to kill one another any longer. I shouldn't sighed. But it seems that your never-ending battle continues. Our vigil is long, the night dark, but neither are without end. Mon replied, and Atra almost swore he was trying to make a joke. And our next mission will be a return to the Watch Fortress. We are down a member, and I have communicated arrangements for a new brother to join our cause. And then, at last, back to war. For we are Death Watch, the Angels of Death, and in the Emperor's name, we shall not suffer the alien to live, no matter where they may hide, or what realm they dare trespass. Morn concluded. And we are Equinox. We are the point of balance, and we are the turning of the tide. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.